Welcome, friends. It is another edition of Texas Sports Unfiltered, and we're doing Texas Sports Unfiltered in multiple locations today. You see Brad Kellner right there. He is over in Las Vegas. You're looking for Bucky Godbolt. Bucky Godbolt, there it is right there. There it is right there. I am at Circuit of the Americas. Adam Wagner on his way. We will go from 8 to 11 this morning talking Texas basketball, talking NFL, talking Otani, and of course, we'll be talking NASCAR at Coda and a whole lot more for you all morning. And remember, we're going 8 to 5 live every day, Monday through Friday, right here on Texas Sports Unfiltered. BK, how are you, my man? Oh, man, I am hurting a little bit. You can probably <laughs> tell by the sound of my voice this morning. It is a little after 6 a.m. local time in beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada. But despite the minor hangover that I have, despite the major loss of voice that I have, I'm feeling good because Texas basketball got us a win yesterday and a double-digit win at that and a relatively stress-free win, all things considered, in the first round of the NCAA tournament. So no complaints here, my man. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. And and uh, like you were talking about the other day, man, it's dark coming out here. Um, I've been out here a lot of times. I've been out here at night, but I've never been out here in the morning like this. And uh, very, very dark. But uh, I tell you what, man, this place is uh, already starting to crank up. They're doing the uh, Speedway Ministries uh, laps for charity. So all of that's happening out uh, on the race course right now. But I think uh, we're setting up for what is going to be uh, a fine weekend here. And uh, <laughs> Magic Man, I can smell the booze off of you from here, BK. It's a, that bad, my man, that bad. Was it that bad? Oh, man. I mean, it's always bad in yeah. Vegas. That's, yeah. that's just how it works. But no, last night was the relatively easy night, right? So I got probably two and a half hours of sleep on Wednesday night. Yeah. And I was up from, you know, about 5 o'clock local time. Um, until probably crashed around midnight local time last night. So for Vegas to be in bed by midnight, that's impressive. So this this is probably the best I'll feel over these next three days, and y'all can just hear how I sound <laughs> this morning. So, uh, man, yeah, it's uh, it was a relatively light day yesterday, and, and we already look and sound like this. So it's it's all downhill from here, my man. I was surprised. I was surprised, and at the same time, not surprised when I got a text from you this morning. I was like, uh, "Okay, he just wants to make sure everything's working." But uh, when I saw you pop up on the screen, I thought, "Man, look at that! Uh, and that that's that that's a true sign of a of a, of a great leader right there." You're taking one for the team this morning, my man. <laughs> hey, happy to be here. I'm wearing exactly what I wore yesterday, so. <laughs> Uh, but, hey, we're repping the Longhorns. we got the beautiful Sue Patrick Texas shirt. I know you've got one of these, too, as well, yeah. Rodney. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, man, excited to be here. There's there's obviously so much going on in the world of sports right now. And uh, Coda coming to NASCAR this weekend is great. I know you guys are going to have a couple of special guests coming to join you all out there at the circuit this morning, which will be fun to listen to. And, obviously, I mean, what a, what a crazy day of the NCAA tournament. You couldn't ask for much more in day one. Maybe if you're a Sanford fan or just a Kansas hater, you could have asked for a better call in the last 30 seconds of that game, or I should say a better no call in the last 30 seconds of that game. But you had a massive upset with Kentucky going down to Oakland. You had a couple of tremendous individual performances. Obviously, you got to see the Longhorns come away with a win. I mean, there was uh, so much to like Maybe a lot to dislike, too, from yesterday at the tournament. But obviously, you got three more epic days of college basketball coming up. you got Texas spring football going on. I mean, it's a, it's a great time to be a sports fan. March is one of the best sports months of the year. And it's cool that a lot of the big stories are kind of involving Austin, Texas, USA, America. But, no, nah, man, happy to uh, be able to pop on for at least a little bit today to, to talk about just everything that's happening. You got to love, I was talking about that yesterday. To me, the, to, yesterday and today are two of the best days in sports, if not the best. I mean, you can talk about, like, you know, I, I was talking about Indy 500s and all these different things when it comes to me on the racing side. But it's, th these two days is where you get, I mean, you just never know what's going to happen. And, and when everything starts out, you're just waiting. You're waiting for that first domino to fall down. And then boom, once it does, it, it's that they call it March Madness for a reason. Yeah. And that's and that's exactly what we saw yesterday. And, you know, I think I was listening to an interview with uh, the coach, uh, 
coach uh, from Oakland and uh, him talking about his squad and, 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 you know, the, the that's how dreams come true, man. Um, I, I know that with March Madness, they paint a, a lot of different ways, and a lot of people think that it's hyperbole and 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 just just overdoing things, media driven. But I'll tell you, when when you see days like yesterday, it's what it's all about. This this is why we love sports for days like yesterday. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the biggest story from yesterday was Oakland, right? Greg mm-hmm. Campy has been the head coach there for forty years. It's the only head coaching job he's ever had took the gig in 1984 and yeah I mean everyone knows the history and pageantry surrounding Kentucky basketball and I myself Rodney I'm not a communist so I hate <laughs> Kentucky basketball so I was going nuts yesterday I was watching these games at Circus Sportsbook out in Vegas which if you've never been to that place find a way to get to that place my goodness it is sports heaven yeah. and it's even better when it's the first couple of days of the NCAA tournament and I agree the two best days for a sports fan are yesterday and today with just 16 basketball games going on pretty much from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed it doesn't get much better than that but yeah what a story and then of course Jack Golke 10 yeah. three-pointers I mean that guy was unconscious yeah. from the floor yesterday and uh, damn near tied the record the nc 2a tournament record was 11 if that guy shot a couple more times he could have easily gotten to 11 hell he could have gotten 15 the way he was making them yesterday but an unbelievable game an incredible performance and that's what march is about you get stars in the month of march sometimes they come from the big teams but sometimes they come from the no-name teams i mean how many people figured out that oakland is in michigan yesterday right? yeah i know so, right like oh, it's a bay area team no that's that's oakland in the detroit area And, uh, yeah, an incredible individual performance. Obviously a phenomenal story with that head coach and with that program. And, look, any 14-3 upset is going to be a big deal. But, once again, when you do it against John Calipari and Big Blue Nation, that makes it even more special. I think it was pretty easy for just about everybody to root for that one yesterday. So that was probably the coolest thing from an unbiased perspective that went down yesterday. And, like you said, man, that's just what the dance is all about. And then when you get when you get situations like with Duquesne, I mean, it had been I, I can't even remember how long it's been since Duquesne's been in in the dance. And and here they come and, and they knock off BYU. And, and that's, you know, BYU was one of the teams that I thought was really capable of making a run here. You know, when you look at when you obviously you've got, you know, the Yukons and whatever route you want to go with all of that. But uh, when when BYU goes down to Duquesne right there, the Dukies getting the win there, that's an 11 over uh, over a six. And that I mean, that's fantastic to see right there. That's that's the stories that, like I said, man, dreams are made of. And 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 that's it was outstanding to watch all of this. And then, and then of course, uh, I, the or, Oregon, South Carolina matchup. I talked about this one specifically yesterday on chaos theory, where I had Oregon moving on in my bracket and I changed it and mm. I changed it. And, and as, as I sat there and watched that, and I mean, it was, I mean, they handled it. South Carolina handled yeah. them easily. Yeah. Oregon's good. Oregon's good. You did have a couple of 11, six upsets yesterday. I think you might get a couple more today, but yeah, you know, Oregon got hot at the right time. And Dana Altman, and that's a coach who's coached in a Final Four before. And I don't think he's ever lost a first-round NCAA tournament game. So, uh, look, South Carolina was a tremendous story this year. They were the luckiest team in college basketball, according to Ken Palm. So I was a little weary about them going into the dance. And I'll tell you what, you talk about conferences, right? And, and sometimes this is scary. and Sometimes this is bad to do this. We do this around bowl season, too, and it feels a little fraudulent. But you always look at the conference records in bowl season, right, in yeah. college football. And you always look at the conference records in college basketball as well. You know, this this was regarded as maybe the best year of SEC basketball in 20 years, 30 years. Yeah. And they went 0-3 yesterday and had Kentucky, a three seed, lose to a 14. They had Mississippi State get boat raced by Michigan State in an 8-9. And obviously they had South Carolina get beat pretty good by Oregon. So uh, I, I've said it all year long. It, it's not a, a hot take or anything like that. Texas is getting a little bit of a reprieve in basketball. They're not getting much of a reprieve in other sports, jumping from the Big 12 to the SEC. But at men's college basketball, They are, and it was a bad, bad day for the SEC. Obviously, South Carolina was a part of that. And then, yeah, good story for Duquesne. Look, BYU, BYU's, uh, they got to be a frustrating team if you're a BYU fan. I mean, every team lives and dies by the three in today's college basketball. It's just how the sport works. But BYU shoots more threes than any team in the country. 
And give Duquesne credit, they were a good matchup for BYU because they were one of the better three-point defensive teams in the land this year. And BYU is not making their threes. They can lose to a high school team. If BYU yeah. is making their threes, they can beat a number one seed. And yesterday, they just they just weren't making their threes. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's a tough one. I know a lot of folks had the BYU-Illinois upset. You talk about last-second changes. That was a last-second change, right? I had BYU over Illinois in the second round, and I'm like, man, I just, I just can't trust a team that shoots too many threes. So, look, I won't take too much credit. I had the Cougars over the Dukes yesterday, and that didn't even happen. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, BYU, frustrating. And, yeah, the 11-6 has almost become the new 12-5. We're seeing a bunch – of 11-6 upsets, obviously, NC State over Texas Tech, another 11-6 up upset. Hell, we had three of them yesterday. The 11 mm -hmm. seeds are 3-0 and oh right now, and the fourth 11 seed is favored. That's New Mexico against Clemson in a game that's later today. So, yeah, it's uh, that's if you're a six seed, it's almost cursed right yeah. now the way uh, this sport has trended in recent seasons. And I was really wondering as I was watching this, um, you know, and that's the cool thing about it. Now, now you can watch them all. I mean, it's super easy to watch them all. All you got to do is figure out where some of these other channels are. I mean, this is the only time of year I watch True TV, and it's like you know, asking Siri where True TV is, and you find it. And thank goodness they're all in a row right there with uh, with the TBS and so forth. But I, I'm sitting there, and I'm and and I was saying yesterday I wasn't putting a lot of stock in Arizona. I mean, I looked up at one point and I thought Arizona was in major trouble yeah. uh, and, and they came back uh, to take care of business right there. But I mean, how, how much of a uh, well, wouldn't have been a shock to me. But I mean, if Arizona would have gone down, I mean, that that would have really oh, wiped out some brackets right there. And I know a lot of brackets are in trouble. And, and the cool part about this is, well, I guess it depends. I get I look at it two different ways. If you're doing a bracket, if you're in a bracket league just for fun and your bracket gets busted in the first two hours of the of the tournament it's not that big a deal but if you're uh if, if you got some coin on the line and you're eliminated that quick uh that kind of sucks but um yeah i thought arizona might be in trouble and like you said i i think that was just that's just a preview i see three or four of more of those today yeah yeah i think so i think you might and, and you see that happen a lot right it's so easy to root for the underdog it's so easy to say the hell with your bracket, especially after you miss the first couple of games. But yeah, you, you see, you see the lower seeded teams hang around with those big dogs in the first half, and it gives yeah. you some hope. Like, oh, we might see some history here. And Arizona, they were a two seed last year, and they lost to a fifteen seed in round one. So you're thinking, oh my God, is Lightning going to strike twice in the same place? And yeah, they pulled away in the second half. Creighton, Akron, right? That was a game that was kind of close in the first half. Mm -hmm. Creighton went on a big run to start off the second half. They kind of pulled away. Same thing with Illinois and Moorhead State. And that game was close into the second half. But the Illini went on like a 16 to 3 run or something like that. And they sort of pulled away. So yeah, you had a few more close ones. Obviously, Sanford, Kansas, that was, uh, I mean, what a comeback by Sanford and what a collapse nearly by Kansas. And or the officiating. I mean, uh, the officials got yeah. more air time than Cats got more time on Broadway last night. I mean, it was ridiculous how many replays and reviews that we had. The last three minutes of that game, it felt like it took 45 minutes to get done. And obviously, you had the controversy at the end with the uh, the block foul call uh, in the last few seconds that helped Kansas kind of put the game on ice. But uh, yeah, I mean, day one, it had just about everything you could have asked for. And like you said, the, the beauty of this thing is we get one more day like that today. And obviously, you know, weekend or into the weekend, you get round two. You don't get as many games, but Saturday and Sunday are going to be a hell of a lot of fun as well. So don't Absolutely. do any work. I mean, no one's doing any work right now. It's the biggest crock of crap is people going into the office or getting on their computer and acting like they're getting stuff done. Don't even try. Just go to cover three. Go to Jack Allen's kitchen. Yeah. You know, somewhere. Absolutely. Watch the games. Enjoy yourself today. You deserve it. You work hard for the other 363 days out of the year go uh go play some hooky go have some fun on that yesterday and, and today and today's friday nobody does work in austin on friday yeah, anyways yeah, so this, yeah. this will be the least productive day of the year i think everybody's off and and, and i'm curious to see because i know a lot of times out here uh when you have events like this i can tell you when i go to when i go to major short track events in in florida and it always seems like it falls on the weekend of the SEC championship in football. And you've got 
I mean, the tailgates are just jammed with folks watching that. And they actually set up areas at racetracks here for this stuff. So I would be more than willing to bet that you're going to be able to look around here at Circuit of the Americas if you're coming out here. And this, BK, you should see this. I'm looking out the window and the, the, the charity laps. There goes a little Miata. Uh, going by, you had like an old Ford pickup. There goes a Toyota Camry. It's like every every variety of uh, vehicle. There, there goes an there goes a mom van. There's a mom van trucking along mm. right there. So, uh, and that's something you can do. You can come on out to Coda uh, Children's uh, Ministries there, uh, doing that. Uh, here's a question right here from RSC asking, uh, and you guys don't forget the Coda text line is open as well all day long, 512-222-9328, and never a better day to jump on that uh, CODA text line if you are on the free Texas Sports Unfiltered app because we are at CODA today. Uh, yeah. Texas Tech goes down, uh, so it looks like the national championship will not be going through Lubbock after all in basketball, according to uh, uh, you-know-who. Yeah, the only meat or the only championship that goes through Lubbock is the meat judging championship in Texas Tech these days. Yeah, look, N NC State, I mean, they they were incredibly hot going into the NCAA tournament. They won five games in five days in the ACC tournament. They needed all five of them, too, to get that automatic bid. They were not going to get in as an at-large team. So they're playing with a ton of confidence right now. They have maybe my favorite player to watch in the country with that big right tackle. DJ Burns down low. I mean, that guy is massive, but he's also graceful. It's crazy the touch that that guy has at that size down there on the low block. And, yeah, it was an up-and-down year one for Grant McCaslin and Texas Tech, but they ran into a buzzsaw. And now NC State, you know, they get Oakland in round two. Yep. So it yep. could be seven straight wins for NC State. I think they opened up as a five-and-a-half-point favorite. Now, you don't want to count Oakland as an easy win. Just ask Kentucky how that works. But, uh, no, I, I always enjoy – rooting against Texas Tech. I'll credit the Buck. By the way, Bucky will be on with Zay from 1 to 3 this afternoon. So if you want to get your dose of Bucky on a Friday, uh, you can do that a little bit later. Chip will be at the women's game, which, of course, starts at 2 o'clock. But, um, yeah, Bucky had 5,000 units on NC State. He gave him some credit. He had a hunch that uh, that one was going to happen. And, yeah, NC State, they are rolling right mm -hmm. now. That's, that's not a team. Even if they were playing Kentucky instead of Oakland, I, I'd be pretty nervous for Kentucky in round two tomorrow. That's a, not a team you want to see the way that they've been rolling. So, uh, yeah, glorious when Texas Tech loses. And I don't know if you saw this, Rodney, but B. John Robinson has a perfect bracket after really? day one. There's like less than 0.1% of the world that is still perfect after yesterday. And one of those members of that 0.01% is B. John Robinson. He literally nice. got every single game right. He's 16 of 16 i'll try to share the screen it's a little bit blurry with it being so zoomed in yeah but yeah Bijan, perfect yesterday incredibly impressive he continues to amaze with just everything he does on and off the field and yeah. uh hey it's a good sign because he has texas winning the national championship so right, there you go we're just going to assume go. that Bijan's going to stay perfect for the rest of this tournament and we're going to be celebrating a national title here in austin in a couple of weeks there you go. Hey, BK, I'm going to bump off for just a second. I'm going to go get Wags. This this place is kind of hard to navigate, so I'm going to go grab him right quick. All right. Very good, brother. There he goes. Yeah, Wags will join Double R live from Coda. Once again, some lineup changes today. Uh, excited to be out at Coda this morning. If you want to get out to Coda this weekend, just go to NASCAR at Coda.com for your tickets. Two races tomorrow. The big race coming up on Saturday. Tons of great events going on today out there as well. If you've never been to the circuit, this is the perfect excuse to get out to the circuit. All right, so Texas basketball, guys. We've talked a little bit about the Longhorns game. Also talked a lot about the other games in the first round of the NC2A tournament. But an, an impressive showing for Texas. I know it wasn't the you know, aesthetically most aesthetically pleasing game the Longhorns have ever played. I mean, when you're talking about a final score of 56 to 44, it's obvious that you weren't setting the world on fire offensively, but you know, that was gorgeous to me. A lot of people were using the word ugly to describe that game. I saw some folks take to Twitter and say, Oh, you know, we don't need to talk about how it happened. We're just happy it happened. You get a double digit win in the NCAA tournament. I mean, Texas was up double digits for most of that game. They were in control for most of that game. You get a performance like that in the big dance, especially against a team that, you know, you were seemingly even, evenly matched with on paper, right? Texas was only a two, two and a half point favorite on paper. 
and they go out and win by double digits. That was gorgeous to me. I had a very good time watching that game out here in Vegas. And uh, yeah, a great showing. And I think what's even better is look, the Longhorns won that game despite making just one three. Now, do they have a chance against Tennessee if they go one of 14 from beyond the arc tomorrow? Absolutely not. They've got to figure some things out offensively. I don't think 56 points is going to be enough to be the two seed in the Midwest region. But to win a game where you make just one three, to win a game where Max A. Smith goes five of 15 and Dylan DeSue goes five of 18. I mean, if you would have told any Texas fan that those guys were going to combine for 10 of 33 from the floor last night, I'll ask you guys this. I mean, if you would have told me, And if I would have told y'all that Texas was going to get 5 of 15 for Max A. Smith. I got to take you guys off. Crazy static there. Uh, Y'all would have told me, and I would have told you that Texas would have gotten boat raced yesterday. So for them to, uh, you know, have their star players play that poorly and to shoot that poorly from the floor and still find a way to beat a very good team. I mean, say what you will about Virginia. Colorado State still won a tournament game by 25 two days prior, and Texas kind of took it to them. Uh, They held Colorado State to three points in the final 15 minutes of the first half. That stat almost looks made up. I mean, CSU jumped out to an 8-2 to lead, and you're thinking, oh, well, season's over. Way to go, Texas. Uh, This is what we're going to get. And then the Texas defense just absolutely clamped down on Colorado State, holding them to three points in the final 15 minutes of that first half. It was a great defensive showing for Texas. Give Dylan Mitchell a lot of credit. Give Dylan DeSue a lot of credit going up against Scott and Cartier. Those guys carried Colorado State to that big victory over Virginia on Tuesday night. Those guys were really good defensively. And Tyrese Hunter. Look, Tyrese Hunter has been much maligned, much criticized all season long. A lot of it's been by me. And he didn't have a great offensive day. I wouldn't even say he had a good offensive day yesterday, but his defense on uh, Isaiah Stevens, who was Colorado State's best player all season long, was tremendous. And Stevens was 4 of 16 from the floor, had just 10 points for Colorado State. So uh, it was great to see. Uh, it was great to see yesterday for Texas. And we got a little little less static, but still some static. Hearing you guys too well. Try to chop through some technical difficulties from being half in Vegas and half in Auda out at in Austin. I just combined Austin and Coda to get Auda. I'm not sure what that is. I'm tired. I'm hungover, drunk, maybe both. I'm not entirely sure what's going on this morning. But yeah, you take it for Texas and you give Ronnie Terry some credit. Like he's been criticized all season long. And Ronnie Terry, this is his first full season of being the head coach for Texas basketball. He did something that Shaka Smart couldn't do in six full seasons of being the head coach of the Longhorns, and that's win a tournament game. So give RT some credit, man. Give him some flowers. I don't know if people are going to sit here and say this is an incredibly successful season. Texas goes out and loses to Tennessee tomorrow in the round of 32. But once again, I mean, Shaka Smart in six seasons could not win a single game in the big dance. And here you go in RT's first full season. You know, if you want to credit him for what happened last year, I think he deserves at least a little bit of credit for that deep run to the Elite Eight. But uh, this one, you got to give him all the credit for uh, finding a way to guide Texas to a tournament win. And those were few and far between for a while with this Texas basketball program. So, guys, uh, still some static. We'll see if we can hear you now. And yeah, now, uh, not, uh, you, you guys are barely coming across right now. So, We'll see if we can find a way to make some things happen. That whack shows up and all of a sudden things fall apart. That truly is chaos. That's why they call the show chaos theory. Uh, yeah. If you guys have some questions for me, for sure. Now, look, we'll, we'll obviously talk a lot about Texas, Tennessee, because this will be the last day of shows that we do before that game happens tomorrow, uh, seven o'clock local time. How about that prime time for Texas in round two? Of course you got the great storyline, the Longhorns going up against the greatest coach in Texas basketball history in Rick Barnes and boy, Tennessee looked really good yesterday. I mean, I, I know it's a two fifteen matchup, but on St. Peter's last time they were in the dance, they went to the elite eight as a 15 seed and they did not come close to doing that this year because Tennessee just steamrolled them pretty much from the opening tip, 83 to 49, the final score in that game. And it was like 24 to seven at one point. It was 46 to 20 at halftime. I mean, Tennessee just ran away and hid from the peacocks of St. Pete 
yesterday. Not a great day for the phallic name school. But even worse. That's even worse, guys. Uh, not a great day because you had more head state going down. Uh, we'll see if Longwood can pull off the upset over number one seed Houston today. I got a hunch that that ain't going to happen. Not that I'm going out on much of a limb there. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, Tennessee looked about as good as you could possibly look. And what scares me about Tennessee, there's a lot of things that scare me about Tennessee. They have one of the best players in college basketball and Dalton Connect on their team. But that's uh, one of the best defensive teams in the country. All right, Tennessee ranks number three in defensive efficiency on Ken Palm. And Texas yesterday against a Colorado State team that's top 40 in that stat. They're not a bad defensive team. And they, they obviously did a great job shutting down Virginia a couple of days ago. Uh, but, you know, Texas really struggled. Once again, made just one three, scored just 56 points against a defense that is worse than what they will see with the uh, Tennessee Volunteers tomorrow. So, and the Longhorns obviously have to figure some things out offensively. They got to find a way to get Dylan DeSue and Max Aceman's going a little bit more. And I thought DeSue was forcing things a little bit. And I, I don't get that mad when he forces things because I trust – I trust him shooting more than I trust just about anybody else on this Texas team. And, uh, yeah, I think he'll, he'll have a much better game. The bar was working until the last thing you touched. Whatever you just did did not help. No, still out. All right, we'll try to, we'll try to figure some things out out there at uh, Coda. Uh, a lot of wires in a small space. I feel bad for – for the guys, they're trying. You guys can't see it, but uh, they're trying. Magic Man says they should share a headset. That'd be hilarious. Whenever one person's done talking, they just take off the the lid and pass it to the other person. Uh, that would be fantastic. But yeah, look, every Texas fan knows the Longhorns are going to have to play better to beat Tennessee. But the good news is, look, maybe that's the ugly game. Texas get the get the you know bad offensive performance out the way and. This team has been up and down all season long, so maybe that was the down offensive showing, and uh, well, they shoot a hell of a lot better tomorrow. But, yeah, Tennessee, I was hoping – I was obviously hoping for the St. Peter's upset to hell with the storyline. Like, uh, give me regular season Rick in round one. Like, have him losing in the first round of the tournament so we could play a 15 seed in the second round. I would have loved that. And even if St. Peter's couldn't pull off the upset, I was, I was hoping they'd at least give Tennessee a game, and, uh, well, they weren't even close to doing that, so. Yeah, if you, I'm sure a lot of Texas fans were locked in watching that game. Of course, it was on the same court as the uh, Texas-Colorado State game was. I'm sure Longhorn fans were hoping for a little bit more of a showing for St. Peter's just so Tennessee got a little bit of a scare, just so, you know, Tennessee had to play at starters for more than like the 20 to 25 minutes that they did last night, and it didn't happen. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it was uh, a good game for Tennessee. That was you know, the best they've looked all season long. And what a bounce back for them because they got embarrassed in their first game of the SEC tournament. If you thought Texas played bad against K-State up in Kansas City, go back and look at what Tennessee did against South Carolina in its first conference tournament game. They got just boat raced in that one. And well, they uh, looked like a completely different team after that week of rest that they had. So, uh, yeah, Texas, Tennessee tomorrow at 7 o'clock. Back to Texas and Colorado State, though. Uh, we got to give some love to Kendall Weaver. I'm kind of mad at myself for you know, being a part of the show for 30 minutes and not giving a single shout out to Kendall Weaver. He was Texas's best player yesterday. I know he wasn't their leading scorer technically because DeSue and Aismas both ended up with 12, but Kendall Weaver, 11 points on five of 11 shooting, four rebounds, had a steal. He was everywhere defensively. He was uh, the biggest reason why Texas got that win yesterday. He was tremendous. Uh, okay. No static, but I think the guys are on mute, so that might be why there's no static. All right, buddy. How are we doing now? Fantastic. How are you All guys? Right. Was it the tablet? Maybe so. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Well, oh, as long good as morning. It keeps, as long as it keeps working, uh, that that's that's the main thing. Right. Now you can go back to bed. That's the main goal. That is yeah, it's all right. It's not the hero oh, or oh, ugly oh. mug, but it's to go back. It's, it's the nurse that hangover that he's got in Vegas. There. <laughs> oh. I think I'm still drunk, Wags. I don't Maybe. think the hangover has started yet. That's the problem. That that is usually you just have a have a sip of it, and, you know, have a little bit of a, one, maybe a half a shot. Do a half there a shot go. of whiskey, and then go back to bed, amigo. You say you, you look great. You might not sound as as good as you look, but you you look fantastic. I appreciate that, brother. Well, he's still wearing the same clothes he had yesterday that's, too. That's, so that's, that's probably that's, why. That's, he that's perfect. Fantastic. Yeah, I did take them off to go to bed, so I didn't get any Sharpie on me or anything last night. <laughs> but, uh, these were the clothes by the bed. You know, I'm sharing a room. I'm at an Airbnb with, like, 12 dudes. 
because we just got salt it. day behind me. Just sprinkle it. And I just, whatever clothes that I, I found next to my bed, and they were the clothes that I had uh, popped off right before I crawled into bed a little after midnight. So. Nice. So, yeah. um, so definitely needed a lanyard to get in here today. Um, but didn't have one. But I just said, basically, I'm Adam Wagner, and I got a show to do. I run this fucking place. Tell Bobby I said hi. <laughs> yeah, it, all that stuff, you guys know it just as well as I do, right? Like, it, it all depends on on yes. what person you get to Good talk dude. to. All you got to do is put your head down and walk like you got a purpose, and nobody stops you. Seriously. <laughs> That's kind of what I always – I've always nobody told my kids. It's like, it's like act like you know what you're doing. Yep. It's, it's like just, just – act, act like you run the damn place, and people won't even ask you a question. Yeah. Oh, yep. this guy, That's, this guy, this guy's pissed off. Don't even talk to this guy. Yeah. Yeah. He's in a hurry. Clearly. Yeah. This he's guy, busy. He's the Capitals, the Capitals are not having a great season. This guy is pissed. Let him this go. This guy's pissed <laughs> off. Ovechkin can't even hit on a weak open netter. He gets stopped by, by the sisters of the week and unscrupulous. It's done. I even texted you right after that. I was like, it's over. Ovi yeah. is done. Yeah. I don't know. He yeah. got, uh, Hey, shout out to, you know, another 20 goal season. Um, At least, you know he's got that going for him so buddy it's bad when you're saying that it's bad it might be yeah. time to skate off the ice yep. just going through anyway, that thank record. you for humoring me with my capitals talk i appreciate that yeah there you go all right guys well i'll i'll stay close just in case something pops yep. up but, i think we're good uh, yeah i think i think we got it i think we got it i think awesome all right appreciate you guys thank you brother thanks dude have a great show have fun you bet man so that's uh what he was talking about right there so we Why'd you make me change my bracket? <laughs> well, I got to tell you, man, um, I was on the ledge and I was hoping that I, somebody would do a backflip double gainer off of it with yeah. me. And sure as shit, I pulled you with me, man. No, oh, no. All over, all over with, you know, NC State and, and whatnot. We'll talk about that surprise in just a couple of minutes here. But yeah, dude, um, look, it, it's, it's the best thing in the world to come on here and have to eat crow about the Texas Longhorn. Uh, hey man, it, it, you know what? I'm, I think I've actually hit the meta for doing a show. Right? You be pessimistic. You bet against the Longhorns. You say that they're going to lose. Um, they're you know it's the end of the world. Um, doomsday it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you know, sign it and write it off. You know, pack it in. Um, you know, there goes the season. Right? Do that every week, every game. Yeah, they probably win. They might win. You know what I mean? Because if I have to come on here and eat crow every day or every time well, that, that happens, Rodney, I'll do it. And you know the thing about that game last night was, I mean, was it a pretty win? No. no, I don't give a damn. It's a win. And 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 like we were talking about, I, I mean, I, I honestly didn't see that coming. And here's 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 I thought what that the Longhorns should have done a lot more with what they had. You with yeah. the opportunities yeah. they, they were squandering a lot of. They, they were. They were. Here, here's here's what I liked. Damn, that, that that team had continuity. That team had um, role players. You had a lot of dudes doing different things. That's what BK said too. Yeah, um, it, the the game kind of changed when Weaver came in. Yeah, right. Like um, and yeah, no, no, I love you know Timmy Hortons. It's a great place to get you know a cup of coffee and a bagel or whatnot. <laughs> but I mean, you know, it Horton. Um, you know, yeah, you guys know you guys saw what you saw last night. It wasn't really working out that well. And then and here's another thing too, guys. I t I kind of touched on this like last week. Or, or a couple of days ago, um, you can't have your your dominant shooter, or excuse me, you can't have your number one shooter um, with Ace Miss be so damn ball dominant and right. expect to have that many team assists, right? If you got two shooters on a team and and it's the Sioux and uh, and it's Ace Miss and they're your, your your primary bucket getters, you have to find a way to get them the ball instead of just having you know the ball completely in Max Ace Miss's yeah. hands the entire yeah. night, or at least that's what it felt like. And BK touched on it too. The Sioux was off. Like he we, was. Play, we played pretty damn he well was. last night, and the suit was, was off. So it was a really good contribution from the team. You know, Mitchell being able to get down there and get active on the boards, he's going to have to continue to do that, Rodney. Yeah. Um, yep. Especially going up against going up against Tennessee, man. All right, yeah. they can score inside, and they can score outside, and you know that you know that type of defense that they play too. Um, hey, look, Barnes is going to have him coached up, that's for sure. And look, they were one of the best teams in the SEC, and everybody knows that the SEC has been coming on. We'll break that down in just a little bit here, guys. But hey, good morning from to everybody, though. It's uh, finally here on the show. So, so I was telling here. I was telling. Uh, what an uh, adventure to get here! I'm, I'm telling you, dude. That that's why I was like when I was like sending all these texts and shit. It's it's 
There's a whole system. Usually, I'm Adam there, Wagner. Works. There, there's a <laughs> I work around there, here. There's a whole system to the way. If if you do it right here, streamline. Nothing to it. Nothing to it. Right. But and if you come here enough, you know, like like probably if I if I would have did if I wouldn't have had this, I probably could have got in because I, I know those people. Right. But I did, I need. That's exactly what this they asked. this is what you they need. Asked, it, they asked it, for it, that. Where's it, your Where's your land? That's the first question they asked. Where's your land? Where's your lanyard? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I'll tell you where to get this. That way, in case you come back uh, later yeah. on in the weekend, um, because with this, dude, you, you can go everywhere. Dude, I know that's that's your everywhere. that's your get out of jail free card it or whatever. Is. I even pulled it up is. the digital stuff. I was just like, hey man, I've already been here. I was here on Tuesday. Look, they sent me the credentials. Well, it doesn't have your face on it, and you where's your, <laughs> where's your lanyard? And yeah. I'm just like, well, it's all of it. It really is all about the lanyard. It really is. It doesn't man. even matter about the credentials as long as you got the NASCAR yeah. lanyard, you're good. Yeah. They just want you to advertise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you could probably you could probably do this, just like stick it in there, show and a little just, bit of taco just, meat just, there. Just have that like that, and they'd be like, come on in. But uh, no, I'm, I'm glad you made it. Uh, I'm glad you made it. And and the whole so thing is, the whole thing is, I really did. I put my head at like a, a like they said. I, yeah, you need a yeah. lanyard. Like, no, I've already been here. Thank you. Yeah, I just put my head yeah. down and kept walking. Yeah, I just tell them it's so over there. Probably gonna get in trouble. I, I, I don't know. The, the, you guys came look, and that's one thing I didn't want to go around asking people because they were just like, "Where's your lanyard?" Well, that's what I was. I was gonna text <laughs> you and say, "Ask those guys over there where room four is." <laughs> I, I was. I was I did, wondering I was asking people where room four is, at, and they were just like, "There is no room four in this media center." I was just like, "Okay, well, oh, you know, Lord. my partner just said room four. So. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't know. Anyways, we're here. We're here, and the show is on the road. Be, be watching. I was telling BK, so they're doing the charity, the the laps for charity. So you'll see. Yeah, I've been seeing. It's, yeah, it's distracting, man. Yeah. It's a uh, you know. You, you see the, the see them running up and revving up here. I'll tell you what's cool. How fast you think they're going? I don't know how how fast they let them go, but I'll tell you what's cool. I, I wish we were doing this. Did they put a governor on there or anything? Well, that's your own car. I mean that, that that that's that's your own car. So I mean, um, you know, I, I would think it would be one of those things where you kind of lag back a little. For bit. For those of you guys that can't see what we're looking at from people back, yeah, home this is the front the show, stretch. We're actually looking at the front stretch of of Coda right now. Yeah. So this is pretty damn. This is actually really cool. Yeah, the main grandstands are there, and what's really cool. And I am. Fa- I'm almost in fanboy mode. I, I, I don't know. It. I don't know if we'll be here. I need to look at the schedule. I've got everything put away now because I don't want any more humming. It's the only time I don't want any humming. I um. If if they start practicing, dude. If they start practicing, that's because it's like, oh, and that was that was always a cool thing when we would do shows here at the Horn. Is that was like at eleven a.m. or whatever time oh, that yeah, was. Or, getting, oh yeah, and, and all you all up. you'd hear was cars going by, and uh, it made for real good. I, I kept ambiance. thinking this guy's got a got a stop. He does have a stopwatch over here. Oh yeah, yeah. He's, he's clocking. He he's sitting over there right uh, right there. But uh, no, the place is decked out. The place looks great. Like we were talking about, today's a really good day to come on out here because you're going to be able to um, move around a little bit more, uh, whether you're in the fan zone back on the other side. There's a carnival back there. Did you see the other day when we were here, they had that thing already going, what, whatever that ride is called. I, I don't Ferris know. Ferris wheel? No, no, no. It wasn't a Ferris wheel. It's that, it's that single one. It's that single one. <laughs> it's, a, it's the one that looks like a jackhammer. That, that, that thing was going already. <laughs> what are you talking about? It, it spins. It's just. See there. Well, that's a tundra. What it's it's about? just a straight thing like this, and it and it just goes like that. I mean, maybe it is a Ferris wheel. I'm used to the Ferris oh, wheel. Oh no, I know what you're talking about. It's like yeah. um. Oh look at there. There goes a charger. It, it hell, it's got it's like a it's like a flip boat or something yeah, like that. It's yeah. got two ends on it, right? And it, yeah. it rotates yeah. and it keeps going look, up and down like that. They're they're going. They're pretty racing good. trucks and everything. They're, they're going pretty good right there. They're going pretty good out there. Look at that. The, Somebody bring, look, there he <laughs> goes. He's gonna try and get Mustangs out there now. <laughs> Mustangs out there. He's hauling ass. Yeah, you're gonna see. There he put spoiler on. Yeah, that's a Camaro. You can have a you can have a fast time out here. I wish I could. Ju- I wish we could actually have two like a two cam. I thought about. I thought about. I thought about bringing another camera. I thought about bringing another. I don't camera. know if this computer would actually support it though. Um, yeah. But if we could get like a two cam window to show you what we're seeing, that's that's the setup that we're gonna need next time when we get out here. Yeah. Stuff yeah. Like that, or when we do main events. Don't mind my sweat marks either. I was running around here for about. 10, 15 minutes trying to find this place. Yeah. You know, oh, by the way, I was here on time. It's just like oh, the, I know. the shuttle, the damn shuttle. It took 15 minutes to get back over here. It says they're supposed to have multiple media shuttles. There was not. Yeah. There was not. Yeah. There's, um, when I got here. phone humming and buzzing? Um, I, I'm not sure that, uh, that that was the problem. <laughs> I'm not sure if that was the problem, but I'm going to have to. Um, what do we want to get into? We're going to talk a little bit about the, the race, of course. Yeah, we but, talk- I mean, yeah, there are tons, tons of March Madness yesterday, my guy. Yeah, uh, yeah. You were all over it with the Wolfpack here. Look, guys, um, 
sometimes you go to the whole conference breakdown thing and you really think that that logic is going to play in and it just does not uh what can i say about the wolfpack um what middlebrook's probably having the the game of his career last night going off dominating in the paint making an absolutely just nastiness for everybody that tried to oppose him last night and the wolfpack come out and they prevail man they played deep they played excellent um defense in the paint and also uh holding uh holding the opposition to um to really forced uh four shots from the perimeter as well man yeah Contested yeah shots. i think i think they're scary dangerous man so i, I think the they're thing, scary like, dangerous thought, right now the way they i came honestly in. did think that they would run out of steam right um usually the magic does kind of leave after the conference tournament that's just it's traditionally happens like that and once you in to, to not win the conference tournament yeah. to, to be what runners up or whatever yeah uh, you, you I don't know. Maybe left a little bit of a taste in their mouth to, to actually go get it, but you'd think that the air, the air, kind of would have left the sales. I mean, it, it seemed so if, much for it, taking emotion. If, if anything, I mean, if anything, hell, they look better. Uh, I mean, they, they came out and uh, we were talking earlier. I mean, the other one that I told you yesterday that I was all over, I was all over Oregon, and I had Oregon penciled in there, and I changed that one. And it's like, son of a bitch. I, I, you turned... did your... I thought you called Oakland too. I swore uh, you called. I, Oakland. I, I almost did. I swore I you called. I almost did. I almost did. Uh, did you know that that's in does Michigan? Cal, does, I didn't know that Cal, was in Michigan. Is Cal Oakland, Michigan? Yeah. What? That that Oakland is in Michigan. I thought I honestly thought it was Oakland. <laughs> I thought it was Oakland. California. Me too. Honestly. Me too. I, I'm like, there's going to be uh, some fired up people over so there. Does California keep his job? Uh, pretty pretty big buyout right there. He sure threw his team under the bus, didn't he? Did you hear him in the post race? Post I race, post game. I didn't. No. I didn't. So let me ask all, you all the kids. All, all right, the kids. If, it, if, it's all the team's fault. Why? Because they didn't execute. They didn't. They didn't. They didn't have passion. They didn't Shitty want play enough. call. They didn't want enough. Bad um, coaching. So let me let me ask you this: If would you hold Kentucky as a blue blood? Would you consider Kentucky a blue blood in college basketball? You know, I, I think. They're just, that's where the blue blood. I think they're. I think they're still. No, I think they are too. But that's where I've always had that question because we can talk about it in all. I mean, even. Like, like like with football, when you talk about a blue blood, okay, so there's a pace truck. If Kentucky's a blue blood, is it? Hold on, is A and M a blue blood in football? No. Okay. No. No. Okay. So A and M not being a blue blood in football was willing to get rid of Jimbo Fisher yeah. with that buyout. Yeah. You're telling me that a blue blood in basketball isn't willing to make that same move? Well, that's that's a good point. And I'm sure that they can come up with that. They, and they kind of they kind of talked about it last night. Yeah, like it, yeah. you know, Calipari's got to go. Like, I, I'm, you'd like to think that he doesn't survive next season. I, I'm sure that they can that they can come up with that money. I'm sure that I they can so. come up with that I money. Think so and you got to think that the fans of Kentucky are kind of done with it, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Kind of basically underperforming in all of you know in all of here. I'll sit there before you lay it over. There. Underperforming in all of uh in all of March Madness for the past, what, three three seasons now? Mm -hmm. uh, Sparty, though. Sparty coming alive in dominant fashion. Yeah. Dominant fashion. Yeah. Um, I'm, hell, dude. Uh, Izzo does it again. Izzo in dominant, dominant inside in the paint and excellent defense there. Uh, I, I don't know how much this run can happen or how long this magic run can happen for, for Sparty for Michigan State here. Um, but, hell, they, they move on and they're going to, they're gonna make some noise going for uh, yeah. going. I think I I think I got them at Sweet Six. I think I have. Of course, I got a different bracket up today than I had yeah. yesterday. But yeah. I thought I had Michigan State going to the Sweet Sixteen. Um, I believe that I do. I believe that I do. I'm not touching a phone. I'm not touching an iPad. I'm not touching anything right now because Why? I don't want anything to get Was something buzzing. No. Well, not that I know of. Uh, yeah, no, I think we're good. So, uh, anyway, it's like I'm not touching anything, man. I just just want to sit here and make sure the was damn thing stays humming, on. Damn it. Something was uh, camera's a little fuzzy. Camera's gonna be a little fuzzy, yeah, sorry, it's, guys, because it's cloudy. Um, cloudy with a side of meatballs. I got some sweat and keep perspiration here playing in the background, so yeah, yeah, no I doubt about any it. of my jokes. <laughs> Man, I'm just worried about buzzing, dude. No, That's man, we're worried. good. You want me to run the computer? No, we're good. Right. We're good. We're good. Morning, Longhorn Bear. Absolutely. Yeah, an extended version. So uh, those of you checking in, uh, we are here from 8 to 11. So we we get the long shift today. Um, and then, of course, you'll have Jeff and Jordan. And then I think it is uh, Zay and Bucky 
from one to three. That'll, there we go. that'll be fun. Now, you know what I forgot? I didn't even take into consideration. Hmm. I'm going to be probably 30, 45 minutes late for my next job. Uh oh. Getting out of here if I got to wait for the medium shuttles Eesh. to get back there. Yeah, get out. That, well, if you need to. No, need hell no. I ain't leaving you in the trenches slinging grenades. That's all right. What are you talking about, man? We don't do that. Hey, it, 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 it could be at a worse place. Uh, you know, uh, I'm okay here. I'm okay what? here. You you leave me at a soccer game, and I might be like, "What a the soccer, hell do I do? A what, match? what do I do? Oh yeah, a soccer match. You leave me at a soccer match, I may be a, a little confused." Um, the... Iowa State surprised at all with Iowa State as as dominant as they were last night? Oh no, man, I I, I got to tell you, dude, I really think that uh, I know we talked about it yesterday. I think Iowa State, man, that that that's that that's a team that can make a run. Um, they handled the Houston pretty well, and I don't think that was a fluke. Um, and what I saw, and again, quality of opponent right there. But uh, I think Iowa State, man, you better keep your eye on the Cyclones because that uh, that might be somebody for the Big Twelve uh, that's gonna. Since Tech's not gonna do it, that might be the one that uh, that's gonna make some noise. Um, so I thought I had Michigan State going to the Sweet Sixteen. So I did upset. I did pick them to upset North Carolina in one bracket. Just mm. it just my shit show bracket, like yeah. the flyer bracket, right? The gotcha. one that we don't count, right? But I do have North Carolina taking them down. Mm. Um, yeah. So I, yeah. I don't think I and don't think Sparty is going. To and and that's way. probably accurate. It, it, <laughs> that, that probably that, is accurate. That, that's probably accurate. But, um. What What do we else? What else do we have here? Um. Arizona. I, I dude. Said I, Arizona I was, was probably going to go very far. I was kind of shocked. I was little, to see Arizona actually cover less. Actually, I was actually, concerned. Cover was twenty five. I was concerned because I was telling BK. So as I'm going through everything yesterday, I, I, I see that score pop up. So I flip over. I find the channel and I flip over there. And man, they they were, you know, they they were out of the box slow. They were definitely out of the box slow, but they caught fire. But I'm still, I'm still not sold on them, dude. Um, I think that um, I, I don't know what it is. Uh, it's just kind of one of those gut things, like I was talking about with some of these other teams. I just, I just don't think that Arizona is going to give us the run that, that we anticipate from them. I, I was very strong on Arizona probably two months ago, and then they kind of just fizzled. I, I, their team defense is still good. It's just the fact that they can't put teams away, right? And now, I mean, I'm talking about a team that, you know, won by 20 points last night. Uh, but still, f- for some reason, they just give me a little bit of scare. I can't put a, my actual pulse on it. Um, but I did have them as a, as a strong candidate to actually, you know, win this thing and compete for the for March Madness. But now, I, I, don't, I don't know if it's anything that they did less. I just think it's the emergence of other teams. Um, like, one, I've always been strong on Houston, right? Mm-hmm. But now, like, I can't help but but want to give, uh, but want to give UConn all their flowers and think that they're going to repeat, man. I mean, they just look so damn strong. They, what it is, is they look so balanced. They can play inside. They can play, but you know, they play big. They play fast, and they got excellent perimeter shooting, man. And not to mention, they play pretty damn good defense too. That, that that's the thing, you know. When when I was talking to somebody the other day, and and I said, yeah, I've, I've got UConn, and it's like, why? And I said, well, because because they're just good. And, and, and the dude was like, well, that, that's kind of a lame, that's kind of a lame breakdown. I'm like, there's really no other way to put it because they, they do, ev- do everything, they, they do everything they do right. The small things right. Yeah. They do everything right. I mean, the fundamentals are exceptional and you know, this is, I, I very much think this is an instance to where you can talk about the whole, uh, being able to repeat and all that shit. I mean, you throw that out the window because this, this, this team is just good. Um, and, and. I don't. I don't think they're so good. I don't think anybody can sneak up on them as we talk about. You know, when somebody's going to sneak up on somebody in the tournament, they're just they're just too sound. They're just way too sound. No, I'm with you there. Uh, what was sound last night was NC State, by the way, uh, taking down Texas Tech. I know we flirted with that just a little bit there. Um, field goal percentage, it was just off for Texas Tech last night, only 38%. And it looked like everything that NC State threw up there was going in. So half their baskets went in last night. You got to think that that's going to pretty much be a good recipe for success there. Any surprise and shockers from you guys out there that you thought, you know, from the tournament, clearly, I mean, what, Fordham? Almost making a run, almost taking down Kansas there. Holy mm-hmm. shit. I was about yeah. to text BK. That's probably why he's hung over. He probably couldn't handle that Kansas game. Everybody that doesn't know, BK is one of the uh yeah, what, residential Kansas. residential Kansas. Jayhawk. He, he he roots for Kansas. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's a, he's a longhorn. We're all we all bleed the burn orange here. Like I uh I love Maryland, you know, from time to time, whenever they're not putting up a shit show on the <laughs> when they're when they're good. <laughs> like... No, I love them when they're bad too, man. 
Yeah, I know. I know. It's kind of always bad. That's a, hey, uh, hey, absolutely worth mentioning right here. Uh, oh, yeah. The number seven Texas women's tennis team hosting number one Oklahoma State uh, at the Texas Tennis Center. Uh, that's over on Comal. Free to attend. That's the best part. Free attendance? Free attendance. Why wouldn't you go? Absolutely, man. Uh, I, I would definitely do that. Well, do unless that. you got to work. Like yeah. I could, yeah, I, gotta, I probably can't go because I got to work. But could you take game film for me? I, I can go. I go make some videos. Yeah, go make some I, videos. You there. know what, man? I, I'm not. I'm not sour on tennis. I actually enjoy tennis. There's a lot of times where I'll have tennis. So, more women's tennis than actually men's tennis, just because. I know what I, you like women's tennis because they go. Ugh! No, I like women's tennis. <clears throat> it's, it's actually competition. There's the yeah. the field is more is closer and and more uh, pair comparable than it is with uh there's a lot more parity rather mm-hmm. than it is with the men's field usually the men's field's dominated by one dude one one dude it's, yeah it's, it's like it's the joker man it's like it's like when i talk about I don't four- know, like roth Ralph, roth's kind of out of it yeah. you know what i mean roth's old so but, well it's like when when people ask here at coda uh, since we're here at coda when people ask me what's your beef with formula one i'm like well, my beef is the same fucking guy wins all the time. And and he and it's not even close. I mean that's it's, gotta be gear and equipment though, right? You gotta think that the it's, team's it's, got some really good it gear. Is. It is. It's resources. I mean they they've got the better resources. They've got the better engineers. They've they, and they've correct done, me from is there a cap on on what a team can spend as far as putting into there is, but it, 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 it fluctuates and, 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 you know, but it's just, it's just so obvious. And, and I think that's, that's what I'm you're talking about team Red Bull, by the way, guys. That, you yeah, that's right. On, that's right. Don't say that too loud. They might throw us out of oh, here. Right? Say that stuff? No, we can say whatever we want. God, Rodney, but, you got me all jumping on see, you put gold on the wall. I think it's there. See, that's the nice part. If you come to the race this week and any of these races, the trucks, trucks and xfinity tomorrow and then the cup race on Saturday, on sunday is you're going to see very many drivers capable of winning where if you come back here in october when texas is playing georgia who's scheduled that you got texas right? and georgia that's, that's, and four- that's gonna be a mess man. that is gonna be an absolute oh, mess around here. god this 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 my me um the media shuttle lady is from fort worth and she's she just says uh, she doesn't know how any of us do it down here uh, in terms of just transportation, getting around. She gives us a mess. She got loops that don't even loop. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. Loop one. Loop. They should actually call it Arch One because it's like somewhere over there, right around Camp Camp Mabry, it kind of kinks a little bit. It kind of arches just a little bit. Craziest, call it Arch craziest, One. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Road. Yeah, you know, all these that I've all these cities. I mean, people want to bitch about you know traffic in Dallas and Houston and San Antonio or whatever, but they all have a loop or two. Uh, you know, it's it's like uh, or, or toll. Well, this tollway helps. But this tollway is already falling apart. You but know hell, it's not even. It's you know, a, people were on the tollway here going what seventy five when it's eighty. The speed limit says eighty, and I know there's a little bit of fog out there. But damn it, we got a show to do, my guy. Dude, when when I was when I was in real estate all the time. I, I had to do a lot of work down south, and and I would hit this tollway all the time. And there's people driving sixty, and I'm there's like, three, "We get it. You got money. We get it." You and know I'm what like, I mean, if you got, if you, if you can waste, if you can waste your time and waste your money on taking the toll road and not even going fast, not even going the speed limit here, you got more money than you can wipe your ass with. Well, and then so when 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 BK had his uh, his beer party, his birthday party, the soiree, yeah. the soiree. So so we go to that. I get on the the Mopac Express, you know, because you've got that over there on the on the loop on Loop One. You've got the Mopac Mopac Express. So I get on that, and there's somebody in front of me, Wags, going 55, 55 miles an hour. I'm like, come on, man! I'm like honking, flashing the lights, doing all this different shit, hitting the blinker, get get out of the way. Consultations five one two two five five eight six seven eight. It's avconsultations.com. They are the best in audiovisual automation, setting the standard in that bad boy since what 1988, Rodney. That's been the drill since for 35 years. They've been doing this thing, man. Whether you want TVs in your, you know, your Coda 
booth box or whatnot, or you want TVs in your house, you want a surround sound system, you want that Sonos surround sound system, you do it with audio visual consultations. 512-255-8678. That's avconsultations.com. Go to the gallery of website or gallery of projects that they got on their website, and then maybe you'll get an idea. If uh if it's the two TVs that I got in my my place or the four that BK has in his place, man, or the Dream Theater system, it's all deadly, man. You guys know the drill. 512-255-8678. That's avconsultations.com. And I'll tell you, one of those setups is really cool to to watch these races because... I wonder if they could do a virtual reality setup. I'm sure you probably could, man. And that's what I'm going to tell you guys if you're going to come out here. That's the thing with McKay. He's just got ideas. Like, yeah. he goes through your... he Once he sees your house, he's just like, oh, my God, can you imagine what we could put right here? And I was like, no, but you can... Like, you tell yeah, me about you, it. Let's, yeah, let's you see tell what me. you can do. Yeah. Well, we're going to do this here. He didn't, and he doesn't even let... He'll give you an idea of what you want, but then he'll be like, here, let me do it for you. Nice. I'm the expert. That, that's even better. Presentation. That's the best part. That's the best part. So when, when somebody says, when somebody says I'll that. do it. Oh, yeah. Well, we need to be checking that out. Yeah, when guys. somebody says, I'll do it. Exactly. Yeah. Take take it all out of my hands. My yeah, guy. yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, code of text line 222-9328. Uh, this was a little bit earlier. Who was that no tie guy in the halftime studio? He sucked. I'm glad they didn't say this studio because neither one of us are wearing a tie. What studio? What are they talking about? I'm assuming that's uh, uh, March Madness. I don't even know what you're referencing. Yeah, I, I don't know. I was The no tie guy. I, I don't even – when one goes to half, I flip to another one. Well, I usually I got them all. Yeah, there. yeah, you got yeah, yeah you got them all there. But I usually plant in one spot when it comes to this, and I've got two of them on, and uh, I'll just flip around. I, I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to figure out who that might have been. But um, with that sound system that that Tom is talking about, you guys, if you're going to come out here on Sunday for the NASCAR race, this brand new next gen car that NASCAR is r- racing right now, it is so loud. It is so What's in loud. It? What's in it? I mean, it's, you know, regular GM, well, GM, Toyota, Ford. I mean, but, I mean, the exhaust system on these cars. What, you got a small block in that thing, man? <laughs> these, these things, these things are so loud. And you hear them, I mean, you can hear them throughout the hills, man. It, it's like, it, it's a great sound. It's I, a beautiful sound. I, I say it all tongue-in-cheek, but I really do like racing. Um, I, I kind of, I know I, I pull, you know, I pull your, your strings a little bit and I, you know, oh, I don't I, care. I, I you talk, know, I, I make fun of the linger or whatnot, but hell, it's just because I, w- I want to get my ass into a damn car and run around the track a little bit, man. And how can you not talk like that when you're in a round right or a racetrack? Hell, man, damn, let's go, bro. You know that that that's that's the whole thing. You know, people, and and it's like I have I have no country accent in me whatsoever. Yeah, I grew up yeah. around you know in, in in Maryland or whatnot, but but yet. For the life of me, I try and throw a damn country accent into oh, it when I get around a race track. Well, you have to. You're in Texas now, so so you have to have some kind of country accent because they they say the tex they say the Texas accents. I saw a poll a while back, and it said the sexiest accent in a man is, is, the, the is the Texas accent. Texas accent. And, definitely and, and I didn't even know that there was one. To be honest with this you, you're from here. Well, yeah, I guess so. Well, yeah, but you come down here, and it is a it's a thick one. That's for is sure. it really? It uh, kind of. Well, hi, honey. Well, hi. well, no, that's uh, actually uh, that's, yeah, that's 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 uh, you go to that's jail. Like Georgia. That, you well, go, hi, sugar. Well, hi, honey. That's like that. Go, that's like jail. that fake southern there. hospitality yeah. that you get go, around the pan. Speaking of Texas, did you see that the king of country, George Strait, is going to be doing a massive concert at Kyle Field? He still performs. He's retired. There's been about 20 farewell tours, but uh, that's the way to get the money. Yeah, money. Money's coming out a yeah. little bit of the estate. You got to bring it back yeah. in. Yeah, I, I think I've been to at least four last four rides. Tours. Yeah, the the last ride of the the Troubadour. But uh, yeah, doing a big concert at Kyle Field in College Station. Where the sidewalk ends and the road begins. I'm sure he's going to be singing that one. We said okay. goodbye. I'm sure he's going to be singing that one. But we have to do our uh, country hits again today as we uh, had Tiger by the Tail yesterday. Now we had that. So uh, since we're at the track, we'll have to be uh, singing some um, some good uh, country music and all that good stuff. Well, I mean, C.W. McCall was uh, was the good call. Convoy. Uh, con- we got a the convoy. Because we got a great big convoy and, coming and, down. I don't know. The and, and there will be a big convoy happening right here well, let's, uh, let's talk about it. let's get into it man well so what are you expected on sunday here i can't help but get into the vibe of it here because if you sit around and you're watching damn cars go by um this is kind of where you guys intrigued me i thought we were going to be out here racing and, and whatnot 
I'd be out here able to do a show. Look, as we speak, I'd be able to sit here and do a show. Well, look at look at that one from the damn from the damn cockpit of my car. Or what? Yeah. See, see, this is a different batch. That's that's a little Honda. Yeah, they, they the yeah, little. So, uh, oh, I was getting ready to say you can't really see that. <laughs> no, don't, 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 don't say that. Um, oh, look at that. <laughs> you know, taking film. Those are country film. boys came out for that one. Take game film, There's man. Mom, mom, vehicle there. I wish you all could see more. I just got nothing but smiles from ear to ear. Yeah, as we're watching this, man. It's just it's just a cool scene. It's just I, a cool I wish vibe. I wish you had more time. Man, that so you I did. Could drive, so we could drive. What, we well, could I so if anything, so, so you can, so I can take you to the garage. To, to take you to the garage because you go walk. But you gotta have this. Well, we're gonna go. <laughs> you are not going. So, can, you, can I get? Can you get me one of those? Can I just give you my ID? And you can no, I, I tried. I tried to get Jones yesterday. I tried to get Jones yesterday, and um, I, I said these are my. Uh, th- these these are, are my friends. The, I didn't even. But look, seriously, he's got a lanyard, and I don't. Right? <laughs> I got in here because I put my head, my damn head down, and just kept walking. Just said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm out of Wagner. I'm going in here. Call Bobby. I. I got a show to do. <laughs> Call Bobby Epstein. Call I Bobby. To, I got a show to do. Call Bobby. Tell Epstein. Bobby I'm here. Bobby <laughs> right. has no clue who the hell Bobby, I am. Bobby and all his friends from the Travis County Sheriff's Department are, are going to show up and they're, oh yeah, that's Adam Wagner. Get him out of here. Yeah, get that asshole out of here. Get that Yankee out of here. Get that dude out of here, man. Who's your favorites? Let's talk about it. Uh, you were talking about Elliot. Yeah, throughout right. the week. You still like- a, no? I, I'm, I'm leaning more to those track house cars I was okay. talking about the other day. I think it's uh, Chastain and, and Daniel Suarez are going to be um, really hard to beat. I mean, they've got their program together. Chastain has already won here. Daniel Suarez has had great runs here. Michael McDowell's another guy that you want to keep your eye on. Uh, you can never rule that dude out. He can race. He race street street track. He can race. Jo- Joey Logano. Um, can can do anything. Uh oh, we might be having a buzzing problem here or something again. I, I don't understand. What, the buzzing? I don't understand what's going on. I, I I swear I don't understand. We're not even y'all shit jacked up. What's jacked we're up? We're not even moving anything. I um, mean, it's like Scott. I, can you tell me what you're hearing? Yeah, you, yeah. Is it a buzz? Is, is it a what hum? is uh, what is jacked up here? Yeah. What does jacked up mean? Yeah. Let's because we hear nothing. I, I mean, everything is loud and clear as far as I can hear at, at this point. And, I, so, and on the uh, on the uh, app, uh, when uh, I had the, I didn't want to hit the playback on the app because I didn't want to have it buzz. Yeah. And go back all yeah. these in the frequencies either. So. Yeah. So no, I, I don't know. I mean, everything everything seems to be good on our end. But no, when you talk about Joey Logano, I mean that's a guy that you are not going to count that dude out. I mean, it doesn't matter the racetrack. It doesn't matter um circumstances i mean you can he he's smooth the dude is smooth as silk but at the same time if if you're gonna get down and dirty he's gonna do that too and thank you magic man we're good it just kind of happens random appreciate you um you know the other part the the other some of the strong the other thing could be we're running (laughs) we're running through a landline we're running through a wired connection can i say something yeah i don't give a shit about the connection I want to have a conversation. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> Magic Man will tell us if we're good or not. Um, so let me ask you this, all right? Because I need a little bit of an education if I'm going to put some green on the table here. Okay. All right? What are some of the best street drivers that are in this field? That's the thing. They're they're all good. They're all good. See, it used to be back in the older days. You had come to a road course because you only did it one or two times a And what would happen is you would get a team that would bring in what they would call a road course sprint. And what that was was somebody that ran sports cars, can and that was just the team that looked really good. Right, right, right. He, he was a oval track racer. He, he was a road racer, and 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 that guy, Dan Gurney, one of the most famous names. You would he would show up at Riverside and he would win every time. But wasn't there a, a um, Bass Sam? Not Sam Bass. Jesus. That was a, that that no, that was an artist. That's, That's a bad badass what artist. Am I thinking? Racing artist. Uh, boat. At B O, I can't think of the damn. Yeah, B. He stunk. He, he smelled awful out of that car. <laughs> yeah, I'm just all over. Sad, 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 sad. sad? No, 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 still no. not an ass car guy. There's, oh, there's, there's, there's been, there's been a lot of Boris said. You're thinking of Boris said. said. I'm thinking of Boris Thank said. you, Boris said. He, he still, he still shows up. He still shows up. Boris said. Boris said. But now he, now he just, Bo, Bo said. Bo said. B O. Bo said. Oh, Boris. But Boris. But that that's so now I mean, I mean you, you you look down the list all of these guys are great they're they're great you have to be because you go to the road course eight or nine times eight or nine times so it's like when we look at each other 
you don't stop looking at that damn thing here, I'm gonna switch seats with you. <laughs> I shit like this, guy. You, you know how I am. Shit. Magic Man just said it's bad when we look at each other. So I guess we'll just have to keep looking. Why straight. is it bad? Why is it bad when we look at each other? I have to think that. So, everybody out there at home, who is your favorite driver for this weekend? <laughs> Since you won't let me know. No, that, 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 that really is the thing there. There are so many. We'll know a lot more. We'll know a lot more after they get on the track. Because once they get on the track, that's when we're actually going to be able to see what team has made the right job. The, the thing is, you're going to come here with a package. You'll be able to do some adjustments, but you're not going to be able to do a lot. Um, so we'll know after practice who the favorites are going to be. But, but I guarantee you, track outs going to be right well done. Hi, I'm Dan Covert with my wife, Hayden. Welcome to Covert BK. Our newest location in the gorgeous hill country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Covert, born and raised in Austin. There they are, the Covert family. I'm pretty sure we're keeping the carrots because I've got to check the app and we can hear them play that. So I think, oh. I think you're, you're letting people mess with you a little bit too much. <laughs> oh, hey, hey, hey. I said be nice to Hayden. I said be nice to Hayden. Dan got no buzz. His chick does, though. That's not. That's Who's nice. got no buzz? They're talking about Dan Covert. Oh, okay. Yeah. Dan got no buzz, but the chick does. All right. Yeah. Yeah. See that? Be nice to Hayden. Be nice to Hayden. So who goes down today? So we, we had and we get back to the race talk here. Well, the Darlings of Orange Madness last year played today with Florida Atlantic. And they're the team
Now, I, I've seen them. Uh, I've seen them in a lot of final uh, projected brackets. But uh, I know. I, I, I'm, I'm not buying Purdue at all. Uh, I mean, we see them. We see them early exit quite often, as a matter of fact. And I mean, it, it's it's one of the things that that, that comes up. Uh, you know, when you talk about them. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if that were to happen. Right? So, I mean, I, I don't know if they'll go down the game, but yeah, I, I'd love to see. Uh, I'd love to see them make a run because they can silence a lot of this, but I, I don't see them going very deep at all for exactly what you're talking about, for exactly what you're talking about. We will break it down in just a little bit. I'm trying to pull my bracket up here too, Rodney, but um, of course that's not working out as well. So we're having a whole bunch of technical difficulties here. On the scene, um, on the scene, <laughs> on on the scene of Coda as we try to take this vibe. Uh, so for me, I think if Marquette falls, uh, that wouldn't be too much of a surprise. You already saw that um, that hell, you know, Shock Smart struggles with with getting into the tournament, with getting in postseason play. Uh, Providence played them pretty damn well mm-hmm. in the Big East tournament. Um, so that that's kind of like the tail of the tape for me. With- at, you know, can they actually get out there and, and keep scoring and being dominant from the perimeter? They got an excellent backcourt. We know that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we'll, we'll see if it plays. We'll see if it plays out, man. Yeah, and Marquette really is another one that that I just like. It's like we were talking about yesterday, man. You 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 play all year, and you're playing. You know, you have some non cons. You have some tournaments early in the early in the season, but once you get into conference play, I mean, it's like you see you see the same opponent. The time after time, you, you see the same opponents twice, and when you get to this, and it, you don't exactly, you don't have an actual that's, script for that's what exactly the opposition is right. going to do, right? You get, that's exactly you get a right. Shock value, you get the little shock and all, yep. and then sure enough, you don't have an answer for, for yep. whatnot. You don't know. Oh, you got the plays down, you got the play script, or usually you think, all right, they're going to run to the back door. Mm-hmm. You know, this guy's going to get the ball coming off screens or whatnot, and that's not there because it's not scouted on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a whole thing. I mean, it, it's a whole, it's a whole different, about, uh, it's a whole different playbook that you have well, when you. Get it's how tournament. well can you how well can you adjust on the fly too? That's what tournament play is, and how well can you adapt to getting ready for the next game? You got not, you got you know the next team that you're playing. Yeah, play them. So yeah, how well that's can you adapt to around? and that's a great part about it. To, to where there there isn't a lot of time. I mean, yeah, you can probably go find some film, but and I mean, there's not a lot of time. Started figuring out what the hell they're doing. So I don't know, but I mean, I, 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 I think you first you call state to be the you call state to be the one that are not going to be the one that are going to be the one whole theory and this whole logic that I'm throwing out there with, you know, big, always take a team that's that's in a tougher conference or whatever, mm-hmm. that kind of has a little bit of, of value to it, right? Or it, yeah. It's got a validity there, right? Like a, a a team that's seven or hell, eight. No, what, is, what was TCU? Nine? Nine. Nine in, Nine. in the Big 12? A yep. team that's ninth in the Big 12 should not be beating a conference champion. They just should. And uh, I I, I picked them over Utah State, and if that comes to fruition, guys, you know we got some questions to ask about. You know, when it comes to tournament time, if some of these teams that are getting you know bids into the tournament actually deserve to be there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree, and that's that's exactly. Uh, I mean, yeah, that that that's going to be a fun matchup right there. That, that's going to be a hell of a lot of fun to watch those two uh, get after it today. I think, um, and again, I mean, hell, the the, I, the stunners could start early. Could start early. I think St. Mary's and Grand Canyon that kicks off today. I would be shocked if uh, if Grand Canyon is able to actually, you know, steal a victory from St. Mary's. Of course, we talked about the West Coast Conference, you know, it being a little bit of uh, lack their luster, not having exactly, you know. Usually, have coming out of the West Coast Conference. Usually, it's just Gonzaga, and it's just. Um, it's just St. Mary's, but uh, there's a chance that I could 
I see uh, St. Mary's falling here to Grand Canyon. Of course, we still need that 12 to kind of do the upset, right? We thought that we were going to have, you know, a, a sleeper yeah. um, over the past couple of, or we thought that there was a sleeper that would arise and kind of steal the show. Hadn't really seen one of those yet, um, except for Oakland. You know, yeah, like, yeah, Oakland. O- Oakland yeah. Being, being kind of like the top of the tournament here. Um, I, Baylor and Colgate, you know, I think Baylor is going to you know, win handily yeah. against Colgate here. But, of course, this is this is a team where, you know, and talking about Colgate, that where you, you always have that streaky shooter. You always have the guy that can, you know, knock down. We saw that yesterday with Duke and seven threes at halftime. So. Yep. Um, and, again, we talked about Texas Tech and um, NC State yesterday. Middlebrooks basically, you know, having a career game. Dude only average, usually averages like five points a game and then coming out and shelling out 21 points to take down the Red Raiders. Uh, just really just basically destroying my bracket because I had to read I mean, my bracket is absolutely Yeah, yeah, mine, mine is. Um, it, it, mine's okay. I mean, it, 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 there have been times where it's like completely trashed. I mean, but there's still there's still some hope right there. there there's still some hope. But, um, yeah, I, I can see where some folks it just absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's that's uh that's not good. That, that, that's not good, right? And I had kids. I have kids one of I'm gonna be concerned now because I have kids one of the bottom. I don't have to get down the bottom floor, but I have kids one of the bottom floor. Um, or do I? No, my uh, elite eight. Elite eight. Okay. I have kids going to the elite eight. Uh, but yeah, like I I'm sitting here last night. I was like, Jesus, this is done. This is gone. Busted. My kids just laughing. It was like Jesus. That. Mm. <laughs> yeah, no, that's uh, that's not a good way. That's uh, not a good way to uh, to start to start your tournament. That that's that's, that's when you're like, I don't give a shit, whatever. I'll, I'll just watch it. I'll just watch the championship game. Um, so I, I thought the Kansas was going to be a after after Kansas Kansas State and Kansas State Kansas State Kansas State Kansas State well, they didn't really struggle with Sanford. Sanford just came pouring back. Yeah. And it just, I mean, yeah. hitting shot after yep. shot. Uh, in, in, in dramatic fashion, too. I mean, talking about just, like, stupid plays that you would get, you know, to finish off, you know, a, a three-point play the old-fashioned way, you know, with the M1 uh, underneath the bat, uh, underneath the bat there. Uh, and also, with the colors out, uh, who's, who's the kid that steps in? Uh, A little bit more. I mean, didn't play too bad last night, but again, you're gonna you're gonna need to step it up. You're gonna want to make a, a tremendous run, like I thought was gonna happen. Uh, you know, for Kansas being able to do it, not as strong as I thought they were, not as strong as I actually evaluated them uh, before the tournament. Uh, and uh, Dickinson, I mean, what, dude, dude had another.
I just yeah, yeah. I, I really like. You guys got a lot more time on your hands than I do. Uh, that's for sure. Um, uh, what else? What was another game that kind of threw threw me off when I was just looking at it based off of, based off of the first slate here, just the initial slate. Um, oh, the, we talked a little bit about this earlier. Florida and Colorado. Initially, I had Florida. I had the Gators um, over Colorado here, but I kind of want to walk this back, Rodney. Yeah. Um, I don't think Florida is as strong as I thought they were. Going no, I, I don't I, think so. I, I, I gave them a lot of roses. I gave them flowers just because they're coming out of the SEC. And we, we, we're all kind of seeing what my logic is kind of running into. Like, it's not exactly working out the way that I thought. Yeah. No, for, Florida. Florida. Stronger for this team because they're in this conference. Then yeah. by God, they're probably going to win against a you know mid major. Yeah, champion. yeah, yeah. No, I, I didn't. I, Florida, no, not for me. I mean, it's just, it's just not there. It's just not there. Uh, I, I think I've got them going out uh, this weekend. As a matter of fact, so yeah, yeah. Florida is not. Uh, it, it, and, and hell, who knows? Who knows? I mean, that's, that's the beauty of this. That's all said and done. Let's take out the. Are you uh, serious? Yeah. Uh, how how deep are they? Go- or are they going to be done tomorrow? Or, or well, you- if you go if you go off of my theory, right? If because I'm thinking that NC State's got to be bowing out soon. Like they got to be the, the gas. They have to run out of gas here sooner or later, right? They've been playing on such a high. I think they've won what six six straight. I think they've won six straight now. Yeah. Um. Wait. They, they no. They lost a. North Carolina in the ACC. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so besides, so besides that, uh, what uh, dropping that one game? They've been pretty damn dominant here. So to me, there's there's a chance that Oakland could could take down uh, NC State and then get to the damn Sweet Sixteen, Rodney. And then they're the damn Cinderella. They're the they're the dandies or the you know the darlings of of the tournament this year instead of Florida Atlantic. Um, but Florida Atlanta, I'd, I'd like to see what Florida Atlanta can do. I think that they're still a strong team as they were last year. Um, hell, uh, I kind of, I kind of think that that NC State's won me over a little bit, you know, especially with that win over Texas Tech. I didn't think that they would be able to get past the Red Raiders, man. I thought that I thought that all the yeah. uh, um, momentum had already left their, you know, the team's locker room or whatnot, you know, after the ACC tournament. But they they battled strong last night, very. Very dominant in the paint, and then they shot well from the perimeter too, Rodney. So, it, I don't know how I can, I don't know how I can look past NC State anymore. But after what I saw out of Oakland last night, being able to shot Calipari's team, but maybe causing him the job, yeah, uh, for yeah. Kentucky. Um, I, I'd like to think that Oakland could put up a shot against NC State, but I'm. I'm gonna pick NC State to get that. that I, I like that matchup right there. I, that's I mean, a, because, that's, a, that's probably gonna be one of the funnest. Uh, I, I think it is. I mean, if you're just if you're just a basketball fan, that that's gonna be a fun game to watch. I mean, because like we were talking about NC State with you know the way that they've come into the tournament, and then with o- Oakland, what they've done, and you know the coach has been there 40 years. And I, I heard him interviewing the coach uh, this morning as I was driving in, and, and they asked him. They said, uh, "Hey, wh- why have you never taken another job?" And he said, "Nobody wants me." Nobody who's ever wanted me. So so that's why I stay here. So that's um yeah, you know, there's there's that part. So, so I don't know, man. That, that's a All right, guys, I'm going to pop in for a second because I, I don't know if there's anything that y'all can try off screen to. Yeah. I mean, it might it might just be what it is at this point, but. Let, let me if, jump up. I'm going to do a couple things. Okay. Yeah. See if see if there's any troubleshooting. I can I could filibuster for a little bit. I will filibuster for a little bit. The guys are trying some technical difficulties out there at Coda. Um, yeah. It's unfortunate. Sorry to put y'all through that. That's the worst part of all of this is that uh, you guys have to listen to random humming and audio shifts and tweaks and 
uh, yeah, they're working on it out there. I know, I know they're trying. It's obviously no fault of Rodney and Wags. It's just sometimes that's uh, how technology goes. So uh, we'll see if we can get the guys back ready to roll out there. Uh, but yeah, if y'all have any questions in the meantime, fire away. And we'll uh, we'll talk for a little bit, and hopefully the guys can unplug and plug things back in, and you know maybe blow on the cartridge a little bit. I mean that works works for the Nintendo sixty four. Maybe that will work with uh, with this equipment too. Uh, Vegas is good, Rob. Um, you can probably hear by the sound of my voice that I've I've been better, but uh, hey, it's it's okay. There's no better place to be for the first couple of days of the NCAA tournament than right here in Sid City, getting to watch those games at. Uh, the circus sports book down on Fremont street in old Vegas last night was a lot of fun. And I got, I, I, I almost cost Texas the game yesterday, guys. I almost was the reason why the Longhorns lost in the NCAA tournament. Now they, they never got that close. Texas played pretty well, but I did something that is so against everything that I stand for. And I'm pretty mad at myself for doing it. Turned out to be okay. But as a superstitious guy, I'm not just stitious, I'm superstitious, especially when it comes to major sporting events like the NCAA tournament. I watched the Texas-Colorado State game at the same place I watched the Texas-Miami game in the Elite Eight a season ago. And normally I don't do stuff like that. Normally, hey, I, I watch a loss like that and a heartbreaker. I am not ever going back to that place. Forget watching a game at that same spot. I'm never going back to that place ever again because of the memories that are attached to it. And, well, here in Vegas again for a bachelor party, this time for the first weekend of the tournament. Last time it was uh, last year, it was for the second weekend of the tournament. And I had to exercise some demons. Found myself in the same spot. I was at a different place inside the Circus Sportsbook and Casino. So I wasn't in the same seat that I was last year. Still watching on the same screens in the same building, I would have taken the blame if Texas came up short yesterday against CSU. I would have taken all of the blame for uh, for the Longhorns not getting it done. But thankfully, they played well enough to uh, to find a way to get it done. And now my memories here aren't uh, aren't that bad anymore. Um, what the hell was I drinking last night? Yeah, what what was I not drinking? Was uh, probably a better question, Brock. And that was the easy night, too. We got two more nights of this joint out here. So it's uh, it's going to be even worse. Uh, I'm almost grateful we don't have shows tomorrow and Sunday because I, I don't know if I'll, I'd have a voice to do one. And Mondays, curious how Monday is going to sound if I sound like this after just one full day in Vegas because we got two more coming. Uh, yeah, there will be some early drinking today for sure. There's about 12 guys in this Airbnb I'm staying at, not including Salt Bay behind me. And uh, I think we're headed to the Top Golf on the Strip inside the MGM Grand here in a little bit to watch some games, to drink, and obviously to hit some balls too. So uh, the drinking will start early. Of course, the tournament, you know, it's 11 o'clock Central Time when these games start, but it's uh, just past 9 o'clock local time here on the left coast when these games get going. So uh, yeah, it's it's long days of drinking out here. I wouldn't I wouldn't want it any other way. Don't take that as a complaint. Like this this is the place to be at this time of the year. But uh, yeah, 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 yeah. There will be some hair of the dog action today, tomorrow, maybe maybe Sunday. And I made the horrible horrible mistake of taking the six thirty a.m. Sunday flight out of here on Sunday morning. So that's you pulling all night or Saturday. That's not one you even try to sleep for a couple of hours. That's you just you just stay up and you keep going Saturday night. And then you hope you uh, are sober enough to get through TSA and get on the plane on Sunday morning. Like that's that's how much of a college basketball junkie I am that I don't want to miss any of the tournament games. So I'm willing to fly out that early so I can get back home to Austin before the games even tip off on Sunday. So, yeah, that's uh, – it's. I'm going to be sick next week. I won't call in sick. I'll show up to work. I'm already taking a, a half day today, so I feel bad enough for that as it is. But, uh, yeah, I, I am going to be ill next week for sure. Yeah, all of my teeth are intact. I don't have any boobs. Uh, there's no tiger in the room. I'm trying to think of the other hangover movie bits. Uh, the, the bachelor on this bachelor party is still here. We know where he is. We can locate him. 
Well, hopefully that's the case tomorrow and uh, Saturday. What's today? Tomorrow is Saturday. Today, tomorrow, and Sunday. Uh, we uh, hopefully will be okay on that front as uh, we got Wags and Double R back. Can you How guys- we doing? What do tigers dream of when they take their little tiger snooze? <laughs> oh, that's good. Is that's good? a good sign. If he's laughing, that that's a good sign. Yeah, I was doing good until I heard that. There you go. We don't, we don't need Canadian Idol Wag showing We're up. We're going <laughs> to find our best friend, Doug, and give him a motherfucking hug. <laughs> well, it sounds good right now. I don't know what y'all tried or what y'all did, but uh, I'm, I'm afraid to say it. need a little bit of lubricant. I had to piss in the computer. Right yeah, now. yeah. I just uh, mm-hmm. I took a dump on it, and uh, it seems to have helped. Hmm. What are we in kind New Orleans again? Like, kind of like on. those airplane stories, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Dug, yeah. Dug, yeah. Dug, yeah. Dug, All right. Dug. Yep. Yeah. I think okay. we're good. I think we're in a good place. I'll be I'll be around for a few more. We'll uh we'll try this again. Good luck. <laughs> Here we go. Fire. Take four. There it is. All right. Back live in Coda. All right. Now all right. Now I think we got it. Don't think there's gonna be any more if, fun. If that is the problem. Machine's been waiting to hit for about an hour now, yeah, and you haven't yeah. done anything. So yeah. if you could move along and get your free drink somewhere else, that's usually it. So yeah, yeah, that's a pro tip. You just kind of sit there, and if they they keep bringing you that stuff, it's um, you know, it's done. I think we're good. I think I think we're fine. We're getting. Did you get good the feedback. on the bat phone right there. On the bat phone, boom! There we go. All right, so let's get any NFL news you want to talk about. Uh, I was kind of out of the loop with the NFL yesterday. What 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 did we miss in NFL yesterday? Um, well, Sutton got released because of uh the Lions released Sutton because of the police search. Um, with Sutton there, we could pull this up and find out what the hell is going on. Um, let's see. So, veteran quarterback Cameron Sutton released. Uh, or excuse me, was released by the Lions last night, wanted by police in Florida because of an alleged involvement with a domestic violence case. So domestic violence. So instead of, you know, letting the case actually be solved out and gone through, Lions just said, you know, we're just going to cut ties with you guys. And, you know, hopefully after everything, you know, comes in, and it's solved. You might be able to get back on the team or whatnot. But yeah, cutting ties with it all. Well, and that's, that, and that's the only news that's in. For, and and that and that has to happen. I mean that that's that's the thing these days with with just everything. And, and I mean it's the right thing, I'm sure. But it's like anytime you have any allegation, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Any, any allegation or anything like that, you have to do that. And that's why, like, when, when folks uh, – I just saw Joe Mixon right there. You know, I, I see folks talking about with Joe Mel, oh, that guy's a bum or whatever. I mean, if all of that would have happened now, remember when he had the dust oh, up? Oh, yeah. But, I, you know what? That's, that's funny because I've, heard, I've already – that's in the back of my see? mind so far that it's kind of yeah. It, it's it's one of those things to where these is things. Bad? Is it bad he, that it's already left my that it's kind of. You know the thing about it is if you if you were trying to remember all of these, <laughs> you'd uh you you wouldn't remember any of them because there's just so many there's just so many but I mean you have to do that now but yeah you remember that that was a pretty big deal right there with that dude he uh speaks to the fabric of our society a little bit well, doesn't it. Not to put a damper or a stain on the show, but yeah, man, if we're yeah, talking, if yeah. we're already, you know, sl- letting stuff like that slip our minds, and damn, man, how many actually? Well, it's because there's so many. There's so many. Uh, I tell you, the other thing we need to talk about because it ke- it keeps getting more interesting and more interesting. We touched on it yesterday. Is this whole Otani thing? This. <laughs> so look, I wanted to run something by you, but I didn't want you guys to think that I was crazy. All right, you guys know that I'm. You guys. I'm not a conspirator, but I do love a good story, okay? Now, what happens if it's the damn interpreter being the fall guy? What if, what if Shohei has a huge gambling problem and they're pinning it on the interpreter? Because look, man, here's, it just don't add up. You said it yourself. We're really good friends, but you there is nowhere in damn sight that you're giving me access to your bank account. And I don't care. I'm not giving my cousin. Dudes, y'all got a daddy account? And y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all got that secret account, don't you? I know I know you got one. I have one. Well, I guess it ain't secret anymore, but usually nobody's got access to it, right? Mm-hmm. There's just you you don't set up it doesn't add up you're not giving no. your best friend access to all of your fun, all of your funds well especially and, if he's not a cpa especially if he's not a, an account you know what i mean it and, just and, doesn't and add here's up. and here's Show the whole gambling guys and, and here's the whole thing show he's got a huge gambling problem the, the story the story's changed three or four times already i mean it's like first of all the guy does the guy does the interview and then he walks a bunch of stuff back. And the, right. the, the reporter calls and says, did you lie to me? I did. <laughs> About what? Everything. Some things. <laughs> it's like, so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I have no, and, and of course, you know, Tony, they can't let him say anything. I mean, well, he doesn't, by speak, the way, he doesn't speak very by good the way, English. Yeah, I don't know if that, you've that, heard, that's by the way, he speaks tremendously good English. I don't know if he, he speaks pretty damn good English. He, he, yes. He's, he's allowing someone on the roster He's giving, you know, he's allowing his friend to get a paycheck. Sure, you know what I mean. Like he's, you know, of course Shohei, Shohei Otani speaks. English. Of course, of course he does. And uh, I mean, I, I thought this. How, I mean, that's how naive do people think that everybody? Yeah, is? that's that's like, the whole thing. Is the and it's population like population just stupid. Like people always think they, that the American population are stupid, or will just. Well, I'm pretty gullible. But. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, and, and at any time I do my research, though. Right, any time that I've concocted some stupid plan that i'm going to try to pull off i i I plan it out let's do it like this i mean not that i've robbed banks or done anything but but i mean but it's like have have, have, just don't the guy looks like an idiot you take take risk assessment into consideration though right like you have to walk it back like all right there's an element of of this that i could get called now if this goes down how am i getting out of this yeah like you have and i'm not I'm not advocating to do bad things, but if you guys, whenever you guys do any type of thought, you obviously walk through the process of that right now. There's going to be some, there's going to be some bad feedback to this. What are some of the repercussions that could happen? Oh, oh, do the pot, do the pros outweigh the cons? Yeah, we're going for it. You know, that's, that's the whole thing, you you know, with this, when it, when it came out and, you know, they immediately shut him, uh, you know, Otani, no, no, don't meet with anybody. It's like, it's all talk. It's, it's like way too obvious. I mean, you know why? Because we've seen shit like this before and, and that, Honestly, dude, that that's my thought. That the dude's got a gambling problem. That was the first thing that I thought of. I didn't want to roll it out there until I had a few pieces of the puzzle figured out. But now all these, all the stories getting walked back, and it, it's just so convoluted. And w- when there's when there's multiple stories and people pointing fingers, usually it leads to one person. 
the the initial person of the piece, right? And that's right. Shohei. That to me, that's Shohei Otani. Yeah. There's no way in hell that it's his. That this is. Yeah. Um, that this is an interpreter. It's it's this is a typical fall guy. Set, well, and it's like setup, it's man. like they're, all these they're letting them take it down. All dude. these bank transfers and all this stuff. Whose name is on it? Shohei <laughs> Otani. Yeah. It's like, c- come on, man. It's it, you know it's you know a court of law or whatever. I mean, I, 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 this is just. I mean, come on. Yeah, man. I'm not a lawyer, but yeah. if I had to follow the transactions and itemize lists or whatnot uh, of the transactions, you you ain't got to be Perry Mason right. to, to figure this one out. And right. and look, Matt, uh, look, I, I have I have helped Matt people. Lock. Matt Lock. Yeah, I have helped people buy and sell homes for 15 years. And, and it's not near these kind of amounts of money. It can't be a matter of, hey, Wags, go transfer right. $4.5 million for me out of my account, if you don't mind. So I, I actually, I, I brought this scenario. My wife does work with stuff mm-hmm. like that. And she's got privileges to yeah. see stuff yeah. like that. So I brought this scenario up to my wife. There's like, there's no way in hell that no another person is managing somebody's money like that. And they have no idea that they're doing it. So. I don't know. You guys take it for what it's worth. You want to be naive and and believe some of the stuff out there. I'm telling you right now, Shohei's got a gambling problem. Look, I would <laughs> look. I, I would I would give it a little a little thought. I would give it a little thought if it's like his uh his his money manager, his uh his account. He didn't have one. I know his account. What somebody somebody that you would empower to handle your finances for you if they were kind of in the middle of this, but. An interpreter? Your fiscal consultant? Yeah. Your financial yeah. consultant? E.F. Hutton or yeah. whoever the hell. But Timmy Horton? <laughs> Tim Horton? Yeah. But I'm out of pattern. I'm out of oh, no. your interpreter? Come okay. on, man. And 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 I like how they did try to spin it at, at one of them, one of those things where it's like, well, Otani paid it for him, you know, as a friend. And and, and the guy asked. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. He's, yeah. He, he's gonna. Loan. He's gonna. He's gonna somehow pay him back. Five percent juice. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I can tell you one damn thing. If the interpreter is losing that much money on gambling, I don't know how he's gonna pay him back. He's obviously not a good gambler. Uh, he, he's not a very. Money from his friends? Have I what? You ever borrowed money like in, like a substantial amount? Of I, money never from his I never have. I never have. Never. I never even thought to ask that. No, no. It's um, one of those things where I hate to. Uh, I always struggled. Oh, much money ruins relationships. It, it really does. It really does. I mean, it ruins marriages. Yeah, you, you know, I had a one of my best friends, one of my best friends, um, um, lifelong friends. Uh, when I first got into real estate, you know, you you see stuff online. This dude posts, "Hey, made a dream come true. We bought a house. You know, we're so excited." I call him up. I'm like, dude, do you know what I do for a living? Yeah. I mean, he's like, yeah, yeah, man, I know, I know. And I'm like, you know, I'd appreciate it a call, you know. You know what what, what, what did what did I do? Yeah, you know, this is how I make my living. What did I do wrong? And he's like, I'm going to be real honest with you, dude. We've had some credit shit. And he was like, it was going to be extremely embarrassing for us for you to see that. So so I, I could totally appreciate right. that. Right. No. I, I could totally appreciate that. Yeah, that's uh, that's something that's that's kind of understandable. But yeah, I just I've never even once thought of putting my friends or or family in a bind like that to where one it, it's not out of an embarrassment or anything. No, like that. no. It's just one I don't want to ruin the relationship. And usually, um, hell, that's that's the first thing that wrecks a relationship is mm-hmm. finances, man. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It really is. Like yeah. you borrow a you, what fifth, when I was in the Marines, man, I'd have people borrow fifty bucks from me at one time, man. You expect to get that back? You ain't yeah, ever no, getting that no, thing back. No, you know. You ain't ever getting yeah, that back. Yeah, you absolutely know. I mean, there's time, you know, twenty dollars, twenty five dollars, I mean, something like that. But I mean, the, this whole thing, it just stinks. I mean, it, it just stinks. Telling you right and, now. And, and the bad part about it, Wags, it's it's just stupid. It's just stupid. Shohei, Shohei's gonna run into BK down at the Spearmint Rhino. Probably Vegas. so. That's what's gonna happen. It's, they're gonna be betting on some things. It's poorly executed. This is like Milli Vanilli. They're gonna, they're this gonna is get just... the dances at the Spearmint Rhino. They're gonna leave the Spearmint Rhino and head on, head on over to the damn ghost bar or whatnot. And after they get done dancing over there, they're gonna go out and find themselves at the circus. Uh, circus, circus. Circus Circus still in. Uh, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure it's probably still there. <laughs> but to, have themselves a grand get, old time. Get BK to go circus. check that out. Oh go bet, go play some bets, bet on the ponies, and then hell, maybe Shohei's gonna bet on himself. Like, yeah. Well, Pete Rose didn't bet on himself, did he? Uh, I think if, I think he did. Did he? I think he did. 
I think he did. Settled himself to win, though, right? I would assume so. You know, Charlie Hustle. Charlie, uh, Hustle, Char- Charlie Hustle, he ain't going to bet on himself to lose. I mean, that, that that dude always bets on himself. Dude's still not in the Hall of Fame. Boy, that's a discussion. We can well, talk I'll about tell you right. I'll tell you, if this does happen and it goes down to where Shohei Otani is gambling or whatnot and it comes out and they allow him, well, there's no evidence that he's betting on himself or anything like Pete Rose did. Yeah. Um, or betting on the game that he's playing in. Uh but there's got to be some talk to let Pete Rose into the Hall of Fame. You know? Yeah, yeah. So. Well, and I'll tell you, for Major League Baseball, if indeed this is true. Whatever. This is still, this is good. Good news. Any news for baseball is good news. It, it is. It is. But the, but the whole thing with baseball, it's just another scandal. Uh, you know, you had, you had the steroid era. I mean, the Pete Rose thing still comes up, and it's like baseball's finally turning that corner. But see, here's the thing, though. I don't Nobody should tell you what you can and what you can't do with your money. I, I, now, like, I do agree with the that. Way, if you earn your damn money, you should be able to spend it the way that you you want to spend it. Yeah. As long as you're not as long as you're not endangering anybody else mm-hmm. or doing harm to your doing doing harm to yourself. You know what I mean? Um, willingly doing harm to yourself. Mm-hmm. I don't know. You, some you should not have any restrictions on how you spend your money. Yeah, yeah, but. You know, you know, I, I do get, you know, with I, the, I got some morals to me. Well, you know I mean? but but I get the sports part because that, I mean, directly maybe influencing the outcome. Betting, of, yes, if you are betting on your match, or if, or if you're betting yes. on the the game that you're playing in, then yeah, that's that's that's, that's right. a problem. That's right. That's a problem. That's right. But if I play for the Dallas Cowboys and I want to lay some money on Tennessee versus Cincinnati. I also, but see, that's so that's I, where it I could can be. Also see a I can I can call my buddy from Tennessee. Right, that, I could see a problem with you being in the same league, betting on a game that's in the same that you're in the same league with. Yeah, right. But if you want to, or or the sport, if you want to bet on a, a sport that's you know outside of you or a game that's outside of your sport, have at it. You can't. How much influence do you have outside of your sport? Yeah. Serious, yeah. I'm, I'm serious. That's an actual question. Yeah, that, that, yeah, yeah. That, that's a great, Chris. Chris, it affects the outcome of the game because of how you bet. Then you're given the fa- uh, fraud of a game. Yeah, that, th- no, no, Chris, I, I, I agree with you there. I'm saying like, why don't you? Why aren't you allowed to bet on a sport that's outside of that sport? Yeah, yeah. That's all. Like, I, I and I completely agree. I completely understand why you aren't you. Why sports players or athletes aren't allowed to, to place a bet inside of their sport. One hundred percent understand. I mean, I'm. I mean, I, I did go to college. I graduated. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and then, you know, that's where it all comes back to. I where got, I got somewhat of an education. <laughs> where, where, where people start talking about these games being fixed, being rigged or whatever. And, and it all ties into the fact people say this, what we're about to watch this weekend, say that this is rigged. How can you? Rig yeah, I don't know. The, 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 I don't know how you could rig a race unless you're unless there's a guy that's just in such a dominant yeah piece and, of gear or piece of equipment, and then just pulled like says, uh, you know what? And now, I, now I, don't the, to, I don't even have to cover the floor here. Well, and now this is a sport because because you will see guys where there there are guys on this NASCAR tour that have raced a long time and have never won a cup race. They, they've been close, but they've never won a cup race. They put themselves in a position to win a cup race. And here comes, you know, Kyle Larson, Joey Logano, you, you name it. One of the guys that wins a lot. They're not going to let that guy win. I mean, they, they there are times where it's like, oh, you, you got to think he's – that guy's such a good dude up front. You got to think that, that he's going to let him. <laughs> Goes right by him. Goes right by him. You see it all the time. So, I don't know, man. But the, the whole thing – the, the Otani thing – even though it's very serious, just the way that the story keeps going, it's it's comical at this point. It's 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 like one of those stupid black and white comedy movies. I'll bet I'll bet that this story goes away within a week. Oh yeah, I'm 100%. sure. I'll bet it gets swept under the rug and it goes. I mean, we got opening day in six days now. Six mm-hmm. days for opening day. Mm-hmm. So I, there's well, hell, they already started. Yeah, the Dodgers. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're <laughs> the, their regular season started, even though we're still in in spring ball here, but uh, I, I guess it will, the record will be updated once, you know, opening day is, is in, in effect. So, yeah. Um, and how about that for Tony? So he, the day that he goes, his first regular season game, the, the day he goes out and hits a home run, game's done, time to fire the manager, or time to fire the interpreter. Yep. That's <laughs> oh my god! Fall goodness. guy. I'm telling you right now, it's fall guy. Yeah. Gotta be. 
anyways, Got guys, it. that's that. Um, that's baseball news that's for a you. Yes, man. That is a mess. Oh, man. I can't believe that. Get back into some NASCAR here. Let me tell you about audiovisual consultations one more time. I know we've already been through an hour or whatnot, and they're rated to. Uh, ad read every hour. So let me tell you about Tom McCain, audio visual consultations, 512-255-8678. That's avconsultations.com. Been setting the standard in audio visual automation since 1988, 35 years in the business now. Um, make sure we talked about, you know, great sounds around the track or whatnot. If you want to you know, kind of simulate that sound, make sure you hit them up for one of those Sonos surround sound systems. That way you can have a TV on in your room or whatnot be out in the kitchen getting yourself a snack and still hear the surround sound system in your kitchen depending on what zone that you're in and part of that house anyways it's all deadly man 512-255-8678 that's avconsultations.com give them a call right now tell them that the guys from tsu sent you man they'll be uh very thankful to hear from you get you set up ready for march madness and for your uh sweet 16 get you set up for uh for opening day, man, first pitch, getting ready to fire off here next week. So make sure you guys get it ready. That's right. also want to tell you guys about uh, the Autograph app. If you're a TSU fan, what's that? The congressman, that's right. If you're uh, you're obviously a TSU fan, if you were checking us out, uh, you might as well be rewarded for uh, for doing that and, uh, and being a Texas fan. Uh, the Autograph app, co-founded by Congressman Thomas Brady. Um, you giveaways, tickets, all kinds of cool stuff that you can get from that. And all you have to do is just be a fan. Boy, that Chevrolet was close. All you have to do is just be a fan and being a fan, listening to TSU. You can uh, download the free uh, autograph app. It's right here in the YouTube chat down at the bottom. Check it out there. Uh, use the promo code TSU as in Texas Sports Unfiltered. So be sure and grab that and uh, you might get yourself some cool stuff just for checking us out right here at Texas Sports Unfiltered. It is the autograph app as we are live at Circuit of the Americas on a cloudy. Boy, that's a truck going by once again. I think they're looking for Adam Wagner. I think they are. <laughs> they keep looking Where's that in guy here. without the lanyard? They're, they keep looking in here. Is that they're like, I swear that guy don't have a <laughs> Where's the guy without the lanyard? They didn't have a lanyard on. So if y'all missed that, Wags came in here all rogue today and uh just kind of rolled in. Uh 15 minutes late. Actually, I was 10 minutes uh, early. You but, were on time. But, but 15 minutes early, you're on time. Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But uh, anyway, we had to catch a shuttle over here. Um, And once we got over here, there's people – for as soon as, as soon as I got into the the show, she's just like, "Well, where's your lanyard?" And I was just like, "Well, I don't have one." She she was really sweet there. She goes, "I only got to ask because my boss is right there." I was like, "All right, well, here, let me show you my credentials." She goes, "Okay." So I showed the credentials on the, on, um, yeah, the little barcode thing, on the barcode on my on my iPhone or whatnot, and then showed my ID. That allowed me to get over here. But once I got out, everybody's asking me for my damn lanyard. Yeah. I just put my head down and kept going, <laughs> "Hey, hey, sir, sir, wait!" And I was like, "I've." Bobby knows that I'm here. <laughs> I just kept walking in, man. Oh my God, that's crazy. That's so they probably they probably are looking for me, man. I gotta tell you. Yeah. So I don't like Bobby. Don't know who the hell I am. That's been the joke all morning. Is you know I I told you know I said hey go tell Bobby Epstein that I'm here. <laughs> God just what? <laughs> so I just kept walking. Tell him man. I arrived. That's it, dude. Tell him I'm here. The show's on the road, baby. We're here, baby. I like what RSC says. This this pretty much sums it up right here. If he's stupid enough to bet on MLB, MLB he probably needs to be banned just for being a dumbass. <laughs> I mean, that's it's, that's valid. Yeah, absolutely yeah. valid here, man. Yeah, yeah. Oh, now we got we got a Pete Pete Rose debate going on over here. What's the Pete? What's the debate? What what is that? Uh, it's, that's why I put my glasses. Sounds on like if uh, if he was any good. Uh, let's see here. I, I saw the yeah Pete Rose wasn't too big of a star. Says uh, Longhorn Bear. I, I grew up watching Pete Rose. I, I thought Pete Rose was a pretty damn pretty damn ballsy player. But it, but it was a different time. It, it was a different time when Pete Rose uh, played. Um, but I, I, I thought Pete Rose was a good baseball player. A, a damn very, damn good baseball he was player. Very angry. Did he not? He, he did see. He didn't. Take, he didn't take a playoff. Yeah. Um, yeah. That that kind of kind of reminded me of Brett Favre. Kind, now, kind I of, never. I never got to see Pete Rose play. He was before my time, or, or at least from when I actually started having fond memories of baseball. I yeah. think I think my. I, honestly, I, guys, I think my first real baseball memory was Bo Jackson catching the ball against the Baltimore Orioles. Oh wow! Running up the, running up the ball, man. Um, yeah. And which which made me fall in love with the the play style of Bo Jackson and him being my favorite athlete. Yeah. Um, two sport athlete. Uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't, rem 
I don't remember Pete Rose actually playing live. Like I remember seeing clips, of course, and mm-hmm. you know maybe no, but he was he was done. The Big Red Machine was done. Oh, yeah, by, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, hell, yeah, I, was, I, I was born in '81, guys. I so think I mean, it was more. I think probably my first really good memories of Pete Rose. He was a Philly. Uh, that would have been in the early '80s when the Phillies uh, they had Tug McGraw, Mike You're right. Schmidt. Uh, I do remember Pete yeah, Rose. As yeah, a Philly. He, he was a, as a Philly, and 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 Daryl G makes a good Schmidt was sh- Schmidt was on that Mike team Schmidt, too, right? Yeah, Mike Schmidt. Um, this is a great point because Pete Rose still to this day is very fiery, very. Oh, yeah. uh, if the shit hits the fan with this Otani thing, Pete He's Rose. Speak out. Pete Rose is going to fucking you, be on fire. You well speak out. Woo! He is going to be so let me pissed. Ask, is this everybody that's in the chat here? Is this good or bad for baseball? I would I would yeah. argue that any news for baseball is good news, right? Well, this isn't I, really a stain. I mean, it's, it's, I, I don't. I don't. How big of a stain is the Otani? I, I think. I, I is think it's. Scandal yet? I, I think it is because it's him. Because it's him. Best player in baseball. Be, because yeah, th- this. Major League Baseball, you know, I, I think they've been pretty transparent with it that this is going to be the star that's going to take Major League Baseball into the next what two decades with with what he's able to do and 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 the global effect of Otani, you know, um, I I think if Boom. this if this was if this, this was isn't a, this isn't a USA thing, this is a world this thing. is a world thing, and I think as as much as baseball that that's where baseball. You know, football has has surpassed baseball. I think in 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 a well, lot football, of football's money maker. Right, football's money right, maker. right, and kind of America's game is football or the NFL, as as America's we're talking about that. Times. That's right, that's right. Um, but I think where where the MLB is still such a worldwide phenomenon. Like, I mean, you you saw the the, the Dodgers and the Padres, the two games they played. I mean, it was. I mean, the place is rocked. The the people are going crazy. They love it. They love it in other. Countries. And and I think that that's one of the things that I respect so much about baseball is that it has that effect. And like we've talked about in the past, baseball doesn't change. Right. Yeah, they put a but, shot. Uh, yeah, they, they put a pitch they, they clock. They it up a little bit. Yeah, and, and that's not a bad thing. But baseball is very traditional. It's the same concept. Throw the fucking ball and hit it. Somebody tries to get you out. And, and it's just huge. It's just huge around the world. But the fact that it's this – yeah, yeah, play. yeah. yeah. Uh, but the fact that it's this guy, holy moly. Uh, it, a, a guy that, one, we haven't seen anything of his caliber of skill set since Babe Ruth, right? Exactly. Unprecedented. Exactly. Uh, we haven't seen a guy. And, and I mean, it's it's one thing to be able to say that you're a pitcher uh, that can that can rake at the plate, but this guy is a pitcher and a hitter. Mm-hmm. This is a this is a guy that going out and, and throwing a damn complete game, a, a a one out, a one hit shutout, complete game, and then come in in a doubleheader same day, doubleheader, go two for three and hit two fucking home runs. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Know, it's just yeah, best, and it's best, best player I've ever seen. Best, he is the best baseball player I have ever seen play the game. Yeah, and and it, it it would be one thing this sport here, NASCAR Cup racing. A few years ago, Kyle Larson driving for Chip Ganassi at the time. You know, N- N- Kyle Larson now a Hendrick driver. He's a he's a Cup champion. Um, he's one of the favorites this was here. After that little scandal with, yeah. With so Larson. so so at that point, Larson Larson was driving for not for Hendrick, but he was one of the one of the guys that was going to carry the sport, and he had he was face. Yeah. He, he was, yes, he was. He was a young, was, talent, was, young yep, driver. Yep. And 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 looked look good on camera. Yeah. Made made, made a mistake um, in an eye racing thing. He mumbled something that that he shouldn't have said. Racing with a bunch of his buddies, um, they throw him out for a while. He he does what he has to do. Um, he comes back, gets in a better spot, and here he is, winning races and winning championships. But that this betting thing, I mean, if indeed it's a gambling issue with. Otani, especially in baseball and football. Well, I guess basketball too. That is. I would say basketball even more. I would say basketball. Basketball, you can control. Like if you're shape, if if you are betting on a sport, if you're betting on a game that's in your sport and it's basketball, I could say I would argue that you have the most control in a basketball game than you do in a football game because you can hell you can control. It's very easy. Every sequence going down. Now it's it's, the scarcity of of how often that you can touch the ball probably 
influences a little bit more in the other sports, but you could actually take control of a game in basketball. I, I have always, I've always said when it, when it comes to folks talking about rigged and fixed and everything, basketball's the first one that I go to where it's like, that's the one, if any of them, 100%. that's the one. 100%. Yeah. I mean, because it is so easy. I mean, not easy, but it's, I mean, it's easier. It's easier. It's easier. It's easier. I mean, like you can you can sit there and the ball's in, the in your hand. You're controlling it. You're going to the cup. Oh, oh, oh my God! I had a bad shot. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, I, 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 it hit the bottom of the rim, and you know, on the layup. Oh, the guy blocked my shot. Oh, oh, oh he man. stole the ball. He me. stole the ball. Yeah. Yeah. No. I turned it over. I traveled. Shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I'm yeah. serious. Like there's a lot more that you can influence in basketball. Yeah, I, I think Longhorn Bear has it right here. That's uh, you know, the Dodgers right now. They're thinking, oh, 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 oh. yeah. DJ is so is. Is Kyle Larson? I don't think Kyle Larson's a racist. I think he just had a little slip up. Yeah. So, well, the thing about Kyle Larson, what people don't realize, he's he's part Asian. So you know that that's why I always thought well, that. I would argue, what, I would argue that what, I've heard some of the most racial things come out of out of what, that what, when they when they went and labeled him <laughs> that. It's like uh, okay, Kyle Larson is his name, but uh, you know he's, 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 he's yes, you're exactly right. I mean, I'm, I mean, I, if, you know, you want to. Pull that, pull out the facts, get yeah, out the list. Yeah, yeah I want to say that some of the most racial things I've seen what, have come from that culture. What, one of my, <laughs> one of my best buddies was, was, is, is an Asian dude, and that dude used to call me up and he'd be like, "Hey, what's going on?" and, and call me the that word. I, know. <laughs> I, know. I, I had a couple of Marines of mine that were uh, that were Asian, and uh, they were very. They let let things with the tongue. I mean, just let it let it fly. It, it is, man. It just it just kind of comes out, you know. And it's like it it's, it's it's that culture. And I asked him about it one time, and he's like, "That's just the way I was raised. That's how my dad that's talks. Just, I mean, I, I don't know any different. You it. know, it's like that's I I, I don't know. And I mean, we, 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 we Hispanics are like that too. I mean, my aunt says st- things. First time that I took Tracy to meet my aunt and uncle, and my aunt starts spouting off stuff, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't have family. So, I mean, like, the, usual, oh the, the family I have is is my wife's family. So it's um, and and honestly, nobody they're Italian. You know what I mean? So yeah. no one talks. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like after dinner, the men they go into the like the, the father and the, and the brother and the son, the father and his sons, like Katie's brothers, yeah. they'll go in there have the little the discussion in the room or whatever after dinner. You'll hear the music of the Godfather come on. Nice. Da, 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 you know, something like that. But yeah. usually it's very, it's, a, I wouldn't say it's a secretive family, but it's a, it's a hush hush. Yeah. No one really talks. And, and usually Italians are loud. Yeah. You know what I mean, like yeah. stereotypically, yeah. an Italian family is a loud family. Yeah, but this one's a very quiet thing. They're up to it's something. Get, They're up guy, to something. My guy. It's like Otani's I've been, I've been interpreter. Studying, I've been studying for about twenty years now and I haven't come. <laughs> <over yet. laughs> so they've been keep. They've been keeping it clean, and they don't. They, they don't have any. They don't dabble in waste management or or sanitation management or anything like that. So, Yikes. Um, man. yeah, Longhorn Bear. We did, we did have to move to Texas all of a sudden for a reason. Oh. I'll Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, Samford did kind of get the shaft last night. What with the in in terms of officiating? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little bit of back, but I mean, you're going to expect that. You're going to expect Kansas. They're not going to let a blue blood like Kansas get. Yeah, get. Uh, they're going to get the favorable call. Yeah, get I mean, with, if call. if there's if there's going to be any leeway in, in in any of that stuff, that that that's definitely going to go the way of the of the more established blue Bill blood. Self will win that argument and win that. I, yeah. I would. I used to say that Mike Krzyzewski is one of the best coaches to work a ref. Have you ever watched Bill Self? Oh, yeah. Ref? Oh, yeah. He's pretty damn good. Yeah. Um, and, and and all the great ones do it, man. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, can't – any any scare last night after what you saw Sanford be able to come back and do? Or is it just the fact that they got hot at the right time and, and Kansas started to – Honestly, just get tired. But I think it was. I think a lot of this goes back to Wags, the, the conference they come out of, and that's where Kansas didn't see too. Kansas didn't really get to see too much of Sanford. Or well, like well, I think technically sound. I mean, you saw a lot of backdoor cuts uh, from Sanford or whatnot. You know, different variations. Yeah, of backdoor cuts. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think Kansas coming out of the coming out of the Big Twelve gauntlet. I, I mean, the same concern that I have with Houston. I, I think. I think Houston's tired. 
Jeez. I think Houston's tired. But but they've had some time off. I mean, they've had time off, and, and that's – We're sitting here I, debating and thinking that Kansas, the two of the top schools in all of the college land, is, is too tired to sit here and make it through March Madness. I mean, that's – you got it's a, a grueling damn schedule. You got a damn good point. It's a they, grueling they schedule. They beat the hell out of each other. I mean, they beat they the hell out of they each do. other. They do. Um, which is why, I, which is why I sit here and say you shouldn't put too much. If you know that your bid is already in place and you're going to be a one, you shouldn't put too much stock or in too the much tournament. energy into the tournament. Yeah, you should go yeah. ahead and let the let the team that needs the the outright bid to get in go ahead. I, well, God, I never lay down. Never lay down. But you guys know what I mean. Well, it, play it, play it, some of your players that. Uh, that don't get a chance to, right, to get right. on the floor. Well, and I think maybe where it's more concerning for me with Houston is let's say that that wouldn't have been Iowa State. I mean, we, we, we knew Iowa State was good. I mean, obviously, they were the number two seed. Iowa State handled them, but Iowa State's good. So that's why I'm – want to talk about a team that does all the little things right? Iowa State. Iowa State. Absolutely. I mean, I don't think they're at a status of Connecticut, but when it comes to – when it comes to doing those little intangibles that they like to talk about, the shit that's going to win you games, they, they really do, help man. De- I mean, talk about health defense. Absolutely. Uh, being able to play both ways. Um, different. Talk about uh, you know being able to play on different types of pace as well. That's Iowa State. Uh, Iowa, Iowa State is – they're going to be – they're going to be a tough out for, for a lot of people out there. One hell of a two. You know, I, th- yeah. I thought for sure they might be a three going in, but, holy, you make them a two. Like that's like that's lights out, man. Cyclones yeah. can make a run at this. Day. I got, I don't have my my real bracket, but I, I think I got the Cyclones going to the Elite Eight. Really uh, I've did. got them in the Elite Eight. Yeah, yeah. Rob's point right here. Uh, this is the guy that apparently they were talking about. Uh, he was going to be selling insurance next year. Uh, the dude is that old. So, um, yeah. What? Yeah. I took Japanese. I don't know. I didn't take Japanese. That's, I don't know. that's Longhorn Bear. Uh, that that is. Uh, what does that say? What did you just type out right there? That that Are is put, that, that translated translates into this apparently. You're fucked in Japanese. <laughs> that's uh, right there. Well done. What? How do I don't you know. Write I, that? I, I don't even I know. know how you wrote that. Yeah, how do you I don't find you, that on your key. How, how do you do that on a computer? I don't have that uh, keyboard. I don't know how that works out. It's pretty impressive. This Longhorn Bear, man. We got some really intelligent listeners uh, and watchers here on this program. I'm more brighter this. than us. I actually, actually, you know what? I'm sleeping on myself. I'm actually a bright guy. Uh, uh, I'm not, but that, that, that's, <laughs> that's, that's okay. It's all right. Not, not a bright guy, man. It's uh, I'm actually a pretty dark guy. You know what I'm saying? But uh, it's just just kind of one of those things. So so Texas got, a, got another hour wrapping up here at that. Uh, at Coda, man, at Circuit of the Americas out here, having a good old time. Um, I, again, I might have to leave early just so I can get into one of these trucks and go running around the damn track here. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm not going to leave you in the trenches, man. But if you guys get a chance to get out here and, and try this, you guys definitely should. Um, this is my, only my second time being out here. I've, I've lived in Austin uh, since 2012 and honestly never really seen an event out here. Never even came out to a concert really, or anything like that. Yeah. Um, one, I just... You know, comfort of my own house, you know, because of audiovisual consultations, I really don't have to leave too much. Um, and one, I, I don't like to venture outside too much. That, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not really, I don't like fresh air. I don't like sunlight. I don't like any of that. Well, what's, what's Get nice. And laugh. Jeez. Oh, well, yeah. I'm with my bad jokes, bad dad. I'm jokes. with you, dude. I, I, I sit in the house all the time. I used to get out and run and do other things. I mean, every now and then. We oh, need to get oh, on our yeah. bicycles. Yeah, we, we got to go do some biking. Outside. Go, go do some cycling. Outside. Get some vitamin C. Is it C or D? D. I, it's, I mean, it's vitamin, vitamin D. D. Yeah, just to check it out. But no, that, that's the good thing about when you come here. When you come when you come to a race at, at Coda is, yeah, if you're going to be along these front grandstands, if you're going to be in this main plaza area where everything is or over at Turn 1, Turn 1 really is the best place for views and for all of that. Sure. But but it is very crowded. But the, the, other, the other good thing to do is that, that you can, you can just you can go out and you just roam around, and that is the nice thing. Where you, you, you say can, Duquesne or you can, you can, you can. Oh, you can. I you thought you can. said Duquesne. Du- Duquesne. Du- oh, Duquesne. Duquesne. Moving on, moving on, baby. D- Duquesne, moving on. But um, yeah, you you can come out here and you you can make a real day out of it. And I do recommend if you don't if you don't want to come Sunday, t- today's a good day to come. Tomorrow is a really good day to come because what you get tomorrow is you get a taste of all of them. 
you're, you're going to get so so the trucks are going to qualify today tomorrow the xfinity cars are are, are going to qualify the cup cars are going to qualify brian said that uh, when we talked to brian the other day he said saturday is usually like the family yeah yeah S- saturday's a good family day because you get you you see every series every series is on the track at some point and two of them i mean the trucks and the they actually run their races on Saturday. So you get a full day. You get a full day on Saturday out here. How, how many drivers still race in the truck series and then race on Sunday? So NASCAR has gone in and they have totally eliminated almost so that you program. Don't, you don't get to do that anymore? You can, you, can, you can run five races. If you're a cup, if you are running for a cup championship, you can run five races in the truck series. Kyle Busch does it every yeah, now and then. Good. No, nobody else really does it anymore. Um, I haven't looked at the entry it, list here. Does Kyle only does Kyle Busch only do it because of nostalgia or what? Well, a lot. Of, I think a lot of that. That's how you come up. Well, a lot right. of it's sponsorship driven. Oh, is is you know yeah. if they're investing money, Ooh. they want him in. The, but but where where it's so different now is it is it used to be, and it was a valid point. It was a valid point where guys would say, "I'm going to race on Saturday to help me on Sunday" because the cars were somewhat compatible or comparable but now between the between the trucks the trucks have a have a a sealed crate engine in them that that lacks horsepower you know depending who you ask the xfinity car is probably the coolest race car of the three because it's it's foot to the floor sticks like a magnet you ever been in, one? in an xfinity car yeah. yeah i have been in an xfinity car Th- those things are extremely nice the cup car is you know, like is like none of the other ones. So 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 the whole thing of well, cup car is just bare. It's almost a shell, right? The cup car is, is very much uh, a standardized car. Yeah. It's a standardized car. But when you get to racetracks like happy, like everybody's driving, the same everybody's thing. driving the same shit. But when you get to Coda or, or some of these other road courses, Chicago Street Course, some of these racetracks, this is where you're going to see guys that may run in the truck race or an Xfinity race. That's a cup driver because they're not familiar with this course right. because it's so different. I mean, this this racetrack is pro- dude, the, pro- the best racetrack in the country. So how many how many drivers in the field today have experience on Coda in in the sun in the Sunday race the Sunday race? Because usually that I mean track experience plays into a good oh, part of it if you're going to win, right? Especially here because there, nothing here is the same. Every corner is different. And you think every straightaway? Best, you think this is the best track in in America? Absolutely. Absolutely, and I'm an oval track guy. I'm an oval track guy, but when it comes to when it comes to you're pres- not placating to the Austin crowd, like no, no, like, Austin okay. has, Austin no, I'm, has I'm, nothing dude, to do with it. You are the aficionado of, of racing. yeah, no. Uh, th- this place, the, the way this place was what designed, so, yeah, like what? So, so when Tavo Hellman bro- drew this thing out on a piece of paper, he took little pieces of racetracks that he had visited all around the world. Put it all together into this and created this monster. So this is the Mac. This is the Mac this, book. This of... it really is. It really is. And designed and... actually that that's not the MacBook. The MacBook was designed by people that weren't computer people. It was mm. designed by mm. original people. Mm-hmm. That, yeah. Like but this, I mean, in and of itself, right here, this this front straightaway. When when you rip down this front straightaway, and then you have that two story drive up to the top. And you were just hauling ass. That is crazy. And then there's a turn, and the turn's like this, Wags. I mean, it, turn, it, like, it, like it, would, it would be one thing if it was like that. Like a, like a, like a yeah. soft C or something like that. You go, you jam the brakes, and you hope that son of a bitch is going to get it come out on the other side. And they're going to be four, five, six wide. Oh, but God. here's what's going to be cool about Sunday. Just a couple of notes. So, so if you're going to watch it on TV – Think about this. So they're going to be talking about a restart zone. Okay. And what that is, that's where when you're under caution when or or when the race starts, that's where you can get on the gas and go. The restart zone used to be right over here by the main grandstand. So you're like, oh, and you're going to turn one and you got to lock it up and, and you're, you're just getting into the power. And that's where you had a lot of mess. The restart zone is moved to here. Okay. It, it is right at the exit of turn 20. So you can start there. So you have a little more. Um, turn 20. 20 turns. 20 turns. 20 turns 3.41 miles. 
you, you you're going to be balls to the wall all the way, but but you have a little more response time by the time you get to the top of the hill. Where before it was like boom, you're on the gas, then you got to get right. back on the brakes. I kind of wish they'd have left it over there. Then the other part about it is you talk about the stages. Remember you were talking right. about yeah, stages. For playoff, qualifying for playoff points. Right. So what had happened was they had gotten rid of stage breaks here on the road courses. Well, they brought them back. So that's wow. the intrigue. Intrigue. What did were was ratings down after they no, took okay. No, no. It, it it's better for the drivers because what that does is it allows, especially at a road course like this, because this is where you can start working fuel mileage. You get to the end, you're getting towards the end of a stage, and you're maybe running in eleventh, twelfth place. Leaders have to go hit pit road, get right. gas and tires. You stay out, hell, you win the stage. Right. And, and, then, you, and then you can you know, you can fuel up and pit while you're, that's right. while you're at the break. During the break. So that's coming back, the restart zone moving. And I was also told, I, I haven't verified this, but I was told by a really good source, there's been some repaving that's gone out around here. Uh, a couple of different areas, I think on the front stretch, they've done some repaving. So we're, we're going to see... We're going to see a lot of different parts and pieces that are going to uh, be happening here. And, and I'm here to tell you that the the sa- Saturday Xfinity race is going to be damn good. Well, all these guys got jackets and everything, man. They have a lanyard? They got. They didn't need a lanyard. They got a jacket. They got one of them NASCAR jackets. So I guess if you're on the NASCAR team, you're torn. Oh, yeah. 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 You you, li- you live in motorhomes and hotels. And, and that's... Well, Brian stays here all the time, though. No, Brian, Brian I, I think, is in Dallas. See, because that's, that's the way that that, that works, because SMI is actually run out of Texas Motor Speedway and the different tracks. They've got Charlotte. They've got, like, eight different racetracks. And that's how they, you know, all come here to run this operation. And that's the really the cool part that he talked about. SMI, with all the conglomerate of racetracks that they have, they only run events at tracks they own. They don't own this place. Mm. They rent this. So... It's, I mean, see this guy, you know what he's doing out there? He's getting out there and he's measuring pit road. That, that's how detailed this stuff gets. Uh, I mean, getting out there, trying to figure out distance. That's probably going to be something. He's probably making $30 an hour. Doing that. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? He just had, he's just out there walking around, man. This, this, this is a show that comes into town. And when you see them, when you see them come in, you know, like when a circus or a carnival comes into town, oh, yeah. it's, it's just like, yeah. That's exactly yeah, what like, happens I, here. It's it's intoxicating. Like I can't. It's captivating. I can't take my. my but, but the I'm thing about this is, I wish. You know what? We're gonna put this in the show notes. We need to get two cameras. That yeah. way, we can have another screen set up so that the viewers can see what we're seeing too. Yeah. Because we're doing them a disservice by not allowing them to see yeah. what we're seeing. Yeah. Yeah. If they'd be able to see right here on the front screen, anyway. but um, highly recommend NASCAR at Coda. Get yourself out here. Get yourself a day pass, and and that's a good thing about it. Is like if you come out, let's say you come out Saturday. Come on out, watch two races. We're good all weekend, right? Oh yeah, yeah. We, stuff we, we yeah, can come out yeah. We can come out weekend. anytime. Yeah. You come out. You come out Saturday. I'm sorry, you don't want to come back Sunday. Yeah. Because you're 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 really. Well, Sunday's main event. Yeah, it's main event. Weather's holding out. I mean, the first year's torrential downpour. It was it was horrible. Um, that was a mess. Um, last year you had golf in at the same time. One year it was really hot. This is year number four. I think everything's in order for him, man. This this is going to be a fantastic show. It's going to be a fantastic show. And if Texas beats Tennessee, I mean, it's... it's... Come on, man. <laughs> Come on, man. Is, what are you doing to me, dude? If Texas beats Tennessee. Everybody's going to be in such a joyful mood. If and... Texas beats Tennessee. How and many people out there listening right now actually think that shit's going to happen? There's, Seriously, there's concerts, pre-race concerts, all this stuff, and, and the cool part about it is, is like when they do driver in. They got the top score in the SEC. You really think we're gonna fucking win, <laughs> dude? I didn't think we we're gonna win last night. I so, didn't mean either. I didn't either. Go on, keep going. Go. Um, on. like driver intros. I, I mean, you really will enjoy this if, if it's gonna be your first time. Come on out and and enjoy the show. NASCAR at Coda dot com. We'll be glad you came, and and I promise you, it won't be the last time. I, I am, I am very embarrassed that it's only been my second time here. Um, I need to get out here a little bit more. Hell, even if it's only just to bring the kid out here and get him some experience on the damn track. Well, and usually I, I'm, I'm pretty damn sure with our Texas Sports Unfiltered, you know, vibe and stuff like that, we can talk to Bobby and make it happen. Well, hell, you Bobby can, already you knows can me. do that. Bobby, I mean, we we have dinner every night, so <laughs> we're gonna make it happen. We're gonna get the people. We're gonna get the people of Texas Sports Unfiltered in a car too. And I'm going to do a damn rate. I'm going to do a show 
in a car. See, the the the, the carting is a lot of fun. I don't know if you if you were able to see that. It's carting, probably I dark. Get in the cars like these guys are doing, <laughs> driving. <laughs> And the, these aren't professional drivers that we've been seeing. Hell, we've seen two Mustangs trying. Oh race yeah, the, yeah. These guys. That that that, that that's this a charity. This guy caught up here with a spoiler. I mean, the spoiler was bigger than his damn car. You know, they, they actually do. I don't know if they still do it here. There's shit going on here all the time. I mean, this place is all the time. I mean, if, if it's not a concert, it's they used to do. I had a buddy that used to come out and they would do Biking Wednesday. And you would what like right bike around the track. Bike around the track. Can you imagine going that up that can't hill? Be fun. No, hell no. Twenty turns. Three point four one miles. That sounds like exercise. I want to push something that's going to do it for me, man. Yeah, yeah. It's like he's like. I do go. I do go. I do go karts on here. Listen, like come out easily. You, you I need would to come out and bike. I would do go karts like yesterday on here. Yeah, but the fun, the the real. Actually, I probably would be a little bit more reluctant if I was in a real car, just because I wouldn't want to dang anything up. But if I was in a go kart. Shit, man. Balls of the wall. I'd be reluctant in my car. Uh, I don't know about somebody else's. I just thought I wouldn't want to hit anything. You yeah. know what I mean? I, I know how I am on the regular street. <laughs> <Let alone out laughs> here, no, it's it, it, it's a good time to come out here. But th- there's always things happening here at Circuit of the Americas. Great concerts. I mean, ha- have you seen have you seen the concert? I, I've, never, I've never been to a concert yeah, the, out here either, man. The, the concert venue is, I mean, it's great out there, man. Uh, we were out here for Formula One, and we saw – I don't remember who we saw. I didn't realize how big the grounds were out here. It's either. huge. You're only, you come out here, you're only expecting a track. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then you get here, uh, hell, the whole damn thing. It's almost like a damn campus Yeah. when you get out here. So. I mean, it really is. I mean, there there are so many – I mean, this thing just stretches out. And, and the cool thing is, like, when you're driving out of here, if you drive out on the main road, you look over, and it's like, oh, look over there. There's turn 13 or whatever. It's it's just – it's massive. It's massive, and it's going to be a good race. Echo well, Park Automotive uh, Grand Prix. Whether you're watching NASCAR this weekend, or you're watching, you know, March Madness, or you know, baseball starting up. You got spring baseball. We got six days until opening day. Uh, we'll, have, well, kind of. They've already had a, a regular season game for Major League Baseball. But you're watching NBA. You got to do it with um, audio visual consultations. Five one two two five five eight six seven eight. That's abconsultations.com. They've been setting the standard in audio visual automation for the past thirty five years since nineteen eighty eight in the great Central Texas area of Austin, Texas. And if you guys want something in your home, make sure you give them a call right now at five one two two five five eight six seven eight. And uh, get them out in your house and get them ready for uh, for all the the, the best time of sports because of all the seasons that i just told you about with uh with nascar and and nba and march madness hi i'm dan covert with my wife hi i'm dan covert with my wife dan covert there too <laughs> but yeah you do it all with uh audio visual consultations 512-255-8678 that's audio visual consultations.com dan covert has av consultations yes, he does. how about a word they from got dan? they got it in the covert bk studio as a matter of fact hi i'm dan covert with my wife hayden welcome to covert bk our newest location in the gorgeous hill country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Covert, born and raised in Austin. Yeah, Sam. So what they were talking about, it was uh, Speedway Children's Charities is uh, something that uh, SMI, the Smith family, they are very passionate about that. They do that, uh, I believe, at every NASCAR uh, event or, or NASCAR Cup race uh, that you're gonna that you're gonna be able to get to, and you can actually get on the racetrack and 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 take some laps right there. And all of that money uh, goes to some uh, really cool, uh, well deserved, uh, well deserving children. Uh, Strippers. So- <laughs> Na- Goes the strippers. The, and NASCAR very passionate about about two things about uh, about children like that children and children's strippers. ministries. I'm kidding, <laughs> kidding guys. Well, maybe, maybe some maybe some of the competitors uh, <laughs> uh, would be, uh, and and not only that, the military. Um, they, they don't care about the military. They, they are very. Uh, they do lots of really cool things. For the uh, for the military, so uh, let's my take... my South Midwest brackets are already in the recycling. My oh. my entire bracket. Is I'm, I'm doing okay. You're I, doing a lot better than I. Am. I, I I'm doing if, okay. If you if you went chalk, you're probably in a mess. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm actually doing a, a lot better than I thought I was going to be doing. 
Um, I, I say that tongue in cheek about NASCAR. Yeah. But, but no, you know no, what, no, you no. Know I, really, I, know, I know what you, you know. What chaps my ass about organizations? What's that? that? They say they love military stuff, right? No. But then they charge the military to put endorsements on your shit. Like, yeah, see? we're here for the military, but you got to pay to advertise. Yeah. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Like, see, whatever. Bro. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's where here. <laughs> right. about your bottom dollar. Yeah. 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 That, when, that, when, that, when, that, when, that is when, kind of shitty. You really tell me that you care about the military. Yeah. Show me that you're doing something without, you know, the military having the, the pay to yeah, get a little yeah. bit of a spot. So. I do agree with that. I definitely do agree. I don't with speak that. shit. I just tell you how I feel. Yeah, yeah. And usually, uh, I'm really, I'm pretty spot on. Uh, actually, here's what. So, so Rob was at Wicked. You know, have you seen that? I saw that. Wicked pictures. No, no, Vivid Productions. No, <laughs> Wicked, Wicked Vivid. Is that what you're talking about? No, uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming. Uh, Rob, so hold on, well, hold on. We got to have a conversation. I can't believe we haven't had this conversation. What Vivid Production? No, the hub is down. Oh, I know. The hub is down. We saw breaking news last oh, week. Yeah, but I was on vacation. Yeah. I wasn't. Pay- I oh, wasn't yeah. paying attention to it. Yeah, the- guys, what are we doing? What are we? What are we? What are we sourcing? The news broke on our show. Uh, what, are, what are we sourcing? When when that happened, when that happened, so so one one of our I got of, back to Texas and I'm like, where, where's Pornhub? What one of our TS, TSU agents broke the news. It said, guys, the, the I saw the, that it was Grant. Hub, it was Grant. Grant, it was Grant, Grant, Grant and, and Stu was on that day, and, <laughs> and it said the hub is down. And I'm like, oh my god, I can't. Believe the hub is down, and I looked over. It's Stu was on on screen, and he was like. <laughs> oh, oh, the stew was trying to figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> like, Stu's not, Stu's not, orig- Stu's not really embraced the chaos yet. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean. Stu, yeah, we, we bring yeah. Stu on here, and God love him. Yeah, man. sometimes yeah, man, he just yeah. looks at us like we're fucking. Uh, I, uh, I said that. <laughs> I, I said that, and uh, and then I just went to Dallas Cowboys afterwards. It's like, okay, let's talk about something else. I have dual volumes, low for our art and high for wax. Sorry, man. Yeah, I, well, dude, I'm I'm a very loud and vocal guy. Yeah, I, I, well, the, and, and that's where I think seriously it's a connection because earlier you were low and I was high. So no, I'm that, usually just yeah. sometimes the the mic's closer or the mic away. And yeah, whatever. You guys know, man. I, no. I, I'm, I'm I'm all whatever. over the damn whatever. Place, now I'm we a know. Roller coaster. I'm but a yeah, roller coaster I, I don't. So so why why is it why did they shut that down here? So look, so I I did a little bit of investigation because some of the other ones now, work. I, I, now hold, you do they? Yeah. You got to You guys got to help me out here, yeah, or so. not help me out, but you guys got to talk me on the target. Um, now look, I did a little bit of exploratory investigating journalism. Okay. Okay. This was completely for work related and not for pleasure. Uh, just just checking out checking out the sources here. Um, hey, my guy, uh, checking out the sources here. So went to the website of Pornhub.com. And it said it gave you a little message, and basically, you got to be a content creator. The only way that you have access to Pornhub, you got to make a video. You got to make a video. I've signed up. <laughs> I'm on it. I'm there, guys. I'm a content creator. I got my toes out there. I got some clippings of my toenail. You know, me taking some yeah. toenail stuff. Um, didn't specify what you had to make a con. I'm kidding. I don't have any. I'm not a content creator on Pornhub. But yeah, that's that is the loop around. So if you want to, or the reach around rather, well, that, if you want to, if you want to reach around to, to get to bypass it's like OnlyFans you know, Pornhub or what? Yeah, kind of. You gotta. That sounds like OnlyFans. You gotta do yeah. that. You gotta make sure that you so creating. Daryl G, what is House Bill 1181? I, I mean, I, I'm all confused. I know there's one with the border that's number four or something like that. Thanks, uh, Gov. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, Gov, Governor Hot Wheels right there. It's like. Uh, that's the uh, that's the least of his interests right there. Uh, I, would, I would assume he's like, uh, no, no part of that for me. Uh, I don't, I don't. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like, yeah, no, nah, I can't. Does me no good. Fuck it. Shut it down. Shut it down. Slam the thing like Bucky. He's like, does does me no good. Oh, he says, fuck. So I'm sorry. That's a, I'm sorry. That is I'm I'm sorry. I should not laugh. God. Yeah. So I I don't. But, I hate you all. Sometimes I hate you all. But that's My God. You can't say shit like that on here. We're we're we don't have our. Sometimes we have our bearings, but God, you can't put us. That's setting us up. That is literally setting us up for failure, buddy fucker. 
Yes. <laughs> you have to you have to verify your age by entering your government ID information or a third party system. Government, see that, and that's where they got me. That's where I'm just like, all right, now the government's going to be on me. You know, smut peddlers. They don't need life. to know what I'm they're watching. Gonna, they're going to they're going to deem me as a smut peddler. No, oh, I ain't got time for it, man. Go, go fix real problems. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I mean, I saw I saw where the other day the United States for the first time is <laughs> the United States. It's so good. It's such a good. The, I saw oh my God, that, that, that for one of the oh. first times ever, the United States was oh. on uh, was not on the list of the 20th happiest countries to live in. And then they do that. Oh. They probably took the they probably took the took the poll the day after the hub went down. But yeah. All right, I got my I'm back. Governor. Oh, I look I'm I, mean, I got steam coming on my glasses here. Okay, so thank you Greg Abbott. We're going to call him Greg. He goes by Governor Greg Abbott here, guys. But now it all cuz I wasn't putting two and two together until that happened like somebody said he doesn't need it and yeah. i was like oh yeah. shit yeah. no yeah. shit he, he doesn't Dude, need it. slow slow days on a friday my guy doesn't slow days it. on a friday he doesn't need it uh, all right let's get into uh, the sports go <laughs> I got him beating Houston. God bless. I'm telling you, dude, it's 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 one of those things that just I don't know what it is about the Aggies. I think it's actually more about Houston. I've got him. I've got him beating. So you're to the point. You're basically your logic is that Houston has worn themselves down too much from the rigorous Big Twelve tournament. Mm-hmm. Or a big big twelve schedule the the season. Or, yeah, the season. That's, yeah. That's, that's yeah. Really yeah. That, that, that's kind of my thought. But I mean, going, going the distance, that's true. And that's that's where I thought, kind of to your point, that you beat. Dude, I was talking to her last week that I thought BYU was one of those. I could beat. Me too. I'm in trouble. I, I had them. I had them. Not only winning yesterday. Winning a couple of more times. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I, maybe I'm wrong. But he's, uh, I hope I am. I hope I am. I hope I am because I like that team. I don't think long enough to get out of this team here. Like I said, I mean, the affirmation game, the affirmation game that we just talked about with Nebraska and Texas AM, I, I really see this as kind of irrelevant. Um, basically, you know. Whether the eight or the nine wins are going to fall to Houston, that's kind of how I see it. Um, and then going down out of that bracket, still, we got Duke in the line tonight. Like I know Duke's not as strong as they usually are. Approach is still one, a, a decent, legitimate facilitator there for, uh, for Duke. Like, I'm sure. Wisconsin and James Madison. Look, traditionally, Wisconsin and Badgers are the decent team. They, 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 play, they usually have tremendous defense, and they, you know, the opposition really struggles to score on them. So uh, I, I don't see James Madison giving too much. No, of a I, I, I don't to think Wisconsin so. Here, no. I think the Badgers win in a dramatic fashion. Here. Out, of the, you know, out of the next matchup between Wisconsin and Duke, yeah. there's a damn good chance that Duke. I've got him. I've got Wisconsin over Duke, as a matter of fact, in that in that next round. So yeah, uh, Duke, uh, just just not just not the Duke. You know what I'm saying? It's just not the Duke that we've seen in the past. That we've seen 
in the past. It's kind of my thought. Even with, when, even with the latter years of Shashevsky, I would say that Duke was kind of still running out of steam, right? And, mm-hmm. You know, you argue, can they still get the recruits that they used to get? It's it's kind of the first time that I don't have Duke actually making it to a Sweet Sixteen. Yeah, so, yeah, same I'm here. With you. I got Duke actually bowing out and next losing, this losing weekend. Wisconsin, yeah, Wisconsin, yeah, yeah. Which is yeah. actually it's just very weird. But like I said, traditionally Wisconsin is. No, we no, we haven't had one. Pretty sure. Uh, pretty sure it was him. Pretty sure it was him. Moving on, my guys. Um, what else do we have matchups today? Florida Atlantic, like I was talking about against North uh, Western. Um, look, we know that there was roster turnover with Florida Atlantic. I don't think there's going to be. I don't think they'll essentially be the darlings that they were last year. But I do have them get past Northwestern. Now the thing about that is, after they get past this game, they got to. They're probably going to play UConn. Yeah, you know I mean? yeah. And we yeah. all know, like I got UConn going up against Can or going up against uh, Houston in my in my uh, national championship game. Mm-hmm. So, um, look, UConn that they, they are. If if I'm not picking Houston, I would say that UConn's probably the most complete team. And where I give UConn the nod over Houston is that UConn's got a little bit more depth. I think both teams probably play, go through about eight players in, in the roster. But yeah. But the ninth and tenth, the the nine guy and the ten guy usually gets out there on the floor more than or more for UConn than um, than Houston does. I forget yeah. the well, and, and that just goes back to what we were. The kid that plays for Houston is his little brother played with my son. Uh, really? Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. And it's, and it's, I can't, mm-hmm. I can't. And, and that just goes back to what we were talking about right there. It's the things like that that UConn just does so well. I mean, even that. I mean, to where it's, man, it's going to be so hard. It's going to be so hard to beat them. Uh, I mean, I, I don't – it's like you, you're looking for a flaw. It's like uh, I want to see – have they had a – I mean, they've had some off games, but even – But when, when, when the dominant shooter, when the backcourt doesn't play well, the frontcourt doesn't play well. That's it. That's it. I mean, even, even an off game for them, it's like, shit. If I could be that good on an off day, oh my god! And that's like you know, you know, the frustration that we talk about with the with the, with the Longhorns. It's like, god damn, on a good day, man. But oh, 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 on a bad day, yeah, it gets it you know get when the bad day that. is. Uh, San Diego State and UAB here. Uh, I wanted to give UAB the nod just because I don't, I really don't know much about both of these two schools. I, I, I but I wanted to give Bur- you know, Alabama, Birmingham, a little bit of of the shock just because I needed, I felt like I needed to pick. Yeah, uh, you know, a sleeper team or a twelve, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I took, I went with San Diego State there to take on Auburn, Auburn okay. in the next round, and then kind of like, like I was talking about, that's where the heart kind of gets involved, and it's like, okay, I want Auburn to make a little bit of a run right here, but San Diego State might knock off Auburn. It, it, you know, that that may that 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 heartfelt pick by me may even do my bracket further. You know, going that route. How far does Auburn go? Because one would argue that Auburn, besides Tennessee, Auburn, Auburn is probably the strongest team in the SEC. Now, I've I had I thought Kentucky guys. My pick was Kentucky. Like I yeah. thought Kentucky were tradition, and I don't know. I guess traditionally because you know I'm I'm wowed over by by uh, by Cal, but yeah. I mean hell now you know Cal's probably going to be out of a job. We talked about that mm-hmm. in the first hour. You know, mm-hmm. coming in losing to a team like Oakland. Uh, having a, have a one guy beat you essentially. One guy, you know, Oakland, hits, Michigan, Oakland, Michigan. Yeah, one guy beat <laughs> seven threes at halftime, dude. Um, and then you know, still made, still wasn't able to make adjustments at halftime. And dude, and Kentucky wasn't even in. I, I don't even. They weren't even close. Like I kept looking up and thinking, oh, Kentucky's gonna, you know, here they they're gonna close the gap, close the gap, and then you know, a three point play. Uh, what or not or, or an and one like a three point play the old fashioned way. With yeah, an one, yeah. Whatever. Um, they were just never, never in it, man. It just always felt like Oakland was in control of that. Um, 
and they move on to play NC State. Uh, how now? How how much credit do I give the rest of the SEC schools? Uh, ten, Tennessee's gonna Tennessee's gonna beat us. Tennessee's gonna beat us. They got the um, top score in in the SEC. So uh, again, that's gonna bode well for them. Uh, but I would sit there and give Austin or uh, Auburn just as much strength as I would give Tennessee. As a matter of fact, I don't I don't know which team's better between Auburn or, or Tennessee. I can't I can't give a nod to which one is is the actual king of the SEC just yet. I mean what about Alabama too? I was just about to ask you about Alabama. Um I, I've got Auburn going I've got Auburn into the sweet sixteen. But yeah, Alabama is one that I, I've went back and forth on because it's like I don't I don't. I mean, they had so much good NBA talent last year. But, I know. But yeah, that it's just not. It's it's not the same key cogs or key pieces that was yeah. there last year. Clearly, Sal, my man. Good. Thank you for checking in. Yeah, yeah. What's up, my guy, Sal? That's exactly right. Yeah, that. Uh, I don't know, man. That 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 entire. It's like the side of the bracket. Triangle, yeah, right? it's like yeah. it's just an odd an odd portion of the bracket here. Um, schedule breakdown reminder, you got us for about another 15 minutes and then we were going to have a regular show of, um, yeah, it's only an hour, an hour with Jordan and Jeff, and then it will be Bucky. And- well, I don't know what midday is. I don't know what midday is today. Midday, probably midday. Pro- probably Trey and Jeff. Trey and Jeff or Trey. Yeah. Cause oh, no, BK said he was only working half day, so it's going to be BK. Okay. Okay. So okay. midday with, with Trey and BK. So you'll get yeah. your original, uh, show there. And then after that will be. Um, Zay and Bucky. And Zay and Bucky. Chip and, yeah. Chip and Bucky. Yeah. That, that'll be good. Yeah. Cause Chip. And then Longhorn Misfits. That's right. Cause Chip, Chip will be covering the Texas women's game because they're, they're firing off. Now, th- now that's going to, that's going to be fun to watch right there with the, with the Texas lady. God dang it, man. I hope they can make a run. God dang it. They I got, hope they make a run. Look, they got a favorable seed. Oh, we'll absolutely. I love, I love seeing them there. Playing at home. Playing as the one. But look, man. When it comes down to it, you're going to have to go through either LSU or South Carolina. Yep. When it's all said and done. Yep. With. And, and if you guys, if anybody, if anybody's been watching, or or what? What about UConn? You know what I mean? Uh, UConn. You can never women's. count UConn women out. I mean, it's yeah. Are you like Clark's probably the best, the best female shooter, the best female player in college, right? But you, but. Uh, I, and of course, the name's eluding me right now. But UConn's got a sensational guard as well, who can basically knock the the whites out of the damn gym. Um, I don't I don't think she's got the range that that Clark has, uh, but she's got accuracy. She's got the precision and accuracy. I just can't think of the name. And I'm doing uh, college women's college sports a disservice by not remembering this. Uh, bad recall on my part. Sorry, people. Um, but yeah, look, uh, South Carolina they're they're the stalwarts. Yeah. I, I, Pretty much thing. I'd love to see Coach Schaefer and the Lady Longhorns be able to take this down, um, but they have one hell of a hill to climb. Yeah, yeah, they um, they do, and, and, and of course everybody does, right? Yeah, like, um, yeah. but but to me, the clear favorites is South Carolina. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think what what you really take out of the the Texas women's program this year, I mean, a lot of things. I mean, obviously, like it, like you're talking about, but what 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 a season when you lose when you lose your best player. You lose your best player early able, on. Yeah, and you're still over the first year. Yeah, yeah, and 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 you've got a you've got a freshman that's an All American, and and I mean you can't help but I mean there's still work to be done, and we're talking about you know their chances right now as the ladies tournament gets ready to fire off. But it's good dude, path. It's yeah, good road. but it's you can't path. you can't help but look at next year and think, holy shit, right. it's gonna be loaded. The, it's the, like are the you reload is gonna be yeah. crazy. Let, but if hell, that's the, that's the thing. If you can steal, if you can steal, yeah, because. I mean, you're not the you're not the favorite. If you can steal a championship this year and oh. come back with the pieces that you have, reloaded, oh man, that's that's pretty you're cool. you're setting yourself up um, such a little dynasty going on right there uh, with that. And Coach Schaefer, they they do such a great job um, with that program, and and that's again like we were we played that uh, I think we played that sound of Vic, Vic Schaefer talking after one of the games, mm-hmm. and and it's like you know, a couple, that, a couple weeks ago. yeah, it's like I mean that that's the coach you want. I mean, I mean, that's a coach that that, that that you want leading your team. And, uh, you know, I know we always make the jokes. Uh, I've seen it so many times where it's like, can Vic go coach the men? <laughs> it's like, uh, well, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't, motivated, I don't really laugh at that very loud because because uh, that's a great point. Teach him how to play his own defense. Absolutely. Get some that's, rebounds. That's, some, some, <laughs> that's the other thing, too, man. My <laughs> God, last night I was. 
throwing shit at well, I was getting ready to throw shit at the TV. Um I'm I'm so tired of seeing seeing every Longhorn try and out jump out jump the opposition. The only person I ever see put a body on anybody is Brock Cunningham. Mm-hmm. I'm serious. And and mm-hmm. uh, and call it what you will. Everybody that knows Brock Cunningham and everybody that knows this team knows that that was that was of course that was Absolutely. a calculated box. Absolutely, he knew damn well that that elbow was going to the chin. Yeah, all no right? doubt he, about and, it. And in Brock, that's why I love you. All right? right, that is why you play the game how I I you, expect the game to be. You played. you need a junkyard dog you like do. that. You need a fuck, you, need, you a, need a Bill and Beer you, type of player like that. You need that. a guy he ain't like that. Dirty. He plays the game how you're supposed to play it inside, man. Yeah. When, when those dudes see him rolling in, they're like, they oh, it's man. It's an intimidation. It's yeah. Like, yeah. Man, here we come. This dude's going to bang us around. Yep. And you know what? In short, he he did it. He took one. And you go back and watch. Go back and watch the film. He took one glance over. He's like, that's the jaw. I got to get it up a little bit. Boom. Yep. Bam. And, it, yep. and you see it extend just a little bit. That little nudge, right? Short elbows wins fights, boys. Yeah. Short yeah. elbows wins yeah. fights. And I, lo- I love this double D. Every time when they every time when they ding him, he's like, what? I didn't do what I did. What? What, what? I do? What? Make it about him. <laughs> Seriously, play the victim. Play the victim. He plays the victim pretty damn well. That's right. right. Dude, that's right. throw somebody in the third right. stand. That's... And it's his, you know, he's the one that that's, uh, that's what Otani's going to be doing in a couple of days. Oh, me? <laughs> he's the one to play me? the victim. Me? Me? <laughs> No, no, that that is the best part because it's like you're waiting for it. It's like, and it's but, like. But, but anybody that saw that last night knows that that was a calculated buy. I mean, that he knew exactly what he was doing. But look, flagrant. You had to only give him the flagrant one because it, yeah. it looked like it was a an incidental. Uh, of course. Play. Of right? course. Um, yeah. But still, uh, the only person that box out on, or it seems like the only person that box out on this team is Brock. Yeah, it, it really is. It really is. He's just he, put a body on somebody. Stop trying to out jump someone for a rebound. If yeah. You put a body on them. They won't get the rebound. And then the ball will fall, fall to the floor. Then you go get the damn ball. Yeah. But he's taught in middle school. Man. These I guys don't want to have any contact. No. These guys don't want to have any contact. Got about 10 minutes to go or about 12 minutes to go until we get on any unsaved rounds we got to talk about for the race before. Kind of, kind of, I, run down anything? Kind of pull some stats uh, where we were talking about um, earlier about, you know, who who do you, you know, who, who's going to be a comer and goer or whatever, uh, uh, a contender in this thing. And, and lo- looking at, you know, overall in the four four years that, that NASCAR has raced here at COTA, um, the number one guy, when you look at it based on driver rating, and 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 the driver rating takes into uh, average finishes, um, highest rating. I mean, all of that. Ross Chastain's at the top of that at, at the top of that uh, list, and that's the guy that I talked about from Trackhouse Racing. He was a winner here two How years ago. How can we didn't mention Dinger? You got AJ up here. Oh, yeah, I mean, we AJ. We talk about Almondinger. AJ Almondinger. If you're coming to a road course, you, you've got to factor him in. Tyler Reddick is number two on that list. He drives the number 45 car for uh, 2311 Racing, which is the Michael Jordan team. Tyler Reddick, the defending winner of this Echo Park Automotive Grand Prix here at Coda. And that's a guy that that's another. That is another guy. You put him on a road course. You put him on an oval. You put him on an intermediate oval, a short track. And that's going to be a dude that is going to drive his ass off. What's his average finish? His average finish is 13th. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, fifth. 20, fifth. Who are you talking about? Um, I'm, I'm uh, looking at Dinger. Uh, Reddick. Reddick. Oh, T- Tyler yeah. Reddick. Tyler Reddick. Yeah, Reddick's running at uh, average Average finish is five right there. He's got a high rating of 141 and an average rating of 111. Yeah, see, the, those those are outrageous numbers. And, and kind of the, the thing with Ross Chastain, and, and it happened here. It happened the year that he won. If you get Ross Ch- Chastain down to the end of this race, you talk about Brock Cunningham laying bodies on people. Ross Chastain is going to lay a body on somebody. And so that's why if, if you if you look up and your spotter tells you Chastain is there, you better be ready because he's going to lean on you. And, and, and Logano is going to do that. Denny Hamlin's going to do that. Uh, I mean, but but then you, got the numbers too. Yeah, yeah, you, you get to some of those other guys. The Hendrick guys are in there uh, with Alex Bowman and William Byron. Alex Bowman coming off of an injury last year, really starting to try to get his feet back on the ground again. But I, I really do think, um, you know, I mentioned Chase Elliott the other day. I, I think this it's not a make or break race for Chase Elliott Wags, but I think this is a, a good. Uh, street driver too, isn't he? Chase Ricky Stenhouse. Oh, Ricky Stenhouse. Yeah, yeah. He's he's hit or miss. Uh, that, that's another guy. He's gonna put his body on you. Uh, he he he'll lean on you. But I think Chase Elliott's the real the one that I'm really focused into because this is uh, Chase Elliott needs to get right. Um, 
you know, he's had top 15 finishes, but it's not when it comes to Chase Elliott, you, you expect to see him winning races, knocking down top fives and his teammates, William Byron and, and Kyle Larson at Hendrick. Hell, they've, they've already races. won. Yeah. 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 Those guys have already won. So it's Austin Sendrick is another kid. Uh, he drives a number two car for Penske. That's a guy that is an exceptional road racer. Uh, the year of the, of the rain race out here, he was driving, I think, a satellite car for Penske. He led the first 20 some odd laps. I swear that was a chair. What's that? I, oh, never mind. You didn't even hear it. Oh, no. Oh, no, oh, did you fart? No. It was oh, a chair. I swear oh, it was a chair. Oh, yeah, just in time for us to get out of here. <laughs> There's nothing, you won't be smelling any dirty air here. <laughs> um, and then, of course, you can't ca- count out Kyle Bush. It's dudes the like menace. that. I tell you. Is he, is he he's softening most, up. Is he the most hated driver? Not anymore. He's softening up. Who that's, is the most that's, that's Denny Hamlin. Okay. That's Denny Hamlin. Just because he wins? Because he wins, talks a lot of shit. Dude's I, got, know the, I know the Eminem car. Used dude's, to get... dude's got a podcast. It's called uh, Actions Detrimental. And the dude says it like it is. And he Don't hold back anything. He, he was doing this thing. He was doing this thing, and he stopped doing it. He stopped doing it because he said his dad told him to stop doing it. So what happens, NASCAR guys get out here. You win a race. They interview you on on the front stretch. The crowd can hear you. The TV can hear you. Denny Hamlin would win, and he'd talk about the race or whatever, and he'd look up at the crowd, and he said, the first time he did it, he said, oh, by the way, I beat your favorite driver. And the reporter said, who? He goes, all of them. And so he did that. So, you know, he's winning more races. He would do that every time they boo him out of the place, dude. It's like, it, it's like the dude. Playing it, the heel like a. Playing play. the heel like professional wrestling, man. I'll tell you. I always uh, thought, you know, for for the what, a good two or three year span there, it was Kyle Bush that was the most hated. Or, uh, he was. I felt, I felt was the most hated, you know, out of the field there. Um, just just the the style, the the bullyish way that he would he would drive. Um not not so much like an enforcer, but I mean, he was just an asshole on the track. Yeah. Or, or yeah. you know what? He was driving to win. Well, what an asshole just driving to win. Well, huh? and, and that's the thing. You get a lot of these guys, you get, a, you get different drivers in the sport to where some talk a lot of shit and they're running in the middle of the pack. You know, they're bitching about stuff and they're running in the middle of the pack. And then you get guys like Denny Hamlin, Kyle Busch, Ross Chastain even. That will. Chastain got a mouth on. He he's backed off. He's backed off a little bit, but the, these guys they say shit and they back it up, and they will grind your gears. I know it's MTJ, like anything. MTJ it's MTJ middle. Likes to run it. MTJ likes to run it a little bit. Now, now what? Now what he has kind of gravitated to, and, and people say that this is him getting a little older. Is that what you get with Truex now? Is a lot of times he's kind of bitching about stuff. Uh, the old man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, and, and people are like, well, do something about it. You, you know, somebody somebody runs him over, yeah, he gets mad. And, and he gets pissed off, and 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 they're like, well, do something about it. You know, I mean, next time you're on the track with that dude, get him back. Yeah, get him back. But yep. but you know that that's not the way that he's groomed to race. And, and but you will have. I mean, like I yeah, said, he's a, yeah, he's a gentleman. <laughs> yeah, he's a gentleman. He's a gentleman. So. The two races tomorrow will be. I say that tongue in cheek. Yeah, yeah. the The two races tomorrow will be good. Uh, the the, the truck race is always entertaining because you got to think about that big truck trying to cut the wind here in this big old skin's peeling on my back from the Florida sun, man. Oh, ew, that's it. I hate that feeling, yeah. dude. Put bad. put some aloe vera. Hey, on now. There. hey look at that. On, hey, we need that. a lift. Can you give my man his uh lanyard? I gotta tell lanyard? you. I gotta tell you. Um, I, I, I've been to one NASCAR event. Yeah. I think the, uh, the Delaware. Oh, Dover? Dover down. Oh, that that's a great uh, place, man. So look, the sights that you see, and you know what the sights I'm talking oh, about. Oh, of course. Some of the most beautiful, and you never, you would never think that you would see be- some of the most beautiful women at a NASCAR event. But damn. I'm telling you. I, and I, I I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the the ambiance or the vibe about it or whatnot. But holy shit, man, that one's never looked so good. And I and I and I'll tell you what you see here on Sunday. More on Sunday because that's main event day. You see ladies that are dressed up like NASCAR fans. You know, a a, a racer girl as they like to call them. Hey, we got any drivers? We got any drivers that we can put for athlete of the week? 
Uh, yeah. All right. Well, let's yeah. go on that. Yeah. Yeah, we do. Um, and then you have then you have some of the other ladies that it's like they're going to the Kentucky Derby. You know, they got the, oh, with the, whole, got, with the they got all that yeah. shit on and and it's all hot out here. And yeah, I'm I ain't like, got time yeah, for that. Like, man, what are you doing wearing like, that? I'll I mean, tell you what, the 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 uh the tied up flannel. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? That oh, yeah. that'll get that's that'll get me. You, you get the know, um that'll get me. Especially with the weather that we're gonna have this weekend, you will get the um you will get the Texas uh, pregame uh, boots and shorts and oh, yeah. all oh, of that. Yeah. You, you that's, get... that's the staple. The, the staple. The, the regular Austin outfit is yeah. what you get around here. Yeah, that's yeah. for sure, man. Yeah, yeah. good sights here. That's for sure. Yeah, that that yeah. was cool. The uh, PBA NASCAR Invitational, and that's where NASCAR and, and the Professional Bowlers Association seem to be having some kind of. Uh... Who do you think you are? <laughs> I am. Yeah, so some kind of thing going on right there. Yeah, that that really was cool right there. Pete Weber. Pete Weber. Pete Weber, Pete man. Weber, that's a bad man. Best shit talker that's, in all. That's a in bad. All the game. But but just like these drivers I'm God talking about, bless. what's he do? He backs it up. He does back he it up. He backs it up. All right, you got one. Love me or hate me, you watched Pete yeah. Weber. So you got one last chance. Texas over Tennessee, right? No. <laughs> no. You talk good? Me off the, talk me off the ledge, guys. Uh, what's the, what? Real quick before we get out of here, what's your biggest surprises? Um, what will be? Your biggest surprise today will Marquette fall, huh? Mm-hmm. Well, well, I mean, every a lot of people are, are you know placing that Shaka Smart exit stage thinks that Shaka Smart could exit stage right again and, uh, and not survive the first round. I mean, hell, that's kind of his MO, Rodney. It is, it really is. Same different for Mar- different Marquette. Teams. Same for Purdue. Pretty damn Marquette. Team. Pretty damn good Marquette. Team. Yeah, um, but yeah, I would like if. Um, if I were to give anybody a shock and awe moment, I'd probably think I'd hit it on the, the head again that Purdue gets upset by Grambling. So, I mean, I don't. I'm yeah. not calling that. I'm not betting on that. But if, if I'm going to pencil it in, Grambling, I, Grambling State over Purdue. The, uh, you know, I wouldn't be shocked. I wouldn't be shocked. I, I I just don't have faith in Purdue. It's like there's teams that I keep mentioning where I'm like, I, I have play, no faith if you in play them. Play half court. If you play a half court game. You're playing into the strength of Purdue, right? If you continue to stay high pressure, keep the ball at high pace all the time, and not get into half court sets, force you know Zach Eady to be in so much uh, you know, so much wear and tear, and you know, just be tired so damn much that he creates stupid fouls and you know, bad mistakes. Hell, not just Zach Eady, but the rest of the team too. Mm-hmm. Uh, get them in foul trouble, man, and then got a damn pretty good chance to be Purdue. That's mm-hmm. that's there's there's not too many ways to, to knock out a you know Goliath like that, but you know, that's that's the recipe for David to take him down. That's for sure. Yeah. So you got to yeah. go with the foul trouble. Yeah, definitely looking forward to Nebraska and A and um, I think that's going to be a lot of fun to watch. I don't I don't know why I'm so honed in on that one. Um, I think because that's one of my stronger it's little, fields. It's, it's, little, it's probably one of the most yeah one of the most games with parity than in, in all the field than anyone else um i don't think i i don't really think western kentucky is actually going to upset marquette but it would be it, it's one of the games that's kind of raised my eyebrow just because of the mo of shaka yeah of shaka smart um i honestly don't know what what western kentucky does well i know they got some streaky shooters uh, but but hell man that's every basketball team you know, anybody can catch good fire. fried look, chicken look at uh look at middlebrooks middlebrooks had the game of his life last night mm-hmm. um or I can't say the, the game of the game of the year so far. The guy averages five points per game or whatnot. Comes off and has twenty one or twenty two or some shit like that. Uh, but Middlebrooks, you know, it's sensational being able to help NC State continue their little uh, run at this thing. I think it's gonna. You know, you know I, I don't think I don't think Purdue or Marquette falls today. But what I am curious out of, to see out of Purdue or Marquette, which one would you could you see falling? Purdue. Purdue. That's where I'm at. But 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 I'm curious to see I'm curious to see how they play. Because that, that to me that's going to be a direct indicator on how they play what would that be? That would be on Sunday. Because like you said that that's the beauty of this is okay, you win yesterday. How do you adjust? How do you yeah, adapt? You, you right. don't have a lot of time. You don't have a lot of time. And and that's just one of the many beauties of this. And I think that's why this tournament gets turned upside down so often. And, and that's the beauty of it. And and yeah. Yeah, the, the, those two teams, if they're flat, 
it's going to be an early exit. So here's if the, if they don't if they don't lose today, if they don't the crazy lose, thing. like if Marquette drops, if Marquette drops, NC State could actually make a run and keep going. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Do you believe that shit? Yeah. Yep. Yep. It's amazing what if it's, if you can survive the first the initial, first weekend. The first weekend yep. You actually have a chance. That's that that's really the whole thing. It's like you know we. We put all the stock in, in how cool it is to, to, to watch and and fuck off two days of work or whatever, you know, doing this stuff. Rob thinks Marquette's going to be in the Final Four. <laughs> I think Rob's wrong. I, I mean, they got the squad, I mean, Rob. Maybe. Rob, they do got the squad. I'm just I'm, – I'm sheerly going off of the underperformance level of Shaka Smart. Yeah. And him – his inability to make sound decisions in clutch key coaching moments. Yeah. And, and drawing stuff up. But, no, I – Rob, I agree with you. I think they got, they got the Joes, for sure. Mm-hmm. They got the Joes, the pros and the Joes. Yeah, that's right. That's right. All right. See our man. Let's bring in Jeff Howe. Jeff, what's going on, my guy? What's going on, fellas? Can you hear Hi. us? Yeah. Are you hearing a buzzing sound? No. Sounds like a golden shower, man. I'll We're tell good. you. Oh, I'll tell you. Hey, go God. four more hours. I, I like my limited. I like asking you questions based on my limited knowledge of NASCAR, knowing that I haven't watched NASCAR and I don't know a good 15 years. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I kind of felt like, you know, you remember the first time, like when you found out wrestling was what it was when like you know, <laughs> kayfabe died, I Yo, found yeah. that out this week because I had no idea. Like I love the Dale Earnhardt, Jeff Gordon rivalry and everybody took sides, right? Like I was a big oh, Jeff Gordon fan. Yeah. My they were buddies. Dale Earnhardt fan, and now I find out that they were like really good friends and hung out and just played up the rivalry in front of the camera. I'm like, dude, it's like kayfabe and NASCAR just died. Like, what the hell, Jeff? Th- those guys were actually like business partners. Yeah, they they revolutionized the NASCAR merchandising industry with diecasts and all of that shit. Yeah, yeah. they they were they were joined at the hip. Those guys were tight, but like oh, yeah. on the track, it was like, all right, in front of the camera, let's pretend we hate each other, but behind the scenes, well, and like Jeff Gordon was my favorite driver, but I'm I'm unearthing facts, like if you know, there I've I've seen some people like I've even gone like doing some rabbit hole deep dives with some forums where people are like, hey, people don't realize the depth Jeff Gordon went to to pretty much make NASCAR what it was because he yep. could have been selfish. And hog the glory, but everything he was doing in his garage from a technology standpoint, all that was going into, into the car he owned into Jimmy Johnson's car, which is why yeah. Jimmy Johnson was the force that he was, was because Jeff Gordon didn't hog all that knowledge for himself. He passed it yeah. on to Jimmy Johnson and made Jimmy Johnson what he was. Yeah. And I'll tell you, Jeff, one of the I think one of the biggest things class himself, Jimmy Johnson. Yeah. I'll tell you one of the one of the biggest um things that ever happened was when Rick Hendrick got Jeff Gordon from Ford because in the Bush series at the time, he was a Ford driver. So Hendrick's able to pull him over. But at one point there were lucrative offers on the table for Jeff Gordon to go to formula one. The fact that, wow, that formula one was not able to get him, I think set them back, you know, now it's a big push here in North America, but the fact that if they would have imagined that in the, in the early nineties, Jeff Gordon to formula one with the success that he was capable of having, you think formula one is huge now? My goodness. That'd be massive. Massive. Yeah. There there's, there's that. I I had no idea about that, Rodney. Thank you for dropping that knowledge on me. Yeah. Um, You know, and, and Jack brings that up. Jeff Gordon got, he being from California. I always said, Rodney, you know, as a Cowboys fan, people are like, well, if Jimmy and Jerry had just, you know, gotten along, whatever. My thing is, can you imagine still the be number of, of cup titles if Ray Everham and Jeff Gordon would have stayed together? The the records those two would have set would yep. be untouchable right now. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Probably See, another. Right, man, I know. I got a little. I got a little NASCAR knowledge, oh, dude. You're good. We will we'll have to bring you out here next time, Jeff. <laughs> Come on, we'll get in the damn trucks here, Jeff. We'll drive in the truck series. Hey, man. Uh, Jeff Gordon's a hell of a. You mentioned the Formula One deal. Jeff Gordon was a hell of a road course racer back in oh, yeah. the day. So, oh yeah, unbeatable at makes, one point. Makes total sense. Yeah, at one point. I uh, boys, I gotta catch a shuttle and get out of here, man. <laughs> go for it, Wags. Go for it, Wags. Uh, Rodney, I told you. I told you about the. Uh, text the computer support place i worked at one summer while i was in college and this dude 
is one of the supervisors. I'm pretty he didn't admit it, but you could tell dude had a gambling problem. He, he had bet like a three driver parlay on a road uh road course race one weekend. I've yeah. never seen somebody so excited for Marcos Ambrose to win a win a road course <laughs> race than my supervisor was at the computer. Yeah, okay. that's right. Mar- Marcus Ambrose, that was uh that's quite the character there uh, like, at one point as well. I was like, Travis, you, you got a problem. You might want to get that checked out, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, like Wax said, like Otani is an Otani guy. Yeah, man. That's uh it's getting nasty. I'm I'm, I'm scared to think how I, I hope that thing is only on the surface of what, what really it is and you don't have to dig too far and unearth some stuff about Otani that we don't want to find out, but yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, that's kind of what I'm worried about. Yeah, man. That's what I'm worried about. It's usually, usually where there's smoke, there's fire. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Guys, don't forget NASCAR coded.com. You can still get your tickets for uh, today, Saturday, Sunday, Echo Park automotive grand prix. That's happening right here uh, at Coda. Uh, Xfinity Series and trucks tomorrow on the track. You'll have cup qualifying, all of that, all the uh, information you need, NASCAR at Coda.com. And we thank Coda for having us out um, this morning. Gentlemen, um, you guys have a great show, a great weekend, and uh, see if Texas can uh, keep rolling in the big dance. Thank you for keeping your pants on during the broadcast, Rodney. It's greatly appreciated. (laughs) You got it, brother. You got it, man. (laughs) All right, let's do it. It's a Friday. It's only an hour. It's Jeff. It's Jordan. Jordan, did we bore you enough with the NASCAR talk? Yeah, uh, I got a couple NASCAR shirts. I'm actually, I'm not wearing one right now. No, I'm not wearing one right now. But, uh, yeah, I couldn't, you, you can't pay me to watch cars go in a circle. Man, back back in the day, me and my buddies, we would we would, well, of course, I was in college, so you know, on Sunday, what's better than you know, go buy some sixty nine cent tacos from Taco Bell, drink whatever beer is left in the fridge, and watch the NASCAR race. Well, that's how we passed the time back in the day, Jordan. Well, uh, it used to be it used to be Sunday, non football Sundays. I used to look forward to the binge drinking and NASCAR. Now on some non football Sundays, I really look forward to the golf nap. Put some golf on the TV, pass out from that golf nap about 45 minutes or an hour, wake up refreshed, feeling ready to go. Yeah, no, uh, not not there yet myself. But man, if I ever if I ever get into NASCAR, that I, that'll mean I'm in a dark place. So if anyone's listening to this and you ever see me watching NASCAR, please uh, do something. Man, CB, I don't know. I don't know if they are. I, I don't. I mean, I don't have Sark's uh, itinerary with me. But you know, let me he, ask. Sark is Sark is all over the place, man. He's anytime he's got a chance to to promote the program. I mean, I saw he did the deal with Stephen A. Smith at South by Southwest. Man, Sark is Sark is not shy about getting out and about. I I'll say that he's. That's another area where he's very, very, very different from Charlie Strong and even Tom Herman. Tom would do some of that stuff, but man, Sark has no problem just being. He get he understands what being the Texas head coach is all about. Jordan, you gotta you gotta do the the dog and pony show bit. He also he understands what um, I don't. Know. He understands what he can get out of these things by doing them. Like for example, the the Pivot podcast. I watch that a lot of a lot of these recruits and kids aren't sitting down and watching podcasts, but they're seeing clips of it on social media. So mm-hmm. and the, the pivot specifically does an amazing job with their social branding and, and how they roll everything out. And uh, no, I'm not a fan of the left turn, but, um, you know, he, he also went on busting with the boys. I was going to say, I thought he did that. The, podcast. That's yeah, that's my favorite podcast. Personally, I've listened to that since like the third episode. Um, and then Stephen A. Uh, a lot of kids couldn't tell you what the hell exactly Stephen A. does, but they know who he is. I'll tell you that much. You know what I mean? They know who he is. So Sark isn't stupid. He's purposefully going on these things, I think, you know, to – I don't want to say come off as a cool coach, but, you know, if you really want to dumb it down, that's the best way to describe it is you come off as a cool coach. You know what relatable. I mean? Relatable. You're relatable. I think it's the same reason why – he obviously was getting a check to do it, but I think a similar reason why Nick Saban was on Pat McAfee every week. You know what I mean? Um, you weren't you weren't seeing Gary Patterson go on shows at TCU. You weren't seeing 
uh, Stoops do it. You don't see Venables do it. You know, Daryl I mean? mentions so, it perfectly in the chat. It's free marketing. It, exactly. Yeah, that, that's a much better way of d describing what I'm trying to say. But yeah. but I think Sark just understands that. And I mean, look, the, the University of Texas is in the city of Austin where uh, there's South by it's growing media hub. I mean, everyone watching this knows what, what type of city Austin is and what it can bring you from, uh, you know, an influencer standpoint, I guess. I absolutely hate using that word, but I had to. Um, you, you and me both. And so, you know, that that being said, I think Sark's incredibly smart for, you know, all the different shows and talk shows he goes on. I, I know it's obviously always going to be a little restricted, you know, with him being the head coach of Texas and probably CDC standing behind the camera and all these shows you see. But, um, you know, he he's smart about it. And, you know, I think I think kids pick up on it and they watch it and they pay attention to it. And, um, you know, I, I've never asked this specific question, like where would you list Sark amongst like other head coaches that are recruiting you like? You know, how, basically just like of your cool list of head coaches, where would Sark be? I've never asked that. But the way kids talk about him, um, the vibe he gives off, especially, you know, once they're able to sit down in his office and talk with him for 20, 30 minutes, uh, a lot of them seem to really gravitate towards him for, for a head coach. And he, he just seems, um, you know, in today's day and age, the uh, kind of Tom Herman, Urban Meyer style coaches of being a yeah. hard ass and, you know, walking in the hallway, acting like you're not there, giving you shitty eggs or whatever. That shit is gone and going <laughs> extinct. It, it's endangered because what? you can't you can't cuss out a kid nowadays oh. and not have the thought in your back of your head. I can't be too mean and hurt his feelings because he could go in the portal. And then my job gets a lot harder. You know what I mean? So I think yeah. Sark, all these things that he's doing, um, I think it's kind of. I don't want to say setting the pace, but I think a lot of coaches are going to realize five, ten years from now, you got to adapt coaching styles and you got to be more, more media friendly, more personable, and you know just do what yeah. you can to get your name and your your university's brand out there. Sark, Sark is media friendly with the right people. He needs to be media friendly with, like you mentioned, he does the Pivot podcast. He did busting with the boys. Uh, you know he'll do he'll do some stuff with Joel Klatt. Uh, you know, who, whoever he'll, he'll do, uh, he does the deal with, uh, he goes on Greg McElroy's podcast and Greg McElroy does a good podcast that, uh, has the YouTube, uh, element to it as well. The other thing Sark will do is, you know, that's why I, again, I mentioned it the other day when we got our kind of our site, got our own little one-on-one -on -one with Sark for, you know, YouTube purposes. I, I didn't do it for Horns 24 seven. I just passed it on to Josh Pate because that's. It may it made more sense, I thought, for all parties. Like it's it's getting the network in our site quality content because it's Josh Pate talking to Sark, but it's also getting the Texas brand out there. I'm not disrespecting our brand at all. I love what we do at Horns 24-7, but on the YouTube platform, Josh yeah. has by far a bigger audience. So yeah, more, yeah, more eyeballs. Yeah. And, and another thing that's great about Sark and all these, I guess, honor hits he does is Look, Sark is a uh, he's got to be at the top of the list, if not the top spot for who these people want to interview from head coaches in college. Because think about it. He has a unique story to tell. You know, the alcoholism part of his story. That's unique. Everywhere he's been, he's been in the NFL. Uh, he's coached players at Alabama that, you know, created or shaped the modern day NFL to uh, Mac Jones, Jalen Hurts, you know, all those different guys, Devontae mm -hmm. Smith. He has stories to tell that other guys don't, and he's actually oh. pretty personable. You know, he comes out of his shell, uh, not 1,000%, but he's coming out of his shell for a lot of these on-air hits, and, you know, that's a gold mine. Anytime you can get stories out of an actual coach and not just coach talk, people want to listen to that. Like, the main reason podcasts and everything is blown up in the sports world, especially in the football world, is because people want to find out more about athletes, you know. Um, people always talk about taking the helmet off the athlete in football. I mm -hmm. think it's – you know, the same thing with coaches. People want to find out more about coaches. And Sark actually has some unique stories to tell. So as long as he's in Austin, as long as he's winning at Texas and is a winning head coach at uh, one of, if not the biggest brains in college football, every single podcast show personality you can think of is going to be wanting to interview this guy. And as long as Sark keeps it up, it's only going to, you know, pay dividends. I, I think you look to at the the high level coaches, the championship caliber coaches that have that kind of personality that aren't in college football anymore. You know, Urban Meyer isn't in college football anymore. 
Nick Saban is not an active head coach. You, know, you, you can go on down the list. You know, Pete Carroll's long since gone. It, it, with Nick Saban retiring, man, that title, the, the top of the totem pole is kind of open for, okay, which coach is going to kind of be the personality or the face of college football? Hell, man, it, it, it might be Sark. It might, it, it, and Jim Harbaugh's off to the NFL now. It might be Sark. Maybe it's Sharon Moore. Maybe it's Ryan Day. Maybe it's sure is, Sark. I don't know. Sure as hell ain't Dabo. He would have had about no. four years too late. But, but you know, Dabo, Dabo appeals to there are certain recruits, certain families, certain portion of the college football fan base that Dabo appeals to. Likewise, and I have, I, look, I'm a Christian. I have no, zero problem with what Dabo Swinney does, but understand what he does and the way he does it. It's going to rub some people the wrong way. Yeah. Uh, you know, Sark, and, and in the day of NIL, he's going extinct with those strategies. Sorry to cut you off, but no, hey, it's, it's an endangered strategy. Kids could give a shit if you're hitting them over the head with the Bible. If school 200 miles south wants to give you 200K a year. I think, with, like I said, I think with some with some kids, it works. Uh, it, 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 it's a great it's the recruiting tool that's, that's going to get them there. You know, we, we talked about it with Cade Klubnik. I mean, Cade Klubnik. Love uh, Dabo Swinney and and the pitch from Clemson. And there's some kids where it's gonna Clemson is gonna be the spot for them. And but there's some kids where, not to say that it's it's gonna turn them off, but it's it's not gonna matter all that much. Like you said, it's gonna people kids are gonna pick schools for different things. But I digress. But you know whether like I said whether it's Sark or or Ryan Day or Lincoln Riley. There's really we're kind of seeing of a changing of the guard of coaches in college football. You know, Kalen DeBoer is a guy that now has to be in that conversation. I mean, when you're talking about active coaches now, Jordan, that have won a national championship, Jimbo Fisher's out of that equation because Jimbo's not an active coach anymore. I mean, who are we really talking about? We're talking about Kirby Smart. We're talking about Mac and Dabo Swinney. Okay, I think if you had to power rank those coaches of which one is kind of the face, the top of the totem pole in terms of college coaches right now. Yeah, Kirby Smart's a pretty good pick if you're going to put somebody in the number one spot. But Mac's not moving the needle anymore. And like I said, Dabo's kind of carved out his own niche and for lack of a better term on my part, isn't really a threat to the throne. So there's there's room for guys to move up in that pecking order. It really is. We're in a kind of a unique time in college football for a lot of reasons, but I think for coaches, there's really – other than Kirby Smart, there's no coach right now, and Clemson, especially since Clemson's kind of slipped back a little bit, there's no coach right now that who you expect to compete for national championships every year that you feel like is a proven commodity that's going to do it year in and year out. It's pretty, it's pretty wide open at this point. Yeah, um, and I mean Kirby Smart would be who I go after. I feel like that's pretty easy choice for number one but after that it's a hodgepodge you know yeah that might the the verbiage you use and again i hate putting words in your mouth always please correct me if i'm doing that incorrectly but i think it's almost as easy as if, if you just ask yourself the question like you're you're an ad you're a school president you're a decision maker at big state you mm -hmm. you you just got a college football program you're starting a football program from scratch you have unlimited funds You've got to go hire a head coach. Who's your first call of, of the of the active head coaches in college football? Kirby. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I think it's I don't know that it's much of an argument against Kirby Smart at number one. Yeah. Yep. I'm gonna go get Cal Shanahan to be my OC. <laughs> I'll Man, make him say no. There's there's certain guys that are cut out for certain levels of football. And, you know, in the interest of full disclosure, I do a podcast with Rod Babers. Rod is good friends with Kyle Shanahan. We've talked about it on the Blitz. Like, I, I don't think Kyle Shanahan could stand to be in college football because he's just one of those guys that just is a – if Kyle, like Kyle Shanahan's ideal work day is sitting in the film room with a spiral notebook and just crushing film for like 18 hours. Like, that's what Kyle Shanahan wants to do. And as a college football coach, you know, you really can't do that. I think to kind of get, you know, into more of the nitty gritty with Sark, I think that's why, Jordan, that's why Sark has to call plays because in this, you know, this world where he, as the head coach at Texas, you've got to wear so many hats. It's almost like he, it, it's almost like 
you know, people need water, plants need water to live. You know, th- people, we need air to breathe. Sark needs to have play calling because he's got to have something that draws him back to this is why you coach football. This is why you do what you do. This really centers you. And I think, too, that's why he's so hands on and involved in recruiting as much as he is. Uh, you know, he it would be really easy to as a head coach of Texas to just let your assistants do the work and then stand back and be the closer. But Sark doesn't want to do that. Yeah, he doesn't want. He's talked about it a lot before. He doesn't want you know the GAs or uh, people in the the personnel department, people in the recruiting department, sending you know blanket text messages for him. Like he wants to be the guy that communicates with recruits whenever he can. And it's 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 funny that he's using the word obsession. That that's kind of the theme for the twenty twenty four team because I've said that with Sark. Like we don't hear about Sark. I mean, you, you look. I said this about Arch Manning a couple of weeks ago when uh, I was talking to Brad Crawford from our national desk about, you know, when Arch opted out of the football game, the video game. And I was like, that probably never even got to Arch. You know, he's just enjoying being a friend, a, a, co- a college student. And, you know, if Arch Manning was getting into some stuff, Jordan around town, like we, we would have heard something, you know? Yeah. It's way too high of, high, high of a profile to not do that. Likewise, if you heard about Sark doing stuff, something nefarious, like we would hear about it. Like we would hear specifics. And I think Sark is quite frankly, like boring in the best way possible because football is kind of his healthy obsession. It's, you know, I don't know if he has any hobbies. I don't know. You know, he doesn't strike me as a big hunter fisher. Maybe he is. I don't know, but it's like his, his hobby is football. Like this is what he does. It's, it's the healthy obsession for him. So I know that's a really long, long road around to get back to what we're talking about, which you tie all that together, man. Sark has a chance to get himself in the mix to be the answer to that question that I asked. You're you're overseeing a startup football program, need to hire a coach. Who's your first call? Right now it's Kirby Smart. I, you know, Sark is on the periphery of that discussion right now. Yeah. So did Charlie Strong try to hire Shanny as OC? No, actually, funny enough, Charlie Strong tried to hire Tom Herman as his OC year <laughs> one. Oh, uh, man. Is he sh- I'll tell you what. He should have done that. Um, Because that would have saved Texas a lot. I don't. Time. I don't a lot of him. time. I don't recall him, CB, trying to hire Kyle Shanahan. I've slept since then, but I don't recall that. He wanted to hire Chad Morris, but Chad Morris was the OC at Clemson at the time and had pretty much you knew Chad Morris was going to be a head coach and it was going to be a seven-figure a seven figure contract for an OC. Basically, you were going to rent him for one year. And uh, – from what I remember, Steve Patterson basically told Charlie, yeah, that's not going to happen. It's a non-starter. Hire Chad Morris as your OC. And I, yeah. I was privy to some of the discussions that went on with uh, the intermediaries between Texas and Tom Herman at the time for the OC job. And I, I think Tom was interested. I just don't think at that point he could leave Ohio State. You know, he was getting JT Barrett. He had Zeke Elliott. He had... Look at that 2014 Ohio State offense, man. That, that deal was chock full of dudes that went on to be first-round picks and all pros, and it was a pretty loaded Ohio State team. I just don't think Tom was was ready to leave, and uh, you know, I, I think he could kind of sense that if he had that one that one big year at Ohio State, which they ended up having, uh, he 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 basically bet on himself and won because he got the Houston job a year later. So, yeah. Um... <laughs> Boy, Rex, I'll tell you what, man, to end up with Sean Watson, that was, you know, like we, I've, everybody's critical in some way, shape or form, or you question like staff hires. And we talked about how Sark has knocked, knocked his initial staff hires out of the park. I hated the Sean Watson hire when it was suggested. I hated the Sean Watson hire even more when he was hired. I hated the Sean Watson hire even more when I watched his offense on the field. And I hated the Sean Watson hire even more when he came back for another year. I was never on board with that hire at all. Hated it, hated it, hated it. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, no, I don't even remember what years he was there. I was too young. 
Um, 14 and 15. Yeah, very. It's also just like the most forgettable time of Texas football of all time. So Yeah, Rex, not a not a not a fan. I always say, man, if Sean Watson saw me again, he probably punched me in the face because I was not too kind to him. But how, you know the how last, did, go ahead. How does he spell Sean? S H A W N. Sean. That's how my stepdad does it. Oh yeah. 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 The one of the last times uh Rex that we talked to Sean Watson did a press conference with him is when he uh he basically pulled the you remember when T.O. Owens after the Cowboys lost that playoff game when T.O. cried about Tony Romo and said that was his quarterback, and when everybody makes fun of him, that's not fair. That's pretty much what Sean Watson did while defending Tyrone Swoops during a press conference. And then they went out and got their head bashed in by Notre Dame. Or not Notre Dame. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, by Notre Dame in, uh, in South Bend. And then the following Tuesday, Charlie Strong comes in and says Sean Watson's no longer going to play as Jay Norvell to play caller. So... It's very rare, Jordan, that you go into the second week of the season being like, all right, this this just became a season where you're not thinking about what's going to happen a few weeks from now. It is, it is not only a week-to-week proposition. It's day-to-day around here, which is what it was for Texas at that point. Uh, so CB brings up a question about Sean Watson and quarterback offers. There was a camp that would have been the summer of – was that their first summer or their second summer? I, I think it was their second summer, summer of 15. Or no, 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 no. Hold on. Let me think. This would have been summer 2014. Yes. Um, They had Texas had Shane Bouchelle. I'm trying to remember all the quarterbacks. Shane Bouchelle, Shea Patterson, Jalen Hurts. Uh, and they'd offered Shea Patterson because he was a class ahead of those guys. It's like the fucking Jalen Hurts <laughs> clan was... of misfit toys. There was somebody else who was and Jalen Hurts, <laughs> but yeah, Sean Watson worked all of them out. Uh, he might have worked Sam out too at that camp. I mean, I want to say was Sean Robinson there? Maybe I forget, but yeah, he didn't offer. They didn't offer Jalen Hurts, and uh, they offered Shane Bouchelle instead. Which man, I. Shane Bouchelle, he's an NFL quarterback. He's backing up Patrick Mahomes in Kansas City. But Shane Bouchelle wasn't a bad quarterback. It's just, you know, I, I don't, you know, you can go revisionist history, man. But, Jordan, I'll be honest, man, there was so much about Jalen Hurts that we didn't know because nobody really could cover his recruitment. Hank could probably maybe tell you about this from an Alabama standpoint. But, like, I, I went to the Rosenberg 7-on-7 seven seven that Channel View played in. This was going into, I think it was going into maybe Jalen's junior year. It's a and, SQT. Yeah. And every question I asked Jalen Hurts about recruiting, like we talked about team and, you know, you breaking the ice and whatnot. Every question I asked him about recruiting was, well, you have to talk to my dad or you'd have to ask my dad about that. Well, my dad's handling that. And it was all like, all right, well, I'm, you know, what I'm, I'm just kind of, wasting my time here and it wasn't any disrespect to him it was just his dad was handling the recruitment he didn't divulge anything publicly and nobody really kind of knew what was going on with Jalen Hurts's recruitment but pretty much once Bama offered it was it was done as far as I remember yeah also like I don't know I know Texas fans are always looking back like we could have had Jalen Hurts or like how Jameis Winston wanted to go to Texas or whatever. I, like, I think the like, Jameis Winston g- thing g- is BS. Yeah, I think the Jameis Winston thing is BS. But also, like, Jameis Winston isn't going to be Jameis Winston under Charlie Strong. And Jalen Hurts isn't going to be Jalen Hurts under Tom Herman. Like, you're out of your mind if you actually do. Or Charlie you, J- or whatever. Jalen Hurts in a Tom know. Herman offense, what a, uh, that would have worked. As much quarterback run as Tom has in his offense, that. Okay. Uh, Jalen My Hurts, thing, I, I, I struggle to believe that Jalen Hurts would achieve the success he's achieved so far. Is it what he is an NFL MVP? He won it, right? Hurts won. No, Hurts in an MVP. Okay, whatever. You, you get what I'm saying. I yeah, don't yeah, think yeah. he has the career he has if he's at Texas, and that's no shot to Texas. It's just who the fuck would have been coaching him? You yeah. know what I mean? Like he had Sark at Bama. 
and Lincoln Riley at yeah. OU. Like, yeah, Lane, yeah, Lane come Kiffin, on. Too. He had Lane Kiffin yeah, like, for like, a year. Come, yeah. like, come on. Um, he's not – like uh, uh, we're basically expecting me to coach him and him to end up in the NFL too if, if we're wanting him to – like you know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I get it. And the Texas offense uh, really up until – up until – Sam kind of found himself, so to say, as a quarterback. Uh, and you kind of started to believe in Sam. Dude, the Texas offense from Colt to really from, from the time Colt got hurt against Bama until probably Sam's game against OU in 2018, dude, the Texas offense was a cluster, dude. It was an S show of epic proportions. Like you didn't you didn't know from one year to the next what you were gonna get in hell, like especially during that the Charlie Strong years and Tom Herman's first year, dude. You didn't know from game to game what you were gonna get on offense. Hey, I'll tell you what though, that that Texas Cal game where Nick Rose shanks PAT. I was just thinking. I was. I, 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 I could have sworn ninety percent of the Texas fan base thought thought they had something in Jerron Hurd because I sure as fuck dude. did. However old I was, I'm like breaking all Vince Young's records first start. Pfft. Hey man, come look. And this guy on the other side's the number one pick, Jared. Goff. You you look. At I, that. I knew then. I knew then. Jared Goff was a bust. I, I knew then because he had all the number one pick hype. Like it had started like week one. I yeah. Think Texas played him week two. That might have been week one. I don't remember. It was a week three. It was week three because Texas yeah. went. Uh, that schedule went at Notre Dame, Rice at home, and then they Cal came in. Yeah, because I remember just being like to my dad at this game, like. Yo, this Jared Goff, <laughs> what? But hey, man, I'll, you know, I'll never forget just seeing really Nick quick, Rose's. Just, I know this will fire. This will fire up CB. You know when Jared Goff has been at his worst as a pro. Think about it. He's been good, except the time he spent playing quarterback under Jeff Fisher. Yeah, and I mean, I don't know. We also would throw his ass in a box too. Or I say we as a 49ers fan. 49ers would have his ass in a box a lot of the time, even after McVay came in. True. But he's so. hey man, he, he won a playoff game with the he got the Detroit Lions to the to the NFC championship game. Yeah, no, I'm just uh t- a diabolical hater right. to my blood. I can't anyway. The Nick Rose Mr. Loki. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll I'll never get that image out of my head because the 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 tickets we had, I think I think that was our last year with season tickets, I'm pretty sure. Because we were in our normal seats then in section two, row 10, mm-hmm. where I ha- I'm having a front uh, or great view of this, this PAT sailing. So, dude, uh, you know, you know what's funny about that PAT? Hmm. I, I missed it. I didn't see it because you're just looking was, down. You assumed it was going in. I was sitting in the because remember, they used to have those the, the metal bleachers in the south end, and mm-hmm. I found a spot to sit down and have my laptop with me. And I'm changing my game story on the fly, and I'm looking at my computer screen. I'm not looking up. And then I hear just like this collective. I hear like 100,000 people gasp at the same time, and I'm like, what happened? And somebody, and I hear, hear the students behind me going, no. And I'm like, what happened? And then that's when I find out he missed the extra point. I'm like, oh, yeah, you see the refs doing this. Yeah. Only, <laughs> only this team, man, only Charlie Strong, Texas football, could this happen where you have this great comeback, and then you, you bone the PAT. and, and don't win the game. Nick I remember he had a cup of coffee in the league, though, man. Man, I remember the next offseason, Nick Rose is posting these videos of him banging like 85 yard field goals. <laughs> and all the Texas fans <laughs> in the comments just like, go fuck yourself. <laughs> like, Nick Rose spent some time. Uh, he he should have known better. He should have known better. You can't, you can't do that. You can't shank a PAT because. It's from the two yard line, and then go and post you banging eighty five yarders when it's like hurricane winds at the Texas practice fields, <laughs> and not expect one of the fans to be like, "Hey, <laughs> you know what I mean?" I don't but, you, know. but you know what's funny though? Nick Rose wasn't the kicker in sixteen because he was gone. You remember who the Texas kicker was in twenty sixteen? Remember they got Trent Domain, the transfer from uh, LSU. Yeah. Uh, no. kinda, yeah, and they they did the backflip too. I remember that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Speaking of, yeah, LSU, I know they're doing trick shots. I'm still hating. Like you can't, you got to know where you stand. You can't shank a PAT to not send it in yeah. overtime and then expect Texas to be like, oh, Nick Rose, cool tricks. Like, no, 
speaking of LSU, yeah. didn't uh man, didn't Trey Holtz just get hired at LSU? Like in the person? he got hired somewhere because I, I saw yeah. it on a Zenith tweet. It's in the LSU last week. or AM. Some Trey Holtz, I believe, is employed somewhere in the SEC right now. Yeah, I'm I believe sure. you're correct. Where so was he punter or kicker? I think Anthony Farah was his name. Yeah. He was I remember both. him. Was yeah. okay. Cause I'm like, he was kind of from that era ish, right? Yeah. Uh Anthony Farah was a, a finalist for the Lou Groza Award. Yeah, Trey Holtz is a uh, uh assistant quarterbacks coach at LSU with Brian Kelly. That's yeah. what Trey Holtz is now. Uh yeah, uh I was thinking about Trey Holtz. Who are we talking about just now? Oh yeah, Anthony Fair. Anthony Fair oh, transferred. Mac Brown era. Yeah, he was 20, 2012, mm. 2013. Anthony Fair transferred in after the whole uh Sandusky mess at Penn State. And oh, Joe yeah. Paterno got fired. Yeah. When the Penn State guys were allowed to transfer, uh, Anthony Fair transferred to Texas. Because he was a he was a St. Pius, St. Pius kid from Houston. Shit, I drove by St. Pius last week. Um Man, the the goat specialist though, Michael Dixon, man. First, oh, man. first and only specialist I've ever seen win a bowl game MVP. Yeah, I thought I've covered, and maybe this is why they let me vote for the freaking Ray Guy Award, Jordan. I don't know if you know that, but I got to vote for the Ray Guy Award. I take that thing seriously. Mm. Um, I, I kid, I just uh, nobody. Uh, I I appreciate the vote for the Ray Guy Award, but um, when I was covering Baylor. I covered a guy that won the Ray Guy Award twice. Daniel Sepulveda won it twice at Baylor. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know. Baylor's best player program history. He, dude, he Daniel Sepulveda was the man. He actually was a fourth-round pick uh, by the Steelers. But tore, I think, tore one ACL and then tore another and just was never the same after a couple knee injuries. But Daniel Sepulveda was the best college punter I'd ever seen. I He was the rare punter, Jordan, that would punt the ball or on kickoffs and be the first guy down there to try to tackle the return guy. Like, because he he was a walk-on linebacker. He's a Highland Park kid. He's a walk-on linebacker and just kind of accidentally became the punter and won the Ray Guy Award twice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. With, uh, it, that uh, it's funny story because – uh, a lot of great Lake Travis alumni. Not not many bring up Cameron Dicker. And Cameron Dicker, what a lot of people actually don't know, he lived in China for a yeah. lot of the first few years of his life because his he had a younger sister, Annabelle, who uh, moved into my homeroom class in the third grade. Um, and her brother, Cam, was originally a soccer player. And then mm-hmm. when it was time for football, he hadn't played football. He's living in China. They don't play tackle football over there. Yeah. Uh, Lake Travis needed a kicker, so they went over to the soccer team and l- literally handpicked like three or four guys to come try out for a kicker. And Dicker was the best one. And then he went out for football the next year as a freshman and was Lake Travis's starting kicker as a sophomore. And yeah, uh, one of the best high school games I've ever been to in my life. It was Hudson Card's sophomore year. He was a receiver. Garrett Wilson was a junior. Matthew Baldwin, who is Lake Travis's quarterback, uh, ended up signing with Ohio State before transferring to TCU and later medically retiring. Yeah, One of the best Lake Travis teams we've ever seen. Nathan Perotti uh, was also a senior on that team. He ended up walking on at Arkansas and earning a was scholarship. That year, was that the year they won a state championship? Beat that Lord? was the year they went to state and lost to Allen. Um, okay, Baldwin they, got hurt. Yeah. yeah, but they played Cibolo Steel um, week two at home. And I don't think Caden Stearns was still on that team, if I remember correctly. But still was loaded. Jalen Jones is on that team. Um, it's like a sophomore. What 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 year was Stearns? Because that would have been 2017. Yeah, that would have been Caden Stearns' senior year. But he okay, might have been so, hurt, though, because I think Caden missed some games as a senior. Okay, I can't remember if he played in that game or not. But I do remember – I have a video on my phone of Cameron Dicker hitting like a 40-something yarder to walk off Cibolo Steel as time expired because that was Dicker's senior year. But, but, yeah, man, Dicker was originally a soccer player, and I don't know. I always love the stories like that because Hank Carter never needs a kicker. You know, what the hell is Dicker doing nowadays? You know what I mean? And how different is that Texas OU game in 2018 or whatever? But, Dude, it's uh, 
what's what's interesting is man i felt like cameron dicker especially his senior year at texas i thought he was a better punter than he was a place kicker uh i don't know about that i don't remember to be honest but um jordan was a kicker that would use a karate chop to line himself up honestly i don't remember i don't remember um maybe that that would make sense yeah but it is kind of wild how like texas two active kickers in the nfl are from 20 minutes apart from each other in westlake and lake travis and they're both well, i mean they're Dicker both is from china they're both interesting cats too oh yeah you talk to him you know like you talk to justin tucker it's not to say he's strange or odd or anything but just. Now he's a weird cat. Like you're out here making M's, banging sixty yarders, and you want to come sing choir on a piano. Like that's not normal. <laughs> and then Dicker, on the other hand, he's a pretty. I don't know. Like he's outgoing, funny, but he's a pretty normal guy. Like I don't know. Married my eighth grade history teacher's daughter. So so Cameron Dicker married the daughter of your eighth grade history teacher. All right. So that's a little. There- sick- it's a little six degrees to separate, or you could have you could do six degrees between Jordan and and Cameron Dicker. That his sister was in your homeroom class in third grade. Oh yeah. Okay. Yep. I got all the Lake Travis ties, man. <laughs> Make but, it, we'll see if those come in handy at some point, Jordan. Yeah. So uh, Texas, no, Tennessee. What are we? On, what real, are we looking? Real quick. Uh, CB mentioned that we were talking about Justin Tucker. And uh, I think Jack in the chat mentioned he went to school with Phil Dawson at Lake Highlands, and Phil Dawson played linebacker. Justin Tucker played a little bit of safety at Westlake back in the day, along with kicking and punting. So I played then, against a couple of Phil Dawson's sons in seven on seven growing up. But um, is he still? He's at Highland, not Highland Park, Hyde Park, right? Man, is he still there? I thought he, I thought he left and went to Regents. Well, I don't know why I thought that, but. Maybe he is still at, at uh, Hyde Park. <laughs> bro, I'm sorry. Hold in the Google machine. Bro, kid, pardon my language, but some kids and their families make the dumbest decisions. There's a four-star receiver at the Woodlands uh, in the 2025 class who just transferred to North Shore. There is no way in hell that is getting cleared. Like, absolutely no way in hell. Um, why? Why would you do that? Yeah, I feel like I'm watching the, the Cameron Dicker version of This Is Your Life. Uh, all right, Texas, Tennessee, Jordan. Yeah, Phil Dawson, by the way, is still at Hyde Park. Uh, Texas, Tennessee. I look, man, anytime we're talking about Texas, you look at any time Texas has lost a game this year, it usually boils down to the fact that they lose the battle with the backcourt that their guards get outplayed. And the Tennessee backcourt is no joke, man. So to me, it's all, can can Matt, can you get a more, you're going to need a consistent, productive night shooting the ball from Max Asmus. Tyrese Hunter just has to be a factor. He can't be a negative. I'm not saying he's got to go off for, you know, 15 points and six assists and five boards and three steals. But Tyrese Hunter's got to be a factor. He can't. What you got? No, I, I'm list. So the kid I was talking about that's transferring, um, pretty much everyone on the show is going to know who he is because his dad is Quan LX. You really? know, yeah. Um, okay. And his son, Quan LX Farrakhan Jr., is a four star receiver in the 25 class. And he's had a really interesting recruitment just because of who his dad is. Like, he'll get on campus and some reporter will post he's on campus and that whole fan base that will lose their shit. It's so stupid. But that's why AM has barely been able to recruit him. Um, I think he's talented. I'm not sure if he's a Texas-level receiver, to be honest with you. But he does have a lot of big-time offers, Penn State and some other stuff. But, like, there's no way this is getting cleared. There's just no way. And the reason I'm laughing is because a group chat I'm in with a couple other people are just <laughs> putting up shots right now. Jeez. Uh yes. So CB, Sorry for throwing that off though. No, Texas Tennessee. Uh <laughs> CB uh, Dalton Connect deserves a little more respect than that. Yeah, Dalton Connect is a big time scorer. Uh 
I think was he SEC Player of the Year? I think I, I, I haven't done all my Tennessee prep yet, but yeah, man. I mean, this is. I saw Rick Barnes had the quote like, if you asked him and you asked Rodney Terry if if they would both rather be playing somebody else, they'd say yes. I mean, I he, one guy doesn't want to knock the other one out of the tournament, but I, man, I I think that's just what it boils down to. Can the Texas guards at least make the backcourt battle a push? And then you get into the fact that, okay, if if you get that and Dylan DeSue stays out of foul trouble, you've got a chance to win the game. But if Tyrese Hunter's a negative and DeSue's in foul trouble or Max Aceman's isn't shooting the ball consistently, if two of those three things happen, you're done. So the margin for error is small, but there's a path for Texas to win this game Saturday. What time are they on? Seven o'clock. I'll, I, I think too. If this is a close game, if Texas if Texas can make this competitive, I think the other thing too is RT substitution patterns. You know, because there was a stretch last night when they really needed to to lock down on defense in the second half. Colorado State started to make a little bit of a push, and they went with more Brock Cunningham and Kendall Weaver over IT Horton and Dylan Mitchell, which at the time was the right call. I just wonder if, you know, you get to one of those stretches. I don't, Jordan, I don't want Texas to lose this game. And then we look at the box score and see that Kendall Weaver only played like 11 minutes. Yeah. You know, because you, yeah. you need his defense on the floor a lot. To- look, I'm no uh, basketball uh-oh. Especially Texas basketball, um, fanatic, or I don't know. I just, you know, I don't know it super well. I know the game of basketball incredibly well, but not this Texas team, right? You know, y- y'all get what I'm trying to say. But like the, the Kendall Weaver shit blows my mind. Like it's so obvious how much better the team is when he's on the court. And like I get he can't shoot worth a damn, but like. Uh, do we want to win games? You know what I mean? Like he needs to be playing more. Um, and I, I don't get what it is with him. I, I, I just don't get it because I remember seeing him. I watched Kendall Weaver play in high school and I watched him uh, his senior year at the state tournament in San Antonio. It was the first basketball games I'd gone to that year um, and watched all the semifinal games. Uh, he was there with Timberview. I forgot who they beat in the semis, but. Anyways, I remember asking all those basketball videographers that I met that weekend, like, how the hell does this albino looking kid not have offers? And all of them were like, we don't know. He's been the best player on the court for like the last three years in a row. He drops like 28 one of those games, and I'm just like dumbfounded, and he has nothing. And he ends up at UTA and then ends up portaling, but like, I don't get what else he has to do to like earn his respect and earn his minutes, like. Besides developing a jump shot, yeah, just like there's there's so much he does for you being on the court. And again, like my the the amount of Texas basketball I've watched this year is very minuscule, but I feel like that's just such uh, an obvious thing. And I mean, I know Chip and other people in the group chat are watching every game, and they're bitching and moaning about the same thing as well. So <laughs> I gotta I gotta be on to something, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, you're right. Um, I do. You know, you look at this game and the matchup problems that that Dalton connect is going to pose for Texas, you know, six, 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 two thirteen. Uh, I do think Kendall Weaver, not just because, not just because he's a, he's a freaking pit bull on defense, but he does have some length and his ability to jump. I do think he can match up on, on connect a little bit. He's your, he's your best on ball defender. Like I think he's a more consistent on ball defender at least than Tyrese Hunter is. And with his length, he's the guy that you probably want to check and connect whenever you can. But, you know, this Tennessee team, I mean, between the three guys that feel like, man, they've been there forever, Josiah Jordan James, who's uh, part of a really good front court there with Connect and uh, and Jonas Alt. Although, um, yeah, James is a, what is he, a fifth-year senior. Josiah Jordan James is a fifth-year senior. And then Zakai Ziegler, it's got to be a fifth year senior too. I'm waiting for this roster to low. Actually, how is the Kai Ziegler only a junior? Feels like he's been there as long as as long as Rick has. And then uh, Santiago Vescovi is a fifth year senior also. 
So this is a Tennessee team that's got some experience. Uh, they're pretty well rounded, but again, the there is a path for Texas to win this game. I just think the margin for error for Texas is so small. It's a lot has to go right for them to win this game tomorrow. It can, but you're asking a lot. Oh yeah. Um, hey man, made it to the second round, which is uh, further than uh, where they've gone most of my lifetime. So you know, but recently. You- you say that Jordan, like it, it's, it's funny. Like I, I looked this up and I think Texas Scott McConnell, the SID actually mentioned it in the notes last night. This is the third season in a row that they've won at least one game in the NCAA tournament. It's the longest stretch this program's had of at least one March madness win since they did it four years in a row. Oh, six to oh nine. So it, I, I think it just depends on what, through what prism are you viewing Texas basketball? Are you viewing it on what it what you feel it could be and should be, or are you viewing it on what history tells you it is? If you're viewing it on what it could be and should be, yeah, it's not it's not anything to really brag about. If you're viewing it though through the prism of okay, historically, yeah, this is a good year for Texas, then you're probably satisfied thinking it's 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 a pretty good year. You, know, you get to 20 wins. You finish 500 in the Big 12. You don't have a losing record. You you win a game in the tournament. Yeah, it's pretty pretty solid year. Yeah. Um, this is wanna... the year where I would say, man, this is this is the this is where the, the the bar is set. Like this is this is the the minimum expectation. Go win a tournament game. Position yourself to go win a game in the second week. To go and win a game again in the second weekend. Oh yeah. Um. You want to talk some recruiting, some football, maybe the last couple of minutes we got left? Uh, we, we can do one or two things. You tell me which one you want to do. Do you want to you want to run down some recruiting stuff or you want to talk about this SEC schedule? Uh, well, we'll do some recruiting stuff just because this weekend um, we got a big seven on seven tournament in Houston that I'll be driving to here actually in about a couple hours. Um, Is that the OT7 tournament? No, so OT7 is going to be the April 6th and 7th and 13th and 14th weekends in Dallas. But I'll also be at, uh, should be at at least the first weekend, the second weekend, I'll either be there or in Nashville. But um, uh, but this Saturday and Sunday is the Battle Houston tournament. So oh, nice. From all over the country, we'll have teams there. Um, I'll be there Saturday only though, unfortunately, because Sunday is the elite 11 regional in Austin. Uh, it'll be at Westlake elite 11 does about 20 regionals across the country, but this one is a pretty big deal because they do this thing called all 22 at four of those regionals Mm -hmm. and all 22 is it's effectively Nike's version of the Under Armour camps um, where it's, more testing, more one-on-one drill work. Everything's recorded. All that, all that data is sent off to schools, just like the Under Armour camps as well. So, uh, some more exposure to some guys, and then also, um, I had reported it back when I was in Atlanta uh, for Under Armour a couple weeks ago, and I talked to KJ Lacey then. But uh, he was a possibility to be coming in this weekend. He was going to try to throw out Elite Eleven, just because there's not one that's necessarily super close to Mobile. And then also try to come down for a visit as well. And that is going to end up happening. Um, still figuring out the exact details of when he is actually going to come stop by campus. But, uh, I mean, I'll shoot him another text sometime today or something like that. But, uh, yeah, he'll be in this weekend. That's who we'll be covering. And then there'll also be a nice. lot of the other top guys from around the state there as well. But, um, yeah, and right now, as we speak, actually, uh, it's pretty big, important time or not not super important but quite important uh for texas they got um i mean these are the five biggest names they've they've got about two to three dozen kids on campus right now but uh, they're all with the california power developmental program um and if you've ever heard of them they do seven on seven and five on five five on five is the offensive and defensive line version of seven on seven effectively uh where it you know looks like it sounds um really big on the west coast uh it's starting to get big on the east coast and you know eventually it'll be big in texas um but 
Cali Power, they've got uh, both 7-on-7 seven seven and the 5-on-5 five five team visiting today in Austin. They flew all those kids into Austin last night, had them stay at a hotel, and they're visiting Texas right now. They'll be visiting till about 5 o'clock. After that, they're going to get on a bus and drive to Houston. The 7-on-7 seven seven team will be playing in the tournament I'll be at tomorrow, and then the 5-on-5 five five team will be in some 5-on-5 five five tournament at Klein Kane. Um, which I might try to stop by as well. I'm not sure if I'll be able to fit it into my schedule, though. But uh, of the guys visiting today, the biggest names are Brandon Brown, who's a composite four-star from Florida. Also, Texas commit defensive tackle. That'll be his first ever time visiting Texas, actually. Yeah. You know, even though he committed back in December, uh, this is his first ever time at Texas. Uh, he committed back then to Bo Davis, so... You know, since Bo Davis has left, Hank and I have done our best job to kind of clarify that uh, this is a pretty, pretty soft verbal commitment <laughs> yeah. he, he currently has. Um, I'm and, not – me personally, I'm not – and I don't have any inside information or anything. I don't feel good about Brandon Brown being a part of the class when, when the oh, dust settles. No. Um, and I'm not sure if I've actually written this, but, yeah, I don't – I, 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 since Bo Davis left, I, even when he gave his commitment, I did not feel like this would be a guy who, you know, just recruitments like these usually don't end up, you know, finishing where they're at. Uh, another big name is Matai Tagoi, or however you say his name. He's from uh, San Clemente High School in California, uh, originally from Vegas, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we have him listed as a linebacker, bit of a tweener type. He's 6'4", 190, and can play pretty much uh, everything in the front seven except for – you know, interior defensive line. Um, so, again, listed as a linebacker, but could end up being kind of a – I hope no one cringes to this, but could end up being kind of a Tassili Akana type. Um, so, he's interesting, and he's our number 71 player in the country. And then Josh Petty, it'll be his first time ever at Texas. Uh, he's from Georgia and is our number 14 player in the 2025 class and our number two offensive tackle in the 2025 class. Uh, honestly, not expecting to hear a ton out of this trip with him. Again, it's his first time in Texas. Uh, the schools for him have been Auburn, Clemson, Georgia, and Tennessee. He's been getting recruited since his freshman year. been visiting those schools since his freshman year. So Texas will have to push pretty damn hard to, to yeah. really be a contender in that. And then another one, uh, Lincoln Cure from uh, Goodland, Kansas. He's our number two tight end in the nation, number 27 overall prospect. Uh, three crystal balls in for K-State. They've actually done a really good job of recruiting him, even though, you know, he's a five-star. A lot of people are going to doubt that he's actually going to stay home in Kansas State. But, uh, again, Kansas State has done a phenomenal job. And believe it or not, uh, the Kansas State's NIL collective, like it, it obviously won't ever be able to compete with a school like Texas or whatnot. But they are organized enough where they can be competitive in certain recruitments, and this could be one of them. So him, the uh, Lincoln cure to Kansas State is very much a possibility. Um, and then last but not least, this will be the the name that uh, Texas fans are most familiar with, uh, Kevin Ford Jr. from Duncanville, or he also goes by K.J. Ford. He's our number one player in the state of Texas for the 2026 class. We currently have him listed as a D lineman. Uh, he's 6'3", 6'4", probably about 210, 215, somewhere in there. Uh, I have him listed as a D lineman, but I honestly think he'd be more of an edge um, just because of his build. I think he could be either one, but, again, I like him more as an edge. Uh, he actually outperformed Colin Simmons in every single statistical category this past season. I know Colin Simmons missed about two games, but uh, you watch any of Colin Simmons' Duncanville senior year games, he's not – not putting in a ton of effort, whereas yeah. KJ Ford is on the other side of the field making some damn plays. So, yeah, uh, KJ Ford, he's a part of this Cali Power program, even though he's from Duncanville. You're probably like, How does this Cali Power program work if none of these kids are actually from California? Uh, the way it works, they basically will get these kids after they have a bunch of offers and stars and say, Hey, we want you to play with us for seven on seven, we're gonna fly you out here, take care of you here. Do all these things for you for free, spend money on you, give you money too sometimes to play with us. At the end of the day, we just ask that you let us do your NIL when it comes time for you to get to college, and that's how they end up making money. So uh, that being said, that's how all these kids are from all across the country and all within one program. It's because that's Cali Power's strategy, and it's actually pretty smart compared to the majority of other you know, club program strategies where it's just we're going to pay this kid 4K to play with us this weekend. So, 
yeah. man, I uh, this is what it's like, folks. This is uh, we're all we're all finding out. We all just get to see how the sausage is made now. So it is what oh, it yeah. is. I do want to bring this up because I want to some food for thought for next week. But, you know, the SEC, I hate this with every fiber of my being is going to uh, they're going to do the eight game schedule next year in 2025. Is this is this going to be the toughest? The toughest road schedule Texas has ever played. Just in terms of venues, when you think about going to you go to Ohio State, you're going to go to Florida, you're going to go to Georgia. I think you also would go to Mississippi State too. I think you go to Starkville. Mm-hmm. Like it's 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 a hellacious road schedule for Texas in 2025. Trey, yeah. any thoughts on that one way or the other? Those cowboy those cowbells are going to be so fucking annoying. <laughs> I know you mentioned some other tougher venues, like I. And probably not even considering going to that game because I don't want to hear that bullshit for two and a half hours until Texas sends the fans home. The Florida game is interesting because if Florida is good, that's going to be a tough venue. But otherwise, it's historic, of course. But they're like any other fan base where you got a lame duck coach or a guy who's not getting things done very well in season one. It really diminishes the overall enthusiasm for the fan base. Yeah, who's going to be coach in Florida? Because it's not going to be Billy Napier. So, yeah, I, I yeah. tend to decide with BK, who I heard say this first, that he there's a good chance he's not going to be coaching that team by the Texas game. They've got a brutal schedule this year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm not worried about Mississippi State or Florida at all in 25. Like, Florida – look, Florida's going to be absolute trash this year. Uh, and then once they can, Sunbelt Billy, no one's going to want a portal there unless they can bring Dan Landing or, like, an actual big name home. Um, because until they do that, Florida's gonna be in the cycle they're in where yeah, just it's this repetitive cycle. Because the Mississippi Palmer, State, remember, like how much can Levy turn correct. around and two hammer years? players from the roster and then also recruits too, correct? Sorry, what do you say? Uh Florida is hemorrhaging guys from their current roster and then also recruits who are deciding to sign elsewhere too, even though they're oh, trying yeah. to throw money at a lot of these dudes. Yeah, they their their twenty four class was like ransacked at the end. I mean, Texas took Xavier Filsimi from them mm. um, and Wardell Mac. Yeah, that <laughs> oh <laughs> that play. that commitment was such bullshit. Like I I forgot about that commitment just because all of us knew he wasn't signing there. Yeah, but um, yeah, Georgia on the road is obviously going to be tough. Yeah. Um, and then like Kentucky on the road, like pff, all right, you know, I don't know. I'm not really worried about Florida, Mississippi State, or Kentucky. Although we do get a down Michigan team this year, theoretically, in week two. This is a brutal road schedule this year when you count going to Fayetteville and College Station in the same season. Vietnam, baby. Yeah. yeah. I think this year's schedule is harder than next year so in terms of a, an away schedule. Because mm. outside of Ohio State, like all the games are very winnable, in my opinion, looking at the 25 away schedule, you know. Have to think about that, Jordan. That's interesting. I think the hardest games are going to be in 25 because Ohio State and Georgia are both still going to be really good. Yeah. But the most hostile environments are going to be this year with those yeah. hillbillies in Arkansas and then the whatever you want to call them in College Station. <laughs> yeah. Cheap fuckers sometimes works, but I'm trying to be nice <laughs> on the air, you know? That's no, Friday. Hell, just throw caution to the wind. <laughs> Uh, right. What do you guys see who my co-host is today? Yeah. Yeah. How you doing, Jeff? Uh, I'm wonderful. <laughs> Terrific. Jordan, good to meet you. Yes, sir. You too. Jordan Tom McKay of Audiovisual Consultations, even though he's labeling himself as old man on the screen. Come on, Tom. That's doing yourself That's a my name. <laughs> he's the old yeah. man. Hey, I, I tell everybody that, uh, you know, the, the best that's the name that's on the center ice seat at the stars arena old man oh is that right yeah i've i've got the uh i'm the envy of everybody in in my my friend group because tom set up not only my living room set up we've got the patio speakers on the back oh nice got the, got the home office set up yeah i'm golden see the av ads are done now for the next hour trey <laughs> <laughs> good to know 
too. By the way, thank you, Tom, for donating a 65-inch TV instead of the 55-inch TV that we were initially talking about with the bracket challenge. Yeah, my guys told me we had a surplus this morning, so I changed it. Got to go. Mr. You know, the, the good stuff. stuff. I'll say this, Tom, of all the bells and whistles in the house, the best thing you put in were the Wi-Fi extenders. Like, I can... I can watch YouTube videos while taking a dump with zero interruption. Like it's. Oh, now I'm successful. <laughs> yeah. I got you videos on the toilet. Yeah. Yeah. Revolutionized shitting in Central Texas, Jeff, with the TVs and the bathrooms at Pluckers. Like, I mean, going to the bathroom has never been more fun than after you have audiovisual consultations visit your place. You, you should you should make that the slogan, Tom. We your dumps can, we have can never been more enjoyable. Peacefully. <laughs> all right i'm looking forward yeah. to what you guys are going to discuss for the next hour so i'll get out of here and yield the floor to both of you gentlemen have a great weekend have a great day and we'll be back day. to it on monday see you on great monday great stuff guys and with all that right. we hey, you want to talk about something we know nothing about basketball um i know a little bit about basketball i just don't care about the modern version of the game but it was yeah. interesting to watch texas take care of business after initially looking like shit last night how much of that game did you watch uh, no, I was watching hockey last night. Yeah, I don't fault you at all. If I did not have a team in I this had the tournament, scores going across the bottom of the screen so I could see how badly I was doing in the bracket because I did fill out a bracket. Mm -hmm. I think I'm tied with Zay so far. Mr. I, basketball. In a good or bad way. Are you all doing bad well way. or We're, poorly? I, I was way – I thought the SEC was stronger than it was, and I was wrong. So – all my SEC picks the lost. Big 12, by the way, I had BYU and Texas Tech both moving on a couple of rounds, I believe. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I could be fine after this round, uh, quite honestly, with the upsets. But the only thing that bo the honestly, the only thing that bothers me about it is dogging Bucky for three days about talking about NC State, mm -hmm. and now they've just created the easiest path to the semifinal of anybody. Look, I am on the record as rooting for this archetype in any sport but if you've got a fat guy who's really good at said sport i am likely going to be rooting for that dude and nc state has a badass fat guy well come on i mean they, that uh what was oakland who beat kentucky that was that was a bunch of uh like preppy looking white dudes that was like frat that was like bk's running around the basketball court yeah, there are all sorts of jokes flying around on social media today about their star player who's going to be like an architect or engineer or something when his college career is over with. But those sorts of stories are a big reason why this tournament is always so much fun. You love having some Cinderella stories. The unfortunate thing for college basketball and the NBA to a lesser degree because it is a healthier product right now, its biggest problem over the last 10 plus years is there's too many of those Cinderella stories. You still need good teams to be good. Like I had a, I won't say a number of people, but I saw some people whose opinions I respect on these things much more than my own with college basketball have Kentucky going far. And they end up. I think I had them second and third round, round only just because I can't stand Calipari as a human being, but that's, that's beside the point. I completely, I don't, I don't know enough about basketball to say I had any right to think that I would do well in this bracket. Yeah, I'm surprised you didn't send it through your computer simula simulation. You got a computer program. It doesn't work for basketball. I tried postseason stuff. It doesn't work for basketball. Really, NBA? I well, I don't have any way of getting the stats that combine that work properly with it. I mean, if I did it, I could tell you that the team that would probably have won the whole thing would be the team that was playing that uh, the shutdown. Tennessee would probably be picked to win it all. With the way they played shutdown defense yesterday, because it's 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 based more on defense than offense. All I mean, in every other sport, it works. With basketball, it doesn't because basketball is a free for all. Let's run, and if you touch someone, you get the penalty. Phil, are you familiar with a guy named Billy Walters? He's like Billy one Walters. of the all-time most well. Jason, that's cool. Thank you, buddy. What's that? I was just sorry, calling out Jason from the text line. Oh. Uh, it's hard to be a good team when the good players are only there for a year or two, no time to gel like a power team would look, you're right about that. There's too much roster turnover and it's gotten worse with the transfer portal. Like we had to relearn what three fourths of the Longhorns roster this year. It's going to be the case next year too. That's just the norm in basketball going forward, especially college basketball until 
you were able to figure out the wild, wild west nature of guys going from one place to another. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. but the two-time transfer thing isn't working all that well because the NCAA no longer has teeth. They're basically just trying to gum at people when they punish somebody for doing something that the NCAA doesn't like, although they do also enforce those rules in such an arcane manner. Uh, Coach Cal is a fascinating case study, though, because I have, I have been off the Cal train for a long time. BK and I talked, like I want to say, a few years ago on the radio waves, and he was a big proponent of Texas bringing Calipari in. And he obviously knows a ton more about basketball than I do. But I'm like, no, this guy has lost it. This, this, his attempt to build rosters through mostly five-star freshmen who are going to move on to the NBA the next year, that's not the way to win in college basketball in modern times. Roster construction is so important in the offseason. Now, he's gotten better in the transfer portal. Trey Mitchell, former Texas Longhorn, is there now. Boy, talk about a guy who bounced around. I want to say it was Pitt, Texas, West Virginia, and now Kentucky. I mean, he's one school away from, I think, setting a record, perhaps, or tying a record with Brew McCoy. But, uh, yeah, Cal I, I have no faith in Calipari as a, a good coach in modern college basketball. I just think the whole bracket thing is fun. That's Sorry, basketball is it, I mean, nobody pays uh, – I, I, people watch, I get it, but nobody pays it that much. If I asked 50 people right now who won the NCAA tournament last year, I bet you bet you 45 couldn't answer correctly. Was it UConn? Yeah, but, I mean, you even had to think about it. This is your job. Yeah, oh, I – yeah, completely agree. I mean, I picked, I picked UConn to win it again this last, year. I, mean, I don't mind saying – there were a couple of poor seeded teams who made it to the final four last year, like San Diego state and somebody else. Yeah. But I mean, it's fun to watch the brackets, but it doesn't mean anything to anybody in the long run is what I'm saying. It's, I mean, the super bowl actually has impact on people's lives somehow. I mean, they actually, people freaking live and die by it, man. They're it's unbelievable. And it's but, also a pop culture event too. It's literally the biggest pop culture event in this country every year. Yeah, it's true, and the, and it's it's amazing. It's the it it seems to me to be the one that means the least out of the major things. People remember the NCAA football champion. They remember anybody that I'm not going to say everybody because not everybody does, but anybody that watches hockey what knows the Stanley Cup champions, the and the Super Bowl champions, the World Series champion. But most people can't tell you who the NCAA basketball champion was. But yet it's the most watched sport of all of them, the NCAA tournament, other than the Super Bowl, of course. Is that still the case? Like it, it, oh, the NCAA I, tournament I, is utterly ridiculous. I mean, how many how many sports are getting wait lines at restaurants at 10 a.m. to start drinking on, on a Thursday? Is, is that happening with the tournament yesterday and today? Oh, yeah. I, I really don't know. Everywhere. Not just here, everywhere. Uh, yeah, yeah. People do get together like it's a holiday, or if and they're they sit around, they watch every one of these games like they matter. Where I understand a fourteen-one and and an eleven-one in the same in the same bracket. Well, guess what? Whichever one of those teams wins the next one isn't going anywhere. I feel like the NCAA tournament is kind of turning into a sort of bridge club for dudes. Because you're going and yeah, you're watching these games, but you're also catching up with friends or family members that you're getting away, getting together with too, and having some food and probably having too many adult beverages. Nobody knows what the fuck is actually going on here, especially for posting up and watching all day. You know? No, it's a it's a reason to go out and get drunk and forget about work for a little while. So maybe that's why I don't watch the tournament. You've been so sober for a long time now. Was it since long, 1988? Long since, time. Since audiovisual consultation started, how long have you been sober for? Just just longer than that. So like 80, oh, that was a result of uh, you going to jail, correct? Yeah. Well, you got a good memory, buddy. Yeah, no, 30, 1986. People, people don't realize, or people may not realize this, but you and I, along with your daughter, Camilla, had some awesome conversations over the summer, like hours long conversations split up over the course of how many total episodes did we end up doing? Seven or eight? I think seven. Yeah. A lot, lot, lot of hours, a lot of hours. And I've got a pretty good memory with this thing, but I, I remember you saying that you sobering up was a result of you going to jail. Do you remember the last time you got shit faced drunk? 
the day before I went to jail the last time. Okay. Did anything crazy happen? I woke up in Dallas. I lived in Austin. <laughs> Where in Dallas? Un I didn't tell you this story, did I? That's sad. The um, I was uh, woke up under a bed in a house that I'd never been in before, and there was a couple asleep in the bed. <laughs> what? Yeah. Oh my God. Drove the, drove myself to Dallas. Somehow, don't remember that. Oh boy, that's scary. And broke into somebody's house and passed out underneath their bed. Oh, it was a Robert Downey Jr. situation where you didn't know. Oh, it was, yeah, don't remember it at all. How and, much space was? And I wasn't bed? smart enough to realize that's the time I should stop. So I went out and got drunk and got busted in Dallas. How much space was under the bed? Oh, not much. <laughs> so you just squeezed your way under there. Dude, I don't know. I don't remember any of it. I don't remember driving from Austin to Dallas. Do you remember if the pressure of the box screen is what woke you up? Like there was a claustrophobic feeling? Like, why can't I roll over right now? Oh, shit, I'm under some random bed? No idea. Wow. Dude, I was I was still so way. I used to drink. I was bad. That's That's oh. a long time ago. Well, we're not, we're not done with the under the bed scenario just yet. So when you, when you shimmied out from under the bed, did the people who were sleeping on no. the bed wake up? Snuck out. Never, ne they never knew. Oh my God. That is impressive. Impressive found, sidling slash. Found nip. my car about a half a block down the street. What's that? My car was about a half block down the street. How long did it take you to figure out where your car was? Oh, it was a yellow Volkswagen. It wasn't too hard to see. So. <laughs> a bug or a van? Yeah, bug. Did you drive straight back to Austin or did you stop and get oh, no. like a Waffle House or something? I didn't drive back at all. I stayed there, got drunk. And that's when I went to jail at Loose Terror. Oh, shit. I didn't get a DWI that night. I got it the next night. Dude, I was always drunk. That's all I, I didn't did. realize that Lou Starrett is where you went. I had to I had to spend uh, the night in Lou Starrett once. You want to know I, why? I had I had to spend a year, but it was supposed to be two, so that's good. Well, I know. Oh, Look, you go to Lou Starrett. A, you went to Lou Starrett for drunk driving. I'm a novice as compared to you with Lou Starrett, but I did have to spend the night there, and it wasn't ideal circumstances either. Oh, this is going to be such an embarrassing story for me. I, hey, I, after we get done with this, since we're good, since we're going on this, we do have to talk hockey a little bit because some folks are actually asking for it, and I love that. All right, well, yeah, we'll we'll definitely talk hockey. Hey, look, we've got forty. Hey, they're guessing. Folks. They're guessing you went to jail for unpaid tickets. No, no, it was. I was guessing that you went to jail for getting into a fight. No, it was something less embarrassing but more douchey than that. I guess if that's possible. You mooned somebody. No. Uh -oh. I was outside of a Dave Matthews Band concert at you are Star douchey. Starplex in Dallas over on the uh, on the fairgrounds. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they call it now. It used to be the Coca-Cola Starplex. Dave Matthews Band was going to be playing there. It was me and a big group of friends. And beforehand, we were pre-gaming in the parking lot. And there were some, we were like 22 or 23, I want to say. And there were some kids who weren't quite 21 but college age and asked us if we could have some beer and i was like yeah sure gave him a couple of beers and the cops walk up on him shortly after that bust them for the booze and then they give us a good talking to because we were um because we had given them the alcohol and so when the cops walked off i walked up and gave those kids a couple more beers and said be more careful this time and then the cops walked back up i was probably pretty fucking out of it if I'm being honest walks back up and they're like we just told you not to do that you're going to jail now so the issue with me going to jail at Luster at Tom because I did just spend the night in the drunk tank I got out the next morning while well, I was wearing this uh button down collared shirt that I don't remember where I got it probably fucking hot topic or something yeah I know but it was the 90s early 2000s but this uh this button down shirt had what looked like marijuana leaves all over it and so every fucking dude in the drunk tank was coming up to me asking me uh if they, if I would trade shirts with them and there were some intimidating looking motherfuckers in the drunk tank but I without fail said no I'm like no I, hey appreciate it thank you for the compliment on the shirt I'm good though and 
thankfully nobody ever really fucked with me. Man, you're getting fucked with a lot though on the text line. Oh yeah. These these assholes. I actually like this text line thing. That's kind of cool. Oh yeah, it's it's great. Hey Cooter, what did you think I was gonna look like? Just a fat little tubbo like everybody calls me? That's probably Ooh. what I'm guessing. I kind of am. Cooter coming in firing today. This is not out of the normal. Yeah. What did you expect, Cooter? What did you expect? I'm, I'm just curious if I if I look better or worse, or if I look old as hell, because I am. Jason says, I went to jail for giving the not so courtesy wave when changing lanes. <laughs> I don't think they put you in jail for flipping people off. I know they'll 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 pull you over and ask you why you did it and stuff, and they'll act like they can put you in jail, but I don't think they can. Did I go to jail for being a douchebag? I, I would say no. The, there was not high douchebaggery with the reason why I went to jail. It was stupid, but I was trying to help some kids out who just wanted to drink a little bit before going into the Dave Matthews Band concert. Well, thank I you, Kurt. Kurt I'm I'm assuming why I didn't Kurt. have to spend more than a night in jail. Cooter actually thinks I'm uh, I'm bigger than I was supposed to be. That's cool. Thank you, buddy. I'm, I'm just so y'all know, 20 days, I turned 60. So trying to look younger than I am. How's the working out going? I know you had told me that you were in a pretty good rhythm a couple months ago. Are those some fucking, <laughs> are those some arm muscles that I'm seeing there? Oh, no, he's got, he's got some guns. Also, Always got guns. Yeah. We're going to Costa Rica at the end of May. I can't wait to see you with the shirt off, friend. And I say that in the most hetero way possible. That's good. That's good. The, the, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to get the six-pack thing going, though. Because I, I got to make the six-pack show. If, if I don't get the six-pack show and the kid's going to make fun of me because she's up to about an eight or 12-pack by now. Oh, that's not fair, though. She's a college kid, and she fucking dances and is on her feet acting and moving around for a living stacked game stacked game she has to work on a handicap or we get a handicap to to catch up oh the, no uh, no <laughs> no no i've never i've never given her a break and i don't expect her to give me one we battle it out straight up everything we do everything we do i i love that about y'all but you're gonna lose that one my friend but hey you're, you're still gonna look great for 60 that's that's the key is great for 60 not great for uh, what is she 19 or 20 now 20 almost 21 Almost 21. Crazy. Good for her. The um yeah, we are we're shipping the TV if it's out of town. Don't worry about it, Chris. Oh, nice. CB. Yes, they will ship it up to you in Washington, CB. All right. Cooter says, let me put it this way, Tom. You do not look like a person I would want to fight. You look like a person I would want on my side in a fight. Yeah, but that's why he fights like a Costanza. That's because he's willing to do whatever it takes to win the fight, right, Tom? Well, you actually know the truth on that one because I've been in a lot of them over the years. Not recently, guys. Said so no, I'm not that. But my my brain is messed up enough that it turned off pain many, many, many years ago. So when I fight, it doesn't matter if I get things broken or kicked out or whatever. It doesn't make any difference because I don't feel it. So I can fight unfairly in that sense. And I'm also a state champion wrestler back in high school and stuff like that. So. Kind of had, uh, if I get you on the ground, you might be in trouble. Other than that, though, you're safe because I'm only 5'3". You could you could reach out and just hold my head and go, stop, little boy, and I'll, I can't get to you. <laughs> There's the self-awareness I love. But here's the thing, though. You've got the lower center of, center of gravity, so you've got the leverage advantage if you do get inside, especially with those guns now. Working on them. Working on them. I'm going to get the kid. I'm going to get the kid. All right. I'm rooting for I'm rooting for Team Tom. Sorry, Camilla. I'm rooting for your dad here. I want to see him be in better shape than you. <laughs> I'll never be in better shape than her, but hopefully muscularly it looks better. Yeah, yeah. That the, the aesthetic, absolutely. Yeah. That's that's what we're talking about here. No, you're she could she could dance circles around you. By the Power way, people, on you end. may have missed what you just said. You are a real life superhero. You do not feel pain, which unfortunately also works to your detriment in a way. Very much so. So you right want to talk a little bit about hockey, Tom. What uh, what did you want to discuss hockey wise? Uh, I don't know. Let's talk. What's well, we got only twelve games left in the regular season. I don't know if anybody's following it at all, but it's. I'll be honest. In all the years, which is a lot, let's sixty years old. So let's say I've been watching it for fifty four years, probably pretty intensely. 
This is the tightest race I've ever seen going into the playoffs. Uh, with with 12 games to go, I, not the teams at the bottom, but all the teams at the top fighting for one, two, three, and wild cards are – It's I've never – Almost anybody could still win any division that's in the top three. That's never the case, ever. Wow. And in Dallas's division, there's three teams with 93 points. They're all tied. Mm. Which I don't I don't think that's I don't remember that ever occurring. That's pretty, pretty wicked. So it's gonna be a it's gonna be a fun race down to the end. The Stanley Cup's gonna make it a lot more interesting. Uh, uh, Chris, sorry, but uh, the Kraken are long gone. You they're one of the ones at the bottom that aren't coming back up. I saw he put on their go cracking a little while ago, but the, uh, Ooh, Blackhawks suck too. Oh, Blackhawks. They're, they're rebuilding completely. They will be probably awesome in three years. They got the best, one of the best players in the league right now. Connor Bedard. He's only 19 or whatever. So yeah, no, they're going to be really good sooner or later, but right now they're awful. Yeah. Just hey, by the way, I get to right. make you a drink up here. Shout out to, uh, my Samsung rep up in Chicago, Denise. She was she said she was listening in. So there you go. Drink up, Chicago. Time to go. <laughs> and also to uh what bar in Paris. There's they said they were listening. A bunch of the distributors are listening today, apparently. What was the second place you said? Uh Wave distributing. They're Wait. actually here in Austin. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That is cool. So uh how much of the Texas game did you watch? Oh, you didn't watch any of the Texas game last night, correct? I just watched all that. I watch everything in some portions. Yes. I watched the highlight ends of it and then went back and also checked it out online. So what were uh, you, what I wasn't, were you I wasn't thrilled, thrilled by anything they did. What's that? I said, I wasn't really thrilled by anything they did. Uh, they showed some grit, which is important in bouncing back from a brutally slow start. And then also things were much harder to come by in the second half, but they made plays when they had to, to close that game out and not make it a tight yeah. contest down the stretch. There's something you know, to be said did. about that, they, but they did what they had to do to beat a 10 seed, a 10 seed that had to play its way in. It was already tired. Also, that's one thing nobody considers in that fact. You're right about that, but the play in team has had a lot of success in that round of 64. If you're talking about a 10 or 11 seed. And so to beat a play in team is a big deal because the, in the 12 previous play-in games, that next round, the play-in team has won 11 of those. So that's a, a really high percentage, obviously. I would think that that would work against them also, but history does not bear that out. But Texas, Colorado did look a little bit tired, to your point. And Texas was weirdly off, too. Like, this team is only going to have a chance against Tennessee if DeSue and Ace Miss start to figure it out. Because that patchwork effort, even though you're getting that blue collar type stuff and also insane athleticism, by the way, from a, a Kendall Weaver who served as a nice spark. Uh, Shedrick really coming on at the end of the season has been a big deal. And that was a more of a focus Dylan Mitchell last night with uh, Tyrese Hunter doing some nice things as well as well, but you got to figure out a way to get to Sue going. And part of that is keeping him out of foul trouble. <laughs> so he may need to defend a weaker player on the other end to make sure that he's able to stay in there and to really help that offense out like he has all season long. I, I'm going to, I'm going to watch the Texas Tennessee game just because I want to see if they can manage to find a way to beat Rick Barnes. Yeah. Who I quite honestly, absolutely loved. I thought he was great. He was, a, he was a great guy. Not a, I'm not a UT guy, but I do have the fortune of the fortune of being able to work with a lot of the coaches on their residences. Do right. not have not worked with Sark, of course, uh, because he's too good for me apparently. But the um, had the misfortune of working with the last one, Ugh. Herman. Oh, Herman. Idiot. Yeah, what a jackass. Um, well, many people that have great stories about him around town. Sadly for Tom, it's like Tom yeah. out of his way to be a dick to people. Shocking that I mean, it didn't work here. I, I am. Uh, hey, Grant, my shirt says don't care. Didn't ask the. Um, <laughs> yeah. Tom Herman was one from the first time I met him. I, I am uh, very egotistical. No question about it. And self. I'm not going to say self-centered, but that guy is. Wow. The worst I've ever met in my life. 
he I think he made me look like a, like a nice caring individual to anybody that would have been around at the same time. I don't remember talking to you about this. Why what was so bad about that experience for you? Oh, he's just kind of a weenie. He just everything he's smarter than everybody about everything. Yeah. And what's what's funny is is he actually brought up I I didn't know he actually said it to other people, but he actually brought up the fact that he was Mensa whenever I met him. And I met him before no, he started he coaching said, here. Wait, he said the Mensa thing to you when you met him? Oh, God, yeah. Because I was trying to tell him that I didn't care what other people had told him. I was the expert. I mean, I've been, I've been run. I started all of this kind of thing over almost 40 years ago. And at that point, it was 30 years ago whenever he came into town. And it was just astounding to me to have a guy sitting here telling me what, what I need to do. And I said, no, I, I know how to do this. And he pulled out the mints. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm not really concerned with that because I wouldn't waste my time taking that test. And he got so angry. And I said, I'll just send you a proposal. So I sent him a proposal and he got one from somebody else. And they honestly had the exact same items on them, mm -hmm. the same products across the, I mean, it was a big house, big house. Um, but it was so funny as he, he said, so what are you missing on your bid? And I said, I'm not missing anything. And he goes, well, how are you $40,000 lower than them? I said, they know what your contract is worth and they're ripping you off. Hmm. And I said, just go line item to line item, compare the prices. And I actually went up to his office at UT and mm -hmm. went across it and showed him where every single price they had was over retail and ours was under retail, which it should be anyhow, because nobody charges retail anymore, except for on houses. Um, the, it was, it was funny though, as they sit here and go through it. And I, I, he said, well, obviously theirs is better. It costs more. So that is when I realized if he were Mensa, that truly means nothing. Because yeah. that is the I mean, dumbest right. statement I've ever heard in my life. Bragging about being Mensa is like bragging that you know how to do really good calligraphy. It's like that's meant something more back in the day, but it's a little bit pathetic. It's a bad look if that's something that you're touting to others. It's one thing, I guess, if it is brought up on your behalf, but even then, it's not that impressive. Here you go. This this is cool. Watch this. It's a decal that a cab driver gave to my daughter. This is funny. Hold on. Wicked smart. Wicked smart. Okay. So in Boston, your daughter goes to oh, yeah. Boston. Yeah. I thought, yeah, that's, I'm going to keep that one. She doesn't get that one. I get to have it. Right. DJ, exactly. You're right. Who cares? You don't need to be some braggadocious ass asshole, even if you are Mensa. Get together. You know the nicest, the coolest coach that I've ever met? He's actually still coaching there. It, Vic Schaefer. That dude rocks. Oh, yeah. He strikes me as uh, same wavelength as you. And his wife is very cool, too. I'm not going to say she isn't. And, but but th that was the most down-to-earth, cool person involved with UT that I think I've ever met. Very cool. Love to hear that. Yeah, Love. a lot of fun. Love to hear Baseball. That. We're going to go through all the sports since we don't have a lot of time today. Yeah, that's fine. We can do that. We don't have to do that. I do need to run some spots though. So we oh, you run the spots. To do so. Start talking about people that I've used. Dr. Eckert. Look at my new teeth. Okay. Dr. Greg Eckert, people, go to his office now. There you go. I know that's not an ad, but you ought to anyhow. Love Dr. Greg Eckert, and I also love the great people at Covert BK. Hi, I'm Dan Covert with my wife Hayden. Welcome to Covert BK. Our newest location in the gorgeous hill country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Covert, born and raised in Austin. 
There you go, Covert B Cave. Also want to give a little bit of love to Audio Visual Consultations, avconsultations.com is the website, 512-255-8678, 255-8678. There, that's all I'm going to say about Audio Visual Consultations. <laughs> Next to me on this video. Also, uh, give a shout out to Big Hat Spirits, bighatspirits.com, those cocktails in a can. They didn't create the cocktail in a can, but they do a phenomenal job with it. Real ingredients, low in bullshit. Go to bighatspirits.com to find out more info. Also, find that map of Central Texas at the top of the website. All the Big Hat logos on that map. Like the one nearest you, that's where you can get those cocktails in a can from Big Hat Spirits. All right, baseball wise. Is that the people who do hey, is that the people who do the non-alcoholic cocktails too? They do, yeah. They've got uh they've got a couple of different options now. They had the margarita, and I literally just found this out yesterday looking at the website. Ah shit. Maybe a mojito too. There are two okay. really good sounding mocktails that uh, Bucky's a big fan mock-tails, of. Mocktails, that's what they're called. Yeah, mocktails. Yeah, it's a good portmanteau there. I like that one. I don't always like the portmanteau, but a good portmanteau sits well with me. Sorry, typing. That's all right. So, and I'm old, so I cannot type without looking. The baseball season. Uh, I, I have that same problem too. I'm a hunt and pecker when it comes to typing. And another. I'm told I'm just a pecker. And in other aspects of life. <laughs> so I, I get having to look down at the keyboard. So uh, the baseball season is officially underway, Tom, with the uh, games over in South Korea this week. It was Dodgers and Padres. They split that series, and uh, the rest of baseball follows suit, what, starting next week, I believe? I think it's April 1st, isn't it? Okay, maybe it is. Where are you with the Astros right now? Watching on TV. Like, what do you think about the the team this year? I, I can't tell what the pitching is going to be. The team's awesome, but except for starting pitching, can't can't really tell because because Verlander's not going to be there, so it's going to be hard to figure out what they're going to do to fill that slot because they were counting on that slot. So I know they've done things. I just don't know how much it's going to go through. Mm. It'll it'll be it'll be a good seat. I think it's going to be a, a cool battle. That division may be tighter than anybody expected. Um, because I, I know the Rangers are probably going to be the favorite going into it, but you know, I, I'm not going to lie. You just never know with that organization. Seems like they're a lot smarter than they were before though, at least. So the Rangers. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The Ra Rangers are going to be okay. They are going to have to figure some things out pitching wise, but it's going to be a fun lineup to watch hit and field too, by the way, they're one of the better fielding teams in the league last year. Doing his own read today. No, I'm not going to do my own read today. Cooter. I told them not to even mention me today, Cooter. So sorry about that. I know. I had to. Uh, I had to defy him there. He snuck Aaron, one in there on me. Show up on the football field. That's for sure. He wasn't the worst football coach that we've had since Mac Brown left. That honor goes to Charlie Strong. So he was a better as a football coach, but you can't be a, a complete. You mean by guy. record or by coach? What's that? You said he's a better football coach. You mean by his record or by his ability? Uh, by both than Charlie Strong. It's a low bar, I understand. But Sark is, Sark is almost a combination of those two guys because he has the football acumen. Now, he is more willing to be self-reflective and making the necessary adjustments that Tom Herman ever was. But he's also got more graciousness to him like Charlie Strong. Like Charlie... Uh, Charlie was cool struck a lot of people as a decent dude, if nothing else. He was just w in way over his head as the football coach here. Eh, he, he, there was a lot of issues, yes. I mean, we won't have to go to that. I thought he was a cool dude. That's up. I don't think he had a chance at all, ever, in coaching here. No. The uh, Sark is I – I wish I could – I haven't met Sark yet. There's like three or four people – around this town, it seems like that I haven't met that I would like to, I still haven't met Elon Musk, which kind of irks me. Um, still haven't figured out how I have, I've avoid how he's avoided me all this time. Cause I would, I would hunt him down to have a talk with him. Do you and, have, do you have an in with him? No, that's the, I'm nobody. So got a judge up in the Dallas area who said he knows him. He's going to try to try to get a conversation with him that way. Hopefully maybe or whatever. But what would you want to we'll see what happens? I got a, um, so yeah, that ought to be, it, it could be that 
Sark would be nice to meet. He seems like a really nice guy, you know, cool guy. Hold and on. As far as uh, Elon Musk is concerned, what conversation would you want to have with him? Political. Like what? Oh, I just like to discuss how he sees all the, the world going right now with, with the political. He sees more than our country. And he sees things in a pretty clear route. Whenever you hear his interviews and things, it seems he, he really does have a pretty good idea. Fuck the cheating Astros. I love that. Guys, that was years ago. Don't worry about it. They're not cheating anymore. He, um, but the, yeah, I just think he sees things so clearly. Um, and whether or not it's it biased to his side, it doesn't even matter because he's only putting out, he's never saying it's more than his opinion mm. in, unless he states an actual fact that he can back up as a fact. And so that I appreciate that about him. He's not telling anybody else how to think. He's telling you, this is how I think. And if you want to look at it from my perspective, this is how you do it. And I think that's great. I, I it's a, he's just a kind of a neat guy. Yeah, he is very much a big picture thinker. He's obviously brilliant with some of the companies that he has uh, not just concocted the ideas for, but they're actually executing things now. And it's everything from sending uh, sending people and things into outer space, planning for a trip to Mars, which I think is going to be starting sooner rather than later. He has revolutionized the whole electric vehicle movement, although I do still question whether fully electric is the right answer going forward. The board he clearly, company. he clearly told everybody from the beginning, it wasn't the right. It's a boutique thing. It's not, it's not going to save the planet. He's made it clear all along. It's not the answer. It's, oh, is that right? I, I never, oh, yeah. I never heard him say that. That's interesting. For years and years and years, he's been doing it. And he, he, he said it's a boutique, it's, it's a boutique automotive brand. Mm. That's, it's not intended to take over. It can't. You're going to run out of minerals before you run out of gasoline. That's part of the problem is that yeah. people, people well, it's act. It's not like really going to be a problem because they're going to realize the problem five years in. And then the idiots who bought all in like Ford are going to eat shit. And then we're going to get to bail them out again. And the European companies that aren't going all in like Toyota are going to continue to make buku dollars. Hybrid is the answer, at least for right now. There may be some sort of big step innovation wise that makes that not the case, but there is a significant environmental toll on all electric on top of the whole, where does the electric come from? That will be an issue. And this is an underrated element to all of that. Tom fully electric vehicles are significantly heavier than gas powered vehicles. That's going to cause problems for our infrastructure, our roads, our parking garages, our bridges, like these are things that real people really need to work hard at correcting or getting better. Uh, if a significant portion of our automobiles are going to be of that fully electric variety, the weight is the yeah the weights are ridiculous. Some of those batteries are two thousand pounds in themselves, just the battery. Yeah, and then it takes what like thirty minutes to an hour to fully recharge if you're going on like a trip or something. Like I, I talked to, who did I talk to the other day? Somebody <laughs> who, who was driving a Tesla and I asked, how do you like the Tesla? Oh, it was uh Perry from Goodstock. Uh, great dude, by the way, y'all should check out Goodstock. It's a uh, boutique butcher near Dell Diamond. The quality of their meat is insane. My family, we eat uh, strip steaks every couple of weeks or so like the two that i've gotten from there that it's been consensus like these are better than what we're normally getting from a central market so check them out and it's like as affordable if not a little bit cheaper too in certain instances so good stock yeah but you cook i do cook yeah but anyhow so perry's driving a, a tesla and i asked him i'm like hey how do you like that tesla and he said you know it's a nice car for driving around the city he's like we'll never take it uh on a road trip though because it's just too much of a pain to have to plan everything else around driving that car, even up to Dallas, let's say. Well, a Tesla can get you to Dallas. I'm not a I'm not an electric car guy, so I'm not vouching for them here. But I, a Tesla can get you to Dallas and almost halfway back on one charge, unless you drive like me and then you eat it up before you even get there in the first run. Because if you're mm. gunning it, it uses the electricity faster. So, and as BK will attest, I like to make it to Dallas in an hour and forty five minutes. So I'm not, you could do that on one tank of gas, but you couldn't do it on one charge. 
I'm not going to lie. Hearing how you drive does scare me a little bit. And I know you're a good driver, but driving that fast, it's just the the margin for error if something goes wrong is um, what? pretty the slow. cars are made to withstand it all. It doesn't matter. So many, so many, so many tra- or trash bags that pop out of the doors in the fronts and all the other stuff. And the seat belts are also set. You can roll a car four or five times. You don't even get a scratch. Yeah, man. Oh, gosh. You're making my stomach turn right now. Driving 220 miles per hour has its consequences, even with the airbags and other things like that. No, no. 160, not 220. Oh, it was only a slight exaggeration there. But no, it's just, it, it does, it, it's fine. You get in a wreck at 30 in town. You can die just as quickly as if you get a wreck at 160 by yourself on the highway. Because in town, when you're going 30, you're going to get hit by the jackass semi. Oh, I'm not going to say semi truck because 444444 needs to go away. The, um, but the old, okay, let's say the, the person coming out of Sun City who didn't realize there was a stoplight is the one who's going to end up killing you. There's a possibility there, but let's not, I'm not going to worry about how I'm going to die as long as I'm living the way I want to live. Let's put it that way. Getting into a wreck. I, I'm, I'm going to defend my, uh, my stance here. Getting to a wreck at 160, like 19 times out of 20 is more dangerous than getting into a wreck at going 30 miles. As per you hour. know, I've written a lot of short stories and poetry over the years and stuff. Yeah. There's actually one that was written about the day that I die and it actually, oh, ends. you wrote. Yeah. Do and you have actually, it on memory or do you have it on, on No, it's a, it's a short story. So, it would, I mean, but, it's, but it, it actually ends with me drive. Uh, your he, not me, he is driving down the highway and just off in the distance. And he notices that the grass is waving goodbye to him and the cows are whispering, you know, goodbye. Oh, sorry. Didn't mean to hit the microphone. And the, and then the violins begin to play. And that's how it ends. So he's just driving and he just dies. And it's all good because that would be a really, really peaceful way to go to just be hauling ass and just, okay, sober. How did the cow sound? Going fast fast is fun, man. Oh, I I understand that. How did the cow sound when they're saying goodbye to you? When you're writing that in your head? I don't know. How the hell would I know? That's not in the story. They're just they're just saying goodbye. Like everything else, probably. Gonna, oh, yep. Man, I struck a chord on some people. Sorry about that, guys. I didn't mean to wake anybody up. Wrecking at 160 may kill you, but wrecking at 30 to 50 will maim you for life, and you'll wish you had been driving 160. That's <laughs> Thank you. There, Cooter. <laughs> Uh, you know, what's funny is, is there's, uh, the, on the grand Cherokee, you can't set the darn cruise control over 125. Really? Interesting. Nope. Noe. What up, Noe? Tom, you're not ugly. I don't care what BK says. Noe says. <laughs> I actually say I'm ugly more than BK does. I think so. That's cool. Yeah. You take shots at yourself. There's a self-awareness that I really appreciate about you, Tom. I, I don't, I don't mind. Uh, I don't, I don't mind having. When you when you get to be my age and you've been married for you know twenty four years and been together for thirty, it's kind of one of those you just go, well, you know, I'm as pretty as I'm going to get, and she's learned to live with it, so I can live with it too. All right, so I didn't warn you of this ahead of the show, but at least I need to be done at twelve fifty five today. Zay and Bucky are going to hop on. I'm sure you can hang out with them for a few minutes if you'd like. Oh, I can yeah. talk basketball with Zay any day. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be a treat. Can you? Can you talk basketball? Because uh, we just talked a little bit of basketball, and it sounded like you didn't have much to say. I'm, I was, I'm going to talk basketball with Zay because I'm going to dog him for liking that sport. That's what I'm going to do. Oh, I see. I see. All right. Well, so stay the, um, that. And I don't know what Bucky's going to talk about with basketball. Bucky said I, – I, I hang out with Bucky every once in a while. You know, he walks around like that. What's the old lady who walks, you know, with a the, with the stoop and – Looks like your grandma always, you know, hunchback. Oh, <laughs> Bucky, uh, Bucky, Bucky's got a little bit of hunch as he uh, rounds the bases to 70 or was 70 last year. You ever hear the Todd Snyder song, uh, Devil's Backbone Highway? 
Maybe I like Tom. It, I, I so like Todd easy. Schneider. He's a great storyteller through music, but I'm not. I'm not that familiar with a lot the, of the live version. Has about a 10 minute intro, and he talks about how he got into the music business and all this stuff. And near the end of that, he talks about how he finally was going to get his first gig at Lookenbach, and he got a call from Large Marge down in Lookenbach, and he was going to head down there with his buddies, and they're heading down the Devil's Backbone Highway to Lookenbach. And they get lost because somebody stole the devil's backbone signs to put in their garage. So mm -hmm. they go into the devil, a place that's conveniently called, cleverly called, I guess he says, devil's backbone tavern. And he goes in and there, there's like, you know, eight guys. They're sharing like 13 teeth between them and that kind of thing. And there's an old lady behind the bar and the guys told him he had to go in. He said, I don't want to go in because I'm not that good at fighting at all. And he said, the old lady behind the bar, she's, she's kind of hunched over like my grandma used to be. She looks like she's about 80. And I thought, well, hell, I could take her. So I went over to talk to her. And that's what that reminds me every time I see Bucky is that old old lady at the bar who finally looks up and she says, fuck looking back, drink with us. And so they did. And that's how he started his music career, playing at Dell's Backbone Tavern. Wow. Yeah, Todd Snyder has great stories. Bucky's got really good stories too. Poor, poor Buck doesn't deserve Tom's wrath. Yeah, Bucky does deserve my wrath. Oh, Bucky will fuck with Tom in return. It'll be it'll be a lot of fun. I'm actually. Oh wait, you know what? I don't have to be done. Okay, so these things are happening. Now you get to hang in there very quickly right now. So at one o'clock, I had an interview scheduled with the actor Skeet Ulrich, who is taking part in the NASCAR festivities this weekend. He is maybe most well known for Scream. He was one of the bad guys in the original Scream, and I guess he's come back for the most recent Screams, too. I thought he got killed in the original, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Um, but uh, he's going to be taking part in the NASCAR stuff this weekend. He's driving the celebratory pace car, whatever the the first, the first uh, the celebratory or the ceremonial first pitch is for NASCAR. That's what he's doing with the pace car. But it's not like he's just doing this to some actor who's promoting a show, although he is promoting a show with uh, Giancarlo Esposito, who played Gus in uh, Breaking Bad and also in the uh, Bob Odenkirk spinoff, whose name is escaping me right now. Great actor who looks a lot like Rodney Terry, too. But they've got a new show on AMC that looks pretty badass called Parish. But anyhow, he's he's doing the ceremonial pace car around the track before the race gets going. Well, this guy has a ton of NASCAR in his past, like family members who used to race for, uh, for NASCAR back in the, the 1980s and 90s and 1970s and other people that have been around him in his life. So uh, curious to have a, an in-depth conversation with him on uh, his history with NASCAR. That was supposed to be at one, but I literally got an email in the middle of this show saying that it's going to be closer to two o'clock now. So there you go. Now you know who he was too in the new in the new screen. He's the ghost, and only his daughter can see him. Oh, is that he right? He was put on the text line just now. Oh, okay. So I sound like not... Norm McDonald, apparently. Sounds like Norm. Ooh, I'll have to ask him about that. No, I was told on here that I sound like Norm McDonald. I didn't know I sounded like Norm McDonald. What? <laughs> Everybody's got a normal. Um, uh, did you ever hear? Do you ever hear the interview with Jimmy Fallon where he was on it? Because he used to be so hilarious on talk shows. Norm Macdonald, he was awesome. I probably watched that reel once a month. It's just a joy. He was a great stand-up comedian, but his his ability to take over and sabotage or make some interviews better is epic. The uh, the one the one because what he does the one about his wife being in a coma. That is the funniest funniest thing and he's getting interviewed live on the tonight show while he's doing this just so hilarious that guy is a riot the doctor tells him he ought to try oral sex so he goes back in the room and he comes out 15 minutes later and the doctor says how's it going he goes well not going that well at all her, her mouth won't open <clears throat> Norm was legendary for these long winding jokes that have uh, very dad joke level punchlines, if not like old timey punchlines. And it's just brilliant performance art. Oh, look who's there. Speaking of a brilliant performance performance artist. Yes, sir. Hey, hey, Bob, how was BK this morning? Was he uh, feeling it a little bit? Uh, I, I didn't talk to him. You remember he's in Vegas and those guys are out at Circuit of the Americas today. 
Oh, did they do three hours? Yeah, they did. Oh, yeah, shit. They, they, that is they're out there being motorhead. Motorheads are out there. Okay. Well, I'm glad he gets a little bit of a day off and he's not having to uh to slog through a hangover to uh talk to you for an hour or me for that matter. Dude, who cares? That guy's at another wedding. Who cares? That guy's at a wedding a week. My God, can you say no to somebody? I keep I keep telling I keep telling him he ought to quit going because if he goes back and checks, he's probably gonna find that half of them are divorced already because he's there's no way he's good luck at this point. I know. I mean everybody asks him to come to their wedding and he just can't every once in a while you can say no, I can't make it. But it just so happens he makes them all. So hey, that that last bridesmaid le- needs a little bit of loving too, though. That's absolutely right. Or somebody's mom whose dad has passed away, or something. Oh yeah, that would be an untapped <laughs> market for him right now. You need to float that one to him. I, he does. Floating. I'm telling you, he. You're right. You know, my wife is looking at me like I'm an old piece of meat today. Like. Dude, how long you got last? And I'm like, I said, you're the one who married this old dude, not me. I wouldn't have married me. Oh, has Joyce been looking BK up and down also? Just uh, plotting? I just that yeah, move she's looking me up and down like, my days are numbered, dude. It's like, she's looking at me like, dude, you're, I'm like, what are you talking about? She goes, do I have all your references and bank stuff and all that? I was hearing that. Just one, like, what the hell does that mean? I'm like, are you, are you plotting something? She goes, no, I just have to be ready. And I'm like, well, shit, I've been feeling this way for 20 years. Like, I've got to be ready. So, but I just plot along. It's okay. Okay. You know, my parents lived to be in their late 80s. What, what makes it say that I got to go at 68? You know, I got to go sometime. I just don't need it to be today. People always think about it with lifespan, like the overall number of years. But health span comes into play also. Sure. Boy, this is about to get dark, and I'm not suggesting this to anybody, but like you heard, you hear about Robin Williams committing suicide, and it's sad. But then you hear that he is suffering. I think it's something similar to what Bruce Willis is going through right now. And for a guy who has always been really on top of stuff, yes, and conversational and funny to lose all of that, it's a very dreadful thought. Yeah, so it was not know. to go down significantly, so he decided to cut the lifespan short. Yeah, and I'm gonna I'm remember I'm a guy who's had two strokes. I'm not this isn't, you know, the things that I go through are not those little, you know, the little things anymore. I don't get ear infections anymore. I get a stroke or an MTA or whatever it is. It's all always has some weird name that I can't pronounce, which means, dude, you can't have too many more of these. I'm like, really? I'm having these like every year and a half, every two years. You know, I'm going to have surgery in April. I'm going first week of April, I'm going to have this hyperparathyroid taken out, and I'm going all the way to Tampa. How about going to Tampa? Because no one in this area knows what the shit they're doing. They're afraid. It's too risky for them. I'm like, okay, if that be the case, I don't need you in my neck. You know? I'm starting to feel like there's a lot of more, a lot more C plus doctors out there than I realize. Doctors who got C plus just to to barely make it through medical school who really don't know what the fuck they're doing. I mean, yeah, we the, plumber about should not have been doing, the plumber should not have been doing my neck. We talk about the weather guessers all the time. There are some fucking sickness guessers out there too who are called MD, you know? By the way, you, you mentioned the two strokes. BK has apparently been to so many weddings now and the reputation is out. That's a, I guess that's his nickname at a lot of these weddings is two strokes. Two strokes. Yeah, he's got, that's all right. I mean, it's good to, it's good when people like you and they want you to come, to come. He must have a lot of money because don't you have to buy a gift to every one of those? You don't show up. No, with, no, 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 no. You, know, you can he, show up with some balloons. He's, no, like, he's being party. brought in. No, he's being brought in by the groom, and he's a single guy. He doesn't have to bring shit. His, his, his. You know, if he's bringing a date, then she probably has to bring a gift. You know, okay. But, but dude, single guys don't have to bring gifts to anything. Please. It's the it's courtesy to, to do a little something, and BK does have a lot of Jewish mother in him, so my guess is he does get the gift. But I would also see him rationalizing that his presence is the present. Oh, really? He thinks that's just good enough, huh? He's too much of a Jewish mother, though. He, he I mean, the guy writes, writes thank you letters, and he is really good with gifts, so he's not skipping out on the gift at a wedding that he's going to. He, he's getting gifts. I would, I would be willing to put money on that. I'm going to a wedding next Saturday, the day before Easter, so, and uh, it's part Jewish, part African American, so this is going to be something very, this is going to be something very unique. On a on that's, how about this? That's Sammy Davis Jr.'s wedding. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. So it's, and I think you were, I, I, you're 
I'm going to Kwame Lassiter's wedding. He played for Kansas, University of Kansas, the wide receiver. Yeah. You know, when Texas got beat by them, caught touchdown pass. So, and his dad played for a lot of years in the NFL. Is Kwame the Jewish kid? No, no, he's not. <laughs> no, he's not. no, he's not the Jewish kid. No, but this, that's oh. in, in my table. You know who I'm sitting with? Tim Brown. Really? Yeah. So that should be interesting. They're putting you with somebody popular, yeah. famous, and actually no sports? Putting with putting me with a Notre Dame guy. That's what they're putting me with. That's that's the main deal. BU Notre Dame. That's a good combo. Wow. That is going to be something now. I I'm can't wait to hear about that. I bet you guys have a really good conversation. Yeah, you know, there was there's a time I picked him up when I was at the when I was at the radio station. I picked him up at the airport because picked him up. My God, man. Picked him up at the airport to bring him, bring him over to the Cowboys camp. I guess I don't know what he was playing at the time, but he was doing something. Remember the Raiders used to come and practice against the Cowboys? Maybe he was playing at that time. That was that was a long, long time ago. He's not gonna he was he probably remember me as the chauffeur or something. But that's all right. Oh, 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 before you go, I gotta tell you this. How about this from Spectrum yesterday? So my wife gets this deal from Spectrum where the bill has gone up like a hundred dollars on on some on some deal. I must have pressed Apple or whatever it is with Spectrum, and it jacked up this price. So she goes to find out about it. I mean, I I may have made a mistake on my phone. So she goes to find out, and this lady, she's talking to this lady, saying, "You know, my bill is up a hundred dollars. Can you can you help me? What's going on?" And so my wife is not she's not really combative, but she's just trying to find out what's going on. You know what the lady says to her? She goes, do you know there's kids dying all over this world that don't have any money? And I went, I said, did you go, excuse me, bitch? He goes, no. <laughs> no, I just argued with her a little bit like, what are you talking about my money? What are, you, what are you doing? And the lady hung up on her. And I'm like, please let me get after Spectrum all day yesterday. So she wouldn't let me get out. I would have been on there at... This is a lady who's trying to supposedly helping her at Spectrum's telling her, do you realize how many people don't have any money or kids all over the world don't have any food and you're worried about a bill? And I'm like, did you really say, excuse me, bitch? No, I, that, it was a excuse me, bitch moment that I thought my wife should have said. I know I would have said you that. Know, you know, he pushed out harder than anybody could push no, out in the world. I, no, he went, I, oh, excuse me, ma'am. If you don't no. mind me saying this to you right now, if no. it bothers you, I'll apologize in advance. He didn't say, excuse me, bitch. Let me just say He's this. He's got no I, balls when it I comes to the bone. I chance to be on that. I was told, do not call them back because it would have been, I mean, really? Well, you're going to get the same person. You're going to get another random. I don't care who I got. I want to talk to I want to talk to the management. That's who I wanted to talk to. I'm like, you got people answering your phone, telling other people about how to deal with their money and telling them about the world's problem when they're just trying to get a bill straightened out. Uh, you should oh. write a strongly worded letter and send it to the management. That would make a difference. Oh yeah, that thing will never that thing will never see the light of day. It'll be sitting there with the other piles of of letters. And she was so she was like, "I can't I can't believe this." You know, this is this this deal is getting so crazy because the last time my wife had it, the next last time she came to me she said, "I went to this new doctor. I wanted to see this new doctor." And the dude said to me, "Are you married?" And she's like, she looked at him like, wait a minute, what, what the hell is you got? To, what does that got to do anything? And he said, are you married to male or a female? And I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> I mean, you're asking my wife, she's coming there to see you as a doctor. You're going to ask her if she's married. First of all, you can ask her if she's married and then to a male or a female. What's going on with the what's going on with the service around this place? Because, well, they couldn't figure out if you were male or female, apparently. Oh, yeah. Well, that's that's different. The only thing separated me is this. They're, they're asking her that to find out which one you are. Oh, I guess. That's but what it was. Those are her two last things. I'm like, I said, they I said, said obviously, they said, Buffy walks around like an old grandma with that hunchback. I got to try to find out if he's a male or a female underneath that fake beard. So she says that that's it for that doctor. But that's the kind of care that we're getting now. That's a, like a, that's a very weird. That is a very weird question to ask. Isn't it? Is it not? I think the one from Spectrum is even worse. Like that wasn't lady. Spectrum. That that wasn't Spectrum. Who was it? Somebody from Indonesia? So yeah, type India. Of that's trying to grip you for a couple of bands. Oh no, she's oh, just, no, yeah. she, she, she she hung up on my wife. The thing about it is, she thought she was too argumentative with her about her bill. How about that? 
her bill, not the lady's bill who's supposed to be working for the company, but her bill because the kids in Biafra needed some more food or something. And she should have been worried about that instead of her bill. Man, oh, man. I just can't even imagine some of y'all would have answered to that. I'm like, you didn't. But my wife won't get, get upset about it. But I've spent all day. I would get on the phone if, if she, say, she said, don't do it. Because I would have spent my whole day trying to talk to everybody at Spectrum yesterday over that. But they said, you know what? They may need more training. I'm like, they should have got that training when they were in fourth grade. Forget it. Now it's too late now. The guy said she may need more training. I'm like, really? You think she should? Hey, guys, I mean, I need to go. Tom McKay may oh. hang out here for uh, a few more minutes. Well, hang uh, out for me. I'm going to ask Zay, Zay and Bucky a question. Zay, what's All up? Right. Always good to see you. Just wanted to give a quick promo. Uh, Jeff Barker and me from 3 to 5 today. It's going to include a couple of different conversations I conducted. One with Skeet Ulrich, who I am interviewing in a little bit less than an hour now after uh, things were changed mid-show. So stay tuned for that. And then also my red carpet for the new Roadhouse movie. Oh, yeah. By Southwest last week. Get, get a little bit weird with it, which is obviously my style. But I asked some fun questions to the Connor McGregor's and Jake Gyllenhaal's on the carpet, as well as some other people from the film that I think will be amusing if and when you get a chance to check it out. So uh, you got it. Roadhouse too. It's looking just right, like you know, it's, it's like the third or fourth iteration of Roadhouse because there was a Ronda Rousey one a few years ago. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. It's supposed to be pretty cool. I haven't uh, haven't checked it out just yet. It's on Amazon Prime now. But right. CB well, said he watched it and it wasn't bad. So anyhow, I'll talk to you guys here at three. Yeah. Tom, thank you so much for the time. Have a great weekend. See you. Have a great one. See you, Trey. Trey. Hey Buck. Hey Tom. Hey, up? I got I got to ask you a question because I was dogging you hard earlier this week about your North Carolina State talk. Yes. So, How Oakland goes good? and upsets Kentucky. If that's and that's got to be considered an upset, no matter what anybody wants to say. It is. But how far do you think they're going now? Was that NC State? Yeah. I got them in the Final Four. <laughs> oh man, you got them passing Marquette. Yes, I have them in the final four. Wow. I got two ACC. I got them in Duke. I don't know how I got to Duke, but. You know, God I, rest his soul. You know, Jim De, Jim Valvano died. Yes. <laughs> he's not there anymore. Yeah, I understand he's not coaching there anymore. Okay. I got that part. I got that part. Yeah, I got them. If he was still around, I'd say you might have a shot. But. You no, know, they've got the big man, and they're playing some of the best basketball right now. I don't. That big left tackle that they got in playing center, man. <laughs> he is serious. He is. Bro, he, he looks like if Travondre Sweat hooped. I know. I mean, he's Sir so junior. Yeah. And the guys are bouncing off of him and falling back. I don't know how they officiate a game with him. It's got to be tough because if he just makes contact, guys go flying all over the place. You know, sort of like those dudes last night that Texas played against. I couldn't see those guys were throwing their heads back. Like they were getting knocked out, like they were being somebody was shooting them from the stands. I'm like, dude, it's not that bad. Those aren't charges. You're taking charges and, and planting their face into the ground. I'm like, come on, guys. What a bunch of babies. Glad they got beat up last night like that. That was their only chance. I guess. You, know, you gotta Talk. flop. They were at a disadvantage. Boy, were they flopping. Every every play, every time Texas would touch one of those guys, it was like they were in the first or second row in the stands. I'm like, dude, it's not that bad. I know Brock Cunningham is going to hit you across the face or the head. Hey, that, that's where I was going to ask. That was intentional. Go. That one I did see, and oh, I'm yeah. glad as hell he did it. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm going to say that shit. I am so I tired it. of basketball players, and they're flopping, little wimpy-ass crap. They're like soccer players on a hardwood. It's oh, yeah. so no, ridiculous no at some point. Oh, no. He got him just at face just level. knocked the crap out of him. It's so much fun to see. Yeah, he went <laughs> – yeah, and that guy went down like he was blind, like both eyes were blind. I'm like, dude, it's not that bad. Come on now. I grew up watching oh. Jordan and the Bad Boys and freaking Ewing up in New York. That oh, was the yeah. basketball. I actually could watch basketball back then when they'd leave the court with bloody noses and oh, stuff yeah. in the NBA. And now, nobody was patching them up and getting the blood off their own. Now, oh, I, I, somebody touched me. I got to take off the rest of the game. You know, they're not like hockey. You know, they get a skate across the face. They get, they go back into the back, get 72 stitches and oh, come yeah. back out and play the game. Yeah. It's, it's, that was bad last night. I thought not very, very excited about that. I'm glad they're done, but that's, that's all right. Because I think that was it for the Longhorns. They can't get away with playing like they played last night. 
Uh, even against you, even against Rick Barnes and his group. So you think they're going to get beat by Tennessee? Yes. Zay? Uh, yeah, I do. Unfortunately, I think this is it. But we're going to talk about it. You know, I'll break it down, break down Tennessee, talk about the game last It'd night. Be one of the only right things I had in my whole bracket is Texas going out after two, in the second round. Yeah. The yeah. Bracket my bracket oh, shit. Other than that. It's yeah. tore up already? Well, I had I thought the SEC was strong. I didn't know I don't know basketball that well, but I thought the SEC was strong. Obviously, they're not. I, I thought the SEC was better too. I, I did that. I mean, I look good Perry. other than the SEC choices. Yeah. Yeah. Did you take t- South Carolina, Tom? Had you had that? Oh yeah. I did. Oh too. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that one hurt me. I, I had every know. SEC team winning the first round. Damn. Yeah, I had, I had. Yeah, I had a bunch. I had a bunch. And I think of, I lost two or three yesterday alone. And Baylor's smacking the crap out of Colgate, the toothpaste right now. So, Chris Bennett's not- tied for second in the TSU group. I, I think see that's you, like, CDB. Yeah, that's like being tied for second in Little League <laughs> in in East Austin. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that I'm in like 70th place in the TSU group or something is what they told me. And so I know I suck compared to you, Chris, but let's not, let's not put our weight on that one. Yeah. But I'll send you the TV if you win it. Try there you go. It. There you there go. go. The um, No, it is funny, though, because I had – it was some <laughs> – somebody was saying something about competition for somewhere, and I, I thought that was – that's kind of what that one reminded me of because I thought, guys, that's not a comp- – you can't compete when there's no basis around it. Zero. I, mean, it's like, I don't know. I did see though that I on the ESPN thing, twenty-seven million brackets busted by the Kentucky game. Yeah, yeah. There's only like twelve thousand perfect brackets left after yesterday. Yeah, one of those perfect brackets is B. John Robinson, former Longhorn running back. Oh, you his know his agent filled that out for him. He didn't do that. <laughs> oh, come on, Tom. Give B. John some credit. He knows. He's in, the N- he's in the NFL. He's going, somebody <laughs> do this for me. I make a lot of damn money. Come man, there's on, a lot of man. Just mustard all over the sheet. And yeah. Stuff. Come on, man. <laughs> he's, he's, he's going, I'm, and he said he's still in it. He's not here in town. He's over in Atlanta, probably still. He's, oh, he's not, working out here somewhere. I got some good barbecue ribs here. I'm going to get some sauce on that shit. Somebody fill that out for me. There you I, go. Come I'm on. not doing anything for anybody. There no. you go. This is Tom B. Robinson, man. Well rounded, versatile. Oh, no, no basketball. He knows, who. He knows everything. Come he on. knows everything. He's, He's the, the ball. ball. He's Maybe the ball Jackson of, of gambling. That dude lives in Arizona. He don't know nothing. Come on, oh, man. man. If Arthur Smith gave him the ball, he'd still have a job. Ooh, yeah. Know, sorry that. about that, Arthur. Yeah, so no, no, not sorry about that. You deserve what you got getting canned. On yeah, the text line, it says Bijan has Texas winning the championship. If that's the case, he ain't staying perfect for long. No, 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 Bucky Gobble, how you doing? Man, I just, I'm telling you, that deal with my wife yesterday, I could, I would have been so, you know how mad if somebody would have said to me that you're worried about your bill and there's people starving? I would have gone, I would have been all up in that lady's, and I wouldn't have stopped. I'd have gone from her, and then I'd gone to the next manager, and I said, who's the next manager in charge? Because I need to talk to them too. That was, that was so 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 where were you on speakerphone or was your wife? She, she just told me she, just, what happened. She, she told me what happened. She said she goes, I didn't make a big deal, but I just wanted to know why my bill that went up a hundred dollars. And she said something to do with sometime a third party will do something. I said, well, it must have been me messing around on my phone, hitting Apple for my spectrum deal. And she said the lady said that to her, and I was like, What? That's your money? So did is that what she saw? Did she see the bill and then she called Spectrum, or did Spectrum call y'all? No, no, we called them to find out what what had happened. And this okay, was a, this it might was, not be a scam. This might be. Oh, she works for them, but wow. she just she thought there was other things that should have been talked about besides that, like the kids who needed food. <laughs> well, I'm like, you talking about my money, lady? What are you talking about? Yeah, it's really unprofessional and interesting 
Again, it sounded like a spam when you were telling the story no. of Tom, Trey, and I. No, but now the fact that y'all called, that seems like. And then she know. actually talked to somebody in management who said, we will, we will find out who that was and answer that call, and they may need more training. I'd be like, no, 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 you don't need to train her. You need to fire her. That's oh, what I'm Come saying. on. She don't deserve to get fired. Come on. <laughs> it, it could have been a language barrier, like Shohei Otani's interpreter. No, oh, no, 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 dude. There was – no. <laughs> No, this lady spoke perfect English to tell her she needed to worry about something else. I'm like, no, you need to mind your own business and find out where my hundred went, where that hundy went. That's all. That's your job. You're trying to make up jobs. Maybe suspended, fired. That's a little much, you know. Especially if this is the first offense. You can't be firing nobody. First offense. This could be the first time she got out of line. And it's a business where you can't do that. You can't say that to somebody talking about their money. They're asking for help and you're telling them they should be worried about something else. No, you should be worried about helping that person. You shouldn't have that gig. But the guy said, maybe she need more training. And my wife, <laughs> she's nice. She's a lot nicer to me. I just, I, I'm ugly on stuff like that. I mean, I, I just, I mean, I go out of my way to be ugly for that. You know, out of your way. I go out of my way if somebody said that. Because you've got people like Tom in your life pumping you up. You can't. You can't do I'm, that. No. Can't, no. Tom talking about you pussing out. Talking about you should have fired no, that lady no, up. No. Now you're thinking we should fire that person. Come on, slow no, your I, roll. I, I, no, I probably would never be saying the word fire, but I'd let her know my business. But she hung up on my wife. She hung up on her. Yeah. You know because she thought that she needed to be worried about something. She hung up on her. I'm like, what? This, hey, this might be it. You never know what people are going through. You never know what she's what's happening in her life. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely, the workplace. you're absolutely right. But you know what? You leave that, take that to your house, to your husband. And, <laughs> and your, your kids. You bring that to me and I'm paying the bill. You know what I'm saying? Oh, uh, yeah. $100 that's up. Your, that's your life. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But, Buck, I appreciate you today no filling problem, in man. for Chip Brown. We are going to get into everything March Madness. Going to talk a little Texas football, a little pro day with you, Buck, later on. But Texas basketball, ugly win yesterday. But Rodney Terry, 4 and 1 right now in his tenure at the University of Texas in the tournament, 56 to 44 against the Colorado State Rams. And yeah, Buck, it started in the first half. I mean, if you only allow 11 points in the first half, like you're doing something right. You're locked in defense. No, I, they, they, they won that game because they were more aggressive than yeah. Colorado State. They just, they had more, they had more energy in the basketball game from the beginning. Even through the end, I mean, even when Colorado State was making their spurts, they just didn't have enough energy. They laid it on the line against Virginia. They were happy after the Virginia game. Texas was playing like, no, we got to move on to something else. And they had tons of energy. Now, things didn't go their way for a couple of guys last night, but they still had energy. They still played good enough defense. against, And that's a pretty talented team. Those guys don't miss, yeah, that, at all. They don't miss that many shots as they missed last night, wide open shots. And neither does Texas, actually. But – they just out – they were more aggressive. That group from Colorado State was so passive last night. It looked like, oh, you played Virginia, so you won your one game for the tournament, now you can go home. And it, and, and that's what it – you know, that's what it looked like last night to me. It just uh, – because there was guys – I mean, Dylan DeSue was not very good in the first half. You know, and then he got to the free throw line. That guy's missing free throw shots. Late he has been missing some lately, yeah. You know, that's – and that's been – that's – I mean, that's just a little bit of lack of focus. And when things aren't going right – you gotta make you gotta make those. They're free. You're sitting there. Ain't nobody bothering you at the free throw line. And he generally makes those, but he was clanging them off the back. He just didn't have a good night. Offense, defense, the whole works. You know, he made it. There was a couple of key baskets when they needed them that he made. But all in all, that was not a great performance by him. Dylan Mitchell's performance was just typical of the way he's been playing. He didn't do anything last night again. That's supposed yeah. to be an NBA player. I mean, you're in the spotlight. Everybody's watching you play now. Yeah, Dylan Mitchell ended up with only four points, went two for four from the field. So he shot 50%, but he doesn't shoot enough to, you know, really. Oh, that, that, jumper, that one jumper hit the bottom of the net. And he oh, yeah, he airballed one. That was brutal. Wow. It, was, it was on the free throw line, too. It was just like, bro, if you can't even hit rim on that, it's just he sometimes. Right the net. I'm like, check out. I don't understand his jumper. It is, you know, every once in a while, that little 12-footer, 
that's near the rim. He can make that. But he starts to move out just a little bit. He can't get it to the rim with that, yeah. that weird jump shot he's got. It's like he has the yips. Like It's like he just knows – his confidence isn't there to go knock those shots down on a consistent rate. Cause it's not like it's anything wrong with his mechanics or form. He has a nice form, nice Southpaw, you know, looking mm-hmm. stroke and everybody always goes back to what he did at the combine last year, just kind of testing his talents out to see what these NBA guys would say. These scouts would, uh, you know, dang it. This damn Mike, you're back. You're back. But um, yeah, it's, Sometimes he just isn't locked in. And yeah, and his defense isn't carrying him either. I mean, it's not, you know, because his offense is so bad, he's not carrying that with his defense anymore either. It's just like he's just kind of sleepwalking, waiting for his offense to come. When his offense comes, then he'll get, you know, he'll get in tune to a little bit of defense. Well, if you ain't got one, you've got to have the other. But, I mean, they played good enough. Once again, they had more energy last night right. than Colorado. Colorado State didn't have any energy. That was, I mean, they should have busted them by 30. Last yeah, they night. look tired. They, they look tired. Like 11 points. I know Texas was locking up and stuff. And again, Colorado State, they got off to an 8 2 lead where you're kind of like, uh oh. And Rodney Terry, man, he's playing with fire. Yes, he's do- doing a hell of a job. If you go look at his record in a tournament compared to what Shaka mm-hmm. Smarts was, Shaka won no games. Rodney Terry's already won four. He's gotten out of the first round twice. So he's already better than what Shaka did during sure. his tenure year. It doesn't matter what you do during the regular season. It doesn't matter how many one and dones you put in the NBA. It matters how far you go in the tournament and how well you do in March. And Rodney Terry has shown so far that he could do pretty well in March. Obviously, we got to see what he does tomorrow against Tennessee. But he's still playing with fire, Buck. When you start IT Horton, when you start Dylan Mitchell, you're going to get off the bad starts like you did yesterday. And yeah. Again, basketball, we've been talking about it. It's not a tricky sport. It can be very simple. When he put Kendall Weaver in, when he put Brock Cunningham in, when sure. he put Aiden Shedrick in, Colorado State scored three points after that in that half. Three yeah. points. I, end I, up I, with 11. I like, love the way Stretch Shedrick has been playing late in the season. He's he's offensive-minded, but he's, often, he's also, you know, he's healthy and his defense has been really good. He's yeah. now playing like a tall man blocking shots don't come down there because he'll block the shot but he's also in his mind you know he's gonna he's gonna get assist if you try to double him up he's good enough he can throw over the top of you but he's got a little jump hook that's nice I mean I I like the way he's been playing yeah they're gonna need him bad he falls on the ground he gets back up right I mean them dudes from Colorado State were getting hit they were laying on the ground and rolling around (laughs) like come on guys me have a play any basketball that that hit right there is not doing anything to you why are you rolling around holding your face and your jaw like you just got jaw jacked? Yo, yo, Scott fell like four times. Yes. Light skinned brother. I yes. was like, dog, you tougher than this. Chip was calling him fullback and shit yesterday. And I'm like, dude, Man. y'all look desperate. Colorado they, State, they they look like a desperate team that would do anything to, you know, try to get the upper hand because they knew they were at such a disadvantage with just putting everything into the Virginia game. Like, yeah, they can't, but they've never been defended like that. They, that's no. a Big 12 defense, one of the best, better defenses in the Big 12 this year. They were they had hands everywhere, and they couldn't take it. They were taking the ball from them. They were trying to get down in the middle. They got in the paint when they put it on the ground. Texas had hands in there. Weaver's hands were in there. Brock Cunningham's, even Asimus was trying, but he's a liability because he can't yeah. cover. That dude can't cover me. I mean, it, really. it's, it's going to be a tough matchup for him in this next game. We'll see. They're going to try to hide him on Vescovi, which Vescovi, he's been really good for Barnes his first few years. This past year, he doesn't shoot as much due to connect, getting Is all Ziegler still shooting, though? Oh, my gosh. He was amazing yesterday. He had a double okay. double. Tyrese Hunter, yo. And, again, shout out to Tyrese Hunter. Great yes. defense on Isaiah Stevens. That's their best player for Colorado State. He was locking up. He did a terrific job and set the tone. He had that steal, breakaway dunk. Like, he, Tyrese Hunter, Coach Terry said it yesterday and the presser, yo, his stats, only eight points. It might not show how his impact. His impact was way bigger than the oh, yeah. stat line, and that started defensively, as you were mentioning, Buck. You know, Kendall Weaver, Brock Cunningham, and that's what I'm saying. Like again, Rodney Taylor, you're playing with fire. Like Dylan Mitchell is good when Tyrese Hunter's good because Tyrese Hunter is the one that creates for Dylan Mitchell the sure. most on those lobs and alley oops and getting into the lane and finding guys like Tyrese Hunter. 
like D- Dylan Mitchell benefits from Tyrese Hunter playing sure. well every time. If Tyrese Hunter isn't playing good, Dylan Mitchell will be invisible. You know, so I defensively, again, just this matchup, it, it scares me. And right now, Northwestern and Florida Atlantic coming down to a last second shot, going into overtime, 58-58, the madness. But, um, yeah, Buck, this Tennessee team, Rick Barnes, uh, this it's personal for him. You yeah, know? and it's not, and they're not going to get away with as many turnovers as they had last night. Those two teams just gave the ball to each other last night. Colorado State sucked at it. Texas sucked at it. Just way too many turnovers. Did they end up with about twenty some turnovers between the no, two? Of them? Texas only had twelve. I think Colorado State. Colorado State I mean, had nineteen. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that was yeah. a sloppy <laughs> ass game to watch. I mean, they were just turning the ball over. And Aismas is one of those guys. I thought he could take care of the ball. He tries too many miracle passes on fast breaks. He just yeah. thinks his guys can go get them. I'm like, dude, this is not the time to give the ball back to them. Take some clock off. Get yourself a good shot. But he's not. He, his handles are okay. I know he can bring it up past half court. But after that, I get nervous with him trying to dribble around and he's trying to make these. Back. He's just not tall enough, you know, to get over the top of guys with their hands up. Yeah, when they double team him when he comes yeah. off these screens and stuff, and he's he to make, yeah, he tries to make those overhead passes. He can yeah. struggle at that times. And then the one that you're talking about, he tried to throw like a blob up the court, and it yeah. just went out of bounds and you're like come on max you're better than that but I, i've been talking about it all year long rt sometimes needs to needs to take the ball out of his hands and put it in tyrese hunter's hands and let sure. him orchestrate the offense and have max Aismas coming off screens i mean you got to mix it up especially with a team as good defensively as tennessee is you know like it, it's so Kai Ziegler is going to be all over Max Aikman. So yes. this is a game that you might want to put Tyrese Hunter on the ball more. You know, sure. Kai Ziegler is tough, man. New York kid. Like, he dominated the game yesterday. Like, everybody talks about Connect, Dalton Connect, who's SEC player of the year, averaging 21 points per game, will probably be a lottery pick in this year's draft. He's a hell of a player. Hell of a player. Beautiful stroke. Can do it all. He is a hell of a player. Absolutely. This Tennessee team – runs on Zakai Ziegler. They, yeah, they're yeah. as good as Zakai Ziegler takes them. And when you have a big man like Jonas Adu, oh, yeah. that dude's a problem. At seven foot, that's going to be a tough matchup for Dylan DeSue, which, to be honest, they might put Jordan James on DeSue. And just because Dylan Mitchell is so much of a liability and nobody's really worried about him scoring, you right. can put Adu on Mitchell and then just have Adu help and stay in the paint. Because sure. you know, Buck, Dylan Mitchell isn't going to shoot the outside shot. No, he's not. So you could, so you could have somebody playing pressure defense like a Jordan James on Dylan DeSue, and if Dylan DeSue tries to drive in the lane, you're going to have big-ass seven-foot Adu, Jonas Adu, who's their second-best player, basically, or maybe third after Ziggler. But he's a hoss, man. Yeah. And he can move. Like, that's going to be a tough matchup, which is why Caden Chedrick's going to have to be huge this game. You mentioned Caden yeah, Chedrick been coming physical. along. He's, been, he's that big, tall dude. Yeah. been physical enough lately. And I don't know what happened to DeSue yesterday. I'm just chalking that up to a bad a bad game. I haven't seen yeah. him play. I haven't seen him. I've seen him play and have bad halves, but that was a bad game by him yesterday, especially when you get to the free throw line. I'm expecting that guy to make his free throws. He's clanging them off, you know, when they've got, like, 11, 12 point leads that could really be stretched out. He's clanging, you know, one and ones. I'm like, dude, you got to make those. If this game ain't over with, I was going last night. I'm thinking, damn, it's a good thing that Colorado State just couldn't hit anything. Their 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 guards couldn't hit anything because that that those 11 and 12 point leads would just disappear because we've seen it. Ha- we saw it happen against K State, you know, yeah. when they, in the second half. I was worried about that was going to happen, but then about three or four minutes into the second half, you just knew Colorado State ain't coming back. They just don't have it. They don't have. They put all their their eggs in that basket against Virginia, but Texas. But they once again, they haven't seen defense like that. They don't see no. defense. They they don't see defense like that in their conference. They no, just, and it shows. You kind of see the Mountain West teams. They struggled yes. yesterday. You know, got Nevada. They went down. The Mountain West is struggling. So, how good was their conference? Kind of like, mm-hmm. like the SEC. Like how good's the SEC when you got South Carolina looking like that and Kentucky going down? And you know, what I'm saying it's just it's the madness and all, but it's telling when you see teams face. 
Texas or the caliber sure. of Texas. With Texas, there it's not like everybody picked Texas to win the tournament. You know what I'm saying? If you're not a homer, like Texas ain't great, but right. it shows the level of the Big 12 and Mountain West. And yes, they were a little fatigued due to that Virginia game, as you were saying. But you know, Texas, they came out ready to play defensively. And if you could stop teams, even if you struggle scoring, like you can't have no one for 14 from three-point no. line game against Tennessee. Like no, that's, there, I don't there, even know what that is. Let me ask you about Calipari. I mean, are the folks he's got enough wins and, and, and got enough great recruiting behind him? Are they gonna start going, what's going on here at Kentucky? I mean, they've bowed out the last couple of years. Are people gonna start wondering if he's lost his mojo? Is he just a regular season kind of guy now? Mm. Or yeah, too many kids going to the NBA right off the bat and not sticking around long enough. Yeah, his style and philosophy doesn't work for this era of okay. college basketball and college sports in general. Jay Wright, he touched on it yesterday uh, with CBS, former Villanova coach, two-time national champion. Yeah, there's something and, different about Calipari now for some reason. Well, well, Buck, you know, with the transfer portal and plus this COVID year, like, let's see, I he's going to have to change things up. But again, with the COVID year... And then the transfer mm -hmm. portal, you got 25. Brock Cunningham's 25 years old. You got 24, 23 year old grown ass men. And Kyler Perry, he's banked his whole career off of freshmen. Sure. And 18 and 19 year olds. And this time of the year, that's just not happening. I mean, again, he only has one championship with Kentucky. Yes, they've gotten close. They've gotten to the championship game and lost. They've gotten to Final Fours and lost. But again, these guys are one and done. These guys are one and yeah, done. Anyway. Like Anthony Davis is a top 75 player of all time. Now, a lot of people will argue that, but he's going to the Hall of Fame. He's a generational change in player. That's who you want it with. Kind of like Jim Beheim. You want it with Carmelo right. Anthony, one of the greatest of all time. You know, that can make a coach look great. And, again, he does a good job of getting guys to the league. All his guys that go to the league become all-stars. There was a great picture of – the all-star game this past year with John Calipari and his former players like Devin Booker and sure. Anthony Davis and Tyrese Maxey of Philadelphia and Shea Gilgis Alexander. Like the list goes on. Kentucky has the most NBA players in the association or yeah, the most NBA players in general from that school. So that just yesterday, that style of play, like Oakland was playing that matchup zone, which is very hard if you don't face that often. Mm -hmm to figure out and yeah i i just think calipari he needs to go back to the drawing board and change his philosophy you up. don't know if he can that's the thing you don't know if these these dudes can do it or you won't be around that's the thing because kentucky is not used to what's going on with them and like for the last couple of years it's just been that way for him yeah it's nice to have those great players but they're one and done they're gone if you can't get into that transfer portal and get guys that aren't your your high school you know all mcdonald all americans to come and you get these older guys, like you say, 24, 25 years old that know how to play, really play and they can just take you and, and work on you. Then that's a problem because those high schoolers are it's it's not that way, even though they go to the next level. after right. one year. Yeah, because it's all about development, like Jack Golke. The dude that was lighting them up yesterday that dropped yeah. 32, hit the 10 threes. That dude, he looks like Dan Aykroyd. That's what everybody's been comparing him to. It looks like. Dan Aykroyd when he was acting in Tommy Boy for the oh, rape company and shit. That's, he looks, he's that old. That's what I'm saying. He's that old looking, grown ass man, like nasty taco meat on the chest type of dudes. Like yeah. these dudes from Kentucky, Reed Shepard, this is the first time he's ever lived on his own. He looks like a damn Disney character. Like wow. those dudes ain't ready for this. So again, it used to work out. He used to sure. you know, be able to get that talent and beat the experience because you were going up against 21, 22 year old guys, but the transfer portal wasn't what it is. Huh. NIL wasn't what it is. Guys, the COVID year and stuff, all that stuff hurts what Calipari is about when it comes to actually winning games in the tournament. And yeah, man, they got got yesterday, but that wow. Jack Golke, the shots that he was hitting, unbelievable. That, that's some of the best shot making that I've seen in a long time. Like that was what Jimmer for that was doing. Okay. That's what yeah. Steph was doing. Like a lot of those weren't good shots, Buck, for no. the average normal basketball player. 
a lot of those shots that he hit were horrible shots that if CC saw me taking those shots, I wouldn't have gotten any play at time type of stuff. Sit down, yeah. Right. But their coach, Brad Kempe, he loves that shit. He, he eggs that on. He says, yo, we got to play that way. And they got confidence, man. They got swagger. Goki talking about they're not a Cinderella team. Like, yo, that North Carolina State game, Oakland game, that's going to be a fun one. Like, that's oh, what yeah. the tournament's about. It might not be chalk. I know people love chalk as the oh, no, I don't see no goes chalk. on. Yeah, I, I just want to see good basketball. And your boy, old left tackle, DJ Burns, wow. that matchup, you know, they're probably going to play that two, three matchup zone on him. North well, what a nice State touch he has. Well, with both hands, right-handed and left-handed. Oh, he's so he's skilled. Nice touch. Yeah. Because I didn't think he'd be able to – I didn't think he'd be able to have the handles in there in the crowd – he handles the ball in traffic really, really well, and he's got great hands. And to be able to go left and right and left-handed, he shoots that little left-hand jumper, man. That's a problem for everybody. Plus, he moves you out of the way. That's what I'm saying. The officials, they're really careful how they call the game with him because they don't want to foul him out just because he's big. And when he touches the guy's bodies, they go flying all over the place. You know, he just yeah. moves him. He just moves yeah. him with his body. That's all. He's not knocking anybody over. Well, one thing about that, because you saw it yesterday with Dylan DeSue, he ran over uh, uh, Scott, which Scott flopped, but it was a charge. You got to make yeah. that call. He was in position. Dylan DeSue lowered his shoulder. With Burns, as you were saying, he's so crafty that he takes his time. So every bump, he'll slow his body down to where sure. it, it doesn't look as intense as it really is. So you can't call it. It's just being physical, but it's not being out of control. Right. And, he, you know, you've got to be a student of the game. If you want to be great, you've got to be a student of the game. And he is. He talked about growing up watching Akimu Lajuan, watching he his a little work. bit of Shaq. He does some Shaq kind of things with his body. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm like, wow, that guy's just moving these guys out. And he's not being real over physical. He's just moving them out with his body. He just knows how to get himself in place. And – and then he's getting layups. I mean, those those little left hand deals. Those things are like layups for him. Yeah, dropping Texas them a Tech went down right. sad. Yeah, Texas Tech. Oh, they went down sad. That that was he tough. Really did. Yeah, shout out CB. I agree, man. It was, you know, Tech. Pop Isaacs is their best player. His field goal percentage is trash. Oh yeah trash like he's a high volume shooter but if your best player is just that bad in efficiency you're probably not gonna be a good postseason team because you know every team's good so they did just enough like let's not get it twisted united supermarkets arena their home stadium is one of the toughest places to play in basketball their record there they win games based off their crowd because what else do you have to do in Lubbock? You got nothing else to do but to go to them games. So they take advantage of it. But when they play on the road, when they play in neutral sites, right. at places where them Lubbock people, some of them probably real cheap, ain't trying to travel, they don't got that same advantage. No, You got to rely on pure hoops. You got to go back to fundamental, the game plan and stuff. You can't have these teams getting rattled just because it's loud in there and it's right. hard to hear and, you know, just the intimidation factor. You can't rely on that. They do. You they know, do I, I, and I finally, uh, Zay, have laid off of Acemas because if he doesn't take those shots that he takes, nobody will. He is a high-volume shooter. And now, but now he's come away from the three point line a little bit and coming inside. He's making his moves inside and trying to hit little fadeaways, you know, at 12, at the 12 foot range. He's not, everything isn't a three pointer anymore. And I like that about him, which makes me say, go ahead and take that three this time. Go ahead and take that tough three because now you're starting to, to penetrate a little bit, pull up, fade away, and make some two point shots. Now, he's not, I'm not saying he's great at going over to the top of guys, but at least he's trying now. Everything right. isn't a three point shot with him anymore, you know? Yeah, you like Max A. Smith's three-point percentage, 36%, uh, especially with the volume that he shoots at. Yeah. It's his 
two point percentage or his overall field goal percentage at 42. That's what you were referring to, Buck. That's yeah. a high volume. And, you know, you knew it was going to be a jump, him going from the Summit League, that mid major at Old Roberts, to the best conference in basketball in the Big 12. But I thought he's done a great job. Like, again, I. Some of the things that Roddy Terry does with him are a little questionable. That's all. It's just he can't be a primary ball handler all the time because now you're taking a pure scorer and turning him into a pure point guard that has to score too. So now his mind's thinking, okay, I got to give Dylan to sue the ball a lot. And, yes, I get it. He's best with the ball in his hands, but not all the time. He's not great off the screen. By the way, he doesn't get his jumper off of his screen because people still can get around that screen and block his little jump shot. He's not that – he's not like Steph Curry. He's no. not like Steph coming off of screens. And he doesn't have that – he doesn't have that that quickness that I thought – now, he can go to the – he can go to the hoop and have that nice high arc and make a two high off the backboard. He does that really, really well. But he doesn't have the kind of quickness that Steph has off of screens. Steph comes off those screens and is sharp. This guy, this guy right here still – the guy who's trailing can still catch up to him off a jumper, you know what I'm saying? Right. He still gets hands in his face off of screens. I don't know what that's about. He, he's not as quick as I thought he would be when he's at Oral Roberts. I was thinking, this guy's coming to this league and coming off of screens and making jumpers, you know, uh, but he doesn't. He doesn't yeah. do it. He's not as quick as I thought he was. Yeah, because if he was that quick, he wouldn't be at Texas. He'd be in the league. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. You're right. He, you know, he, he'd be in the league. He'd be those Trey Youngs and Steph Curry, as we right. mentioned. And yeah, yeah. That, that's just yeah, that kind of quickness. Yeah. And that's if you put somebody big on them, that's why Ziggler, who isn't big, but more physical than him, that like mm-hmm. Ziggler probably has him by 20 pounds. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's going to be physical with him. He's going to bump him every time he comes up the floor. Every time Tennessee scores, Ziggler's going to be right there on Max Aismas to where maybe he won't even let him bring the ball at the court. You might have to just go to default mode and give the ball to Tyrese Hunter and say, yo, just because Ziggler's playing such tenacious defense, you know, let's just get you up the man. court and get into our offense as quick as possible and let's not worry about an early turnover. But, yeah, man, Max Aismas, it's been an adjustment for him. Like, I've talked about it throughout the season. Going from the number one option in the first half of the season because Dylan DeSue's out to the number Mm -hmm. two option, along with this is your first year under Rodney Terry, so you're getting used to his system. You're getting used to all your new teammates because you're coming from Earl Roberts to Texas. Like, that's still difficult. That, that, that's tough. Like, that's why Coach Terry, he's laughed about, man, I wish I just had Max for two years, but he obviously doesn't have any eligibility left. But, you know, he, he's still learning. So now Dylan DeSue comes back and you're the number two option, but you've been the number one your whole college career. Sure. You know, you've been that guy to where you know you can take bad shots, but they are good shots because of the personnel around you. Is it up to par? Is he the Dylan primary Dylan. ball handler at Oral Roberts? Did he bring it up yeah. the court? Every, he did? Every time. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. He was the point. He was That'll the wear point. you out. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, and you got to, he has an Allen Iverson type stamina. I don't see Max Aceman's really getting tired much. No. You know, he might get beat up a little bit and go he through. He gets beat up. Man. He does get beat up. Yeah, he has an Allen Iverson mentality. That's why I can marvel with him. But yeah, I, I, I just think that. You know, the adjustment process going through that. Now you have to worry, okay, Dylan DeSue needs his touches. And going to what you were saying about DeSue, he really struggled five for 18, only 12 points. You don't like that at all. Is he, you you have to think, Buck, I don't know if he's 100%. Because that Baylor game wasn't too long ago. Right. And even though he's back and you're better with Dylan DeSue out there at 20% than, not having them out there at all. I don't, I don't know. He won't say it. You know, he won't admit it. No, no. nobody would admit it. You never want anybody to know, but you would just have to think naturally, okay, this guy with all the injury problems that he's had throughout his career, you just that injury that he had against Baylor, he yeah. might not be fully healthy. He's, and he's, he's, working too, he's working too hard when he's down in the pivot now. He didn't have to work as hard. He was real fluid and had that quick step. He doesn't have that quick step right now, and he's working hard to get that little jump hook off. His little jump shot, he's working hard to get that shot off. Now, he wasn't working that hard 
earlier when he was scoring those big numbers, he was getting that thing off smoothly. And you're right, that knee may still be bugging him where he's having to work an awful lot, you know, now. And he's getting tired coming up because he's playing some defense. He played pretty good defense again yesterday. You he know? did, yeah. That'll tire yeah, you. I, As I said, that, that group yesterday didn't see defense like they saw the Texans put on them because as bad as they were offensively, they were really good on defense. I mean, you don't you don't hold anybody down. You know, you don't hold Holy Cross or you don't hold the women's team down like they did, you know, in the first half. I mean, that's just great. That's just great defense that you play. You know, and, and, and for Weaver, yeah, I like to see him when he gets in there early because he's his he makes everybody around him play defense. They just have to, you know, because you look bad. He can make you look bad if you're not a part of that defense. If you're standing yeah. around just waiting to go on the fast break, that dude will make you look bad because he's diving all over the place, knocking balls off of people's legs. He just – now, I don't like when he's in the corner trying to get jump shots off, although he's hit a couple shots now. Yo, he, he had a little step back in the yeah. mid-range. Yeah. On the baseline, I was like, okay, Kendall Weaver. Okay, dog. Every time he takes a jumper, I'm going, oh, no, don't do that. Yeah, man. I, hey. know where he's, I know where he's going when he drives. He's going right. He's right-handed most of the time. He's going to his right, and when he starts going down through the lane, I said, that thing's going up. Somehow he's going to double pump it, clutch it, and try to get it off or get fouled. That's but he don't, thing, go to the left. he don't go to the left that often. He won't go left. Yeah, he has to work on that offseason. We got to work on the left hand. We got to work on the jump shot. But he's so athletic, Buck, that when he drives, he gets so much hang time. Guys are coming down, and he's still hanging in the air, pumping and moving the ball around. And Once he gets back know, off the court again, he gets off the floor again if he misses. Yeah, good second yeah. jump. Yeah, Absolutely. His second jump is awesome. I, I like watching him play. Yeah, and that, that's what I'm saying. Like, I, you got to put, put him in the game early. Like IT Horton Guard and Dalton Connect, that sounds terrible. That sounds horrible. Like IT Horton yesterday, he was all right. He was a part of the defense, but 16 minutes, he still gave you donuts when it came to the points. Like zero points. That's just six rebounds. He's like, you know, Brock Cunningham will come in and take a three immediately to see if he's on, period. I don't care where it's from. He just takes it. I'm like, okay, now that you missed it, you ain't going to take any more. There's no reason for you to take any more. And Horton's the same way. Generally, he comes in and he take he didn't take that many shots yesterday for some reason. He didn't, yeah, he didn't he defend was. all that well. He t- generally, he takes more shots. He'll say, okay, this is me. This is my night. I'm good with two. <laughs> I'm good with two in 16 minutes. Like, again, I don't know. I don't understand him starting. I don't. If Rodney Terry wins this game tomorrow, I will I won't say anything about it ever again. Because that okay. would be a huge upset. Coach Terry, I would apologize. I come in on Monday, and I would apologize if they win this game with IT Horton starting. But it still doesn't make any sense. And, again, he's going to match up with Connect. Like, he's going to match up with one of the best players in the nation. And if I'm Connect, if I'm Rick Barnes, I'm saying, yo, go at this guy. We could get off to a start. Rodney is going to bring in Weaver at least two minutes in. Sure. There's still no reason why. I, there, I, there's no explanation. The only thing that he said is we want more offense with IT Horton. But if he's not giving you any offense, then it doesn't right. make any sense. That doesn't. He's giving you zero points, so you can't say that. Kendall Weaver's giving you eleven. He's the better offensive player. Like why? I get it. You like those guys coming off the bench and giving you right. a spark. A spark, excuse me. But there's something about starting off slow. That could just give you the bad rhythm oh, yeah. of a game. And then others this time another you're in the tournament. You're in the big time. This is Yeah. It. And like if that other team starts out fast, that could just lead to momentum throughout the game. They're gonna be like, oh, I'm hitting this already. I'm feeling good. I'm gonna continue this. My confidence is up. Say, so how do you how are you feeling about Texas AM Nebraska? I, I like I like AM's guard. I like that the, the Taylor. Taylor. That guy's awesome. He's so good. He's that, so he good. Is awesome. He is made for this tournament. Yeah, yeah, he's good. They're going up against uh, Curry Teriyaki, yeah, Japanese Steph Curry. I like him too. Yeah, uh, yeah I like a And M. I got them winning that game. You know what? I almost wanted to put them to beat Houston. Houston looks tired. Oh, wow. I think Houston looks tired. I think I, I've been telling BK. I think that um, coaches, coaches, always in their ear, twenty four seven. He's, I mean, up and down the court. You got to play good defense. But I think sometimes I think that he's just he's kind of overbearing, it seems to me, a little bit. 
And I got to believe they're tired. They've been playing that kind of defense from game one. They don't take nights off where they don't play good defense. And they look a little tired to me. And they've got the one guy hurt. So I'm just wondering if A&M guard play, you know, you know, shedding those guys are going to play. But, boy, it's hard. That guy's big. That guard from A&M, he's he's kind of long, too. I mean, and he's stout. You know what I mean? He can right. get a shot off. He rebounds. He wants to, and he wants to run. With oh, you're record. talking about the other brother, the brother with the headband. Yeah, they they, they got guys who want to run. Yeah, they got. I forgot his name. I'm I'm thinking Taylor. He's their main scorer. Oh no, Taylor's sweet. I mean, he he's he's he look like he's look like he's ready for NBA kind of guy. Yeah, he has that type of game. His defense, I don't think, will let him go to the league. But huh. yeah, you're Radford. Yeah, Radford, who you're talking about. Yeah, that brother. Yeah, he's Baton Rouge, dude. Yeah, he's physical, 16 points a game. They got a good backcourt, and you're right. If they win this game against Nebraska, they would give Houston everything they could handle. Yeah. Um, You know, Houston, that defense is so tough, and are they talented enough offensively? Like they need and have to have LJ Cryer knocking down shots sure. to keep advancing because the games that he struggles shooting, they struggle. Like Jamal Shedd, as you said, he's going to get his. He's going to do what he does. But he he's still a pure point guard that scores when he has to. He doesn't By the way, if he's, covering, if, he's, if he's having to cover, they get to the point where, I mean, if Taylor if, – if, if, if you got to cover Taylor, he physically can make you foul, and, and Shed will foul. I mean, he's physical. He's trying to block them all, you know, and he's trying to keep you out, and he's not letting you go by. He will whack you across the back of the arms. He's not letting you get anything <laughs> over him. So he can get in foul trouble quickly, you know. Yeah. And that, that's what I'm thinking A&M is going to try to do with their guards, get those guys in foul trouble. But Cryer, you're right, he has to knock them down. He has to. Emmanuel Sharp has to be good. Yep. You talk about – Juwan Roberts, who was injured, their big man who killed Texas when he came into the moon, and he killed Texas when they played them in H-Town. But, yeah, that guy's so versatile. He has to be healthy for him because they'll give it to him in the post, and he'll go score. He's only but 6'7", but he has that really long wingspan. And, yeah, he really makes them go. And, yes, he be Shaka struggling. Shaka down 10 in the first half. Western Kentucky, 43-33 with Tyler no, Coleman. it's back. not going to happen. It's not happening. Shaka. Come on. It's Shaka. No. Come on. He gets tight this time of the year. VCU, you have good. nothing to lose. You play He's loose. good players. They'll be just fine. Hey, man. We saw yesterday Calipari, who's won a championship before, Hall of Famer. Just win it by yeah, one. Got- win them by one. Win at the buzzer. Who cares? <laughs> right now, Buck. Anything else impress you yesterday with March Madness? Kansas, they barely squeaked out one against Samford. They were up by twenty in the. Uh, I a lot of people thought that was just going to back. I think a lot of people thought they were going to just exit in game one. Well, what impresses me is the fact that nobody's going to beat UConn through this, so it doesn't matter. Damn, that, you can't back to back win the national championship in basketball. Nobody's going to beat UConn. It's going to no. be tough. It's going to be mean, tough. I, I watched Iowa State play. I wanted to be really impressed with them. I'm not. You know, you know what I really like still? I like as as they got better at the end of Baylor. Yeah. The way Baylor played at the end of the basketball season. And it just – their coach is good. That dude can coach. Oh, Scott Drew's incredible. And he knows how to coach guys into this time of the year. You know, yeah. from the beginning of the season till now, his guys just get better. So I'm expecting Baylor to go pretty far too. Yeah, they're bigs. That's what I'm saying. He always goes to Africa and gets those bigs, man. They have yeah, crazy does. Zimbabwe, Umbabwe, Kunta type names. Oh, and yeah. they all about seven foot. And so <laughs> them Kunta Locking brothers, shots. man. Yeah, Locking that shots. that hoop barefoot and shit, tough as hell. <laughs> tough as hell. He just gets about three or four of them, and they're always skilled. And I'm like, dude, how do you keep doing this? And it always goes with his really good guard play. And he's so good at developing yeah. those guards and working on things that fit their, you know, personnel. And, yeah, I, I like them a lot, too. I got them going to the Final Four. You know? Yeah, I got, I got St. Mary's winning and then playing Alabama and Alabama getting beat by St. Mary's. Yeah. Damn. That's right, the Gonzaga killers of St. Mary's. That's right. 
Yeah, Gonzaga, they rolled yesterday. That was my big time upset that flopped. I thought Magnese would be better against Gonzaga, but Mark Few, you know, that's a guy that's been to the national championship. He could coach a little bit. I doubted him a little bit too much, but that's on me. Shout out to Gonzaga moving on. You know, you know who's uh, got the easy road is Purdue. They got the, they, they got the easy road. Yeah. But Tennessee play. and Texas? Yeah, they, either one of them. You know, that guy's not going to keep losing every year. But that big son of a gun in the middle, I'm just worried about if his little young guard now, who's only a sophomore, has got it because he didn't have it last year. He couldn't he lead them. He was too young. He was too young. But he was he's good this year, Smith, Is Brandon he? Smith. Yeah, he's good, man. I like his game. He got hurt in the Big Ten uh, tournament. Is he all right from that? He did something to his leg, right? He came back the next day and played, but he didn't look right. Oh, okay. When they lost to Wisconsin, he didn't look right, and they need him because that yeah. dude. That's what hurt them last year. His play, he played like a freshman. They play like a freshman, and Matt Painter put way too much on him last year. Yeah. This year, I think he could take it, but if he's, gim you know, a little gimpy, yeah. that's not good. And Don't sleep on Creighton, Buck. Creighton. I know. I, they, I had South Carolina beating them. I don't know what the hell was wrong with me. They got oh, man, yo. Creighton, old racist McDermott, he he gets those guys playing, and they got three good enough players, good enough star-type players, and Alexander, the guard, who has a really good pull-up yep. mid jumper, Shireman is a good ball handler, can shoot from the outside, the lefty, and then their big man, Colt Brenner, who might be the most important piece because, as you mentioned, Zach Eady for Purdue, he's such a hoss being 7-4 player of the year, 24 points a game, 12 rebounds. You gotta have somebody that could play him one on one at times due yep. to the shooting that Purdue has around them. Like they're the second best three point shooting team in the nation. That's why they've been getting everybody this year, and they're one of the best teams, the second overall speed in the tournament. But if you could play Zach Eady one on one and just make life difficult for him, you right. know, I'm not saying he won't get his twenty, but you don't want him to get. 35, 33, no. and stuff like that. Or you he's don't want to get, get put backs, balls are going to go up off the yeah. rim. He's going to get those. Yeah. If you allow Smith and Jones and those guys to yeah. stay in the single digits or the low double digits, I think they're gettable. And I got Creighton beating them in the Elite Eight. I think that would be a hell of a matchup because, again, I like what old racist McDermott, what he does with his ball club. They looked good yesterday. How you feel about how you feel about Auburn? Uh, I don't know, man. This SEC, that's what I'm saying. Was it fool's gold the whole time? You know, I get Tom Izzo, Michigan State beating Mississippi State. That's Tom sure. Izzo. But, again, Kentucky losing yesterday, South Carolina. We know Tennessee's good. We'll see with Texas tomorrow. But Auburn's one of those teams, and they're in a very tough region too, being in the east at that number four seed. But yep. Bruce Pearl, hey, he gets those guys playing. And he's one of those dudes. They might not have the most talent. But... Yeah, man, he's been a cheater. He knows how to coach. <laughs> yeah, he knows. Yeah, when it's cheating so he definitely oh, knows. Man. But, I remember when Bruce Pearl was at Boston College with Dr. Thomas Davis. You don't remember oh, Dr. Yeah. Thomas at Iowa? You don't remember Tom Davis being at Iowa? No. Dr. Thomas called, yeah, he was Bruce Pearl was his assistant at Boston College. Wow. He was his cheating self. He was cheating at BC? He's cheating everywhere. BC had a scandal, remember? Don't forget. Oh. <laughs> he had a scandal with the mob. They won't win any games, but they had scandals. The players were taking the money. Damn, man. I don't know who this is. I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name, but it says, come once to visit Europe for one of the games in the Euro League. You will have a crazy experience. The crowd there is crazy. There are no such things in the NBA in terms of cheering the crowd. Yeah, that's right. I do see those games that Luka and Jokic and Giannis used to play in. The crowds be rocking. They they treat it like soccer too. Oh yeah, they be shooting fireworks and nice. shit in the stadiums and stuff. It's yeah, man. It'd be popping. And 
Northwestern, they end up beating Florida Atlantic. That game went into overtime, and Northwestern just put it on those dudes. Yeah, I did. I had Northwestern winning that game. Hi, Dan. And I thought Florida Atlantic getting to the championship game last year, or not championship, the Final Four, I thought mm-hmm. they would have more experience. But, yeah, Northwestern moving on. Big time win for them. Yeah, I, I got, you know, my other Big Ten, I got Wisconsin winning too. I like Wisconsin. Uh, I really do. I thought they played their ass off against Illinois in the championship. And when you beat Purdue, you're a good team. I don't care if Braden Smith, their point guards, healthy or not. You're a good team, man. Yes, yeah, I bailed out on. I, I bailed out on Illinois. I mean, I just because I'm such a Big Twelve homer with Iowa State beating them, you know, in that next round. So I, I don't know why why I have that. There's something about Brad Underwood that just rubs me the wrong way. I don't know. I watch him coach. There is something about that. Dude. There's something about him. You're like, dude, you just look like a complete sleaze ball. but he might be the nicest guy in the world. I don't know. I like Illinois, man. They looked good yesterday. They started off slow, but then they started putting it on. Um, I don't know who they played, but, yeah, they were solid. Terrence Shannon Jr., Marcus Domas, who got a triple-double yesterday. They don't have a true point guard, but Domas. More head state. Yeah, yeah, Moorhead State, Domas, their point, who had a triple-double. He's like 6'6". Mm-hmm. He's not super flashy, but he's super fundamentally sound. Like, he'll take you to the post. And since, you know, he's their point guard, you got to put a, your point guard on him who might not be more than six foot. So he'll take guys to the post, and he makes good passes down low. Like, I, I like Brad Underwood's team, and – they didn't win the Big Ten championship for nothing. So Yeah, see, I haven't got a chance to sit down and watch game after game after game. I just get bits and pieces of some of these. Uh, the ones in the, at that 8 o'clock hour, I don't stay up at 11 o'clock watching basketball games. That's just not going to happen for me. But I don't see – I still don't even know what happened to the, – the score I don't know, I, I think I heard something. Did Duquesne beat BYU? Yep. They did, huh? They got them. For real. They got them. Yeah. To yeah, be why you shoot a bunch of threes and didn't get it, didn't score. It was really down low. They were not good. Like you think about Traore, the big African brother dude. That's only about six six, but yeah. he's super super hefty, and he has good footwork. He's been doing well in the Big Twelve. He struggled yesterday with hmm. those bigs for Duquesne. Like they're athletic and. You know, they're not the biggest guys, but they were taller and longer than him. So Khalifa and Traore, they struggled down low. And the only person that really got off for BYU was Robinson. He had 20-something, and he was the reason why they stayed in the game. But, you know, the Mormons, they ain't got no athletes, man. They got them white boys. They ain't got no athletes. The only one that was hooping was the brother on the team. And, again, we knew what happened with their seating. BK told me the other day how – since they can't play on Sundays due to their beliefs and faith, they had to take the sixth seed instead of the fifth seed that they deserved. And hey, so they wouldn't play on a Sunday. Yeah, they can't play on Sunday. So, all right, I guess that fifth seed y'all wanted, we gonna give it to somebody else. Y'all get Duquesne. Good y'all luck, get Duquesne, huh? Duquesne, the Dukes, Duquesne, the Dukes. Wow. Yeah. Good luck. Score. That's a spread, and that's I think that's the only score I don't know about. Yeah, man. So good basketball today. Definitely going to give y'all my Zay call your big hat spirit prediction for tomorrow's game versus Tennessee. We'll break that break that down more later. But got to give the sponsors a shout out. Said yeah, let me talk. Let me tell you about our good friends at Texas Orthopedics. If you're there seeking specialized patient focused orthopedic care, contact Texas Orthopedics. They are our friends, and their physicians offer surgical and non-surgical orthopedic care for children and adults. Spinal care, sports medicine, trauma care, joint replacement, rheumatology, and even more. Dr. Christopher Danny and Chris Stockton, they are dedicated orthopedic surgeons, that their goal is to get you right back into good health and that great quality of life that you deserve. Texas Orthopedics is the largest independent orthopedic practice in the state of Texas. For more information, go to TXOrtho.com. Yeah, Buck, can you tell us about Covert BK? Oh, man, 42 acres of un believable products seven different brands out there and they the folks let me tell you about the coverts they have been with us from day one and will be with us till the bitter end 
86 service bays out there for your convenience. You know, if you don't have a lot of time, that's the place you want to go. And if you didn't even buy your vehicle there, you didn't buy a Cadillac there, or you didn't buy a Jeep there, you can get it serviced at their locations, which a lot of folks aren't going to do for you. But Dan Covert and Stacy and Jerome and the whole gang out there, Mike, we love them. And nobody beats a covert deal. Not now, not ever. That's right. We'll get back to basketball in a little bit. Buck, I'd like to talk to you about Texas Pro Day. Guys got a chance to showcase their skills once again to over 90 NFL people and execs. Mike McDaniel was there. Shane Steichen, head coach oh, yeah. of the Colts. You know, Zach Taylor, head coach of the Bengals. Everybody showed out. Steve Sarkeesian looked like a proud father a couple of days ago, and he should be. He should be. When you got Xavier Worthy breaking records in the 40 at the combine, you got Byron Murphy, who's most likely going to be a first round pick. Javondre Sweat went in the Outland Award this past season for best defensive lineman. You got a lot to be proud about if you're yep. Steve Sarkeesian. And that's how you keep getting those big time recruits and transfers. Well, that's you know? why the that's why the, the the coaches show up, not just general managers and position coaches, but the head coaches and general managers show up. Because this is what you do when you send 11 people to the combine. It's the way it should be every year. This is the way it used to be at Texas. You know, this is this is how it should be for this university when it comes to pro day. And a lot of guys had opportunities. I can't believe Sweat and those guys, Byron Murphy, they had to do a lot. They did enough at the at the big combine. There was there was other guys that needed to do Jay, Jay Witt needed this this little workout pretty much to show what he's gonna do. Is he gonna be a drafted wide receiver or is he just gonna be a free agent? This and, and Sanders, it had to, you know, I don't think he ran another 40 time, but damn, that first 40 time that he ran at the combine, that's no good. I mean, that guy can't be any worse than he's got to be four six, you know, four six four and under. Can't be four seven and change. That's not gonna work. It really isn't. I mean, that hurts his draft stock. It really, really does. And somebody told me he only lifted like four or five times. Hey. You know, Eight times, <laughs> two twenty-five. Yeah, yeah. That's, that, that's, that's like where I was as a wide receiver. That kind of lift. My goodness. Yeah, that's a low light, definitely for all the guys that are putting their name in the draft. And JT Sanders, you know, Chip said that he sounded or seemed a little surly or his attitude wasn't where you would want it to be. He kind of snapped on the bench press guy in the warm-up. The coach told him, hey, man, get it all the way up. And JT was like, hey, I'm just warming up. And Chip said he kind of just – the tone was a little off-putting. Dude, those guys are listening to everything you do there, the way you behave – they're, they they come to the university and they talk to the training staff. They talk to people that, you know, that you see every day. They want to know what kind of attitude you have. How are you personally? You know, if you're having a bad day, how do you treat people around you? They ask those questions. I was trying to tell BK that yesterday. He said, you know what kind of people play in the NFL? I said, I know they got rapists and murderers and stuff. I said, but when these people that come, they're about to pay your check, come to your university, they want to know how you treat just a normal guy who's taping your ankles. If you're an asshole, you know, they want to know that. They want to know what kind of guy they're going to pay. They want to pay money to. So they ask just about anybody, anybody that puts, you know, gives you a pair of socks over there. They're going to say, what kind of guy is he to you? And if you're if you're one of those guys, say, that guy's a jerk all the time. You know, he's or he's just or somebody says he's OK. That ain't good enough. They they they're docking down stuff like that because they got to pay your check. They don't want a bunch of surly dudes around them. They got enough surly people that are good. You know what I mean? Yeah, not everybody has Deion Sanders' talent to where you could say yeah. Detroit Lions, they couldn't even put me on layaway or whatever the hell you said. Deion could do that. Deion could kind of be an asshole because he was that good. Arguably the greatest cornerback of all time. Lawrence Taylor could act the way he does, which he didn't sure. do it much with Bill Parcells because Lawrence Taylor, one of the greatest defensive players of all time. They not everybody be, has that luxury. Yeah, they want you to be B. John Robinson and act like him. That's what they like to see. They want you to be good a good player and act, act pretty good. They don't want, they, that, that, their life is filled with surly people around them in the NFL. They don't need players that are so, so borderline guys to act that way. You know, they, they need guys that are going to be team players. You know, I, I know that they must be happy to have a sit down with a guy like A.D. Mitchell. He just seems like the kind of kid that just can't wait to get in the NFL that has worked hard, been to two different places, had success, goes to the combine and just knocks it out of the park. That they're looking, 
I know Kansas City has got to be thinking about him. One of those two wide receivers. So those are the kind of guys they want. They guys they want people with smiles on their face. They don't want them. They, they don't need no frowns around there. You know. Yeah, absolutely, and it probably would make more sense for Kansas City to go the Adonai Mitchell route if he was available at that 32 spot since they just picked up Hollywood Brown. For, oh, yeah. But they, need a consistent a, guy. they need a consistent guy who can catch it. Who yeah. can catch it anytime. Still running 4-3? Yeah. Are you kidding me? Yeah, and, you know, going back to what you said about Adonai Mitchell just being a great team guy and having his head in the right place – the dude literally came to Texas because he wanted to be close to his family, because he wanted to be close to his right. daughter, because you got somebody 21, 22 years old thinking about being a good father, yeah. talking about changing him. Like he was at Georgia, Buck. He was at Georgia, but he was like, you know what? I want to be in my daughter's life. Like I, I don't want to be, you know, I, I want to be around her as much as possible. Let me go to a situation that's still going to be good for me. Obviously, for her. a great decision. But this is for her. He always talks about, oh, why did you come to Texas? It starts with his daughter first, and then it goes with Steve Sarkeesian and the offense yeah. and all that stuff. You know, yeah, so yeah. Adonai Mitchell, you're not going to have to worry about him at all. Like, yeah, you're right. He's just going to be one of those guys that's going to focus and lock in once he gets to the next level because he wants to be one of those top guys. And yeah, I said I it early in the season, Buck. I said his comparison is T. Higgins. And now you got all these guys who cover the NFL. They're bringing sure. up T. Higgins' name. And I'm like, man. I, I do. You just see that body type. You see the smoothness. And, yeah, he doesn't have just perfect Jerry Rice routes. I get it. Not everybody is Jerry the greatest. But as I Mitchell, he's just going to keep getting better and better. And his IQ, you saw sure. it here, just his ball making, you know, ball playing ability, playmaking ability, excuse me, that, that's that's going to be there, man. He's a big-time player, and I can't wait to see what he does on the next Yeah, and, and, and a lot of these guys will show up because – you know, you've got your quarterback back, and they get a they get a quick look at him. You know, maybe one of the top one or two guys taken in the draft next year. So they get to see Quinn Ewers on a freebie. They come to campus and watch him throw to his own guys and watch his throwing up close and in, in person. You know, they that's great for the head coach. The head coaches are showing up to see that guy. As much as they're coming to see some of the other guys yesterday or the other day, they're coming to see that dude throw the ball in person. They don't they like the film, but what they wanted to do is they want to be live to see him drop back and chuck it to these guys. So that was a big deal for Quinn Ewers and, 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 you know, for the wide receivers to get the ball thrown to him and stuff. Plus they've got some running backs of the future that they want to look at too. They want to position themselves and they want to see the left tackle, even though he didn't have to work out, you know, he came around the facility, you know, those guys. <laughs> Just to be seen. Oh, you know, he came around to be seen. Of course he went through the weight room with all those coaches, general managers there. And the first thing they said, that's Banks right there, isn't it? You know, they, they just know. They just look at him and say, that's it. That's a pro right there. That's hey, word, word on the street is he's looking leaner. Really? Yeah. I don't know if he needs that. I thought his physique was fine, but. I tell hey, you, he ain't looking leaner. Sweat. sweat ain't looking any leaner. I heard he yeah, lost. Yeah, man. I, see, I'm getting mixed reports because Chip. Did he lose a pound? Did he lose a pound? The, the brochure said that he was 362. The little pamphlet that came out that everybody's weight, but then everybody's saying, including our guy CB, which CB, you're very credible to me. You know that. Every he's saying 367. And I thought he was gonna come in at 355. You know, I'm, no. I, I I was I was aiming a little bit, I was reaching, but yeah. I said, you know what? T Sweat saw that 366 at the combine. It's been about three weeks ago. He got on some whole 30 natural. Plant based type diet. You gained a pound? Ten. He ain't oh. dropping ten. He ain't drop no ten. That guy was not weighing no 360 something when he was at UT. That dude was 370, 375. They weren't telling you, they were talking about him weighing 366. That guy ain't never weighed 366 since he was in ninth grade. I don't even know what they're talking about. He, about weighed, three, he weighed 366 at the combine. So if you're saying, and they weighed him there. So, so you know he weighed three seventy something. You know at at Texas he weighed three seventy something. Come on, they weren't going to tell you. They weren't telling you the right weight when he was here. He was Come just on, fine man. playing at that weight. And I told BK, I said, dude, they're going every week. He's going to get fined, except if he plays good, they're not going to touch him. But the minute the minute he raises his hand to come out of a game when they need him, at some time in the second quarter, they're about to get him on the scale and they're about to get a paycheck. They're about to get some out of his paycheck. 
and that'll be every week until he gets to where they want him to be. But if he's good, guess what they're going to do? They're going to say a damn thing. Come on, man. He played in all this heat last year. He never wanted to come out of the game. Nobody, He never tapped out to come out of games. He was ready to go. Now, they did it because they were smart enough to rotate him a little bit, but you never saw that guy with his hands on his hips all tired. He played whatever he was, 375, 380 last year. He played pretty good at that weight. But I know he wasn't stop, three. Hey, stop saying that, man. Stop. You don't need to give him more weight. 380? That's insane. He was not no 366. Oh, he, got to the combine. he wasn't no three. And then what did they weigh him in this time? Three, he gained a pound? I, I don't know how true that is. There's rumors saying he gained a pound. There's rumors saying he was 362. I don't know. I want to give him the benefit of the doubt always. You're out here. You give him him the benefit of the doubt when he drops 10. You don't give him the benefit of the doubt if he gains two or loses two. That ain't nothing. That's just three slices of pizza. I mean, come on, man. If he he, he was 366 at the combine, he came back, he was 364. I'm not saying, hey, great job. I'm saying, oh, you got some more to lose. That's what I'm going to say. And if he's over over the weight of the combine, now as as a general manager, you're probably going, damn. This guy couldn't he couldn't go home and lose a couple pounds before we got back to him again. See, like listen to matter. that keyword you just said, home, which means mama's cooking. Yes. Which means probably a lot of greets, probably a lot yes. of fried. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I, I see, he ain't gonna be in mama's nest much longer. He's about no. to be off in the real world. You gotta, you know, you know them mamas, you know them grandmas. Oh, that baby. Dude's his, that dude's about to have his own chef who's going to say to him, another slice, Mr. Sweat? Yeah, give me three more slices. Not one more. Give me three more slices. No, yeah. hell no. Give me another pie. Give me a Fire whole that pie. Chef. Fire that chef, man. No. That chef that's should not be making them pizza. But once again, if he's playing good, they're not going to say much to him. They're just going to ask him to be at a weight. But if he's not playing well, that's when the checkbook, that's when they started we're having to write them checks out. You know, oh, uh, this is a fifteen hundred dollar check. We're gonna do you by the pound here. So they and they do that. They want to get their money. But if he's playing good, they probably just let it slide till till when he's not playing good. So when they got an excuse to get some more money back from him, that's when it'll happen. Yeah. But you can't if he's an all pro at at three seventy. What are you gonna do? Find him? No, you don't find that dude. Well, what what problem would you rather have? Because obviously. The weight is big. You want it to cut down at least 20 LBs. If he could get to the 350s, even if 359, that's a step. You know, yeah. we'll take that. That's progress. But what would you rather have? Him having to lose weight with him being, as you say, 375, or be like Mozzie Smith, who got drafted by the Cowboys from Michigan, who can't keep weight on, who's in the 290s and stuff, no. who got moved all types of places this year and got dominated by all types of center and guards. No, because I know that I know the big man from Texas is hard to move no matter what. He ain't going anywhere. If he needs to be three, if he needs to be 370, so be it. Let's go. Stop the run. I bet See? the Cowboys like to have that gag because he can help. Hell yeah. Him. You know, hell I'll bring him the pizza. I'll order the pizza for him if he needs to if he's still playing that way. But they just they just have things in their mind of how they want you to look and how they want you to be. You know, and if you are that at a little bit heavyweight, they, you know, they're not going to say much to you. It's just when your pr- production slows down a little bit, then they start dropping the hammer. Oh, you need to lose five more or eight more or seven more, not one more or two more. You can't be gaining six when you need to be losing 15. I mean, if he goes in there at 355, dude, he ain't going nowhere at 355. People keep saying that BK keeps saying what if he got down? To, that dude ain't ever getting down to 355. <laughs> yes, he can. Oh, man, man. Why do you keep saying that? What kind of faith do you have in this guy? I got the faith a that hard he, worker. He be 360, okay, that's fine. He ain't going to be. I told BK, I said, he's showing up always in a one piece. He ain't ever going to be in a two piece. He's always going to be in a one piece. So forget about that. Yo, yeah. you're fat shaming the hell out of him. I'm not what, he's, what does that even mean? He's a man. I'm just saying, always gonna be in a two-piece. He's a two-piece kind of guy. He ain't oh never showing gosh. up a little, a little mid-drift thing. He's not gonna be like uh 
Zeke Elliott, he's not going to ever have his thing all rolled up. So, no. No, Zeke's fat, too. If you want to talk about somebody being fat, Zeke's fat as hell with he's that fat. damn crop top belly. I'm he's not old, trying to hear old that. And fat now. Zeke, are you tell me Zeke is old and fat now? I would say, oh, he still got some life left. But as far as being husky, yeah, man. He was eating all type of clam chowder this past season in New England. Oh, up in New England? Oh, yeah. That's for yeah. sure. He's yeah. a big old dude now. No, I'm I'm all, I'm all right with the guy. I just I just know that that they had this this deal where they they love finding guys in the NFL for just about anything, and in their minds they think you're a better player, whether you are or not. They think you're a better player, you know, from three three seventy or three sixty six down to three fifty five. But that dude ain't ever gonna be three fifty. It's not happening, y'all. So go ahead and start finding him. Start getting the fines that you think he's still gonna play. He's still gonna be good. He's still going to stuff the run. And at that level, when you take up two people, which he's going to do in the NFL, it's going to be more, it's going to be the guard and the center having. It ain't going to be one of them because he's going to run you back into the, into the, into the pocket in the pass. And he's going to stuff the run game uh, in the NFL too if you don't double team him. And you don't double team him the right way, he's going to break through the double team. Yeah. You know, he's, he's just that good. I mean, that's the Allen Trophy winner. That's so you got to be careful how, how you come down on them. I'm not coming down on them for being a big man. Hey, the more pizza, the better. You know what I'm saying? But you're going to fight them. That's coming down on them. I'm you can't fight them. Let him keep his money. I wouldn't find him if he's playing good. But the minute, the minute he started going, hey, I need to get out of here. Hey, I'm look, tired. I, <laughs> I'm tired. I had too many pizzas last night. Look, stop, let's get away from the pizza. He gets one cheat meal a week. How about that? One, one cheat meal a week. One 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 trip to Popeyes. No. Yeah. Every, one no. cheat meal. That that's fine. Everything else has to be from the chef. Do you think that dude could eat a whole bucket of the Colonel? You think he could eat a whole bucket by himself? Well, hundred percent. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Okay, yeah. so if you think he can eat a bucket? He's eating a bucket and a half, right? With mashed potatoes. I don't think oh. he's doing it, but I think he's capable. If he had oh. the chance, yes. Or oh, you think he's eating green beans right now and no bread? I think he's eating more vegetables than he probably has in his life. I think Taraj Sweat is serious about this, man. I really do. He might give off the whole, oh, I'm goofy, fun-loving guy. But that dude, man, he takes the game seriously. Like, well, I understand that. But, man, dude, you know that being a big man, you're a big, you're a big man. That's not that easy to, to – to not to, to get away and do something different. If I told you you needed to lose 10 by next week, you'd be like, shit, I ain't losing 10 pounds. <laughs> yeah, but I don't got millions on the line. Yeah, that's if you different. have millions on the line, that's still, that's still a struggle. That's a lot of weight for a big dude. Oh, man. You know what I mean? He yeah. guy gains weight when he brushes his teeth. <laughs> you can't do – it's hard, man. It's hard for a big man to lose weight. Yeah, when you big, something yeah. in your brain says, maybe I should swallow this mouthwash. What does it taste like? Yeah, I mean, no, I just don't want to be brushing. I need to be drinking this stuff. So, I I, I mean, I, I expected his best, Zay, for him to be, if, if he's in that 266, 260, if he comes in at, I mean, I keep saying the word two, because I know, I keep hearing three, that that screws me up, because I don't know too many people in three. If he's at, if he's at 360 when he comes into training camp, in the NFL, I would think that's pretty good. If he yeah. loses, if he loses seven, eight pounds, but once again, that dude ain't never going to be at three. Hey, maybe when he when he's done his football days, he may get down to 355, 345, but not during his playing days. He's gonna be hungry after practice. <laughs> <laughs> that, dude, that dude is gonna be hungry when it's time to eat. Uh, and that ain't gonna be stuff that's gonna lose weight for him. I love him. I love the way he plays, man. I, I like his attitude. I like the way he plays, you know. And like I said, big man's got to eat. Big man's got to eat. That's exactly right. The women's game has started. The Lady Horns are up by seven, 17 to 10 at the mood against Drexel, the 16th seed. But, by 30. Oh, you think they're just going to win by 30? Yeah. Yeah, they're. Drexel's in a little zone. They're in like a little two-three zone, a matchup zone. They're just running around. It looks like it's confusing the Lady Horns a little bit. Yo, man, 
that zone you saw yesterday with Oakland. If you oh, are yeah. prepared for it, it, it could be difficult to figure out because, again, a matchup zone, you start off looking like a traditional zone, but you have a lot of man-to-man principles. So let me give you an example. Let's say if you're guarding the women's basketball team and you got a good shooter like Madison Booker with the ball, you start right. off with a normal 2-3 and you just wait until Madison Booker gets to a different type of the, or a different part of the zone, which would be the uh, person that you would guard. She goes to the left, the person on top of the zone, they'll go with her to the left. But if she passes and cuts, you go with that person. On the normal yeah. zone, you would stay in your area. If right. she cuts, you would go with her. So they got – they're moving around. They're doing some weird stuff like Drexel – yeah, this ain't, this might not be no blowout, which the first game is always the hardest. You know, you got a lot of nerves. And Leah Moore just hit a little turnaround. It's now 19-10. But, yeah, that, they're, they'll figure it out. Vic Schaefer's girls, they'll figure it out. And they'll start to roll later on. And we'll yeah, see you got to be good at the matchup zone, too. You can't you can't have anybody screwing up in that zone, right? When they no. cut, they, they gotta, you got to go. If you're still standing there thinking you're playing zone, they got nobody for the cutter. No, not at all. Yo, Vic Schaefer, he has on some burnt orange pants with a black with a black jacket. It's Damn. an interesting look. <laughs> it's a it's an interesting look for Vic. I'm not gonna burnt, lie. You got a white white shirt and burnt orange tie with it too. I think it's a white shirt. I don't know. I, I gotta see him again, but black jacket, burnt orange uh pants. Pants, yeah. Nice. Yeah. End of the first quarter, 1912. Bailey Gonzalez just got beat on the back door. I know Coach Schaefer is not going to like that, but yeah, yeah you're right, Buck. You bet you better know what you're doing in that matchup zone because yeah. there's so much communication. And- you don't see a lot of that men's basketball, do you? You don't see a lot of teams doing no. that. That no. that's them, that's gimmicky at times that you can screw up the offense, but if you're not playing the right way on defense, you can get used, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And it took way too long for John Calipari's Wildcats yesterday to figure it out. I mean, mm. you got to run either your best man offense or you have to have enough shooters to where you can run your zone offense still, even though they're playing man-to-man principles. And, yeah, Kentucky, they just couldn't figure it out yesterday. And it showed. It definitely showed. But and that wasn't great. No one like that was a great Kentucky team anyway. No. No, this wasn't one of his teams that had like Carl Anthony Towns and Devin Booker or even that obvious national championship team with Anthony Davis and Kill Gilchrist and stuff like yeah. that. No. Well, those guys are going to be together for a couple of years. That's what I'm saying. If I'm the athletic director, you're not firing Calipari, but you're telling them, hey, maybe they're doing gun stuff. You know, yeah, it's cool seeing your guys in the league, but we're not winning any games while they're here. We're not winning the ones that matter while they're here. So you got to so do again, better than this. Once again, Zay, you thought Tyrese Hunter was okay last night too, right? I thought I mean, he was good. I thought he was better than okay. He wasn't great, but he quietly was probably the best player last night. You yeah. Know? I mean, I, I mean, his defense, he was moving around on defense. He was rebounding. He was doing a lot of different things. But, yeah, he needs to take the ball out of Aismas' hands. That dude comes up the court, and those guards get on Aismas like – I, he's got okay handles, but once again, to me, he's the guy who gets across half court, get, has to get rid of the ball because guys come and double team him. He can't jump up over the top of those guys. He just, he, it's it's hard for him to get rid of the ball. And for some odd reason, they when when they give him the ball on full court pressure, he runs in the corner. I'm like, why are you going in there? You're Gosh. too little. When they double team you in that corner, you got nowhere to go. And he, there. for some odd reason, they they beg him to go to the corner. And he runs to the corner, and then they double him. He can't get rid of the ball. Sometimes they're out of bounds, like press offense or went man to man pressure mm-hmm. offense full court to get the ball in is atrocious. Yeah, and it like take a long time, man. Yeah, like they struggle to get the ball in because they'll just run to the bad spot to like the bottom of the baseline into the right. corner where yeah. the defense wants you to run and then they'll get trapped as you're referring to and you're like guys y'all y'all should have a play and they did it they got after they called the timeout they came out in a little stack set I and saw they got that, the yes. ball in like they fit but that should be you shouldn't have to waste the timeout to do that 
Yeah, that's my old CY. That was my CYO grade school stack right there. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that's old that. school Gene Hackman Hoosiers type. Oh, shit yeah. Right Nothing wrong with the stack, man. The stack can get you loose right there. Especially if you yeah. get a leg on somebody, you trip their ass when they're trying to cross over there. Yeah, you can get you can get out of – but you can't go to the corners. They no. want you to go to the corner. No. And if you do get in the corner, you better throw that ball out right when you touch it. Yes. Right when you get it, all right, get it out the corner. Hot potato. Yeah, they, yeah, Asos gets caught in the corner. He's too little to be caught in the corner. He should be the guy catching it in the middle of the court somewhere. Right. But once again, he doesn't have that kind of quickness like Curry and some of these guys. I, I thought he was going to – You compared him to Steph Curry's I, mean, I can compare him to a lot of guys as guards that have the quickness. Right. He's not like Kyrie. He doesn't, he doesn't have that quick <laughs> – Hey, he doesn't have quick twitch. He's not even yeah. like the kid that plays. He's not like the kid that plays for the 76ers. He doesn't Max have that – yeah, he doesn't have that quick twitch. He's not like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Plus, I don't think he's as tall as those guys. That guy's got to be – I'm going to say, is he 5'11", maybe? Oh, uh, yeah, he's not six feet. They say six oh. feet, kind of like the Trevondre sweat. They say he's 365, but really 375. It's like yeah. that with basketball on okay. the height. If they say he's whatever, if he's 6'3", he really 6'1". If he's okay. seven foot, he's really 6'9", 6'10". So this so, dude yeah. is 5'10". He's 5'10", for sure. Okay. For sure. But yeah, yeah. Marquette coming back. They're up 53, 48, 14 minutes oh, ago. He got too many good, he just got too many good players. He can't screw it up. The players are too good at Marquette this year. Yeah. It's a good point. Point. I know people don't say very much about the Big East, but that's that's a pretty salty league. It is. It's interesting that they only had three teams make it in Creighton, UConn, well, and probably got Marquette. screwed. Probably yeah, got screwed this year. A lot of teams got screwed. Oklahoma got screwed. Pitt got screwed, especially with how bad Virginia looked against Colorado State in that first four game. Like, uh, a lot of teams definitely got screwed. But um, before we get back into basketball, I want to ask you a little bit more about the pro day, Buck, because a lot of those guys that were in the pro day were asked about the current Texas roster. We got spring practice underway this week. A lot of talent on that field, a lot of expectation and aspirations. You know, you think about Jordan Winnington and who's going to take his spot, not only on the field, but off the field as a leader. You know, the wide receiver room doesn't have that right now. I mean, Matthew Golden coming from U of H. Yes, he's an experienced player. Isaiah Bond, Silas Baldwin's not on campus yet with Oregon State, but everybody else isn't proven really at all. You think about yeah. John Cook, DeAndre Moore, Ryan Niblett. You can't put much on Ryan Wingo, even though he's a big time five star. He's still a freshman trying to get acclimated to Steve Sarkeesian's system. So, yeah, I'm putting it on him. He's a five star athlete out of high school. He should be coming here as a grown man. He looks like a grown man. I mean, he's a big old dude. I expect him to come here and take no shit from anybody. I mean, yeah, be coming here like that's my job. I know you got these guys coming from Houston, Alabama, Oregon State, but one of these jobs is mine. That's how good he is. That's how good the kid Wingo is. He shouldn't come in here as a freshman and go, oh, I'll just earn my position. No, hell no. He ought to be big enough, strong enough, and ready to go. I mean, that's what kind of recruit he was. He's that guy. You know, I mean, we talk about Kentucky and players going and becoming great NBA players. He's that dude. So he shouldn't be taking back seats to anybody. I don't care if it's Golden coming from Houston, any of these veterans. He's already a grown man. But some of these guys that are at Texas already, at wide receiver – I don't know a damn thing about him, Zay, to tell the truth. I barely, I, barely, I barely know about the little guy with the speed from up in the Fort Worth, Dallas area. I don't. We didn't see him play. Shit, we saw him run one like one speed route for a touchdown. Oh, J- Jonte Cook. Yeah, we don't know. Any, I don't know anything about him. I don't know what kind of leader he is. I don't know what kind of consistent hands he has. And the other guys, they never played. I don't know what they can do. Now I know these other guys because I've seen them play. I've seen a kid at Alabama get better as the year went on as the quarterback. I mean, we watched the kid from Houston up close and personal, and the kid from Oregon State's been their leading receiver for like the last two or three years, so he's got to be good. But for this wide receiver, this is like starting all over again. They've got experienced players that have played in college, even though they're coming through the portal and all that stuff. They've played in games. The ones that have been here, they ain't played in no games. Right. You know? Yeah, very unproven. A lot of questions there, and – 
you talk about John Tay Cook. I mean, everybody's so high on him. Everybody compares him to Xavier Worthy. They think he's just going to slide into that role. And he's been doing well And you know, spring camp, you know, right now. And who knows? I mean. I don't know anything about Ryan Niblett. I don't know anything about yeah. him. I have no clue about those guys. When they when people mention those guys, oh, they've been here, they recruited them. I'm like, I don't get to go to practice. I've never seen him in games. Well, Jordan Winnett had said this about DeAndre Moore, another guy we haven't really seen. He said, you know, he reminds me of me, talking about Winnett and himself, and said that he's one of those players that actually sat back and watched us and learned a lot of things from us, and he just instills it into the team today. He's a big-time leader at a young age. And, yeah, so if that – if that – it's true. Jordan Whittington, who obviously him and DeAndre Moore are tight. If that's yeah. true, then Sark, we're going to have to have a rotation with these guys, at least early on, because no, sure. you've got to see that Michigan game is going to be telling. You know, oh, yeah. That first week, all right, whatever. Everybody should eat that game. You should beat that team by 40. I don't even know who it is. But when you go to Ann Arbor week two. Are they playing Colorado State early? Okay, yeah, that should be a blowout. That shouldn't be nothing. But when you go to Ann Arbor, yo, man, guys should be ready to go. Like, it's going to be interesting who sticks around, too, when the transfer portal opens. Because not all these wide receivers going to be sticking around. Yeah, because, you know, I want to talk – I want to try to get to Coach Norvell at Colorado State before the season starts. You know, Coach Norvell was here. He's a, he's a good guy. He's a, he's a good guy. Watched their team play last year, Colorado State, and they won't take a back seat to anybody physically. They'll get after you physically. They may not have all the skill players, but it's a physical group, you know. So I want to talk to him about playing teams like Texas, people that he knows in this area and stuff, and what that's going to be like for his team. Because you know they went toe to toe with Colorado. That was like a, that was like they were about ready to fight on. They the did, yeah, the I remember that. And the coaches, and he talked some smack about Dion too. Yeah, <laughs> so I want to talk to Jay Norvell, see what he's all about, and his team will be his team will be tough. They they won't have enough skill players, but. They'll be ready for the physical battle. Yeah. Except for that offensive line. That offensive line of Texas, three years in a row with each other, look out. I mean, I, don't expect, I, I do not expect this run game. They pass protected pretty well last year. I expect this run game to be mowing them over, just like they started to do last year with these two young running backs and a third and a, and a, 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 a freshman coming in is supposed to be something special. I don't, I don't expect them not to be able to run the ball because they don't throw it as well. I th- I'm, I'm thinking that the passing game will be the thing that will take a little time, like you said, with these guys, because we don't know them. Right. You know? Yeah. If you're not ready to go by the end of the spring and you come into this place late, I think you'll have a hard time with these receivers because guys are guys have played college football already. They're not freshmen. They've got two of them. they got three guys that have played, you know, college football. One was the leading receiver, the guy from Houston. We saw him play. He's good. They recruited him when he was a young kid, so he's still pretty good. And and the kid from, like I said, the kid from Alabama became a star at the end of the season because their quarterback could actually throw it downfield accurate then. Yeah, that that's the thing that Isaiah Bond is going to have oh, to yeah. get used to because Jalen Milrow, yes, he had a really nice deep ball, but that 10 to 20 range, the intermediate throws, yes. that's not what he was good at. And Quinn Ewers got a lot better at that this year, and I expect him to get a lot better with it this uh, upcoming season, which – that was kind of the talk around Pro Day, Bug, just how good all of those guys looked and how good Quinn Ewers looked throwing the ball yeah. at all these execs and front office guys and head coaches that were down there in the bubble watching the Horns go through that Pro Day workout. Now it's like, okay, Texas got to a college football playoff. Yeah, that's good and stuff, but why didn't they win the national championship? That was yeah. the same narrative coming out of the combine. Okay, Xavier Wordy breaking the record. Byron Murphy, look at his physique. Look at how he works through drills. This guy, he could be a light Aaron Donald with his measurements and stuff. JT Sanders, even though he didn't test well at Pro Day, the drills that he did when it came to, like, catching the ball, those actual football drills, he did pretty good. So the list goes on with all the talent that the Horns had. And the They just can't cover anybody. They can't cover me and you. Well, that yeah. The problem is they can't cover anybody. College football, everybody's going to throw it. And when they look at this secondary, they're going to throw it. Washington did it. The things that we knew that was going to come back and haunt them, actually, that's what they, that's how they lost. They couldn't cover soul. 
They can't right. cover anybody. They don't have that except, you know, they'll talk about these young, the, the young freshman Muhammad and how good he is. I mean, he was okay. He wasn't, he wasn't super freshman. I mean, they talk about like he, he okay, he played okay for a freshman. Season, but he, he wasn't was super good. Freshman. What do you mean? Malik was good. He was okay. He was, a, <laughs> they don't have anybody that's a super player that plays in that set. There's nobody there that's super, a uh, superstar. In that. You know, he kept telling me about how Brian Watts, the kid from Ohio State, he is fabulous. No, he wasn't. That guy was hurt so much. Every week he would pull something. He went, and then he couldn't put his hands on guys. And then he was in trail position. He couldn't cover them. I mean, I don't care what he tested out at the combine or the senior day or whatever. That dude, could, that guy's, that guy's not going to cover anybody. That guy's, if you think he's going to get drafted, he's a free agent going somewhere. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. They don't even have those guys back there next year. So I, it's, it's. I, it's I think the secondary is going to be much improved. And this is a contract year for Blake Gideon and Terry Joseph. Yeah, and see, he, I'm the guy who said by midway point in the season that that Texas secondary was going to be one of the best in the nation. I was totally wrong. They were one of the worst in the nation. Yeah. They, because they had guys that would put pressure on the quarterback. They still didn't intercept the ball. They still couldn't cover guys. So until somebody shows me somebody – if you got some, you know, I thought the kid from Wake Forest because he he came from a, a you know, he was there when the, the, the quarterback before he went to uh San, was it, where, where did he go? Notre Dame. I mm. said, all he did was throw every day at practice. He got to be able to cover somebody. That dude couldn't cover anybody. That guy didn't Gavin score. Holmes was all right. Okay, that guy. Who was what's his name? <laughs> Priest Holmes. Priest Holmes. You said Priest Holmes. Dude, those guys are not good. They don't have a. Oh spot. my God, man! You got me dying. They don't have Gavin a Holmes. Gavin Holmes. Did he have a? Did he have a pick? Did he have a break? I don't, I don't think he had a pick or a breakup. I mean, this. They don't have a special player in their secondary right now. You're going to bank on a kid that was a freshman last year to take a huge step in the SEC and cover these guys. I, it's still going to be until I see it. I, I just don't believe it. And I made and I made the okay. mistake of thinking they were going to be okay. All right, let, let's dissect the, everything you said because a lot of it's valid. I, I agree. The secondary last year, suspect. Very and suspect. my guy from Clemson coming. Look out. Yeah, Andrew Makuba, I yes. expect him to be good. I, yes. I expect him to be good. That's an upgrade. Jalen Catalan screwed us last year. He was bad. The Arkansas transfer, he was, that was just that was, a, that was a tryout. That was when Sark took a flyer on a guy who'd been hurt his entire career. You know? Yeah. The guy had never been healthy. He was never healthy at Arkansas. He had the one year, and from that point on, he was always hurt. He's like sort of like Jordan Whittington, but Jordan Whittington got didn't get hurt his last year. This dude stayed hurt just he about did. from the beginning to the end. So that was bad. That that was that was a bad move. Now, guys that have left the program now are on to different schools, bigger and better things in their eyes, probably. Jared Thompson, he struggled. Yes. yes, he had that big-time interception against Alabama. Yes, he had a pick six against Wyoming. After no consistency. That, no consistency. Yeah, no. after that, Jared Thompson was kind of a liability at times. Yes. King Crawford, liability. Yes. yes. Off to Nevada with Jeff Cho. He was a liability. That was a problem. So those guys are gone. Mookie Tav, he has his moments. He's in the right spot, but we know just the lack of athleticism. Sometimes Mookie Tav could be – you know, he understands the game. He's in the right place. He's in the right place. It's just yes. he has to get to that place first. So That's does he fine. have to have athleticism to get to that place all the time? That you think not- a lot of what he gave you those interceptions and things and key moments. You like a lot of guys to be smart enough with athletic ability to get to those spots and actually break things up and not chase it down or balls batted up in the air. But still, even those, you got to be that guy when that stuff happens. A lot of guys aren't that guy. They're nowhere in sight. And the ball hits the ground. That dude is, seems to be in the right place at the right time for me. He could play for me. Now, he can't play every down. No. I don't expect him to play every down, but the, the role that they have for him is just right. Yeah, absolutely. You add Makuba, Derek Williams. You know, I think he's going to get better another year under his belt. You can yes. rely on him. If those coaches are good enough to help those guys get better, that's the – And that's the thing. Contract yeah. year for both Terry Joseph, cornerbacks coach, and Blake Gideon, who yes. everybody feels a certain way about Blake Gideon, safeties coach. Like, these are huge seeds. This might be – if they have a struggle year and Texas doesn't, 
make it to where they need to be, which I'm championship or bust at this point. Steve Sarkeesian's getting paid way too much money not to get to the championship game with all this talent around. I know we talked about they, that. We said that they thought that they were they were a national championship caliber team coming up this year. And I said, dude, if they make it to the playoffs, that's good. This is not a – I don't think they're a national I think they are. They got they – got, You're probably talking about me. I think they are a national championship caliber, absolutely. They're not good enough in the secondary to me. And when you're missing two NFL-type defensive linemen – and you tell me who the other guy is, and I've seen him play for the last three, four years. Come no. on, man. No, no. They they're, they got an offense and an offensive line that's good enough to take you where you need to be. They've got the quarterback that can do it, and these wide receivers will get better as the year goes on. But I'm sorry, that defense, as well as they, they're missing some linebackers, and you can't replace those two guys. It's hard to replace the Outland Trophy winner. It's just hard, even, though he, even though he eats a lot of pizza. It's hard to, it's, it's Yo, hard to reach that guy. I Kenny Baker, new defensive line coach, he has big shoes to fill with Bo yes. Davis going off to LSU. And I think it might be unfair some of the pressure that he's gonna get due to or he's gonna get it. He's, he's gonna, gonna get it. it. He's gonna get it. I hope he's ready. I hope he's prepared for it because he's gonna get it no matter what. And I hope Texas fans could give him a little bit of grace, but that's why the edge rushers, they gotta be good. Baron Sorrell, he has to be good this year. He well, was he good last year, but he, he, has he thought he was going to go to the pros last year. You know, and Mr. Sorrell's son needs to have a year like 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 out of his out of this world. He needs to be that guy. He yeah. needs to be. He needs to be. He doesn't need to be first or second all SEC, but he needs to be in the running. He needs to, people in the SEC have to notice him. Like we can't leave that guy one on. We got to be careful of him. He can beat our tackles. He can beat our our guards pulling out, you know, that have to block him. He has to make people think that that's how good he is. Even if he's not that good, he has to show unbelievable flashes in big-time games and, and be consistent enough to be that guy. The inside linebackers, they're going to miss They're going to miss their, their guy, the, the, their main guy. They're going to miss board. They're going to miss that guy. That guy is, was a football player, even though, he didn't, even though he didn't have a great year last year. He spent so much time looking behind him trying to get the secondary lined up that he wasn't his natural self. I don't think he played naturally last year. I think he had to be so much of a leader on the field and a coach on the field that all you could see him is him doing this. Yeah. No, you need to be over there. No, you need – and so the ball gets snapped and he's all out of place. The year before, he just played. You know, he had overshot he's just playing. But last year, I think he had to coach too much. I think Yeah, that was- I, I, there were times where he played way too many snaps too. Like that and overall, then he too, yeah. Yeah, that Oklahoma game. I don't think he, him, or John A. Barron he came out of the out. game. Yeah, and that's kind of goes to not only Jeff Cho but Pete Krakowski and the lack of trust that he had for David Benda overall and Ant Hill, which Ant Hill moved around and Jeff David Wilson. Benda got better as a football player last year. He did, and I'm excited about him. I don't think we talk yeah. about him enough. Like you think about Kendrick Blackshire coming in from Alabama, mm-hmm. who. Yo, talk about physique, like Sart mentioned with Chip's questions. Chip asked about Blackshire and a couple of other guys might be a little too heavy, saving on red and you know, somebody else. And Kendrick Blackshire, yo, he looks like a monster. I don't yeah. know how he didn't get on the field for Saban. Who knows if he just, you know, off the field, you know, Saban, you better yeah. be buttoned up, suit and tie, right, if you play for him. But he, I think he could be big. You think about Mo Blackwell. I think he could step up and have a big season with another year under his belt. And Ant Hill, just his versatility. So the linebacker room, yes, they're going to miss Jalen Ford. And Jalen Ford did have a down year compared to that 2022 season where I think he deserved defensive player of the year in the Big 12. Yep. But that that linebacker crew is going to surprise a lot. Like well, David Bender, they're going to surprise a lot. And, again, going back to the secondary, John A. Barron, him coming back. Like, where are you going to put him? Because now there's been rumors that they might move him to a outside corner spot because Jalen Gilbo, the Port Arthur product, who was really good his freshman year but didn't play much this past season due to maybe him not being locked in mentally because he got hurt that year before. I don't know. But he's – been so good and impressive. Can they trust him at that star nickel spot? Dude, and you're going to have to trust some guys on the outside. They just are. 
Now, I know Bakuba, he can play outside. That guy's an athlete, can play anywhere in that secondary if you yeah. need him. He can be over the slot, but he can be out there wide. He's at, he's he's a fantastic – he was a great wide receiver, so he knows how to cover guys. You know, playing down in Clemson, he's been in big games, so he knows how to play. That's a veteran player. So I feel I feel decent about him and Barron. I mean, but – the other guys, it's just going to take me some time to see them not be trailing guys, running, trying to catch up to dudes that are running down the field, especially that safety position. Wow. That yeah. was – that's scary last year. Safety was bad last year. Yeah. <laughs> if Michael Taft was your best safety and a freshman and Derek Williams were your best safeties, which they had their limitations too, it's not that's good. Surprised, that surprises me in the portal that more guys didn't want to come to Texas and play in the secondary because they could have come and said, I can get a job there. You know, well, for all the country, that really surprised me that, you know, the teams that have to, that played out in the pack, you know, the pack 12 didn't look and say, damn, they're just lighting them guys up. Washington's lighting them up. You know, well, that, that's it, Buck. Like I, I think if you look at former Washington, now Oregon cornerback um, Jabbar Muhammad. Right. He was looking at Texas, but he wanted a solidified starting role. Like he didn't want to be a rotation player like Pete Kwiatkowski did sure. with the secondary and the corners and safeties this past season. So yeah. that might have turned guys off. Also, you think about all the guys that they brought in from a recruiting standpoint in high school. You know, you think about Warnell Mack and you think about – uh, Xavier Filsamy, both of those guys were Florida flips under Billy Napier. And then you got, um, gosh darn it, Kobe Black. Well, they, got opportunity. they got opportunities, right? Yeah. Like they're very high on those guys. All those freshmen, they are very high on those dudes. So, yeah, there's a lot of talent around. I didn't even mention Warren Robertson, Jelani McDonald. Jordan Johnson, Rebel, like Santana Wilson. There's a ton of guys. You got some great names. You got some great <laughs> names. <laughs> yeah, they're just names, though. They're just names. A lot of them unproven. A lot of them jumping from high school to college. That's a big jump, even though they have a ton of potential. So we'll see what happens. I'll continue yeah. to say Steve Terry was... Joseph, Blake Gideon, contract years. Yeah, they got, they got to get it done for that. They got to get it done in there. Because if that would have been done last year, they'd have, they'd have been in the national championship hunt. If they could have covered guys, I, I mean, I'm not saying they weren't covered. They were, they were covered pretty legit guys. That group at Washington was pretty damn good. One guy's about to be a first round draft pick, maybe the the, the second guy taken, and maybe the first wide receiver taken. Who knows? That's how good he was. Roma Dunze. Oh man, he is good, man. They they're saying he might be the third wide receiver taken after. Harrison Jr. and Malik Neighbors from LSU, but what scares people about Neighbors was his quarterback was the Heisman Trophy winner. Well, yes, you know, of course you can look good when you got the Heisman throwing you the ball. You know, he's constantly making plays happen with his feet and keeping plays alive, which allows you to change routes and read his eyes. And you know, you don't get that in the NFL. Guys are too fast. Only Patrick Mahomes and a couple other guys are capable of doing that type of stuff. So, well, it's going to be interesting, as I said, for Quinn Ewers with this wide receiver group, say that's coming in. I, 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 I continue to say it's a hard when you replace the guys on the defensive line, two first round draft choices that you're looking at. Well, just think about the receiver room. There's possibly two first round draft choices at that position. And those guys just don't grow on trees. You can, you can say that this guy's played here at this place or he played at that place, but there was a, there was a connection that Quinn Ewers started to have with those two dudes that just, just left. That was, Incredible. So you got to build that back up. And I don't expect them to take this big. I think I think the more of the drop off will be on the defensive line side than on the offensive wide receiver side. Because you know why? Because that's the damn head coaches who just got all that money, especially as wide receivers and quarterbacks. Right. Mm -hmm. they're not take a big drop off. You know, the defensive side, when you're losing the Allen Trophy winner and another guy that they're comparing kind of to Aaron Donald. Dude, you don't just walk in and say, oh, remember that guy was his substitute guy last year. He wasn't <laughs> That's why he was the substitute guy, because he wasn't that guy. That, those are the guys that are hard to replace. You know, and I'm hoping this Collins kid is just who knows. Yeah, I'm banking on Alfred Collins and Vernon Broughton to have big seasons, man. But 
We'll see. Kenny Baker, you got your work cut out for you, bud. Yeah, if you, All can, right. if you can turn Collins, if you can turn Collins around, then that's that's special. If yeah. you really can, because nobody's done it in four years or five or whatever it is. This is fourth year or fifth year. Fifth. Well, if nobody's done it in four, you're coming in here replacing two two unbelievable players, and then all of a sudden you're the guy that turns him around, then good, you've earned your money to me. If you can make him into a – because he he still looks like the best thing coming off a bus. Yeah. He just does, you know? Yeah, absolutely. All right, Buck, it is time for my Zay's Player of the Game prediction brought to you by Big Hat Spirits. I love you. Cats, man. Margarita mocktails that I get at my favorite grocery store in HEB. Oh, yeah. It's delicious and it's good for you. Only 50 calories, zero alcohol mocktail with kombucha, sparkling water, with real fruits, real spices. It is refreshing and it comes with the lime like salt. It comes with the chili lime salt. So you don't have to go off to the different parts of HEB and you're asking the employees, hey, where's the lime? Where's the salt at? You no know, in a hurry. You don't have to do any of that. It all comes with it in that four pack. Big Hat Spirits. Check They're about to out. have a new one. They're about to have a new mocktail coming out here shortly. Oh man, got to get that. Yeah, got to get that. I cannot yeah. wait. Go to BigHatSpirits.com for all the info. Get yours at H E B today. Absolutely, yeah. brother. I love yeah. I love those mocktails. I, you know, I, I wish I could have a cocktail, but I can't. There's just no way to do that. It can't happen for me. And folks, you know, I've got this messed up back and been getting been getting and wanting the right support for years and years and years. And finally, I do have the right support. And it's because of the folks that relax the back. We've got two great locations in Bee Cape at the Hill Country Gallery across from Whole Foods and in Austin at the Gateway Shopping Center across from the Container Store up north. Live pain free like the buck at Relax the Back. That's right. All right, Buck, my big hat spirit. Zay player of the game prediction tomorrow, Tennessee. Versus Texas, 7 wow. o'clock, Rick Barnes Bowl. Roddy Terry was with Barnes for over 10 years. He knows Rick Barnes. He knows his favorite meal. He does. It's not just philosophy. Like, he knows some deep stuff that Rick Barnes probably doesn't tell or a lot of people don't know about him. So that gives RT an advantage there. But a player that I'm going for, the player of the game prediction, that has to be great tomorrow, Tyrese Hunter. Tyrese Hunter, man. Yeah. He has to be good. good Ty Ziegler, the point guard for Tennessee, he's the one that makes them go. He had over 10 points and over a 10 assists, double-double yesterday in their first-round matchup against St. Peter's. He's terrific, man, and he's an absolute dog. you got to get Zakai Ziegler out of rhythm. Dalton Connect, he's going to get his. He's going to be a high volume shooter. But if Ziggler and, you know, Jonas Adu, they're in that pick and roll game when Ziggler's throwing lobs and stuff, that gets Tennessee going, that gets them energized, that gets them hype. And then defensively, they're one of the best in the nation, too. So, Longhorn, y'all got to bring that same energy defensively yes. tomorrow night that you brought against Colorado State. Tyrese yes. Hunter, you got to play the way you did against Isaiah Stevens, against Zakai Ziggler. What scares me, Buck, is there's no matchup for Dalton Connect, you know, especially with the starting lineup. I.T. Horton, you better have a quick leash if you're Rodney Terry for I.T. Horton. and you be in foul trouble quickly. Yeah, foul trouble quickly or just like last night with that starting crew, Colorado State got off to an 8-2 start. You know, and then once you put Weaver, Cunningham, and Shedrick in, the game changed. And Colorado State only scored three more points after that to end the half. And you go up 27 to 11. And that was the ball game right there, even though you struggled to shoot. You also can't go one for 14 from the three-point line. That is atrocious. That is unacceptable. If they do that against Tennessee, then Tennessee is going to win by not only 20, but maybe 30. Like, that's how much of a juggernaut squad that this Rick Barnes crew is. So... Jonas Adu, the big man for Tennessee, he's a problem. And I don't know if they're going to put him on Dylan DeSue to start the game. He'll be guarding DeSue at times. But with the lack of offensive game that Dylan Mitchell has, it would be smart yeah. to put Jordan James on DeSue, guarding him straight up, and then just have Jonas Adu as a help side guy because you don't have to worry about Dylan Mitchell. That's oh, you gotta get you gotta get you gotta get at least a dozen points from Shedrick tomorrow. That'd be nice. That'd be great. Twelve points would be great for him. 
Yeah, and I think he could be big too because they're yeah. so big and physical. The rebounding that Tennessee brings, like you might have to negate that by putting some bigs out there and Shedrick and Sue having those guys yep. at the four and the five. So obviously Max Aismas has to play well. I'm sure Zakai Ziegler is going to guard him on the defensive side, but Don Connect – Best small forward in the nation. He's a problem. You got to slow him down. Kendall Weaver's the best matchup, even though he has Weaver by at least four inches. Kendall yes. Weaver is so athletic that makes up for a lot. He's gonna take that as a challenge, but getting him in the game as quick as possible. I like the minutes that he got yesterday. Like that's mm-hmm. what Kendall Weaver always needs. Uh, twenty five minutes plus. I like him to get thirty, but he had twenty nine yesterday. It Horton had sixteen. That's fine. That, that's well, Kendall Weaver, if he gets a little jump shot, is going to be really good, isn't he? That yeah. Oh man, man, he'll be terrific. If he gets a jump shot down, he'll be a you know, <laughs> you know, he plays like a Gary Payton the second. Yeah. For the Warriors, he has that type of game and brings that type of energy. Got that mentality, that defensive mentality. Yeah. I mean, he creates points off of his energy. You know, I, yeah. I like what he creates because he'll get it and run with it. Only going to his right side. Let's not forget, he's only going right. So if you're defending him, make that dude go left hand some every once in a while. But he will jump and rise over the top of you, too. He will slam that ball over you if, if he gets a good jump. You know what I'm oh, saying? Oh, man, he's had some nasty tip dunks this I year. Know. Coming off the rebound, like, yeah, he does like a really that. good job crashing the board. So Dylan Mitchell and IT Horton, if y'all could give the horns anything, like – Dylan Mitchell plays well when Tyrese Hunter plays well because that means Tyrese is finding him on lobs and different passes where all Dylan Mitchell has to do is dunk. He doesn't have to dribble. He doesn't have to worry about getting to a spot. Just just jump towards the rim, and Tyrese Hunter could find you if Tyrese is cooking. So not only Tyrese Hunter has to be good defensively, he has to be good offensively too. He has to this is a money game for Dylan Mitchell. I mean, I don't this – is, this, this is money for him, isn't it? Yeah, if you have a good game, you can earn some serious money. Hell yeah. But he he can come back again. He ain't coming back. Oh, he ain't coming back. No. The draft is so weak, he can't come back. Like, to give you perspective on how weak the draft is, Kentucky, who lost yesterday in the first round, two of their best players are going to be top five picks. Wow. And Dillingham and Reed Shepard, most likely. And they're out here losing in the first round. So that kind of shows you how weak this 2024 draft is going to be. And if you're Dylan Mitchell, you got to capitalize now. Like coming back will only hurt your stock. You might as well go in. No, he's not ready, but a lot of guys aren't ready. And sometimes guys will figure it out. And sometimes guys will end up in Spain. Yeah. Yeah, see him in Spain. Yeah, I hope you know your Espanol. You yes. know what I'm saying? I you hope you did. Up in bullfights. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Say it was good, man. It was good doing this with you today. I appreciate it. Appreciate you, Buck. It's been fun, man. Absolutely, man. What you got this weekend? What's going on? What's the weather like? I'm watching games. It's garden time, man. Getting into garden. I got my. I got all my garden stuff. I got my, my tomatoes. I got my garden is already fixed up. I got the fencing around it and everything. I got the, the raised beds, getting dirt in there, getting my tomatoes, canning my canning my tomatoes. My wife and I are going to learn how to can stuff and, and have our own stuff. If we're going to get that lasagna, you know she likes to make that lasagna, Zay. I do. Let's, hey, have her make her own tomato paste, and her own tomatoes. So we're going to do that. We're going to try that, try to eat some of that healthy stuff. We're not, we're not going to your boy's diet. We're not going to the pizza place every night. We're gonna do our. We're gonna do. We're gonna do some good things for our body. Can we some, stop fat shaming Travandre Sweat, please? I'm not fat. Stop he's, it. he's not fat. He's a big man. Yeah, but when you say we're not gonna go to the pizza place, like you're just assuming he probably hasn't had a pizza in months. Like, can we give him the benefit of the doubt? We give him the benefit of the doubt. He hasn't had a pizza in the last 14 hours. How's that? <laughs> That's, I'm giving him the. Benefit. That dude looks like a pizza eating son of a gun. I'm not see. I could be saying Popeyes, but I'm not going that direction. I'm going to say he likes. Yeah, we don't want you to fat shame and be racist. I'm I'm just going to say he likes likes Italian food and he's a pizza eater. I'm going to find out how many pizzas he can eat. I'm going to ask somebody. I'm I'm going to ask Chip to find that out for me. How many (laughs) pizzas can that dude? I guarantee you, he can eat two and a half by himself, two holes. 
I'm and sure he can, but he's yeah. choosing not to. He's getting right. I'm telling you, he's going to be in the 350s at some point of his career. He's going to be in the 350s. I believe in T-Sweat. I'm saying when he re- on his retirement, that's when he'll be. The day he retires, he'll be 2 356. <laughs> that's it. He ain't going to ever be 355. Maybe when he's with his grandkids running around. But that's it. Come on, man. I'm going to find out. I'm going to find out what kind of pizza guy he is. Yeah, I'm gonna I'll, I'll, let's bring our guy Jeff Barker on. Trey will be on the second. Let's bring our guy Jeff Barker. CD yeah, what's up? Boston. Barker, what's happening, man? Hey, okay, so T-Sweat, you, you're, I'm getting mixed reports. Chip said that with the pamphlet that they always put out of all the guys' height and weight and stuff, it's it read 362 for Travandre Sweat. But then you're seeing around social media that – He's one pound heavier than he weighed at the combine at 367. I haven't seen that. Our guy Chris Bennett said that's what it was. With Chris Bennett, I, I take that to heart. Chris Bennett knows his stuff. He does his research. So what CB says, it's usually pretty truthful. But I, I don't know. What have you been hearing? Anything? Is he going down? Is it going up? What have you heard, Barker? I yeah, I haven't heard anything specific on that front. But if he's moving around and hopping around, like shouldn't it? Shouldn't it not matter? Like, why does it matter the the one pound if it's functional weight and he's moving around with it? Then who cares? That's that's how I am now. I don't care. But I'm telling telling Zay here, who said he'll be down to three fifty. That guy ain't ever gonna weigh three fifty five. Three fifty five. Ever, ever ever. Well, so what what so Bucky? What 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 happened when he got to campus? Was it just because wasn't he like two ninety when he got to campus? Oh yeah, yeah. He get down. Was he just not done growing? No, he got to all these barbecue places down here, you know, and hit every one of them. And then he got into the Italian food. He got into pizzerias. And they just said, hey, here's another one and another pizza. I'm telling you, he's a two and a half pizza guy. He get, And I'm not talking slices. I'm talking about boxed. Whole box. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm in the worst shape of my life right now. I went to the doctor today. I'm I'm 180. Like, I can't even imagine someone weighing over 300 pounds. Like, and obviously, he's 100 weight. times more athletic than I am. But and can you imagine that crazy. guy trying to lose that weight? That guy's been weighing that. So, you know, if they said 366 at the combine, what do you think he weighed at Texas? That dude weighed 375. Almost, <laughs> oh I weighed almost God. as big as 380. Well, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to run into him. So No, no, no. They won't make him pay until his production goes down. And then in the NFL, you know, you'll be writing out a check a week when they put you on that scale. And they can't put him on just a regular one. They got to put him on the cattle scale when he comes in. And then that thing, <laughs> and he'll have his checkbook right there when he steps on the scale. And he'll write out a check to them for every pound that he's overweight. And he'll just give them a check. And he'll say, see you next week. And if he plays well, they won't even bother with that. But if he doesn't, that's just what they do. They want to find you for everything. They mess around with your socks. Your shoelaces, the wrong color. It's just silly. They're never going to get all the money that they're going to pay to them, but they'll try. Right, Trey? Look, he's he's going to have to prove it at the next level. He was not an every down guy here at Texas, and that can be okay. You can be a really effective role guy in first and second downs, but I think yep. it would benefit Devondre Sweat to lose a few LBs. What is a few to you? What is a few? Because you don't want him to get it get too light to where he loses his effectiveness. I don't know. 10, 15 pounds is probably a pretty good starting point. See, 355. See, Trey's right there with me. 355, baby. 355. I'd love to see. If he's 360, I'm good. <laughs> but you don't, go, you don't go from the combine where they already think you're overweight and then gain a pound. You're supposed to come back and lose. You're supposed to come back and not go to Franklin's for a, for a time or two. You know, I would have less of an issue if he showed up that heavy, but did the bench press and did the 225 like 58 times or something. But he also didn't do the bench press. So it's like, well, you've got this mass. How good are you at uh, pushing things directly in front of you, whether it's a bar or an offensive lineman or a pizza box? I, I think I think I saw what I needed to see on the field. I you did know what? If, if the pizza diet's working, then it's working. Yeah, I'm like I said, I'm good with it. It's It's all good until... It's not good. And then they start they start asking you to do this and asking you to do that. So, But I think he's, he's an effect. I mean, I bet the Dallas Cowboys would love to have that big dude 
stopping the run, that's for sure. Yeah. You know, they, yeah. they really, really would. So I like the way he plays and I liked his ability. And Trey, the reason they didn't, he wasn't an every down guy is because they did rotate him. He never asked to come out of games. He never was the guy with his hands on his hip begging to come out of games. I never saw that in him. Now I've seen that in other guys, but I never saw it in him. They just did that as a road. You know, it was hot this summer, last summer and they rotate him and that was fine. But that guy wasn't tapping his helmet going, please come and get me because I'm big. He played and he would play every down if they would have let him. Yeah, but there were times where he started to look gas too. And I feel like we saw more, maybe this is revisionist history. I feel like we saw a more effective to Vondre Sweat earlier in games than later in games. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, as I told Zay, he's a one-piece guy. You're never going to see him in a two-piece. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, right? there, there needs to be more people in this country that recognize that too. That's not <laughs> what does that mean? Thank you, Trey. Thank you very much. Two pieces outplayed anyway, isn't it? Oh, wear that two piece. Well, when it's when it's done well, it's it's yeah, when it's done well, it's done well. Yes. <laughs> but he's not gonna be that. Listen, guys, have a great weekend. Appreciate you, fellas. You Thank, you 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 Thank you guys. With that, the three to five show is officially off. What's up, Jeff? How are we doing today? Doing well, Trey. I have a question about the way Bucky signs off. Does he close the laptop? And then he's just like, done? That's the move. That's Lap awesome. Laptop closed. He is done for the day. Because I've, I've seen that twice now. And I, re I respect not even like tying up the loose ends, just being like, I'm done. I'm oh, yeah, now. No. Well, Bucky, you don't, you don't want Buckley, Bucky to have to get too, uh, too complicated with uh, what he's doing with technology. That's not going to end well for anybody. Especially going into the weekend, too. Just get it started. The weekend, exactly. Yeah. Don't 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 let an email catch your eye or anything like that. Just shut it down and get to the weekend. Don't let an, an email catch your eye. Yeah, right. Like Bucky's <laughs> gonna let emails catch his eyes. It took it took like an army of well, an army of two to get him logged back into Twitter and figure out how to tweet again from his phone. Emails are completely lost in that dude. And you know what? I respect it. I wish I lived a life where I didn't have to be so attached to my email. Oh, yeah. Or my phone, too. Phone, social media. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that if I decided to go work as a, and I would never go work as a carpenter, I'm not good enough with my hands, but decided to go work at like air traffic control out at Bergstrom or something, all of that stuff would be going away. I may go back to just a simple landline. Now, I'd probably still keep the cell phone, but it would be a scaled down cell phone. It would be like phone calls and text messages, and that is it. Oh, man. Yeah. That'd be a more, more uh, simple way to live. But you know what? You wouldn't be able to keep up with March Madness scores. You wouldn't be able to keep up with how many points Texas is holding their their opponent to. Texas with, uh, is, an outstanding uh, defense. Is it the Texas defense or is it your standard college basketball offense that we saw play out last night? Or maybe a little bit of both? A little bit of both. It's a fair question. It's fair to point out that – Colorado State had some open looks that they probably should have made. You know, they they missed quite a few open shots, but Texas played great defense too. Oh. I mean, Tyrese Hunter was awesome on Stevens. Um, I thought I thought overall, you know, everyone played played well defensively. I thought they rebounded really well. Um, that was a big thing. I mean, in games they've gotten in trouble in, you know, when they're not shooting well is when they can't – they play good defense, but they can't grab a freaking board, man. I mean, you go back to UCF at home and the 1-3 and three Big 12 start, Houston, Iowa State, you know, good good opponents, bad opponents, tournament teams, non-tournament teams. So, yeah, you know, I, I think um, one, one thought I couldn't help but having last night, Trey, was that if that was a Chris Beard coach team, people would be so prideful of the way that that game was played – and that that was a oh that was a gritty crispier team. Hey, whoa, 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 whoa! No matter how it looks, wins a win. Old ugly is better than old nothing. That's uh, you know, that's what crispier teams do. That's just what they do. You know, they just find a way in March. But somehow, when it's Rodney Terry, uh, you know, for all these uh, Texas haters on my Twitter feed, it's it's something else. I mean, you you would have thought in the first eight minutes, Trey, that this team went zero and thirty two this year. I mean, they basically went zero for thirty two from from the floor, but just. I, you know, and you know what? I can't help myself. I can't help myself but the clap back every time I see it. But it's well, just, that's one it's of the so first ridiculous. 
one of the first thoughts I had last night is Texas was cruising to a victory because that's what it was. I mean, they won by double digits, and it's not like they were making free throws down the stretch. They made some, but they were still very much in control of that game. I was just thinking to myself, boy, the, the biggest Rodney Terry haters out there that are convinced this guy is going to be done after two years, they've, they've got some tough news coming to them, and that is Rodney Terry is going to be here for at least three years, if not beyond. And by the way, you should want to be wrong about that opinion. Right. You don't have to hit re- you don't want to have to hit reset with your coach every two to three years. That's actually unhealthy for the program. Have we not paid attention to what happened with Longhorn football since the end of the Mac Brown era? That uh the lack of stability. Now you can overcome it, I think, in college basketball quicker than football, but you want the current guy to be the guy. And though people have gripes with Rodney Terry not being good enough in the past or inheriting Chris Beard's team, the reality is, is last year he got that team to the Elite Eight despite just unbelievable midseason circumstances that could have torpedoed any team that was in a hunt for a national championship or a Big 12 championship. And this year, with the roster that's a little bit of a down roster, part of that's on him because he is responsible for roster building. But part of it is completely out of his control and losing two important depth guys and one potential star when two five-star freshmen decided to go pro instead for them to have not only made the tournament but also won their first round game and to get to go up against Rick Barnes in the second round now and I don't think they're going to win that game. But to have that opportunity, you either have to say that they met the preseason expectation or they've already exceeded it with that one win. The thing that I think disappoints me the most is and and I, I try to be good about this on social media and realize that like don't take what a couple of crazies say as you know the generalization for what the fan base thinks but man do I see a lot of people just waiting for this guy to fail just almost almost not just waiting for it almost rooting and hoping that he fails it just makes no sense to me you that was a great point you just made. You should be wanting to be wrong. I feel like I say that about my teams all the time, whether it's the Raiders or the Lakers, whoever. All my teams that I root for that have nothing to do with what we talk about on here for the most part. And I'll say all the time, I hope I'm wrong. Like I, I hope I'm wrong, but this is how I feel. And if you thought that if you thought that hiring Rodney Terry wasn't the right decision, I mean, that's fine. You're entitled to that opinion, but sitting here and like openly making it obvious you're rooting for the guy to fail and lose for really no reason is, is just, it's just strange to me. And look last year with the interim stuff, you still have to, yes, you have to motivate the team. And a lot of times that's, you know, you can galvanize a team by being the interim guy and holding it together. But does that translate from one year to the next? You know, those are valid. Those are valid things to ask. I I mean, I totally get it. We see it in other sports all the time too. But to make that run last year, you still have to sit in the seat. You, you, don't, you don't have an earpiece. Like last year, like, yeah, sure, it was Chris Beard's team that he helped build too, and Rodney and the other assistants on that team. He didn't have an earpiece to Chris Beard say, hey, like, go to this right now. Put this guy in. You still have to call the shots. You still have to motivate the guys. You still have to, you know, game plan and all those different types of things. So, you know, I, I don't know how you can be giving the guy anything but credit after yesterday, and I mean, I'm sure – majority of people are at this point but this is the stat that people were talking about in the comments that I, I saw a couple people tweet this too Rodney Terry just won his fourth NCAA tournament game at Texas in basically two seasons and he's not done this year yet I agree with you I don't know if they're gonna win um and then he says Barnes Shaka and Beard won four tournament games combined from 09 to 22 wow 09 to 22 guys so either either just start supporting this guy or like reassess what this program truly is. And we're in the honesty business. So we'll tell you what the expectation truly is for this program. And just this year specifically, uh, I I agree with you, Trey. We've talked about, we talked about it multiple times that a good season for them was basically doing what they did, getting some respectable seed and then winning a game or two. And that's already happened. And they might do, I mean, we'll talk more about the Tennessee matchup later, but just from the big picture standpoint, it's hard to argue with what's happened. A seven seed and a win in the tournament. Yeah, all great points there. Thank you so much for sharing that. Give give me that stat one more time, please. 
Uh, are you going to fact check it? No, I just want to oh. hear it one more time. Oh. I was half paying attention to the first time around, so I want to make sure I heard you correctly. Terry just won his fourth NCAA tournament game at Texas. Barnes, Shaka, and Beard won four games combined from 09 to 22, to 2022. So, obviously, Beard was only here for one postseason. He wins that one game. Think about that with some of the talent Rick Barnes had at the end, though. That he only won three games in that time before he was dismissed by Steve Patterson. I guess it was kind of his own volition too. He had the chance yeah. to make some changes on his staff and he chose not to. And so Steve Patterson fired him altogether. You can't deny that. I'm sorry. And for everybody who wants to say he had a mediocre coaching past, he wasn't mediocre at Fresno state. He had more good years than bad at Fresno state. And I believe he left that job to take the UTEP gig. Now UTEP wasn't a great tenure for him, but that's feels a lot of ways like a thankless position. I think he realized that too, which is why he took the opportunity to come serve as one of Chris Beard's assistants back here in Austin. Yeah. And I'm looking at, I'm looking at the last seven years of Barnes right now, three NCAA tournament wins, which I guess, I mean, CB put it perfectly in that comment. I could have done the math in my head like that, but <laughs> cause Beard obviously only won one cause they lost in the round of 32 his first year. Um, and, and look, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure Beard would have won more. Like, I'm not, I'm not doubting that either. I'm not, I'm also not like anti Chris Beard or thinking that Chris Beard didn't get it done or that Rodney Terry's a way better coach than Chris Beard, but the circumstances are the circumstances. So DJ says, I think it has to do with race with some of these racist donors, not with everyone feels that way. Beard beats up women and people are pissed. He was fired. It's obviously more nuanced than that but he certainly did have a role in all of that. I, I don't know if it's a racial thing, DJ, as much as I think it's a lot of people being frustrated that things weren't handled dis differently. And uh, the guy who ends up becoming a target of a lot of those hard feelings is Rodney Terry. Now, the horns down bit was not a good look for him. I'm sorry it wasn't. I mean, even if he was trying to, to use it to catalyze his team, and it oh, did sure. work in that moment. They had a... a uh, better stretch than most figure they would going into that six game stretch where they uh, against ranked competition where they ended up going three and two at first before dropping that final one to an Iowa State team that's turning out to be pretty darn good at the end of the season. But I do think Rodney Terry is at the receiving end of some of that frustration and some of that anger because a lot of people felt like Chris Beard was the guy. And there are some people who still think that he didn't do anything wrong or that necessitated him being fired. I disagree with that sentiment too but to sit there and frame the Rodney Terry hire as it being completely emotionally uh fueled is erroneous I'm sorry it is what he was able to do last season was him earning that opportunity on top of by the way the fact that with any hire don't you want a little bit of emotion don't you want to feel good about the hire when it happens a lot of Longhorn fans and a lot of people who follow this sport who said, yeah, this is a no-brainer right now. You want to let this guy walk away when he's shown the ability to win the postseason? Sure, it's with a roster that what he, that he didn't construct, but that's the big question that any basketball coach is going to have to answer in this era of the sport. What are you doing in the offseason to replenish your roster? Because the likelihood is that you're going to have to be replay, you're going to have to replace unless you're a mid-major and even mid-majors have their problems because they've got to replace guys who end up going into a bigger program. But can you replenish a half to 50% of that roster with guys who fit into your system? I think the jury is still out as with regards to whether Rodney Terry is good at that side of things. But if you can get that side figured out, I have a lot of confidence in him as a leader of men one, but also a guy who understands what to do X's and O's wise uh, on game day. Now, I say all of that by hoping that Rodney Terry realizes the error of his ways and is done with the IT Horton experiment <laughs> in the starting lineup at the beginning of games and coming out at halftime. I'm sorry. I'm sure IT Horton's a good guy. He's not somebody that needs to be out there. And he's not playing starters minutes either, by the way. But he doesn't need to be out there as a starter. There's other dudes that you can go with and still find a way to get him 10 to 15 minutes throughout the game coming off the bench. Yeah, I, I want to... Before we get to that, sure. I want to say one other thing about, about Beard. I think some of the RT sentiment from those people has more to do with 
a certain group of Texas fans just not being able to let go of the beard hire not working out and because of the way that it didn't work out because it looked like and it probably was by all intents on a rocket ship path to what everyone thought it would be and I think it just felt so perfect when it happened it was everything from hey we ripped him away from tech to you know native son like just like RT has the connections to Barnes Beard has the connection to Penders which not as long and sustained as as what Barnes did and without a Final Four, but Tom Penders was a really good coach here in the 90s yeah. for, for Texas basketball. And again, Beard wasn't a huge part of that, but he's because he was just a student manager at the time. But Penders is a mentor. He's a UT grad. Like, I think it was just so hard for people to get to just actually finally move on from, hey, native son coming home didn't didn't work out. Like it just didn't guys. And it's such a bummer that it didn't work out, but you got to move on now. And I think people's disappointment is directed at Rodney Terry. And I think we were all kind of getting at that a little bit, but I just feel like it's, it's a little bit unfair. If you really have that much love for the program, then I don't want to say you should be supporting whoever the head coach is unconditionally, because I'm not going to say that. Cause I've had instances where teams I root for, it's just like, wow, this is, like this is untenable as a fan. Like I just, I just can't do it, you know? So I, I'm not saying that, but when things are going the way they're going, you, you should be able to get on board with this right now. And you should be able to, at this point, be an adult and move past, Hey, it's disappointing. There'll always be what ifs with Chris Beard in Texas. I mean, everybody, Chris, Chris Beard, maybe more than anybody else will go, you know, will go to his grave um, and, you know, with what ifs and I, he may not admit regrets, but probably something, something to that effect. And it, it just, it's crazy to me because even it did feel so perfect, even CDC in his, when he gave him the Jersey and they do all that, your new head coach, he literally goes prodigal son returns. I mean, and that's how most of the fan base felt about Chris Beard. So uh, I just wanted to wrap, wrap that part of it up with, with, with that about beard, because I do think almost psychologically in a way, that's, that's a bit of it for, for some of these Texas fans. It's just like, they can't get past it. It didn't work out. Like why, why did that have to happen? You know, cause it was, if you're just a fan, that was a really a bad break. Like you had your guy, Texas went out and got the dude they wanted and you know, it, it didn't work out. Worked Back out. to that's it Horton. Thing. That's how these things go sometimes. Even if the, smartest of experts believe that it's a perfect match that's not always the case by the way do you know who didn't make the ncaa tournament this year oh beard Ole miss yeah it's the ncaa tournament now guys are given time but there were a lot of people predicting chris beard was going to go to Ole miss and immediately make them a contender they were ranked at one point in the year but ultimately they weren't playing their best basketball when they needed to be and were excluded from the field Field of 68. And we'll we'll see what he does there. I'm sure at some point they'll have a they'll have a good season because sure. Chris I, Beard- I think they will too. But again, there's there's no guarantees. And the yeah. smartest people who follow things the closest are also wrong at times too. Now, do I think it would have worked out well for Beard had what happened not happened and he was still coaching here? Yeah, there's a chance Texas would have been better off last season with regards to competing for a national championship. But that's a hypothetical game that I try and not waste too much time on because it didn't happen. It's like people who play the Colt McCoy, not getting hurt in that Alabama game, who would have won. I think Texas would have won, but it's not like I spend a ton of time thinking about it. And it's not like anything was guaranteed. Nothing was guaranteed. But I do agree that if you made me a, you know, put a percentage chance on if they would would have won that game. If Colt McCoy was healthy, it would be higher than 50. Let's just say that. Yeah. It would be higher than 50 and quite close to a hundred. <laughs> what do you but, think about IT Horton 100. starting for this basketball team? Cause look, I know there were, there are a myriad of things that we can talk about last night, the slow start, the ugly second yeah. half, this team digging deep and showing its resilience after said slow start and, and making shots and making plays down the stretch and what could have been a tighter game as Colorado state was trying to 
scratch and claw and fight their way back into postseason relevance. They did all of those things, but there are some nits to pick here. And for me, it does begin with IT Horton. That's a waste yeah. guy out there. I think that that uh, simply put just needs to not happen yeah. in the next game. And I've I've really wanted IT Horton to become this, you know, scoring threat X factor kind of extra option, but not one you'd rely on that we were sort of sold as I feel like, I mean, and again, I didn't hear as much about him as I heard um, coming out of the portal as I did max and, and some of the other guys even, but when they got it, everyone talked about like, that was a really good get. And he just, he just hasn't been able to figure it out on really on, I mean, on the defensive end, I think is why he's, you know, been, hasn't played as much, but really I think they would have looked past that a little bit. If you were getting the scoring, what I think everyone thought he was going to bring was was that microwave effect, that microwave scoring effect where he can just get get hot in an instant and a night like last night. That would have been great, but he hasn't shot the ball particularly well. I mean, he doesn't really get downhill with much effectiveness. Now they don't really draw it plays for him or let him handle the ball like that. But um, yeah, I think that he probably needs to see. I mean, limited minutes. I thought he played decent defensively after he struggled a little bit early on and he got you know he got beat a couple times early grabbed seven rebounds so it wasn't like he was he was doing nothing out there but if you're putting a guy in the starting lineup over over when the other option is Kendall Weaver then then that I think is where people really start to struggle because I understand wanting Kendall to come off the bench we well, like, can go different directions with that if you want a guy who's going to do more little things for you Brock Cunningham's an option if you want to play a little bit bi bigger. And I think this and, guy and Brock has started during his time at Texas. So depending on whatever year you want to say, you know, you want to be a little bit bigger. And this guy has become a very important player for Texas down the stretch. Uh, Caden Shedrick is an option. I just think that there are three guys that you're looking at in your bench that you're bringing off the bench. One of whom would be a better option for IT Horton and IT Horton coming in the game to spell a guy for 10 to 15 minutes in a contest. Yeah. And then maybe, I mean, your hope with IT Horton is, don't be terrible on defense and hopefully hit a couple shots. You know, yeah. yesterday surprised me by grabbing quite a few big rebounds. Yeah, I think but those rebounds are going to be there regardless of whether. Oh, I come on. He had seven boards. I understand that, but those, those rebounds are going to be there for other Longhorns. If it wasn't it Horton, that's fair. It's not like he's a rebounding force and Colorado state. And this is why I was confident in predicting Texas to win the game. Yesterday, as we were talking about it, I actually had BK put money on the game in Vegas. Unfortunately, I lumped it in a parlay with stupid fucking Kentucky, not covering. BK in Vegas right now? He's in Vegas right now. Yeah, he's at a bachelor party. So he got in on Wednesday and is probably completely shit-faced calling prostitutes right now. No, he's not calling prostitutes. He's watching basketball. He cares less, much, much more about college basketball than he does prostitutes. BK. <laughs> uh, how close is it, though? Don't answer that. 55-45. Uh, but uh, no, I thought, a bachelor party. I thought this was a good matchup for Texas because even though Colorado State had some gritty dudes, they were an undersized team. Yeah. And what's ultimately going to trip Texas up, unless they go up against a team that catches absolute fire and just can't miss from the outside, let's say, is a team that has decent size down low. That's what's been problematic for them all season long. It wasn't an issue with... Uh, Colorado State. It's going to be a little bit more of an issue with Tennessee, and that's why I ultimately have them losing tomorrow to Rick Barnes and Bunch. But yeah, that that was actually the perfect first round matchup for them, especially because Dylan DeSue found himself in foul trouble again, and Max Asmus has now, for the better part of a month, been off with his shot. Five for fifteen last night. He made big plays when he had to, hit a couple of big shots when he needed to, but. Uh, those, those guys were not reliable last night. So you needed a good matchup to help overcome that on top of guys who are picking up the slack a little bit individually scoring wise on the offensive end and a Colorado state team that just completely sucked from the first TV timeout in the first half until a couple minutes into the second half. I mean, three points to, uh, to close out the first half for Colorado state after going up what 12 to 4, 12 to 2 at the beginning of that game or 11 to 2 at the beginning of that game. I think if if you had told Texas fans 5 minutes before tip off, hey, 
Max Asmus and Dylan DeSue are are not going to play well. Like I feel like even Dylan's 12 point stat line is a little bit misleading. I mean, when he he made baskets down the stretch to help them help them put that game away, but against a better team, i.e., you know, exhibit A tomorrow <laughs> against yeah. Tennessee, yeah. you're not going to be able to survive nope. that level of game from Ace Miss and DeSue. So like it is a lot of times in sports, you look at it and go, well, I hope that DeSue and Ace Miss aren't, aren't going to go one of 12 from three again, but they did and Texas survived. So that's the, you know, the silver lining side of it. And then you would hope you would hopefully say, you know, they're going to, even if they don't catch fire, they're at least going to be better than that. And they can't really be much. There's only one way to be much worse. And it would have been to not hit one of those threes. Yeah. They, um, they need to put Dylan to Sue on a weak offensive player and let his do his, let him do his defensive work as a help side defender. I get it. He's a good defender, but the foul trouble has been a problem for him these last several games now. So you got to avoid that at all costs because he can't start to cook. If he's having to sit on the bench with two fouls in the first half, or picking up that quick third to begin the second half. Well, and I know uh, uh, Rodney is on that roster. Oh yeah. Sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, you're good. Um, Rodney in his, in his post game press conference said he raved about Tyrese and he's like the box score won't really do Tyrese justice. Cause he played so well defensively on Stevens. Who's one of the better point guards, definitely at that mid major level. Um, so that that was a tough matchup, and he played well. But against Tennessee, they're they're going to need one of those games where, like, I think the biggest thing that could happen for them, besides playing good defense again against a much better offensive team and Dalton Connect, one of the best scorers in the country, is a Tyrese Hunter, like, couple quick shots, see a couple quick ones go in. I think you're going to know really early in this game if Texas has a chance. And I think if a couple things like that happen, if DeSue, I wouldn't normally say this about DeSue, but because of the way he played and there being a step up in competition now, I think if you don't see something early from DeSue, that's going to concern me. Because as much as he will never admit this, I wonder if there's a little bit in the back of the mind, like, am I am I healthy? Like, am I healthy enough? Um, and I'm not saying that's why he didn't play well, but I did feel like he looked a little a little tentative, like even those push shots. I know there's so much finesse with him. He's not, you're not going to get aggressive with those shots, but it didn't look like it had the same oomph on it that it normally has uh, for Dylan DeSue. Yeah. And really all three of those guys, but I'll say especially Tyrese, because I think Tyrese is so dependent. He can tell us all he wants that he doesn't lose confidence. He, to me, might be the guy that's most dependent on finding an early rhythm and feeling it where Max is, Max is just an experienced veteran college basketball score, just a great score. Like Max will grind it out, you know, nine times out of 10 when he's not playing well, and he'll find a way to be productive. Like I don't worry about him continuing to shoot with confidence, but Tyrese is a guy that I, I think is just, is going to be huge on the offensive end for them because they're going to have, I think they're going to have to score a lot to win this game. I don't know if there's even a remote chance of this happening. But other than the IT Horton stake, Rodney Terry's his biggest tactical mistake this year has been to allow Max Aismas to be the primary ball handler for this basketball team. If you were smart, you would insist that Tyrese Hunter be that guy. Because guess what? It's not working out well for either guy offensively right now. So switch things up a little bit. They, they're big guys. They can handle that. You're the head coach. You can dictate what needs to be happening here. Let Tyrese start the ball, start the offense with the ball in his hands more. Let Max Aismas work to get open for some of those jump shots that turn into more catch and shoot opportunities. He can still do some stuff off the dribble too if he wants to, but change up the types of opportunities that these guys are getting on the offensive end and how they're able to help set up their teammates too. I think this team is better off, even if it doesn't happen with Tyrese Hunter in more of that role and Max A. Smith, despite his smaller size, not like Tyrese Hunter is any bigger, but despite his smaller size, playing more of that shooting guard role for this team. And yeah, he can be a secondary ball handler when you need. Well, we saw it again last night with Tyrese. He's just a better passer than Max A. Smith. Exactly. And that's not a, that's not a knock on Max, but you saw that weird clunky pass that Max threw 
to to Brock in the second half. It's not the first time I've seen Max Aismas do that this year. I've seen him make some good passes too, but most of his assists, at least that I remember, you know, I don't have like stats to back this up on advanced stats on, you know, the types of plays that his assists came off of, but a lot of them on pick and pops with Dylan DeSue. Like when they just go play that, that two man game on the outside and basically just make defenses decide, like, are you going to let Dylan DeSue get hot? Yeah. And, you know, so um, I think, but, but yeah, I, I think with Tyrese, you saw it on those lobs. A couple of those lobs last night were really pretty. And, you know, that's, that kind of stuff gets him rolling too, where he can yeah. feel more confident. It fires him up on the defensive end. He plays even better defense. Like you don't need the 30 point game from Tyrese Hunter that you got a couple of weeks ago in the, you know, the regular season finale, but you just need like, like 15, can we get 15 point a game Tyrese? Can I get, I mean, hell I'll, I'll even, I'll, I'll be re- reasonable and realistic here. Can I get two of five from downtown Tyrese with uh, six, seven assists? I get six, seven assists, a couple of those pretty lobs, high percentage baskets, a couple free throws, which would mean that he's taking it to the rack and being aggressive. Cause that's another thing that I like. I like to see him do too. Just, against a team like Tennessee, just get them in foul trouble, rack up those easy points, you know, make them play to where they rack up some early fouls and go, well, we don't want to get them shooting one and ones. And eventually the bonus with 11 minutes left in the first half, like Texas's aggression is, is going to need to be, I think at a seat at a season high in the Tennessee game tomorrow. Yeah. Tyrese Hunter having two assists and two turnovers last night is wildly frustrating. That's not what his assist to turnover ratio should look like. And the two assists were on those lobs. Like they were on really high percentage baskets. And that's what you're going to need. Like when you can get those, take them. That's why, you know, when this team starts, I know they have guys that can shoot, but when they start settling for too many threes and then they're not going, then I feel like they almost start pressing to be, keep shooting, keep shooting, you know, because that's for better or worse, that's what all these coaches it seems like that's what they tell so many of these guys. Oh, keep shooting. But some guys should keep shooting. Like, I'm okay if Max Asmus and Dylan DeSue keep shooting, and even Tyrese to an extent. But, like, hey, Kendall and Kendall Weaver and Brock, and more, Brock more so this year, I've seen Brock hit some threes. If Brock throws one, like, into the next into the next galaxy and airballs it on a three, I'm not sure I want to see him take another one for a little while, unless it's absolutely wide open and he hits that one. So... The whole like keep shooting mindset is great when it's a guy that should keep shooting. Yeah. The funniest example of that right now for me on this team is Kendall Weaver. who doesn't shoot a ton of threes just yet. You're eventually going to be right about that. Damn it. That when he does get comfortable and start shooting, he, he does so from a pretty decent clip, but him driving to the basket, going up with the ball and staying in the air so long that the guy who is bigger than him, who has jumped to block the shot is no longer in the air and him finding a way to get the ball in the hole more often than not. Cause he was what five for seven last night. I feel like at least three of those were those sorts of opportunities just continues to amuse me because the first time you see it, you're like, Oh no, this, this isn't going to work. And then you watch <laughs> it how long he stays in the air for and how close he still is to the basket. You're like, oh, I could see how this would be an effective shot for him. Yeah, I, I I tweeted yesterday during the game that he doesn't jump, he floats. Yeah. Like, you, I mean, you said it perfectly. He just stays up in the air, and even if he's 6'3 or 6'4, and the guy guarding him 6'6, well, it doesn't matter because he's just, he's just going to levitate. And – how he feels up in the air, like basically looking down at the basket, like, all right, all I got to do is just drop this in there. Like the only thing I could compare it to that I've ever felt is like when you're playing pop shot and you know, it's a lower one and the basket's like kind of moving around and you're like almost throwing it down into the basket. And you're like, gosh, this is an easy shot, but I hope I don't just throw it right off the heel of the back of the rim right here. Like that must, that must be what he feels like. Well, I'll never know unless I'm on a trampoline. His body control, not just staying up in the air, but his overall body control and staying squared up enough to the basket to get that soft shot up where it's like if you get it to a certain point, it's going to bounce around a little bit and might hit the backboard and go in a lot, especially because distance-wise, it's already such a high percentage shot. Yeah, and even on those plays, 
so let's say he he misses a few of those. Maybe he tries he tries that again, gets a couple good looks. They don't go this time. Well, you have a Shedrick and a Dasu or a Dylan Mitchell right there for a potential putback dunk. Like I know you talk about oh with threes, you know maybe you get a long rebound like and then you, you restart the offensive possession. I would so much rather have a higher percentage shot to begin with, be it a two over a three, with this team specifically. I know strategies, you know, have changed over the years, generation generationally with basketball but weaver going in high percentage shot or rolls around on the rim like then from there i'll take my chances with like i said a shedrick mitchell or desu right there to put it back or hell even weaver himself to put it back that's just giving you more more options i mean i don't know if you saw the uh the florida atlantic northwestern game earlier did you see the end of that game no, I saw that Northwestern was losing halfway through, but it looks like they actually came back and won that game. What happened? So down the stretch, they were Northwestern down to with, you know, 20 something seconds left. They had the ball, you know, they, they worked it around, worked the offense. I can't, I don't know the name of the player, but he takes it to the rack. Finally, they get a good look. He makes a layup. Florida Atlantic has eight or nine seconds to go win the game. Their best player takes it's one I can't remember his name he takes the ball down the floor and you could tell he like decided in his mind that he was going to pull up and try to win the game and even the announcers it was Grant Hill Raftery those guys were like take it to the basket (laughs) take it to the basket man and maybe you're you know you get a better look it's a tie game you don't need a pull up three from NBA range as sick as those are like those, those are sick walk off wins. And if that's all you can get, then that's fine. He had nine seconds to put his head down and take it to the basket. And maybe it doesn't work out, but you might get fouled. Like you bring in so many other things into play, a better shot, more likely. You might get fouled. It might roll off the rim right to your guy who puts it back in as time expires. There's just so many good things that can happen when you have a guy who can aggressively take the ball to the basket. So, you know, to bring it back to Texas, if Weaver can. If that can be on this year's team, his contribution to the offense until they're eventually eliminated, whether it's tomorrow or further down the line in the tournament, that that's huge for this team. If he can be that guy that just gives them that aggressiveness and ability to take it to the rack and finish and, and just create more offense. So that was a tie game in that scenario that you oh. were just, that you just laid out and it went to yeah. overtime. Yeah, sorry. Oh. And then they and then in the Northwestern smoked them in overtime. Sorry, yeah, I didn't exactly. Didn't so- If that had happened, if that had been a Longhorn player that did that, I would have a hard time rooting for him for the rest of his time with the program. I know that's a fucked up thing to admit. (laughs) That is such a stupid low basketball IQ mistake, though, to just settle for a long three versus. And they took they took away the three. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just saying the scenario that you laid out, where it's like you drive it inside, maybe you draw a foul, or maybe you are able to put something up that a teammate can follow up if you don't hit that initial shot versus the complete uncertainty of when you, it's not inevitable, you might make the shot, but that's what less than six out of 10 for uh, even good shooters at 38.5 means 50% from two point range. So there's a better chance that you're going to miss it than make it. And it's so much more uncertain if you do miss it as to whether there's going to be a second opportunity. Yeah. And it's not like, you know, us sitting here saying, take it to the basket more. Like, it's not like we're reinventing the game here, <laughs> Like, yeah. but the amount of teams that don't do that, it, it just, it blows my mind, you know, but not just the last play scenario, even throughout the rest of the game. If you're a team that likes to shoot a lot of threes, like, like BYU was like that all season, you, st- you still should have guys that can take it to the basket that creates, it makes the defense work. It makes the defense overthink things. And it creates better looks when you do get a three versus just like what Texas does now, where it, it seems like they just kind of have like one guy dribble to the elbow. If nothing works, pass it to the next guy. He dribbles to the elbow and they just like hope something eventually opens up. So like, I know this isn't unique to Texas, but one frustrating element to their offense this year is it does feel like they settle for threes far too often versus last year's team, where even when they were shooting the three ball well, they were still doing a much better job of working offense. And part of that is the basic difference in the offense run last year, that motion-based offense that Chris Beard installed uh, versus that two-man game that seems much more common with Rodney Terry right now. I hope he readopts certain motion principles next year 
to keep guys constantly moving. There's there's too many moments where you have two guys standing very close to one another away from the ball, let's say beyond the three-point line or over near the corner. That's bad spacing right there. And you are diminishing what your options are on offense and how good you might be by basically taking at least one guy out of the play, if not both of those guys, because they're standing so close to one another. Yeah, I, I agree with you on last year's team, but I also think it was the personnel too. Like they just had a lot of guys that had very complimentary offensive skill sets, whether it was Timmy Allen and his, I mean, he was a mid range menace. You had Marcus Carr, who was a decent three point shooter, but could drive and take it to the rack and, you know, was was big enough and sturdy enough to initiate and survive contact and still make a shot. And then you had Jabari with everything that he brought to the table, a really good shooter, but then also a good slasher too. guy, guy who made great cuts and always just seemed to make the right play on offense. And, you know, you lose when you lose those three guys, that's that's a, a lot of your offense and your experience. All right, so I'm going to hit pause right now for a second. We're going to have an off-air conversation that is actually going to happen on the air because it's just been one thing for another for me today. So I didn't get a chance to check with you. I assume it's okay, but I want to ask first. So I have uh, two conversations that I can play as part of today's show that will give us a little bit of, break, of a break. One is with the actor Skeet Ulrich, who people probably know best from the Scream movies. Uh, he is going to be taking part in the NASCAR festivities at CODA on Sunday, he's going to be the honorary pace car driver. And so I recorded with him a little bit ago. And so I have that. It's about a 20 minute conversation. I can play that right now if you're cool with it. It'll give us a little break. And then at the end of today's show, if you're cool with it, I have a 10 minute compilation of my red carpet with the movie Roadhouse starring Jake Gyllenhaal, Conor McGregor. I talked to those guys and a bunch of other members of the cast. And the most important question I asked is how many of you would it take to beat Conor McGregor in a fight. And then I also asked <laughs> Conor McGregor how many of me he thinks it would take to beat him in a fight. So if you're cool with that, we're going to play both of those interviews today. Well, now I got to hear that last, the answer to that last question. <laughs> yeah, right, let's cool. do it. So, all right, we're going to do, uh, we're going to do that right now. Going to do the first of these conversations. The second one's going to come up at the very end of today's show. But for now, here is my conversation from a little bit earlier with actor Skeet Ulrich in town for the NASCAR stuff this Sunday at CODA. He's got a new series that he co-stars in with Giancarlo Esposito he of Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul fame. It's called Parish. It premieres on AMC coming up pretty soon. I think it's as soon as next week. But Skeet and I talked about his wild NASCAR past, Parish, and more. Help it all. That is already significantly better. Yes, thank you for doing okay. that. No worries. All right. Okay. Well, let's go with that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. Uh, yeah, no worries. These I, things are uh, so weird yeah. to do meetings on it. Like, where the fuck is the camera? I know. It's. I struggle with that with my laptop also, even though I have the green dot to show me where to look. there's. I mean, you can't help but to look at the individual that you're talking to. It's, it's All very right. easy no. to the world with which we live. It's going to look really odd, but whatever. You're not a, this, you're a radio guy. There, yeah, there's a video. Of course, even radio has video now, and there's a video yeah, element yeah. that gets shared that helps with social media and that gets shared on my podcast too. So, uh, well, we'll do it. We'll do it like Charlie Rose style. I'll, I'll like face this way. How about that? How about I face this way then? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> it's like being in psychoanalysis. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is going to be the weirdest uh tell you about yourself that you're going to experience all weekend but i can tell that you're at the fairmount because of the couch that you were on initially <laughs> okay. because i was there i was there for south by um a couple weeks ago and i got to interview bootsy collins in person which was a freaking thrill that guy's a legend obviously but it was the same yeah. exact couch in whatever room we were in so it might be a who knows what if it was the exact same room that would be wild yeah, it's. I guess it's possible. Yeah. I, I, so you are in Austin. How are things going for you so far, man? Very good. We got in yesterday. We had the premiere of the new show uh, Wednesday night in LA, and uh, and then we're out here to to uh, enjoy some NASCAR. I've got a lot of family. Obviously, I'm sure you heard in the sport and uh, over the years, and um, 
And uh, so it's good to have family come in, my kids, uh, and also get to represent a show that I love and a sport that I love. So, oh, you get to make it a family affair this weekend. That's yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, there's so much to get into with Parish, uh, which does premiere very soon for the general public on yeah. FX, and then, or I'm excuse me, AMC, and AMC. Be seen on Hulu immediately as well. And then also what you're doing in NASCAR this weekend. So you see that somebody is driving the honorary pace car for a NASCAR event. And you're like, oh, that's cool that this person is getting to do this, but that's that's not where it begins and ends for you, as you just alluded to. Now, I can take Wikipedia at face value and see that you've got some serious NASCAR connections in the past, but for anybody who's un unfamiliar, just how ingrained were you in the NASCAR lifestyle as a kid based on uh, family members and strong male role models in your life? Um, well, uh, uh, just to summarize it maybe in a unique way, um... I got on a Ferris wheel in at the Cabarrus County Fair near Charlotte Motor Speedway at, I believe I was 11 or 12 years old, felt dizzy. And the man beside me who took me on this ride was Tim Richmond. And, <laughs> and he began screaming at the guy, let us off, let us off. He was like a protector to my brother and I. Um, um, DK Ulrich, who is my stepdad um you know ran a, ran many many years in the sport and owned uh teams for many years after that and brought ernie urban in brought tim richmond in um uh ricky rudd is obviously my uncle uh so i spent a lot of time around you know earnhard and and richard petty and ricky and sort of the legendary nascar drivers um and i it was it was amazing it's such a family you know, and it, it, uh, I'm not as enmeshed as I once was, but from looking in, knowing Chad Canals, you know, from our relationships through the years, from Jimmy and ever, it's always been a family sport and continues to be a family sport. And it's it's beautiful in that way. It's a traveling circus. Um, when you're a kid like that, you don't realize that you're amidst these legends. So obviously the Ferris wheel story is a great one. Like, do you have a fondest memory from just hanging around the sport though, when you were a kid? So considering that you were around it a, a lot of weekends when these races are going on. Yeah. I mean, we were sort of, you know, at, at that time you qualified on Wednesday. So you got a lot of tracks, you know, or that weren't near to concord you know rockingham obviously north wilkesboro stuff around that uh you know that was a day trip but everything else was you know family leaving on tuesday getting back on monday so you either went or you were alone and uh my brother and i were often alone but we often went and i had a I had an issue. I had a heart problem when I was 10. I had to have open heart surgery. And the week before I went to go in for the surgery was the Talladega race. And we went down for the Talladega race. And I guess word got around to everybody through DK and, and Ricky that, you know, what was going on. And it was going to be a tough surgery, this or that. And so, you know, Earnhardt, like, especially pampered me, stuck me up, he picked me up at one point, put me on top of the roof of the garage in, in, uh, in Talladega. And, you know, they just treated me like a king. I was in the driver's meeting and, and the king himself. It was a bank of pay phones I was sitting along and somehow he got the number to the one I was at and they rang and DK was like, pick it up. And I picked it up and it was the king and he was like, you're going to be just fine. You're going to you're going to make it. Don't worry about it. You know, he's just so sweet. Wow. And uh, I, I had a lot of, a lot of times with, with uh, some extraordinary people and, but those two legends, yeah, were of particular interest that weekend. Gosh, I, you know, I don't want to talk too much about this, but open heart surgery at such a young age, I've got a good friend of mine who went through testicular cancer when he was a teenager and it was so important for him as a character builder and something that built a resilience and a perspective that not a lot of kids or adults even have having to go through something so serious obviously it's very scary for you as a kid not knowing one way or the other but how important was that moment and who you are today oh man i think it kind of defined so much you know I, um everything down to career you know it uh i you know i was like many many kids wanted to be a pro baseball player and that was my jam and you know and 
And then, you know, the fear of getting hit by a baseball, you know, from a, you know, pitch in the chest, they created, we called it <laughs> my Dolly Parton in Little League, but I had a, you know, a catcher's <laughs> chest protector cut up and they would ace bandage it in front of my sternum, you know, in case I did get hit, but yeah. it ingrained the spirit. So I was, I couldn't hit, you know, scared to stay in there and hit. Yeah. Um, so in a way, I know, you know, there's so few of us that go on to be, major league baseball players, but in a way that sort of changed a traje trajectory right there. Um, and, you know, I started finding other things that interested me, uh, like acting. So, uh, um, um, yeah, it kind of defines everything. And you're right in terms of being a human being. I, I mean, I felt invincible, you know, uh, most of my life and still in, in a little bit of ways I do at 54 still feel, you know, invincible that I've, I've you know, I've beaten death um so i know what you mean i know what your friend means yeah it does give you a resiliency and a strength and a and a, a scale of what's major and what's not yeah and i don't mean just medically uh you know but yeah very important perspective so did that keep you from ever getting behind the wheel yourself to race just because of the concern with the steering wheel maybe hitting you there no, that wasn't it at all. I mean, I, you know, it was, um, you know, everybody was really busy. Uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of money to be made in NASCAR at that point in the, yeah. you know, early 80s. So it wasn't like, you know, we had a ton of money to even or, or time for me to even start a go kart, you know, uh, career, if you will, or somewhere to start, you know, your driving career. I mean, we had dirt bikes, we'd ride them all around. We lived off to ride a road, which is now like, Hendrick Lane, you know, or it's every industrial thing to do with NASCAR, but it was, you know, a couple of miles from the speedway, you rode dirt bikes all over out there, but no money, no time to really, you know, invest in bringing along me as a driver or anything. I would have loved it. Um, I, according to Ricky, I have some skills, so. Oh, really? Take, yeah, yeah. I'll take that. But I got to hand it down to my son. My son was doing bandoleros at eight he was doing 110 and bandos at you know eight years old nine years old and damn um yeah and he had a uh you know he ran seven seasons and then you know you hit a price point that just becomes a bit unmanageable you know uh i do okay but i'm not you know i'm not going to be able to support a race team so <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> a good way to put it. So you have served as a grand marshal previously at a NASCAR race. Is this going to be your first time to get behind the wheel of the honorary pace car? Absolutely. I'm not even sure what to expect. I mean, my my brother, you know, he uh he works for the company that runs nine of these tracks and um Speedway Motorsports and um and and uh you know, he when he talked about it it sounded like I was driving the pace car the entire race and I was like and that's a bit nerve wracking. I don't know about that. It can't be it. He's yeah. like, I think so. And I was like, bro, I don't think so. So I think we're like, you know, doing a couple laps ahead of the base car, but yeah. and then we'll peel off and let them have at it. But um, it's exciting. You know, it's really, uh, I, I can't tell you, like, I mean, my mom started one of the first PR firms in this business and she worked at Charlotte Motor Speedway for years doing everything from bringing in, you know, sponsorships to the pre-race stuff to all the different things they did to try and generate fandom etc you know she was responsible for and and so i've had moments where i sat in between the grid as they rolled off pit road you know and ricky waves out the window at me and like you know i've had some really cool moments like that and but this one i you know it's so cool to get to come back in this way to a sport that i've spent generations around and in a role and in in a show that i i can't speak highly enough about and my experience with Giancarlo esposito and amc in general and this material and this show uh, i mean i'm blessed i am a blessed man uh, to have family around me while i'm doing it it's a highlight yeah everybody knows Giancarlo from breaking bad of course and better call saul he actually looks a lot like the longhorn men's basketball coach believe it or not a guy named rodney terry look that up after <laughs> Back, you know, right, we'll check it out. You'll, you'll get a chuckle out of that and let John yeah. Carlo know that too, please, because that's been a running joke ever since Rodney Terry started coaching here a few years ago or came back to I will let him know. Yeah. Absolutely. But this, the show, this show parish looks incredible. 
Everybody knows about Giancarlo and his acting chops. I hope people aren't sleeping yeah. on what you're going to be able to bring to the show, too. Uh, you said in a previous interview, or probably a couple of previous interviews, if we're being honest, that your character uh, is towing that line and sometimes not so well between uh, problem call causing, let's say, and then also fun, too. Is it difficult yeah. cool to get to, to play those two sides on screen like that? Uh, it's incredible. You know, I like, I always have liked, um, I remember really being such a big fan of Gary Oldman and Vigo Mortensen in my twenties, you know, and, and the virility and the, and the tension that they brought to scenes and to characters. And it's, you know, that edge staying on that edge, but this guy's like got the, got a heart of gold, but he's just keeps messing up and keeps messing up. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I had, you know, put that on the front of my script. His name's Colin, the character. Does Colin bring trouble or does he bring fun? And it's and it's obviously both. You got to do both. So uh, uh, it was an extraordinary experience. He's a, you know, a, a Cajun, which is a lot of fun to to work with that accent. I had done it one other time. And um, and this one, I got to elaborate a little more on it. And and that just is a whole sing song amount of fun that uh uh, I can't even explain. Um, but yeah, it's an, an incredible show about really about a guy who's suffering from so much grief at the loss of his son a year prior to the story, starting a 19 year old that was murdered in New Orleans and the story all takes place in New Orleans. And, you know, subsequent to that, his grief sort of overwhelms his ability to run his business. His family's falling apart. They are going to have to sell the house. His daughter's at odds with him everything's falling apart and then an old friend shows up who they had done a lot of crimes together and this guy went away for 17 years for him and never ratted him out and that's me and now his life's on the line and he needs his help and uh and they they get into some stuff so they oh, get in man, deep that that sounds <laughs> exciting that sounds really exciting yeah. i can't wait to hear you do the cajun accent again too i know you've said that when you got into acting that you had to kick a Southern accent because you grew up yeah. in Virginia or North Carolina, technically that you were both mainly North Carolina, but I was born in Virginia. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, you grew up in the South and you had to kick that Southern accent to make it as an actor. Yeah. What did you go back to, to make sure to get the Cajun accent, right? Are we going back and watching season one of true detective? There's something else going on there. <laughs> I, you know, it's, it's funny cause I couldn't really find anybody that was doing what I wanted to do. Uh, that the I couldn't find the accent anywhere. The one thing that was closest is that um that Cajun uh, catfish cook dude. I can't remember his name. He's a YouTube sensation. Um, I know who you're talking about. I'm gonna have to look yeah. And I wish I could talking. remember his name, but um, but I saw that a little bit, and it's close to that. I mean, the character had done 17 years in Angola, which is the toughest prison in the U.S. Oh yeah, and um, and it's a 90 percent um black population so i wanted to sort of figure out how did this guy survive that you know and how and so it was sort of a mix of cajun and what it may have sounded like in angola um that i was after and so that was kind of unique and um but the basics of it are there and and i had lots of people coming to me on set who were obviously from there shooting in new orleans saying oh my god you sound just like my family or just like you know my uncle or this or that and but yeah, yeah, I paid a lot of money to go to NYU and lose accents like that, only to like be asked to <laughs> do them again. <laughs> That's very but, high praise coming from uh, people in the uh, Dubuque, the Bayou State. I was there yeah. at the start of this year for the Longhorns football game against Washington. Man, that city is so unique in so many ways, and it yeah. is very easy. You understand why people may be walking around with five to 10 extra pounds, because there is so much delicious food, yeah. but also extremely decadent as well. I gained 10 pounds over the five months we were shooting there. It was easy to do. I could have easily put on 20. Yeah, ex exactly. So yeah. much good food, yeah. You gotta catch yeah, yourself at a certain city. point. It's like that freshman 15 that first year in college. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the freshman 15 first uh first six months of living in New Orleans. Um, so one other interesting aspect about your story, Skeet, and something that led to you acting as well as a sort of passion for building. You were building tree houses yeah. as a kid with a friend, and you were actually mm -hmm. a set builder, which led to you realizing mm -hmm. this passion 
or acting. I'm curious in modern times, is there something that you've just built or something that you're currently in the process of building that you're especially yeah. proud of or has your attention? Oh my God. Yeah. I've been building, uh, I, I built a lot of, well, I shouldn't say a lot. I'm not prolific because I have a lot of other things going on, but when I do get time and the, the strike allowed quite a bit of time for building recently, um, and I'm building a credenza, like an eight foot long mid-century low credenza for my daughter's apartment now, um, which is all walnut. And uh, I'm probably a week from finishing it. I don't know how much you'll be able to see of that. Like, Oh my God, that looks awesome. Yeah, they're cool. This is all like box joints. Um, let's see if you can see that. Oh, look at that. Yeah, that's beautiful detail there. Yeah. So I got to build the doors for it and uh, and uh, put the finish on it and stuff like that. I've built some stuff recently for my son, some side tables for his apartment, for his sofa. That was a lot of fun. I used Live Edge uh, Walnut, which I'd never used Live Edge before. And I had a bunch of Santos mahogany left over from a current other projects I had built that I used to make the bases and stuff like that. So it was it's been fun. I, it's just something I love so much, you know, in film, uh, you know, we, it's a very collaborative effort at its best and it's, um, and, you know, but we show up, we hand over our ideas and our presentation of, of the story, our part of the story. And then it's not ours anymore. And, um, it becomes how the story gets shaped by the director and by the producers. And that's okay. I mean, and you want it that way you want, you know, but, it's, you know, in furniture building, I get there from design to completion. It's my, mine, mine. And I, if I mess it up, I mess it up. If I make a great piece, I, I completed my vision, but um, it, it's just been a nice, uh, you know, something so interesting to me. And, and I build what's called heirloom quality furniture. There's no metal in them other than the hinges or something, but there's no, you know, it's all joinery uh, based. So it's all woodwork then? It's all woodwork. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like you and Nick Offerman need to uh, do I know people together if nothing that. else so you guys can talk shop. I know. And I think we live near each other too, from what I hear. So uh -huh. yeah, I, maybe one day we'll meet. Um, yeah. All right. So uh, we have just uh, another couple of minutes left, Skeet. I'd really do appreciate the time today. Uh, we're going to finish with this question now because I really enjoy having these sorts of conversations to discover a deeper side to people. And you strike me as a very thoughtful dude from the interviews that I've listened to you do long form and otherwise, uh, smart people, accomplished people tend to ask themselves questions. And at a given time, there's generally one overriding question that is top of mind for you right now, as somebody who's bright and accomplished, is there that one question? If so, what is it? One question that I ask myself lots that you're that uh, you're asking yourself right now more than than any other question, let's say. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think it's a uh, for me at the moment, it's career based like, you know, it's I mean, it's a it's a tough career. It's a tough business to to uh, maintain. I've been in it 30 some years now um, and I wonder if there's a future, you know, I always, you know, wonder, do I still have a future in this? you know, business. And, and I say that as I have a show coming out, but like, you know, you just don't know things are changing so rapidly and, uh, and it's a performer thing, you know, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's a, uh, you want to be doing your best stuff. You know, I don't want to just get by. It's not, doesn't interest me, you know? So I, I ask myself lots, you know, what, how, you know, what can I be doing? How can I be bettering myself? How can I, you know, uh, stay on point so that I don't lose something I've worked 33 years for longer for. So yeah, that's on my mind a lot lately. Well, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for, uh, serving as the honorary pace car driver at the NASCAR race this weekend. Can't wait to see that John Carlos going to be out there as well, serving yeah. as the grand marshal when you guys star in what looks like an awesome new series on AMC parish. It, Premieres yeah. next week, so everybody uh, stay tuned. You're going to have an opportunity to, to watch episode one, and you got to wait week to week, like old school television. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah it's uh, worth Steve, it. Really enjoyed the conversation today, man. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you, man. Thank you, thank you for your thoughtfulness, and it, it was a lot of fun and, and a lot 
deeper than one sort of things when you go, oh, an ESPN interview, like, you know, <laughs> I know it's more than that. So thank you. It obviously is. I appreciate you and uh, and what you do. And thanks for, you know, getting our show out there. Right there it is. Skeet Ulrich. Check him out at the NASCAR race this weekend and on Parish. I have to be selective with the new television that we add to the arsenal, Jeff. But considering that this is a once a week show, it's not like I'm trying to binge through something. I think I'm going to be on board in part because of the conversation. I also like Giancarlo's work from Breaking Bad, too. But the premise just sounds really interesting. And I'm a sucker for things that are set around the city of New Orleans as well. Yeah, that always makes for for a great setting, no doubt. Yeah, that was that was an awesome interview too. You could tell he enjoyed it by that nice compliment he paid you at the end there. And I liked when you threw in the uh, Rodney Terry. Um, you can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yeah, she cut okay. out for a sec. I may have uh, hit the uh, switch off there, but if if you got me now, that's great. I have you now. <laughs> Uh, no, I was just saying you, you could tell that was that was a, a well done interview because he and and that he really enjoyed it too because paid you a nice little compliment at the end there, um, and he you know he seemed like a really good subject to interview too like he he enjoyed going deeper on a lot of those um, you know kind of more I don't know what the word is like just deeper subjects than than just like hey I'm I'm here for twenty minutes pimp your show you know. <laughs> We all have to deal with way too many superficial conversations. So if I can get 20 minutes with somebody who's answered a lot of the same questions over and over again and had to tell their story over and over again, and I can figure out new ways to talk about some of the interesting details. That's always the goal for me. And I had to examine or re-examine or change how I was going about prep. About a year ago, I interviewed this local comedian who is probably going to blow up at some point in the not too distant future, but there just wasn't a ton written on him online. And so I tried to wing it and winging it led to a, just a shitty conversation on my hat on my behalf, which I was embarrassed about. And I've actually reached out to him to apologize for that, but also to thank him for forcing me to rethink how I do things. Now I rely a little bit on the written word of the internet, although take it with a grain of salt because five to 95% of what's said on the internet is complete bullshit. But I do more in the way of actually watching and listening to interviews now, longer form interviews, especially. And I just take notes kind of like when reading a book or a conversation with an author, taking notes in the margins, my iPhone notes app has just a lot of random fucking questions to people on it at this point, as well as some of the kooky thoughts that I share on this show from time to time. Yeah. And I, I think I don't do it as much as you do, but you know, we get one-on-one -on -one interviews occasionally. And when you're putting in the research, like I do a lot of that too, where you look at something on the internet, but then it's almost trying to extrapolate even more out of that or, Hey, so-and-so wrote a quick piece on this, or there, there was a couple tweets about this, even if it wasn't something that was, published with a byline and you know another journalism outlet just saying okay let's take this and then how can we get even even deeper on that which is not always easy to do because like we've talked about a couple times on here you have to have somebody that's willing to take you there like you can ask the question as great as you want and that helps it does help but if the person is just completely unwilling to take you there and go beyond then there's not, there's nothing you can do, but in that case, then that person shouldn't be out doing media tours or interviews and stuff like that. So I don't run into that too much, but one interview that I did recently, not, I, I didn't leave it quite as disappointed as it sounds like you did when the one you're talking about with the local comedian where it made you completely rechange everything. Yeah. But that I, wasn't it, about that person. That was completely on me. That oh was no, no, I know that I'm saying this. I have a similar instance oh, okay. where I, I interviewed Denny Hamlin I see, you know, even people that don't know NASCAR that well, I think no, no Denny. And is this, I left. Is this this week? It was last week. Yeah. Okay. And the interview ran on Sports Sunday. It was ended up being about four minutes, which is a decent chunk for our, you know, for a 30 minute show. And yeah. I wasn't unhappy with it because he was good and he was nice and willing to answer. But I was like, man, I could have dug way more in on that. Like I didn't prep enough for how to ask the question. Like I wanted to ask him about. 2311 racing which he does with michael jordan 
that started in 2020 Bubba Wallace and Tyler Reddick are some of their main drivers. And to be honest with you, like I just didn't ask the question the right way twice to like mm -hmm. really get something more out of it. And it wasn't bad. Like people watching at home were probably like, that was fine. Like you, you asked the question fine. But for me, I was like, well, no, I, I want to do this so that you get more out of it than just the canned answer that he gives everybody when he does, you know, when I don't know how their deals work where they have to, talk a certain amount or be made available but he was very gracious with his time and we talked for about 10 minutes and i cut it cut it down to about four but yeah i just left going like i i should have been better there <laughs> like th that was and not that it's performance but like i should have performed better and at least found a better way to ask the to ask the same question about a topic he's been asked or a question he's been asked about a hundred times or more yeah yeah it's it's all it often comes down to what is the best follow-up for a topic that has yes. been dead horsed, let's say. But you also have to think about it like this, and I know you said that most people watching wouldn't notice that big of a difference. I think the highest performers and highest achievers in this world tend to be their own biggest critics at times because you know what you're capable of. And even if it's subtle, even if it's nuanced, you know – Sometimes it's in the moment or the immediate aftermath, how you could have done something just the slightest bit differently in a better way. Oh yeah. I run into that all the time when I watch something. And then even like my wife doesn't watch every show or every sports cast that I do, but if she catches one and texts me about like, Oh, great job. And I'm like, Oh, I don't know this. And then I'm like, I'm totally nitpicking, but whether you're doing a job like we have, or, you know, you're, selling insurance or doing something like that like you should be trying to get better yeah and and i think that's what one thing i love about being around sports is you get a lot of that like yeah you get a lot of the coach speak but also a lot of the coach speak if you really listen to it and take it to heart is like not a bad message mm -hmm. now it gets old when you hear it over and over again which is why coaches change up the message and the motto and the mission of every season um but that is one of the fun things about covering sports is for the most part, you're covering athletes that are, like you said, they're they're their own worst critic too. Like we could sit here and, you know, I'm not going to mention any names of guys that we've been critical of over, you know, the eight months we've been doing or six months we've been doing this show together, however long it's been. But those guys would, they might take it personally, but deep down they'd probably be like, yeah, I said the same thing about myself. <laughs> you know, I, I agree with you. Yeah. All right, getting back to the Texas basketball team now for a sec, uh, Jeff, because we ended that conversation very abruptly. Is there anything that you wanted to discuss before we move on to Longhorn football going through their first week of spring practices? I just think that matchup with with Tennessee tomorrow, it's it's your classic Rick Barnes team in the sense that, you know, they lead the way with defense. It's always going to be that that pesky um kind of grind it out blue collar Rick Barnes defensive style. But now what makes this team scarier than ever, not just for Texas playing them, but for the rest of the teams, if they move on is they finally have a bucket on offense to go along with that. Like Dalton connect is an absolute bucket. And he's one of the best stories in college basketball this year. Dude was playing mid major last year on no draft radar at all. You know, he was on the college basketball radar of, of course, Rick Barnes wanted him and other top programs wanted him to come be, you know, a top scorer on their team. And now the guy, based on how he played at Tennessee all year, is going to be an NBA first round pick. Like, that's a crazy story to go for. Like, that would be like if Max Acemas came here and then all of a sudden, like, went from what he was at Oral Roberts to now, like, he might be a top 10 pick. He might be a lottery pick. Uh, so that to me is what makes this. For all the, this, it's what makes this team scarier. If I'm Texas and anybody else that may face Tennessee if they move on and beat Texas, is that they have all the Rick Barnes principles that he always has that make them tough to beat, but now they have that extra offensive threat and that walking bucket that really helps you win in March. And with Ziegler and some of those other guys, they have really experienced guards, which we know that helps you win in March too. So that's kind of what I'm looking at with those you know, with, with, with that matchup tomorrow, I'm not sure if there's any, anything else to you that kind of stands out there. I'll be honest. I don't know enough about Tennessee to have a hardened opinion on things. So I'm glad you just shared so we can check that box <laughs> Move on 
to Longhorn football, which officially got spring practice going on Monday. They've had a handful of these up to this point. Were you there for the early practice windows that the media was allowed to watch? And if so, any observations worth sharing with the people? So we only had the one media window on Tuesday for the first day. We are supposed to have one Thursday, yesterday, but they canceled that one just because of bad weather and they ended up moving it inside. But I would say from the first day, what, what stood out was, and I haven't always said this about this team. Like I'm not always the guy that goes to practice and goes, God, these guys look good, man. Look at these dudes and shoulder pads and, or not even shoulder pads, you know, and shorts and a t-shirt and helmets. Sark even joked in the media avail- media av- availability after that day. He said, I call this portion of spring practice or fall camp, whatever it is, underwear. And because you don't play football in underwear, you play it in armor. And I thought, I thought that was a pretty good, <laughs> pretty good quote right there to basically just say, Hey, we liked what we saw today. We're going to go back and watch all the tape, but this is not how football is played. But just for what we saw for about 20, 25 minutes, those receivers look good. Like to me, I've been on this guy for a while and not that it's crazy. He was a five-star recruit, but Jonte cook, man. And Isaiah bond, um, you know, Matthew golden, all those guys, like they, they looked really good. Cause I think when you like just their body, their physicality, even without pads, like, like Jonte cook, probably not, well, not many people are as fast as Xavier worthy, but if his speed is even close to Xavier worthy, I mean, he has a more traditional, traditionally built receiver body so if he's anything close to that with speed like watching him run some of these deep balls run down some of these deep balls even in practice with no defense i mean we're talking about 50 60 yards down the field tracking a ball i don't care if you don't have pads on or anything like that we know he's got enough speed to get behind most defenses and he just looks really set physically and that was the other thing that um i don't know if you want to touch on that with the receivers or, or anything there so I think that Jonte Cook is the it's not unsung hero necessarily, but he's a guy who's not receiving enough talk with regards to that revamped receiving room. Obviously, you bring accomplished guys in from other schools. That is going to take a big chunk of attention, but Jonte Cook is a guy who's been on this roster and in this system amongst him, and I know there's some other young guys that he's teammates with or been teammates with to go along with the new dudes. We as fans, we fall in love with backups and we romanticize what a backup (laughs) might be capable of given an opportunity. But the clamoring for Jonte Cook to get a little bit more run last year, even with those three really talented receivers in front of him, was completely warranted in my opinion. Like I think Jonte Cook, it's either going to be Bond or Cook or maybe some combination of the two because Sark does like to spread it out. One guy tends to get the lion's share, but that second option – still does quite nicely for himself too, especially if he's that deep threat, although Bond is also a deep threat. Jonte Cook is primed for a huge 2024, in my opinion. Yeah, and I was look, I was looking at some of the, you know, just the measurables on these guys and stuff like that when they first, you know, came out of the portal or, you know, Jonte and going back and looking at what he did in high school. And I was a little concerned that it just felt like they had three very similar guys where whereas this year the skill set i mean i think we talked about this on monday or maybe it was on last week's show the skill set of these guys is or of last year's guys were very complementary like obviously we know what worthy does mitchell's you know not necessarily a burner although we found out that he's you know just top top end speed is probably better than we gave him credit for while he was at texas but he's more of just your traditional 6'3", 180, chiseled, can run, great catch radius, can do it all kind of receiver, like I said about Xavier. And then Jay Witt, like your possession guy. I was a little worried about the three guys that I think were sort of plugging in there immediately without letting some position battles play out, which may kind of be a fool's errand, but we won't really know who the main guys are, I think, until we see them hit the field in, you know, late August and then September, but it looked to me like cook golden bond. Like they just seemed like very similar receivers. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I always like whether it's, you know, a two headed monster at running back two tight ends, one that's more your Jatavion Sanders playmaker, one more of like a blocking guy. I just always like those pieces to complement each other and guys that have different skill, 
skill sets. And I think looking at that, not that I'm completely sold and changing my opinion based off the first day of spring practice in a 20 minute window, but maybe I was like, all right, I probably didn't give those guys enough credit for like their frames. If that makes sense. Like just seeing them out there. Like I watched Isaiah bond, you know, catch like a little out route right in front of me. And like, dude almost like went into the camera and I'm like, all right, all right. Like that, like that's a really good college receiver and frame on that guy. <laughs> so I'm thinking back to Sark's most talented receiver room with the Longhorns and with Alabama. Sorry, Texas fans. This pisses you off, but listen to the names here. Jerry Judy, Devonte Smith, Henry Ruggs, and Jalen Waddell. There's not a huge disparity in the skill sets there, but holy shit, were those guys hard to guard. So sometimes yeah. if you're just that good, the diversity and body types or what you do well matters less, especially if you're really good at quarterback like he was then and like they are going to be with Quinn Ewers this year too. Yeah, and I think that's maybe what I'm getting at to put it more succinctly is I, I checked myself a little bit on that take and was kind of just like, if these guys are good enough and they're the three best guys, just give them the freaking ball and let them make plays. Yeah. Even if you don't have a one guy that's six foot four and you know, he's your traditional Z receiver, X receiver. Like you just have three guys that I don't care what letter you put on them. They're just ball players. They just make plays. Seems like Texas has some dudes like that in the secondary this year too. Guys who can play multiple positions, whether you're talking about a, Jonte Cook, who's received some conversation about maybe playing more outside cornerback. I think he could also play safety in a pinch if he needed to. Doesn't need to, though, thanks to uh, guys like Makuba, who are on this roster, who played both nickel and safety. The more traditional safety types, like a Michael Taff and uh, Derek Williams, the kid from Louisiana who turned some heads as a true freshman. You have your more traditional cornerbacks with the uh, – uh, Malik Muhammad's and Terrence Brooks's, but they've got some flexibility in that secondary now to, to really tinker and try different things out over the next little bit less than a month now of spring ball, but also as a uh, fall camp really gets going in late July or early August. Yeah, no doubt. And we know that that's an area of need for this team. I mean, that's what, that's what Stark talked about in the off season was, you know, you use, you want to recruit the majority of your guys, especially when you're at Texas and you know, with your resources, history, tradition, the NIL money. Now you're not really going to lose guys that are playing really well when they get here. So you don't have to worry about being that, that mid major route of like, Hey, do we develop a guy too soon? And then he ends up leaving. Yep. Um, so, you know, they've recruited well from the high school ranks. And I think in that secondary right now, you have a good mixture of that. I mean, you have a good mixture of portal guys and young guys, and then even former walk-ons. Like, you have a little bit of everything, even though you lost a decent amount of guys. Like, you know, not that losing Jaron Thompson's that big of a deal, but it's a guy that made plays and has played a lot of college football. So now you kind of replace him with an Andrew Makuba, who I think, you know, you would hope is a better version of that. So you supplement through the portal but then still build the bulk of your roster through high school recruiting, which I think Sark's done a tremendous job of adapting in that sense. I mean, he has not, he deserves credit for that. He's not wasted any time in, in, in adapting and saying, Hey, the portal is what it is. You may pin me down and ask me for my opinion on it. And I might tell you, I might not like it, but guess what? I like being the head football coach at Texas and I like winning games. I like winning championships. So if I want to do that, better get my ass in the portal and pick and choose guys that make sense and recruit through the portal to a fit and to a need, just like you might during, you know, high school recruiting, but you're going to be a little bit more picky on, Hey, let's vet a guy like Makuba, which you didn't need a ton of vetting on Makuba seeing what he did at Clemson. And then, you know, his relationship to Jamal Fenner, who's you know the director of high school recruiting and uh, our director of high school relations at Texas. And then he was Makuba's high school coach. So they did a great job there. And then, I, the two young guys you mentioned, Malik Muhammad and Derek Williams, I think a lot of people are really high on. And then you hope that Terrence Brooks gets better and that he's a shining example of the development that you keep preaching of a guy that got early playing time and struggled at times, but then maybe he comes back this year and he turns into a lockdown guy that you thought he could be. And if he doesn't, he's at least going to be serviceable. Look, progress is not 
always linear. It's usually not linear. It's a two steps forward, one step back process. And so we saw Brooks start to figure some things out last year, but we also saw struggles at times too. It's just it's the nature of the beast. And you got to always preach patience because there aren't many guys who just hit the ground running as true freshmen or redshirt freshmen and are pl pretty flawless record-wise after that point. Everybody has to go through the the ebbs and flows of development. And certainly at a position like cornerback, where you're already working at the disadvantage of how the sport caters to wide receivers and two offenses. So there needs to be even more forgiveness with regards to mistakes. Now, the mental mistakes can become problematic if you're making those same mistakes over and over again, because then you're not making the adjustment that you should be. But I'm cautiously optimistic we see a breakout year for Terrence Brooks this season. And I think Muhammad is probably the better cover corner right now. I think at the end of the season, he was this team's best option at cover corner, Ryan Watts included. I love his frame and his physicality too. Yeah. Um, but with Brooks last year, you know, you had Watts on the other side for most of the year when he was healthy. And it's not like he was a true shutdown guy, but if you looked at it as an opposing team, he was the side that you wouldn't really want to throw on. Mm -hmm. And that's why sometimes interception numbers can be a little bit misleading because like if you're a corner, I don't want to say you, you want to have no interceptions, but like my goal, like I played corner in high school and there was one year I had like five or six picks and they would always joke with me. They'd be like, yeah, because like they'll actually throw to your side because you don't scare them enough to not throw to not throw at you. And then you get to the point where it's like they see that on tape and they go, well, we don't want to throw at that guy, hmm. you know, and I know Brooks had a few interceptions like that. And it's not taking anything away. I mean, he made plays when the ball was thrown at him in, in, in those instances. But, you know, Texas, hopefully, as they go into the SEC and especially in this this now era of, you know, high flying passing attacks, basically everywhere you look for the most part. You know, you you want on any any given team, any given year, like one guy who can be totally shut down. And who knows if Brooks will ever develop into that? Maybe it ends up be, becoming Muhammad, and they're like, "Hey, we're going to keep throwing at Terrence Brooks because we don't want to throw at Malik Muhammad." Because <laughs> I, I I love his physicality and frame, but Malik Muhammad. Yeah, but he even made some plays at the end of the year where I was like, Whew. like plays that if you're a football fan, you just look and go, "Yeah, like let's go." Even when Muhammad was getting backup reps early in the season, he would come up and show just his willingness to be physical, stick his nose in there when Texas had the game well in hand and say, hey, just because we're up like this doesn't mean I'm not I'm not going to play like I'm going to if this is a 0-0 contest right now. And that has only continued to translate into positive things for him. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one other uh, position on that side of the ball too or at least specific part of a position is D tackle interior defensive line. And, you know, maybe we're not given the guys coming up behind Tavondre sweat and uh, Byron Murphy enough credit. Cause Alfred Collins has played some good football. Vernon Broughton's played some good football. It just hasn't been consistent. Right. But like we talked about last week or Monday, like that's the same thing that we said about Tavondre sweat and, and Byron Murphy going into last year was these guys have flashed, but they haven't stuck. Like it hasn't totally stuck consistently with them. Mm -hmm. So Collins and Broughton are two guys uh, to look at there. And then Sarkle actually mentioned a couple of the younger guys by name. He mentioned Jare Bledsoe and Aaron Bryant as two young guys. I think both either going into their second or third year with the program of guys that could kind of just, you know, maybe you, you Move them up. Collins and Broughton, maybe you move them up, even if they're not as productive to the Sweat and Murphy role last year. And then Bryant and uh, Dre Bledsoe get those reps. And he even mentioned Alex January, the defensive tackle. Who was from Duncanville, yeah. Yeah, and was not like one of, from a star standpoint, recruiting services standpoint, was was not like a, you know, one of the higher rated guys in that class. Uh, but yeah, Stark mentioned him as a guy who's just impressed so far in offseason mm -hmm off-season workouts and then you know the one the one day of spring ball that we talked to him after interesting so another name that people need to pay attention to on the interior defensive line because i've heard a fair amount about Bledsoe, less about bryant and i'm sure you've seen the pictures floating around on social media of this guy this week or maybe you stood next to him and saw how big he was in person but holy shit sadir mitchell is huge <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I saw what I can't remember which Texas uh, fellow media member it was, but someone tweeted like, "This is 372 pounds of Sadir Mitchell." <laughs> like Devondre Sweat, not taking shots, Devondre. I apologize if this is considered a stray. Like, he looks like he could afford to maybe lose a pound or two. Sadir Mitchell just looks rock solid. And he's like what six seven also to boot. That's I'm I'm pulling up the roster right now because that's what I wanted to look at. Is it looks, and again like I, I hate using this word because when we were talking about this with Bucky and Zay, and you know, when we hopped on, like Tavondre Sweat showed that he can play and be functional at that weight. So that's why I'm hesitant to criticize because if it's functional good weight. Now there's a threshold for everything where if you fall over a certain point just with your size and your frame, I mean, we could put a different number on it for me and you even, Hey, if you reach a certain number based on your frame and your genetics and your height, like that's probably not a good place to go. Even if you're still moderately athletic. So What's maybe, your ideal playing weight, Jeff? I'm going to interrupt you mid thought. What is the ideal playing weight for Jeff Barker? Well, I'm, I'm five ten. I actually went to the doctor today. So I got, Wade, 5'10, 182. So I was 185 in high school, but that was muscle. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not a big guy. Like if people saw me, they would be like, dude, stop. Like, You're you, like I do have, that shocks me. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Um, but when, when I was in high school, that was fine because I was playing football. I was doing track. I was, you know, a little pickup basketball. I mean, that was good weight. I was, doing cardio all the time and lifting but now it's you know probably i probably afford to lose a, a few lbs but you know what if i don't then i th i think i think i'll be fine for now me too i'm i'm five to seven pounds over my ideal playing weight i'm in the mid 170s right now i think low 170s to upper 160s is ideal for me and and how tall are you because you're taller than me somewhere between six feet and six one. I think I'm probably closer to six feet now, unfortunately, because once you reach a certain age, it gets around 40. You lose a quarter inch every 10 years, I believe, because your body and spine just continue to uh, compress. So yeah, probably just over six feet. I don't have a quarter inch to lose. I'm not looking forward to that. <laughs> I didn't mean I it. In, no, I didn't I mean it in that, that way. You I idea that I may be under six feet in the next ten to fifteen years. You know. Well, it, at least you got there. At least you you were in that club for a little while. Yeah. And but you know what? I've I've taken pride in not being the guy that is five ten, five eleven, but says he's six foot. Nope. I'm not. I'm not six feet. I'm. I'm just not. I want to be, but I'm not. You know. So I, so I got to make sure that the hair looks good. I got to make sure the rest of the body looks good. You know, I'm, I'm just trying to trying to use the gifts that I have because height's not one of them. And, that, and that's fine. You got good hair. You're a good looking dude. Thank you. TV good looking. That's how good looking you are. You are television good looking. <laughs> well, I hope uh, for another 30, 35 years that my uh, current bosses and future bosses agree with you on that. <laughs> but, but to our point, I have, I have some sort of control of that. I, yeah. I finally pulled it up on the roster here. Sadir Mitchell is listed at six foot six, 372 pounds. Good so again, to be, we're not, we're not trying to like rip anybody else, but that look 372 looks proportional when you're in really good shape you're really athletic and you have a six foot six frame for all that weight to go on. Yeah. Yep. Uh, anything else offensively or defensively that you think is worth a conversation right now? I've got about seven to eight minutes before I'm going to play that roadhouse red carpet to end today's show. Well, speaking of, I guess one other thought was speaking of frame, there was a little bit of talk about that from Stark after about Quinn. Cause I thought Quinn looks really good like just he I, I didn't even know how to describe how he looked before I mean I think when he got to campus he was he was a little had a little bit of that I mean the, the the mullet didn't help either with how the rest of the frame looks but excuse me a little like chunky maybe or just like doughy kind of 
And then you remember he lost a bunch of weight going into last year. And then people, some people were like, whoa, is that too skinny? Now it almost looks like he has put on a little bit of mass, like a little bit of muscle even. I don't know if he's just been in the weight room a ton, but Sark mentioned this and I agree. He just kind of looks broader. Like even in the shoulders, watching him throw, like, I don't know. He just almost looks the part even more than he did before. And I think a lot of that comes with, with two things. It comes with putting in the work from a diet and exercise strength and conditioning standpoint. Uh, and then also just, just growing up, yeah. just getting, just getting older too, and becoming more of, you know, just getting more of that man strength a little bit. This is the but, smart way to go about building your body or rebuilding your body or transforming your body. You want to lose the bad weight first. Believe mm -hmm. it or not. And so he was a little bit wiry of frame last year. We can, uh, we can be completely honest about that. Not that we're not usually completely honest, but to hear that he's starting to put good muscle on now too. The one knock on his game at this point, Jeff, is his ability to stay healthy. He suffered yep. injuries that affected multiple games in the last three seasons where he was a starting quarterback. The two seasons at Texas and then his last year at South Lake Carroll too. So how do you defend against that? Well, you go to Bucky Godbolt's school of falling good for one, but you also protect yourself by getting stronger and getting bigger and you will be better off with the physical rigors of football. Yeah. And I thought it was interesting that Sark pointed that out too, about the evolution of, you know, the way that Quinn's grown and look as critical as I've been about the guy at times, like, I don't, I don't think he's going to get worse this year. So you've got to, <laughs> you've got to feel pretty damn good. If you're, if you're a Texas fan, like third year in this offense, that's not an easy offense to run the way Sark runs things and the amount that he puts on his quarterbacks. It's a lot. So that's why even this develop this developmental year for arch, I think some people get a little impatient sometimes understandably with backups and quarterbacks, especially and saying, well, how much better could a guy really be getting if he's not playing and like, how good are the mental reps if you don't ever get on the field and get to implement it? which I understand to an extent, but I think it just shows that, you know, when Arch actually gets back, when he gets on the field as the starter at some point, whether that's, you know, knock on wood, hopefully this doesn't happen, but replacing Quinn Ewers because of an injury or season after this coming one where he is presumably the starter for Texas for a year or two. Um, he's going to be, he really, he's going to be much more ready to go. He's going to be more confident. Yeah, there will still be growing pains of a first time starter out there, but having two years of just mental reps and watching another guy do it successfully and having that relationship with that guy and that kind of mentor mentee, if that's the relationship he has with Quinn and then the one with Sark, like it's just, you're just building it up. You're building it up. And then you're just hoping that these things pay dividends down the road. And I think that's hard for people, you know, cause we're not in the building every day and fans want to see immediate results, but it's things that I, I don't think you can take for granted. Yeah, and it, look, Arch Manning's going to get some playing time this year. Even if it's a mop-up duty, we're going to see him more, and there's a chance that we see him have to play when it matters more, too, based on Quinn Ewer's recent history. So when that time comes, he's going to be much more ready this year than he was last year. And when he was truly getting in as the third-string quarterback now, I get that he played, is that the Oklahoma State game or the Texas Tech game where Malik Murphy had gotten run into, I think it was the Texas Tech game. Malik Murphy mm -hmm. got run into on the sidelines and the coaches just didn't want to take a chance with him. Arch Manning ends up getting the backup reps there, but he's going to be the true on backup now. And with that comes a completely different mindset from being the third guy who had made, had made it clear as the Manning camp did, while also talking to Steve Sarkeesian who made it clear that we're not looking to play you in year one. Now that he knows that the possibility is much greater, it's going to change how he's going about his business this offseason too, is my guess. And why not have a package for him, potentially? Sure. You know, now we've, we, we've seen him out there. We've gotten that out of the way. The ridiculous ovation he got when he went into the game, a real game for the first time. Best two was, for five in the history of Longhorn football, Jeff. What? Best two for five in the history of Longhorn football by a quarterback. 
I mean, that was some of the most ridiculous reaction from fans that I've seen. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Like the guy's been highly touted. He's a Manning. I mean, you, you're hoping that you're getting the next Aiden or Eli. Like that's, that's what you're hoping for. You're hoping you're getting better than that. You know, at least better than Eli in college. I mean, not that he was bad, but you're hoping you're getting more like Peyton. But I think with, uh, with Arch, yeah, the, even just playing those snaps, getting that out of the way, like now is not just that, like, oh, I got to see who, what's going to be, what's going to be like when I get out there really for the first time in a game. Like, how are people going to react? Not that he's that worried about that, but it is, it's part, part of the fact, you know, it's one of the factors. It's part of the deal. Um, and also, last thing on that is, I'm just so excited for this. Like, there's no red shirt conversation anymore. As silly as that was, that yeah. we were all doing that. So now we can't talk about that anymore. He's used the red shirt. So play him a little bit if you want. You don't have to play him sparingly. And, and not that if Sark needed him, he would have dilly-dallied around or, or worked around the red shirt. But now it's like that's not even a topic of conversation. He's he's one of the quarterbacks. You know, If you need him, he's right there. All right. We are at the end of today's show with 10 minutes left. We're at the end because I'm going to take this last 10 minutes and play for you the interviews that I conducted at the Red Carpet premiere at South by Southwest for the new Amazon Prime flick Roadhouse. Yes, it is a remake of the Patrick Swayze flick from the 1980s in a sense, but it's also its own project as well. I spoke with the cast and crew, including um, Jake Gyllenhaal and Conor McGregor about Roadhouse. And Jeff, if I don't talk to you on the other side, have a great weekend. Great job today, man. You too, my friend. This was fun as always. Yes, it was. And now without further ado, the red carpet premiere of Roadhouse. Hey, Connor Trey, nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you, Troy. Nice Big fan, so thank you for everything thank you do for me and the other fans Appreciate as well. it. Thank you so much, sir. That thank Paisley you. print has never looked so badass, Pretty so cool. kudos that's on that's that. It's like Texas vibe, rock and roll. You know, it's hard, hard rocking for the Texans. Exactly. So what did Jake teach you about acting? Uh, Jake was instrumental for me. I, I would have been, you know, I would have been in a bad spot without Jake and Doug, director Doug, and my acting coaches, uh, Nancy Banks and Elena George, who helped me tremendously. I learned so much. This guy is... Uh, Jay is a, uh, Jake is a consummate professional, so it was an honor to be on a, in a movie with him. Oh man, well Connor was teaching me all the time. Like every every take we would do, we go back to the monitor, we look at it. He would he'd be sh like he'd be showing me moves or things I had done that I could change and switch up like constantly. I mean, even when we were grappling, you know, he'd be talking to me. He'd be like, wrap the leg over for put it put it farther over there. Yeah, there you go under the head. You know, like he's talking to me in the scenes. What did you teach Jake about fighting? I t you know, Jay can fight as well, so I was just a just sharpening up a couple of his punching, you know, make sure the torque of the body was correct. And, you know, not that he hadn't got it already, but sometimes if you're in the middle of a combination, if you've got a five or six punch combination, maybe the third punch might be a little bit novicey looking. And I just wanted to refine that and make sure it was as venomous as we could get it, and that's what we got. It was interesting to have him learn how to not fight, because, you know, for him, He's just used to landing the punch. But to not land the punch, which is what happens in movies, was a new skill to learn, right? And so it was funny to teach such an extraordinary athlete how to not do their job as well as they should be doing it. Um, but in You didn't land any fake punches, did you? Uh, I some actually yes I did sometimes by mistake he didn't care but he hit me a couple times by mistake and that was actually like he was so like but it's inevitable in this I mean we fight there's so much fighting in this movie that was an inevitability you know did you go back and watch the original film as a way to just maybe get a basic idea for what it was you wanted to do even though this is obviously its own project yes um, I've watched it many years ago once and then I, of course I rewatched it again but not to to not thinking like what can I do differently I know that uh, like that's a classic but I didn't want to do something based on it yeah. in a way I honor the classic but this is this is its own thing there's a lot of like fine and care into this you know being like very like meticulous on what's gonna be paid homage to in terms of the old one and then how you can make it fresh still so I think the fans will still appreciate all the homage but they'll still appreciate the new take on it because again they want a new experience but they want what they know you know so that's why I think it's gonna be a good balance I have seen it so I'm excited for them to see it you know well I don't think it should be on that scale and I think art is a subjective thing of a time of a generation so like 
the original Roadhouse, you could celebrate it and it'd be awesome. That's what we did. Like you're allowed to watch the VHS tape, the DVD, whatever screener of it, and you could celebrate ours as well. I don't think it should be like one's better than the other or a competition. Art is not a competition. It should never be. It doesn't make sense when people are competing in this industry because you go like, hey, I'm gonna put something in the world that I think is important to share. Not even important to share, but just like fun. Like I just hope we don't have to compete. There's no reason. Hey, what's going on? He's Dom? fired. What's Shoot. up? Y'all gotta pay attention to this guy. Hey, we got Dom in the middle. Good to see you, bro. He, he's, he's the modern Jeff Healy character in this film, yes. in this movie as well. For someone who's a real-life musician, have you ever actually had to play behind Chicken Wire before? I haven't played behind Chicken Wire. Usually the shows that I play don't get quite that rowdy. Look, I'm a country music singer. Things do get rowdy from time to time. I've had a couple people throw things on stage, but never a full fight like that break out the way that it does in the film. So I'm excited to see how it fits into the overall narrative. Obviously, I've seen the original, but... You know, they've changed some things around. So I'm, you know, cool to see what that role was based on, and hopefully I can do it justice. Did you cover any Healy songs as a part of what you were playing on stage in your role? I didn't. I actually was singing one of my own songs. So that's a pretty cool moment for me and my co-writers who made that record to see it now in a, in a blockbuster film. So considering this movie is all about fighting, yeah. when is the last time you were in a physical fight? Why did it happen? And what was the outcome? Oh, gosh. Well, that takes me back to high school. Um, no, I've never. I've, I've honestly, I've never been in a fight. I've gotten very close. I've wanted to hit many people, but I'm going to attribute that to my oh you spent have you spent time in Austin in traffic <laughs> the traffic is something I will I've se I've just seen it just uh, got a little clip of it um, but no thankfully no actual physical fights verbal abuse for sure like I can scream at someone like anyone but but an actual punch no especially from the safety of your car that's when it feels really good to scream yeah. at somebody oh, else oh, I've got a lot of things to say to the drivers in front of me for sure it wasn't more a fist fight it was more of a clawing fight I remember we were at the we were in the parking lot of the Los Angeles Public Library and and she wanted to sit in the front seat and I wanted to sit in the front seat and I made a mistake because my sister has like these huge bare hands and she kind of whipped my ass a little bit and I was like well I'm not going to try it anymore so and that was all for the front seat. Um, I haven't been into a, I've been in a full fist fight. I had a situation once at a bar where uh, some girls that I was out with, one of them wasn't really feeling the attention that she was getting from a male suitor. Uh, I kindly let him know, hey man, plenty of other girls here, she's not really feeling it. And he took that opportunity to shove me and break my glasses in half, which I feel like, hey, you don't know how blind I might be, bro. Like, you, that, you can't, that's like knocking somebody out of a wheelchair off their crutches. I, I didn't like that, but I did not push back. I said, hey, I'm not about that. So um, as, as Jake says in the film, nobody really wins in a fight, so I stepped away. Well, growing up, my main sport was boxing, so I fought for 13 years. So I was the I was the kid that was yeah yeah. So I was the kid that was fighting on the street. Yeah, the license, so for sure. But growing up, I fought a lot, and then it got to the point where my dad was like, "Yo, you need to get you need to learn how to do this like in the right way." Took me to the boxing gym, became my coach, and I excelled in boxing. So for me. My last fight was in the ring in 2011, you know what I'm saying? And then that's when I graduated high school. I started my path to become an actor and a filmmaker. I went to LA Film School, and then now, years later, I'm doing it in movies. So I get to still do what I love, but as an actor. Have you ever been in a physical fight in your life? If so, what were the circuit? You have not. What's the closest you've come? The closest. The closest. Yeah, yeah, maybe, but like, in home, at home, you know, like when I was younger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But never like physical. No, no, no. You're a big sports fan. Yes, sir. Football, your favorite sport? Uh, football, hockey. Hockey, big uh, Rangers fan. Big Rangers fan. Okay, I'm a big Blackhawks fan. Oh, really? Yeah, I li lived in Chicago and got to cover the team in the six years where they were winning a lot of Stanley Cups. That's so. awesome. I'm sadly a Jets fan, but I love the Jets. Come on. Mets, Jets, and Rangers. You're a believer in the Jets if uh, Aaron Rodgers comes back completely healthy next year? I mean, I Let's look at the track record of what happens when that happens. Like, I was always a fan of Rodgers. I think he's a great quarterback. Um, I hope he does a great job. Or at least, like, leads the team in a great direction with a great mentality. That's my hope, honestly. I believe in him. I really do. What was your favorite part of making Roadhouse? Favorite part was getting to live on the beach for a while. I mean, not the actual beach, but we got to stay in these apartments that were on the beach, which was really nice. Where were y'all? We were in the Dominican Republic. Oh, yeah. That's really nice. Nice. Beautiful water. Like, everyone was super nice. It was nice. First time in the DR? Yeah, it was, actually. Hopefully not my last. Have you been? No, I haven't. I've been to uh, St. Thomas, St. Yeah. Martin, yeah. and uh, St. John's for a day, but yeah. never DR. I've heard great things, though. Yeah. 
Favorite food there? Yeah, I had a lot of good rice there. <laughs> Lots of chicken and rice and in the Caribbean. A lot of good tostones too. What did you love most about getting to make this film with so many talented people around you? It's amazing. I couldn't believe when I when I when I realized, oh my god, I'm doing a movie with Jake Gyllenhaal, with Post Malone, with Conor McGregor, with Billy, with Jack, with everyone. I couldn't I I had to pinch myself all the time. <laughs> all right, last last question now because Conor's obviously a real life badass. How many Jake Gyllenhaals would it take to beat Conor McGregor in a real fight? That would be like the Matrix, man. You'd need like <laughs> you would need a bunch like, of Mr. Smiths. You'd be like a thousand Mr. Smiths. Yeah, yeah. Cool, right? How many Jakes would it take to beat Conor McGregor in a real life fight? Ah, uh, you know, fucking twelve, proper twelve, proper twelve Jake Gyllenhaals. How many of me's would it take to beat Conor McGregor in a fight? Proper twelve, yes, sir. Man, I think three of us, three Bobs, could take him down. Three. Wow. But also then I just saw there was a clip online of these three guys. They used to do, because I'm a big UFC fan, they used to have, there's this fighting network that has these three guys fight against one, this really badass guy, and these three average guys going to fight him. And it didn't end so well for the three average guys. So I might need a couple actually more. Maybe five. Five seems reasonable. Biting at Connor's ankles, we need somebody fucking grabbing his fucking whatever. Oh, you got to fight like a stanza with Conor McGregor. If it's a fight to the death, you got to go to the death against Conor. I think it would probably take maybe six of me. Yeah, five, six seems like the, the number. Five to six feels like a good number. I feel like four is way too ambitious. Um, seven feels like I'm, I'm not giving myself enough credit. I'd say five and a half. Breelands could probably take a Conor. Um, let me just do some math. I'd say about maybe eight, 18, 18, 18.3 BKs to beat one Conor McGregor. I don't want to. I want to become his friend. You want to become his friend? Okay. Just want to become his friend. Okay. Is it better not to fight for me. Six thousand. Six thousand. That's a good number. I've heard eighteen and a half. I've heard six. Somebody is said, some crazy person has said three. Yes, eighteen thousand is the most reasonable answer. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of people. Yeah. To just suffocate him. No idea. I have no idea. In real life. I'm gonna need this many people with me, okay? <laughs> nah, I'm, I'm like, Connor, Connor's Connor. Connor ain't there by accident. You know what I'm saying? So I can make it look good on camera, but in real life, hey, shout out to Connor, man. How many post Malones would it take to beat up Connor McGregor? I mean, yes. Uh, but Post Malone has just given Connor McGregor a bunch of psilocybin. This question is hilarious. Um, I don't I'm say he's still gonna lose. See, I don't think he's still gonna. <laughs> Connor, when he snaps into that mode, man, it's a different beast. So and I felt that energy. We have a lot of fights scenes together, so it's, it's cool working and doing that dance. So to me, I think Connor will still win. Well, hey, thank you so much for the time. I'm glad you guys didn't go with the uh, Patrick Swayze Lions mane. It was tempting, I'm sure, but uh, you had to go with your own hair. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, we, we made another decision. You know, that's Patrick. That's his thing.